Chapter One of Run to Earth, a novel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dale Mattern. Run to Earth, a novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter One Warned in a Dream. Seven and twenty years ago, and a bleak evening in March, there were gas lamps flaring down in Radcliffe Highway, and the sound of squeaking fiddles and trampling feet in many public houses tell of festivity provided for Jack along shore. The emporiums of slop sellers are illuminated for the better display of tarpaulin coats and hats, so stiff of build that they look like so many seafaring suicides. Pendant from the low ceilings. These emporiums are here and there enlivened by festoons of many colored bandana handkerchiefs, and on every pane of glass in shop or tavern window is painted the glowing representation of Britannia's pride, the immortal Union Jack. Two men sat drinking and smoking in a little parlor at the back of an old public house in Shadwell. The room was about as large as a good-sized cupboard, and was illuminated in the daytime by a window commanding a pleasant prospect of coal-shed and dead wall. The paper on the walls was dark and greasy with age, and every bit of clumsy, bulging deal furniture in the room had been transformed into a kind of ebony by the action of time and dirt, the greasy backs and elbows of idle loungers, the tobacco smoke and beer stains of half a century. It was evident that the two men smoking and drinking in this darksome little den belonged to the seafaring community. In this they resembled each other, but in nothing else. One was tall and stalwart, the other was small and wizen and misshapen. One had a dark, bronzed face with a frank, fearless expression. The other was pale and freckled, and had small, light gray eyes that shifted and blinked perpetually, and shifted and blinked most when he was talking with most animation. The first had a sonorous bass voice and a resonant laugh. The second spoke in suppressed tones, and had a trick of dropping his voice to a whisper whenever he was most energetic. The first was captain and half-owner of the brigantine Pizarro, trading between the port of London and the coast of Mexico. The second was his clerk, factotum, and confidant, half-sailor, half-landsman, able to take the helm in dangerous weather, if need were, and able to afford his employer counsel in the most intricate questions of trading and speculation. The name of the captain was Valentine Jernum, that of his factotum, Joyce Harker. The captain had found him in an American hospital, had taken compassion upon him, and had offered him a free passage home. On the homeward voyage, Joyce Harker had shown himself so handy a personage that Captain Jernum had declined to part with him at the end of the cruise, and from that time the wizen little hunchback had been the stalwart seaman's friend and companion. For fifteen years, during which Valentine Jernum and his younger brother George had been traders on the high seas, things had gone well with these two brothers, but never had fortune so liberally favored their trading as during the four years in which Joyce Harker had prompted every commercial adventure and guided every speculation. Four years to-day, Joyce, since I first set eyes upon your face in the hospital at New Orleans, said Captain Jernum, in the confidence of this jovial hour. Why, the fellow's dead, said I. No, he's only dying, says the doctor. What's the matter with him, asked I. Homesickness and empty pockets, says the doctor. He was employed in a gaming-house in the city, 
got knocked on the head in some row, and was brought here. We've got him through a fever that was likely enough to have finished him, but there he lies, as weak as a starved rat. He has neither money nor friends. He wants to get back to England, but he has no more hope of ever seeing that country than I have of being Emperor of Mexico. Hasn't he? says I. We'll tell you a different story about that, Mr. Doctor. If you can patch the poor devil up between this and next Monday, I'll take him home in my ship, without the passage costing him sixpence. You don't feel offended with me for having called you a poor devil, eh, Joyce? For you really were, you know. You really were an uncommonly poor creature just then, murmured the captain apologetically. "'Offended with you?' exclaimed the factotum. "'That's a likely thing. Don't I owe you my life? "'How many more of my countrymen passed me by as I lay on that hospital bed "'and left me to rot there for all they cared? "'I heard their loud voices and their creaking boots as I lay there, "'too weak to lift my eyelids and look at them, but not too weak to curse them.' "'No, Joyce, don't say that. "'But I do say it, and what's more, I mean it. "'I'll tell you what it is, Captain. "'There's a general opinion that when a man's shoulders are crooked, "'his mind is crooked, too, "'and that, if his poor, unfortunate legs have shriveled up small, "'his heart must have shriveled up small to match him. "'I dare say there's some truth in the general opinion, "'for, you see... It doesn't improve a man's temper to find himself cut out according to a different pattern from that his fellow creatures have been made by, and to find his fellow creatures setting themselves against him because of that difference. And it doesn't soften a poor wretch's heart towards the world in general, to find the world in general harder than stone against him, for no better reason than his poor weak legs— and his poor crooked back. But never mind talking about me and my feelings, Captain. I ain't of so much account as to make it worth while for a fine fellow like you to waste words upon me. What I want to know is your plans. You don't intend to stop down this way, do you? Why shouldn't I? "'Because it's a dangerous way for a man who carries his fortune about him as you do. "'I wish you'd make up your mind to bank that money, Captain.' "'Not if I know it,' answered the sailor, with a look of profound wisdom. "'Not if I know it, Joyce Harker. "'I know what your bankers are. "'You go to them some fine afternoon, and find a lot of clerks, "'standing behind a brand-new mahogany counter.' "'everything bright and shining and respectable. "'Can I leave a few hundreds on deposit?' asks you. "'Why, of course you can,' reply they. "'And then you hand over your money, "'and then they hand you back a little bit of paper. "'That's your receipt,' say they. "'All right,' say you, and off you sheer. "'Perhaps you feel just a little bit queerish when you get outside.' "'to think that all your solid cash has been melted down into that morsel of paper. "'But, being a light-hearted, easy-going fellow, you don't think any more of it, "'till you come home from your next voyage and go ashore again and want your money, "'when it's ten to one if you don't find your fine new bank shut up "'and your clerks and brand-new mahogany counter vanished. "'No, Joyce, I'll trust no bankers.' "'I'd rather trust the bankers than the people down this way any day in the week,' answered the clerk thoughtfully. "'Don't you worry yourself, Joyce. The money won't be in my keeping very long. "'George is to meet me in London on the 5th of April at the latest,' he says, "'unless winds and waves are more contrary than ever they've been since he's had to do with them. "'And you know George is my banker.' I'm only a sleeping partner in the firm of Jernham Brothers. George takes the money, and George does what he likes with it, puts it here and there, and speculates in this, and speculates in that. 
"'You've got a business head of your own, Joyce. "'You're one of George's own sort, "'and you are up to all his dodges, "'which is more than I am. "'However, he tells me we're getting rich, "'and that's pleasant enough. "'Not that I think I should break my heart about it "'if we were getting poor. "'I love the sea because it is the sea, "'and I love my ship for her own sake.' "'Captain George is right, though,' answered the clerk. "'Jernan Brothers are growing rich. "'Jernan Brothers are prospering. "'But you haven't told me your plans yet, Captain.' "'Well, since you say I had better cut this quarter, I suppose I must. "'Though I like to see the rigging above the housetops, "'and to hear the jolly voices of the sailors, "'and to know that the Pizarro lies hard by in the pool. "'However, there's an old aunt of mine down in a sleepy little village in Devonshire who'll be glad to see me and none the worse for a small slice of Jernan Brothers' good luck. So I'll take a place on the Plymouth coach tomorrow morning and go down and have a peep at her. You'll be able to keep a lookout on the repairs aboard the Pizarro, and I can be back in time to meet George on the 5th. Where are you to meet him? In this room. The factotum shook his head. "'You're both a good deal too fond of this house,' he said. "'The people that have got it now are strangers to us. "'They've bought the business since our last trip. "'I don't like the look on them.' "'No more do I, if it comes to that. "'I was sorry to hear the old folks had been done up. "'But come, Joyce, some more rum and water. "'Let's enjoy ourselves tonight, man, "'if I'm to stop by the first coach tomorrow morning.' "'What's that?' The captain stopped, with the bell-rope in his hand, to listen to the sound of music close at hand. A woman's voice, fresh and clear as the song of a skylark, was singing, "Wapping old stairs, to the accompaniment of a feeble old piano. "'What a voice!' cried the sailor. "'Why, it seems to pierce to the very core of my heart as I listen to it. "'Let's go and hear the music, Joyce.' "'Better not, Captain,' answered the warning voice of the clerk. "'I tell you, they're a bad lot in this house. "'It's a sort of concert they give of a night, "'an excuse for drunkenness and riot and low company. "'If you're going by coach tomorrow, "'you'd better get to bed early tonight. "'You've been drinking quite enough as it is.' "'Drinking?' cried Valentine Jernam. Why, I'm as sober as a judge. Come, Joyce, let's go and listen to that girl's singing. The captain left the room, and Harker followed, shrugging his shoulders as he went. There's nothing so hard to manage as a baby of thirty years old, he muttered, a blessed infant that one's obliged to call master. He followed the captain through a dingy little passage into a room with a sanded floor and a little platform at one end. The room was full of sailors and disreputable-looking women and was lighted by several jets of coarse gas which flared in the bleak March wind. A group of black-bearded, foreign-looking seamen made room for the captain and his companion at one of the tables. Jernam acknowledged their courtesy with a friendly nod. "'I don't mind standing treat for a civil fellow like you,' he said. "'Come, mates, what do you say to a bowl of punch?' The men looked at him and grinned a ready assent. Valentine Jernam called the landlord and ordered a bowl of rum punch. "'Plenty of it, remember, and be sure you are not too liberal with the water,' said the captain." The landlord nodded and laughed. He was a broad-shouldered, square-built man, with a flat, pale face, broad and square, like his figure. Not a pleasant-looking man, by any means. Valentine Jernam folded his arms on the rickety, liquor-stained table, and took a leisurely survey of the apartment. There was a pause in the concert just now. The girl had finished her song, and sat by the old square piano, waiting till she should be required to sing again. 
There were only two performers in this primitive species of concert, the girl who sang, and an old blind man who accompanied her on the piano. But such entertainment was quite sufficient for the patrons of the Jolly Tar seven and twenty years ago, before the splendors of modern music halls had arisen in the land. Valentine Jernam's dark eyes wandered round the room, till they lighted on the face of the girl sitting by the piano. There they fixed themselves all at once, and seemed as if rooted to the face on which they looked. It was a pale, oval face, framed in bands of smooth black hair, and lighted by splendid black eyes, the face of a Roman empress, rather than a singing girl at a public house in Shadwell. Never before had Valentine Jernam looked on so fair a woman. He had never been a student or admirer of the weaker sex. He had a vague kind of idea that there were women and mermaids and other dangerous creatures lurking somewhere in this world for the destruction of honest men, but beyond this he had very few ideas on the subject. Other people were taking very little notice of the singer, the regular patrons of the Jolly Tar were accustomed to her beauty and her singing, and thought very little about her. The girl was very quiet, very modest. She came and went under the care of the old blind pianist, whom she called her grandfather, and she seemed to shrink alike from observation or admiration. She began to sing again presently. She stood by the piano facing the audience, calm as a statue, with her large black eyes looking straight before her. The old man listened to her eagerly as he played, and nodded fond approval every now and then, as the full, rich notes fell upon his ear. The poor, blind face was illuminated with the musician's rapture. It seemed as if the noisy, disreputable audience had no existence for these two people. "'What a lovely creature!' exclaimed the captain, in a tone of subdued intensity. "'Yes, she's a pretty girl,' muttered the clerk, coolly. "'A pretty girl!' echoed Jernam. "'An angel, you mean. I did not know there were such women in the world. And to think that such a woman should be here, in this place, in the midst of all this tobacco smoke and noise and blasphemy. It seems hard, doesn't it, Joyce? I don't see that it's any harder for a pretty woman than an ugly one, replied Harker sententiously. If the girl had red hair and a snub nose, you wouldn't take the trouble to pity her. I don't see why you should concern yourself about her, because she happens to have black eyes and red lips. I dare say she's a bad lot, like most of them about here, and would as soon pick your pocket as look at you if you gave her the chance. Valentine Jernam made no reply to these observations. It is possible that he scarcely heard them. The punch came presently, but he pushed the bowl towards Joyce, and bade that gentleman dispense the mixture. His own glass remained before him untouched, while the foreign seamen and Joyce Harker emptied the bowl. When the girl sang, he listened. When she sat in a listless attitude in the pauses between her songs, he watched her face. Until she had finished her last song and left the platform, leading her blind companion by the hand, the captain of the Pizarro, seemed like a creature under the influence of a spell. There was only one exit from the room, so the singing girl and her grandfather had to pass along the narrow space between the two rows of tables. Her dark, stiff dress brushed against Jernam as she passed him. To the last, his eyes followed her with the same entranced gaze. When she had gone, and the door had closed upon her, he started suddenly to his feet and followed. He was just in time to see her leave the house with her grandfather, and with a big, ill-looking man, half-sailor, half-landsman, who had been drinking at the bar. 
The landlord was standing behind the bar drawing beer, as Jernam looked out into the street, watching the receding figures of the girl and her two companions. "'She's a pretty girl, isn't she?' said the landlord as Jernam shut the door. "'She is indeed,' cried the sailor. "'Who is she? Where does she come from? What's her name?' "'Her name is Jenny Milsom, and she lives with her father, a very respectable man.' "'Was that her father who went out with her just now?' "'Yes, that's Tom Milsom. "'He doesn't look very respectable. "'I don't think I ever set eyes on a worse-looking fellow.' "'A man can't help his looks,' answered the landlord rather sulkily. "'I've known Tom Milsom these ten years, "'and I've never known any harm of him.' "'No, nor any good either, I should think, Dennis Wayman.' "'said a man who was lounging at the bar. "'Black Milsom is the name we gave him over at Rotherhithe. "'I worked with him in a shipbuilder's yard seven years ago. "'A surly brood he was then, and a surly brood he is now, "'and a lazy, skulking vagabond into the bargain, "'living an idle life out at that cottage of his among the marshes, "'and eating up his pretty daughter's earnings.' "'You seem to know Milsom's business as well as you do your own, Joe Dermot,' answered the landlord, with some touch of anger in his tone. "'It's no use looking savage at me, Dennis,' returned Dermot. "'I never did trust Black Milsom, and never will. "'There are men who would take your life's blood for the price of a gallon of beer, and I think Milsom is one of them.' Valentine Jernam listened attentively to this conversation not because he was interested in Black Milsom's character, but because he wanted to hear anything that could enlighten him about the girl who had awakened such a new sentiment in his breast. The clerk had followed his master, and stood in the shadow of the doorway, listening even more attentively than his employer. The small, restless eyes shifted to and fro between the faces of the speakers. More might have been said about Mr. Thomas Milsom, but it was evident that the landlord of the Jolly Tar was inclined to resent any disrespectful allusion to that individual. The man called Joe Dermot paid his score and went away. The captain and his factotum retired to the two dingy little apartments which were to accommodate them for the night. All through that night, sleeping or waking, Valentine Jernam was haunted by the vision of a beautiful face, the sound of a melodious voice, and the face and the voice belonging alike to the singing girl. The captain of the Pizarro left his room at five o'clock and tapped at Joyce Harker's door with the intention of bidding him good-bye. "'I'm off, Joyce,' he said. "'Be sure you keep your eye upon the repairs between this and the fifth. He was prepared to receive a drowsy answer, but to his surprise the door was opened, and Joyce stood dressed upon the threshold. "'I'm coming to the coach office with you, Captain,' answered Harker. "'I don't like this place, and I want to see you safe out of it, never to come back to it any more.' "'Nonsense, Joyce. The place suits me well enough.' "'Does it?' asked the factotum in a whisper. "'And the landlord suits you, I suppose. "'And that man they call Black Milsom. "'There's something more than common between those two men, Captain Jernam. "'However that is, you take my advice. "'Don't you come back to this house till you come to me, Captain George. "'Captain George is a cool hand, and I'm not afraid of him. "'But you're too wild and too free-spoken for such folks as hang about the Jolly Tar.' "'You sported your pocketbook too freely last night when you were paying for the punch. "'I saw the landlord spot the notes and gold, "'and I haven't trusted myself to sleep too soundly all night "'for fear there should be any attempt at foul play.' "'You're a good fellow, Joyce, "'but though you've pluck enough for twenty in a storm at sea, "'you're as timid as a baby at home. "'I'm like a dog, Captain.' I can smell danger when it threatens those I love. Hark, what's that? They were going downstairs quietly 
in the darkness of the early spring morning. The clerk's quick ear caught the sound of a stealthy footstep, and in the next minute they were face to face with a man who was ascending the narrow stairs. "'You're early astir, Mr. Wayman,' said Joyce Harker, recognizing the landlord of the Jolly Tar. "'And so are you, for the matter of that,' answered the host. "'My captain is off by an early coach, and I'm going to walk to the office with him,' returned Joyce. "'Off by an early coach, is he? Then, if he can stop to drink it, I'll make him a cup of coffee.' "'You're very good,' answered Joyce hastily. "'But, you see, the captain hasn't time for that if he's going to catch the coach.' "'Are you going into the country for long, Captain?' asked the landlord. "'Well, no, not for long, mate, for I've got an appointment to keep in this house on the 5th of April with a brother of mine who's homeward bound from Barbados. "'You see, my brother and me are partners. Whatever good luck one has, he shares it with the other. We've been uncommon lucky lately.' The captain slapped his hand upon one of his capacious pockets as he spoke. Dennis Wayman watched the gesture with eager eyes. All through Valentine's speech, Joyce Harker had been trying to arrest his attention, but trying in vain. When the owner of the Pizarro began to talk, it was very difficult to stop him. The captain bade the landlord a cheerful good day, and departed with his faithful follower. Out in the street, Joyce Harker remonstrated with his employer. "'I told you that fellow was not to be trusted, Captain,' he said. "'And yet you blabbed to him about the money.' "'Nonsense, Joyce. I didn't say a word about money.' "'Didn't you, though, Captain? You said quite enough to let that man know you'd got the cash about you. But you won't go back to that place till you go to meet Captain George on the 5th. "'Of course not. "'You won't change your mind, Captain. "'Not I. "'Because, you see, I shall be down at Blackwall, "'looking after the repairs, "'for it will be sharp work to get finished "'against you want to sail for Rio. "'So, you see, I shall be out of the way, "'and if you did go back to that house alone, "'Lord knows what they might try on. "'Don't you be afraid, Joyce,' "'In the first place, I shan't go back there till twelve o'clock on the fifth. "'I'll come up from Plymouth by the night coach "'and put up at the Golden Cross like a gentleman. "'And in the second place, I flatter myself I'm a match "'for any set of land sharks in creation. "'No, you're not, Captain. "'No honest man is ever a match for a scoundrel.' "'Jernam and his companion carried the captain's portmanteau between them. They hailed a hackney coach presently, and drove to the Golden Cross, through the chill, grey streets, where the closed shutters had a funereal aspect. At the coach office they parted, with many friendly words on both sides, but to the last Joyce Harker was grave and anxious. The last he saw of his friend and employer was the captain's dark face looking out of the coach window. The captain's hand waved in cordial farewell. "'What a good fellow he is! What a noble fellow!' thought the wizened little clerk as he trudged back towards the city. "'But was there ever a baby so helpless on shore? Was there ever an innocent infant that needed so much looking after?' Valentine Jernam arrived at Plymouth early the next morning, and walked from Plymouth to the little village of Allen Bay, in which lived the only relative he had in the world, except his brother George. Walking at a leisurely pace along the quiet road, Captain Jernam, although not usually a thoughtful person, was fain to think about something, and fell to thinking over the past. His mother had died, leaving George an infant of less than twelve months old, and from the hour of her death Valentine had been the infant's sole nurse and protector, standing between the helpless little one and the father's brutality, enduring all hardships cheerfully so long as he was able to shelter little Georgie. 
on more than one occasion the elder boy had braved and defied his father in defense of the younger brother it was scarcely strange therefore that there should arise between the two brothers an affection beyond the ordinary measure of brotherly love valentine had supplied the place of both parents to his brother george the place of the mother who lay buried in allen bay churchyard the place of the father who had sunk into a living death of drunkenness and profligacy they were not peasant-born these germans the father had been a lieutenant in the royal navy but had deservedly lost his commission and had come with his devoted wife to hide his disgrace at allen bay the vices which had caused his expulsion from the navy had increased with every year until the family had sunk to the lowest depths of poverty and degradation in spite of the wife's heroic efforts to accomplish the reform of a reprobate she had struggled nobly till the last and had died broken-hearted leaving the helpless children to the mercy of a wretch whose nature had become utterly debased and brutalized throughout their desolate childhood the brothers had been all in all to each other and as soon as george was old enough to face the world with his brother the two boys ran away to sea and obtained employment on board a small trading vessel at sea as on shore valentine stood between his younger brother and all hardships but the rough sailors were kinder than the drunken father had been and the two lads fared pretty well thus began the career of the two germans through all changes of fortune the brothers had clung to each other despite all differences of character their love for each other had known neither change nor diminution and to-day walking alone upon this quiet country road the tears clouded valentine jernam's eyes as he remembered how often he had trodden it in the old time with his little brother in his arms i shall see his dear face on the fifth he thought god bless him the old aunt lived in a cottage near the entrance to the village she was comfortably off now thanks to the two merchant captains but she had been very poor in the days of their childhood and had been able to do but little for the neglected lads she had given them shelter however when they had been afraid to go home to their father and had shared her humble fare with them very often mrs jernam as she was called by her neighbors in right of her sixty years of age was sitting by the window when her nephew opened the little garden gate but she had opened the door before he could knock and was standing on the threshold ready to embrace him my boy she exclaimed i have been looking for you so long that day was given up to pleasant talk between the aunt and nephew she was so anxious to hear his adventures and he was so willing to tell them he sat before the fire smoking while susan jernam's busy fingers plied her knitting needles and relating his hair-breadth escapes and perils between the puffs of blue smoke the captain was regaled with an excellent dinner and a bottle of wine of his own importation after dinner he strolled out into the village saw his old friends and acquaintances and talked over old times altogether his first day at allen bay passed very pleasantly the second day at allen bay however hung heavily on the captain's hands he had told all his adventures he had seen all his old acquaintances the face of the ballad singer haunted him perpetually and he spent the best part of the day leaning over the garden gate and smoking mrs jernam was not offended by her nephew's conduct ah my boy she said smiling fondly on her handsome kinsman it's fortunate providence made you a sailor for you'd have been ill fitted for any but a roving life the third day of valentine jernam's stay at allen bay was the second of april and on that morning his patience was exhausted the face which had made itself a part of his very mind lured him back to london he was a man who had never accustomed himself to school his impulses 
and the impulse that drew him back to London was irresistible. "'I must and will see her once more,' he said to himself. "'Perhaps, if I see her face again, I shall find out it's only a common face, after all, and get the better of this folly. But I must see her. After the fifth, George will be with me, and I shan't be my own master. I must see her before the fifth. Impetuous in all things, Valentine Jernam was not slow to act upon his resolution. He told his aunt that he had business to transact in London. He left Allen Bay at noon, walked to Plymouth, took the afternoon coach, and rode into London on the following day. It was one o'clock when Captain Jernam found himself once more in the familiar seafaring quarter. Early as it was, the noise of riot and revelry had already begun. The landlord looked up with an expression of considerable surprise as the captain of the Pizarro crossed the threshold. "'Why, Captain,' he said, "'I thought we weren't to see you till the fifth. "'Well, you see, I had some business to do in this neighborhood, so I changed my mind.' "'I'm very glad you did,' answered Dennis Wayman cordially. "'You've just come in time to take a snack of dinner with me and my missus, "'so you can sit down and make yourself at home without ceremony.' "'The captain was too good-natured to refuse an invitation "'that seemed proffered in such a hearty spirit. "'And beyond this, he wanted to hear more about Jenny Milsom, the ballad-singer. "'So he ate his dinner with Mr. Wayman and his wife.' and found himself asking all manner of questions about the singing girl in the course of his hospitable entertainment. He asked if the girl was going to sing at the tavern to-night. No, answered the landlord. This is Friday. She only sings at my place on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays. And what does she do with herself for the rest of the week? Ah, that's more than I know. "'but very likely her father will look in here "'in the course of the afternoon, and he can tell you. "'I say, though, Captain, you seem uncommonly sweet on this girl,' "'added the landlord with a leer and a wink. "'Well, perhaps I am sweet upon her,' replied Valentine Jernam. "'Perhaps I'm fool enough to be caught by a pretty face, "'and not wise enough to keep my folly a secret.' "'I've got a little business to see to over in Rotherhite,' said Mr. Wayman presently. "'You'll see after the bar while I'm gone, Nancy. "'There's the little private room at your service, Captain, "'and I dare say you can make yourself comfortable there with your pipe and the newspaper. "'It's ten to one, but where Tom Milsom will look in here before the day is out, "'and he'll tell you all about his daughter.' "'Upon this the landlord departed.' and Valentine Jernam retired to the little den called a private room, where he speedily fell asleep, wearied out by his journey on the previous night. His slumbers were not pleasant. He sat in an uneasy position, upon a hard wooden chair, with his arms folded on the table before him, and his head resting on his folded arms. There was a miserable pretense of a fire, made with bad coals and damp wood. Sleeping in that wretched atmosphere, in that uncomfortable attitude, it was scarcely strange if Valentine Jernam dreamt a bad dream. He dreamt that he fell asleep at broad day, in his cabin on board the Pizarro, and that he woke suddenly and found himself in darkness. He dreamt that he groped his way up the companionway and on to the deck, there, as below, he found gloom and darkness, and instead of a busy crew, utter loneliness, perfect silence. A stillness, like the stillness of death, reigned on the level waters around the motionless ship. The captain shouted, but his voice died away among the shrouds. Presently a glimmer of starlight pierced the universal gloom, and in that uncertain light a shadowy figure came gliding toward him across the ocean. A face shone upon him beneath the radiance of the stars. It was the face of the ballad-singer. The shadow drew nearer to him with a strange gliding motion.
the shadow lifted a white, transparent hand and pointed. To what? To a tombstone, which glimmered cold and white through the gloom of sky and waters. The starlight shone upon the tombstone, and on it the sleeper read this inscription, In memory of Valentine Jernum, aged thirty-three. The sailor awoke suddenly with a cry, and looking up, saw the man they call Black Milsom sitting on the opposite side of the table, looking at him earnestly. "'Well, you are a restless sleeper, Captain,' said this man. "'I dropped in here just now, thinking to find Dennis Wayman, and I've been looking on while you finished your nap. I never saw a harder sleeper.' "'I had a bad dream,' answered Jernam, starting to his feet. "'A bad dream? What about, Captain?' "'About your daughter.' End of chapter 1「Chapter Before Thomas Milsom, otherwise Black Milsom, could express his surprise, the landlord of the Jolly Tar returned from his business excursion and presented himself in the dingy little room where it was already beginning to grow dusk. Milsom told Dennis Wayman how he had discovered the captain sleeping uneasily, with his head upon the table, and on being pressed a little, Valentine Jernam told his dream as freely as it was his habit to tell everything relating to his own affairs. "'I don't see that it was such a very bad dream, after all,' said Dennis Wayman when the story was finished. "'You dreamt you were at sea in a dead calm.' "'That's about the plain English of it.' "'Yes, but such a calm. "'I've been becalmed many a time, "'but I never remember anything like what I saw in my dream just now. "'Then the loneliness. "'Not a creature on board besides myself. "'Not a human voice to answer me when I called. "'And the face. "'There was something so awful in the face, "'smiling at me, and yet with a kind of threatening look in the smile, and the hand pointing to the tombstone. Do you know that I was thirty-three last December? The sailor covered his face with his hands, and sat for some moments in a meditative attitude. Bold and reckless though he was, the superstition of his class had some hold upon him, and this bad dream influenced him in spite of himself. The landlord was the first to break the silence. "'Come, Captain,' he said. "'This is what I call giving yourself up to the blue devils. You went to sleep in an uncomfortable position, and you had an uncomfortable dream, with no more sense nor reason in it than such dreams generally have. What do you say to a hand at cards and a drop of something short? You want cheering up a bit, Captain. That's what you want.' Valentine Jernam assented. The cards were brought, and a bowl of punch ordered by the open-handed sailor, who was always ready to invite people to drink at his expense. The men played all fours, and what generally happens in this sort of company happened now to Captain Jernam. He began by winning, and ended by losing, and his losses were much heavier than his gains. He had been playing for upwards of an hour, and had drunk several glasses of punch, before his luck changed, and he had occasion to take out the bloated leathern pocket-book, distended unnaturally with notes and gold. But for that rum-punch he might perhaps have remembered Joyce Harker's warning, and avoided displaying his wealth before these two men. Unhappily, however, the fumes of the strong liquor had already begun to mount to his brain, and the clerk was completely forgotten. He opened his pocket-book every time he had occasion to pay his losses, and whenever he opened it, the greedy eyes of Dennis Wayman and Black Milsom devoured the contents with a furtive gaze. 
With every hand, the sailor grew more excited. He was playing for small stakes, and as yet his losses only amounted to a few pounds. But the sense of defeat annoyed him. He was feverishly eager for his revenge, and when Milsom rose to go, the captain wanted him to continue to play. "'You shan't sneak off like that,' he said. "'I want my revenge, and I must have it.' Black Milsom pointed to a little Dutch clock in a corner of the room. "'Past eight o'clock,' he said, "'and I've got a five-mile walk between me and home. "'My girl Jenny will be waiting up for me "'and getting anxious about her father.' "'In the excitement of play "'and the fever engendered by strong drink, "'Valentine Jernam had forgotten the ballad-singer. "'But this mention of her name "'brought the vision of the beautiful face back to him. "'Your daughter,' he muttered. "'Your daughter. "'Yes, the girl who sang here.' the beautiful girl who sang. His voice was thick, and his accents indistinct. Both the men had pressed Jernam to drink, while they themselves took very little. They had encouraged him to talk, as well as to drink, and the appointment with his brother had been spoken of by the captain. In speaking of this intended meeting, Valentine Jernam had spoken also of the good fortune which had attended his latest trading adventures, and he had said enough to let these men know that he carried the proceeds of his trading upon his person. "'Joyce wanted me to bank my money,' he said. "'But none of your banking rogues for me. My brother George is the only banker I trust, or ever mean to trust.' Milsom insisted upon the necessity of his departure, and the sailor declared that he would have his revenge. They were getting to high words, when Dennis Wayman interfered to keep the peace. "'I'll tell you what it is,' he said. "'If the captain wants his revenge, it's only fair that he should have it. Suppose we go down to your place, Milsom. You can give us a bit of supper, I dare say. What do you say to that?' Milsom hesitated in a sheepish kind of manner. "'Mind such a poor place for a gentleman like the captain,' he said. "'My daughter Jenny will do her best to make things straight and comfortable, "'but still it is about the poorest place that ever was. "'There's no denying that.' "'I'm no fine gentleman,' said the captain, "'enraptured at the idea of seeing the ballad-singer. "'If your daughter will give us a crust of bread and cheese, "'I shall be satisfied. "'We'll take two or three bottles of wine down with us, "'and we'll be as jolly as princes. "'Get your trap ready, Wayman, and let's be off at once.' The captain was all impatience to start. Dennis Wayman went away to get the vehicle ready, and Milsom followed him. But they did not leave Captain Jernam much time for thought, for Dennis Wayman came back almost immediately to say that the vehicle was ready. "'Now then, look sharp, Captain,' he said. "'It's a dark night, and we shall have a dark drive.' It was a dark night, dark even here in Wapping, darker still on the road by which Valentine Jernam found himself travelling presently. The vehicle which Dennis Wayman drove was a disreputable-looking conveyance, half chaise cart, half gig, and the pony was a vicious-looking animal with a shaggy mane. But he was a tremendous pony to go, and the dark, marshy country flew past the travellers in the darkness, like a landscape in a dream. The ripple of the water, sounding faintly in the stillness, told Valentine Jernam that the river was near at hand, but beyond this the sailor had little knowledge of his whereabouts. They had soon left London behind. After driving some six or seven miles, and always keeping within sound of the dull splash of the river, the landlord of the Jolly Tar drew up suddenly by a dilapidated wooden paling, behind which there was a low-roofed habitation of some kind or other, which was visible only by reason of one faint glimmer of light flickering athwart a scrap of dingy red curtain. The dull, splashing sound of the river was louder here, and, mingling with that monotonous ripple of the water, there was a shivering sound, the trembling of rushes stirred by the chill night wind. "'I'd almost passed your place, Tom,' said the landlord, as he drew up before the darksome habitation. "'You might at most drive over it on such a night as this,' answered Black Milsom, "'and not be much the wiser.' 
the three men alighted, and Dennis Wayman led the vicious pony to a broken-down shed, which served as stable and coach-house in Mr. Milsom's establishment. Valentine Jernam looked about him. As his eyes grew more familiar with the locality, he was able to make out the outline of the dilapidated dwelling. It was little better than a hovel, and stood on a patch of waste ground, which could scarcely have been garden within the memory of man. By one side of the house there was a wide, open ditch, fringed with rushes, a deep black ditch that flowed down to the river. "'I can't compliment you on the situation of your cottage, mate,' he said. "'It might be livelier.' "'I dare say it might,' answered Black Milsom, rather sulkily. "'I took to this place because everybody else was afraid to take to it, and it was to be had for nothing.' "'There was an old miser as cut his throat here seven or eight years ago, "'and the place has been left to go to decay ever since. "'The miser's ghost walks about here sometimes, "'after twelve o'clock at night, folks say. "'Let him walk till he tires himself out,' says I. "'He don't come my way, and if he did, he wouldn't scare me. "'Come, Captain.' "'Mr. Milsom opened the door and ushered his visitor into the lively abode, which the prejudice of weak-minded people permitted him to occupy rent-free. The girl whom Jernam had seen at the Wapping Public House was sitting by the hearth, where a scrap of fire burnt in a rusty grate. She had been sitting in a listless attitude, with her hands lying idle on her lap, and her eyes fixed on the fire, but she looked up as the two men entered. She did not welcome her father's return with any demonstration of affection. She looked at him with a strange, wondering gaze, and she looked with an anxious expression from him to his companion. Dennis Wayman came in presently, and as the girl recognized him, a transient look, almost like horror, flitted across her face, unseen by the sailor. "'Come, Jenny,' said Milsom. "'I've brought Wayman and a friend of his down to supper. What can you give us to eat?' "'There's a bit of cold beef in the house, I know, and bread and cheese. "'The captain here has brought the wine, so we shall do well enough. "'Look sharp, lass. "'You're in one of your tempers tonight, I suppose. "'But you ought to know that don't answer with me. "'I say, captain,' added the man with a laugh, "'if ever you're going to marry a pretty woman, "'make sure she isn't troubled with an ugly temper, "'for you'll find, as a rule, that the handsomer a woman is— the more the devil there is in her. Now, Jenny, the supper, and no nonsense about it. The girl went into another room, and returned presently, with such fare as Mr. Milsom's establishment could afford. The sailor's eyes followed her, wherever she went, full of compassion and love. He was sure this brutal wretch, Milsom, used her badly, and he rejoiced, to think that he had disregarded all Joyce Harker's warnings and penetrated into the scoundrel's home. He rejoiced, for he meant to rescue this lovely, helpless creature. He knew nothing of her except that she was beautiful, friendless, lonely, and ill-used, and he determined to take her away and marry her. He did not perplex himself with any consideration as to whether she would return his love or be grateful for his devotion. He thought only of her unhappy position, and that he was predestined to save her. The supper was laid upon the rickety deal table, and the three men sat down. Valentine would have waited till his host's daughter had seated herself, but she had laid no plate or knife for herself, and it was evident that she was not expected to share the social repast. "'You can go to bed now.' said Milsom. We're in for a jolly night of it, and you'll only be in the way. Where's the old man? Gone to bed. So much the better, and the sooner you follow him will be so much the better again. Good night. The girl did not answer him. She looked at him for a few moments with an earnest, inquiring gaze, which seemed to compel him to return her look, as if he had been fascinated by the profound earnestness of those large, dark eyes. And then she went slowly and silently from the room. Sulky, muttered Mr. Milsom. There never was such a girl to sulk. He took up a candle and followed his daughter from the room. 
A rickety old staircase led to the upper floor, where there were three or four bedchambers. The house had been originally something more than a cottage, and the rooms and passages were tolerably large. Thomas Milsom found the girl standing at the top of the stairs, as if waiting for someone. "'What are you standing there mooning for?' asked the man. "'Why don't you go to bed?' "'Why have you brought that sailor here?' inquired the girl, without noticing Milsom's question. "'What's that to you? You'd like to know my business, wouldn't you? I've brought him here because he wanted to come. Is that a good answer?' I've brought him here because he has money to lose, and is in the humor to lose it. Is that a better answer? Yes, returned the girl, fixing her eyes upon him with a look of horror. You will win his money, and if he is angry, there will be a quarrel, as there was on that hideous night three years ago, when you brought home the foreign sailor, and what happened to that man will happen to this one. Father, cried the girl, suddenly and passionately, let this man leave the house in safety. I sometimes think my heart is almost as hard as yours, but this man trusts us. Don't let any harm come to him. Why, what harm should come to him? Alone in her room, Jenny Milsom opened the window and sat looking out into the inky darkness of the night and listening to the voices of the three men in the room below. The voices sounded very distinctly in that dilapidated old house. Every now and then a hearty shout of laughter seemed to shake the crazy rafters, but presently the revellers grew silent. Jenny knew they were busy with the cards. "'Yes, yes,' she murmured. "'It all happens as it happened that night. First the loud voices and laughter, then the silence, then—great heaven!' Will the end be like the end of that night? She clasped her hands in silent agony and sank in a crouching position by the open window with her head lying on the sill. For hours this wretched girl sat upon the floor in the same attitude with the cold wind blowing in upon her. All seemed tranquil in the room below. The voices sounded now and then, subdued and cautious, and there were no more outbursts of jovial laughter. A dim, gray streak glimmered faint and low in the east, the first pale flicker of dawn. The girl raised her weary eyes towards that chill gray light. "'Oh, if this night were only ended,' she murmured, "'if it were only ended without harm.' The words were still upon her lips, when the voices sounded loud and harsh from the room below, the girl started to her feet, white and trembling. Louder with every moment grew those angry voices. Then came a struggle. Some article of furniture fell with a crash. There was the sound of shivered glass, and then a dull heavy noise which echoed through the house and shook the weather-beaten wooden walls to their foundations. After the fall there came the sound of one loud groan, and then subdued murmurs, cautious whispers. The window of Jenny Milsom's room looked towards the road. From that window she could see nothing of the sluggish ditch or the river. She tried the door of her room. It was securely locked, as she had expected to find it. "'They would kill me if I tried to come between them and their victim,' she said." and I am afraid to die. She crept to her wretched bed and flung herself down, dressed as she was. She drew the thin patchwork coverlet round her. Ten minutes after she had thrown herself upon the bed, a key turned in the lock, and the door was opened by a stealthy hand. Black Milsom looked into the room. The cold glimmer of day fell full upon the girl's pale face, her eyes were closed, and her breathing was loud and regular. Asleep, he whispered to someone outside, as safe as a rock. He drew back and closed the door softly. Joyce Harker worked his hardest on board the Pizarro, and the repairs were duly completed by the 4th of April. On the morning of the 5th, the vessel was a picture— 
and Joyce surveyed her with the pride of a man who feels that he has not worked in vain. He had set his heart upon the brothers celebrating the first day of their reunion on board the trim little craft, and he had made arrangements for the preparation of a dinner, which was to be a triumph in its way. Joyce presented himself at the bar of the Jolly Tar at half-past eleven on the appointed morning. He expected that the brothers would be punctual, but he did not expect either of them to appear before the stroke of noon. All was very quiet at the Jolly Tar at this hour of the day. The landlord was alone in the bar reading a paper. He looked up as Joyce entered, but did not appear to recognize him. "'Can I step through into your private room?' asked Joyce. "'I expect Captain Jernam and his brother to meet me here in half an hour.' "'To be sure you can, mate. There's no one in the private room at this time of day. Jernam. Jernam, did you say? What Jernam is that? I don't recollect the name.' "'You've a short memory,' answered Joyce. "'You might remember Captain Jernam of the Pizarro.' "'for it isn't above a week since he was here with me. "'He dined here and slept here, and left early in the morning, "'though you were uncommonly pressing for him to stay.' "'We've so many captains and sailors in and out from year's end to year's end "'that I don't remember them by name,' said Dennis Wayman. "'But I do remember your friend, mate. "'Now you remind me of him, and I remember you, too.' "'Yes,' said Joyce with a grin. "'There ain't so many of my pattern. "'I'll take a glass of rum for the good of the house, "'and if you could lend me a paper, "'I'll skim the news of the day while I'm waiting.' "'Joyce passed into the little room "'where Dennis took him the newspaper and the rum. Twelve o'clock struck, "'and the clerk began to watch "'and to listen for the opening of the door, "'or the sound of a footstep in the passage outside. "'The time seemed very long to him, "'watching and listening.' The minute hand of the Dutch clock moved slowly on. He turned every now and then toward the dusky corner where the clock hung, to see what progress that slow hand had made upon the discolored dial. He waited thus for an hour. "'What does it mean?' he thought. "'Valentine Jernam so faithfully promised to be punctual. And then he's so fond of his brother. He'd scarcely care to be a minute behind hand.' "'when he has the chance of seeing Captain George.' "'Joyce went into the bar. "'The landlord was scrutinizing the address of a letter, a foreign letter. "'Didn't you say your friend's name was Jernam?' he asked. "'I did. "'Then this letter must be for him. "'It has been lying here for the last two or three days, "'but I forgot all about it till just this minute.' "'Joyce took the letter.' It was addressed to Captain Valentine Jernam of the Pizarro at the Jolly Tar, care of the landlord, and it came from the Cape of Good Hope. Joyce recognized George Jernam's writing. This means a disappointment, he thought, as he turned the letter over and over slowly. There'll be no meeting yet a while. Captain George off to the East Indies on some new venture, I dare say. "'But what can have become of Captain Valentine? "'I'll go down to the Golden Cross and see if he's there.' "'He told Dennis Wayman where he was going, "'and left a message for his captain. "'From Ratcliffe Highway to Charing Cross "'was a long journey for Joyce, "'but he had no idea of indulging in any such luxury "'as a hackney coach. "'It was late in the afternoon when he reached the hotel, "'and there he was doomed to encounter a new disappointment.' Captain Jernam had been there on the second of the month, and had never been there since. He had left in the forenoon, after saying that he should return at night, and in evidence that such had been his intention, the waiter told Joyce that the captain had left a carpet-bag containing clean linen and a change of clothes. "'He's broken his word to me, and he's got into bad hands,' thought Harker. "'He's as simple as a child.' "'and he's got into bad hands. "'But how and where? "'He'd never, surely, go back to the Jolly Tar "'after what I said to him. "'And where else can he have gone? "'I know no more where to look for him "'in this great overgrown London 
than if I was a newborn baby. In his perfect ignorance of his captain's movements, there was only one thing that Joyce Harker could do, and that was to go back to the Jolly Tar, with a faint hope of finding Valentine Jernam there. It was dusk by the time he got back to Ratcliffe Highway, and the flaring gas lamps were lighted. The bar of the tavern was crowded, and the tinkling notes of the old piano sounded feebly from the inner room. Dennis Wayman was serving his customers, and Thomas Milsom was drinking at the bar. Joyce pushed his way to the landlord. "'Have you seen anything of the captain?' he asked. "'No, he hasn't been here since you left.' "'You're sure of that?' "'Quite sure.' "'He's not been here today, but he's been here within the week, hasn't he? "'He was here on Tuesday, if I'm not misinformed.' "'Then you are misinformed,' Wayman said coolly, "'for your seafaring friend hasn't darkened my doors "'since the morning you and he left to go to the coach office.' "'Joyce could say nothing further. "'He passed through the passage into the public room, "'where the so-called concert had begun. "'Jenny Milsom was singing to the noisy audience. "'The girl was very pale, "'and her manner and attitude as she sat by the piano "'were even more listless than usual.' Joyce Harker did not stop long in the concert room. He went back to the bar. This time there was no one but Milsom and Wayman in the bar, and the two seemed to be talking earnestly as Joyce entered. They left off and looked up at the sound of the clerk's footsteps. "'Tired of the music already?' asked Wayman. "'I didn't come here to hear music,' answered Joyce. "'I came to look for my captain.' He had an appointment to meet his brother here today at twelve o'clock, and it isn't like him to break it. I'm beginning to get uneasy about him. But why should you be uneasy? The captain is big enough and old enough to take care of himself, said the landlord with a laugh. Yes, but then you see, mate, there are some men who never know how to take care of themselves when they get into bad company. There isn't a better sailor than Valentine Jernam. "'or a finer fellow at sea. "'But I don't think, if you searched from one end of this city to the other, "'you'd find a greater innocent on shore. "'I'm afraid of his having fallen into bad hands, Mr. Wayman, "'for he had a goodish bit of money about him, "'and there's land sharks as dangerous as those you meet with on the sea.' "'So there are, mate,' answered the landlord, "'and there's some queer characters about this neighborhood, for the matter of that.' "'I dare say you're right, Mr. Wayman,' returned Joyce, "'and I'll tell you what it is. "'If any harm has come to Valentine Jernam, "'let those that have done the harm look out for themselves. "'Perhaps they don't know what it is to hurt a man "'that's got a faithful dog at his heels. "'Let them hide themselves where they will, "'and let them be as cunning as they will. "'The dog will smell them out sooner or later, "'and will tear them to pieces when he finds them. I'm Captain Jernam's dog, Mr. Dennis Wayman, and if I don't find my master, I'll hunt till I do find those that have got him out of the way. I don't know what's amiss with me tonight, but I've got a feeling come over me that I shall never look in Valentine Jernam's honest face again. If I'm right, Lord help the scoundrels who have plotted against him, for it'll be the business of my life to track them down. "'and bring their crime home to them, and I'll do it.' "'After having said this, slowly and deliberately, "'with an appalling earnestness of voice and manner, "'Joyce Harker looked from Dennis Wayman to Black Milsom, "'and this time the masks they were accustomed to wear "'did not serve these scoundrels so well as usual, "'for in the faces of both there was a look of fear.' "'I am going to search for my captain,' said Joyce. "'Good night, mates.' He left the tavern. The two men looked at each other earnestly as the door closed upon him. "'A dangerous man,' said Dennis Wayman. "'Bah!' muttered Black Milsom savagely. "'Who's afraid of a hunchback's bluster? "'I dare say he wanted the handling of the money himself.' 
All that night Joyce Hawker wandered to and fro amidst the haunts of sailors and merchant captains, but wander where he would, and inquire of whom he would. He could obtain no tidings of the missing man. Towards daybreak he took a couple of hours' sleep in a tavern at Shadwell, and with the day his search began again. Throughout that day the same patient search continued. The same inquiries were repeated with indomitable perseverance in every likely and unlikely place, but everywhere the result was failure. It was towards dusk that Joyce Hawker turned his back upon a tavern in Rotherhithe and set his face toward the river bank. "'I have looked long enough for him among the living,' he said. "'I must now look for him amongst the dead.' Before midnight the search was ended. Amongst the printed bills flapping on dreary walls in that riverside neighborhood, Joyce Hawker had discovered the description of a man found drowned. The description fitted Valentine Jernam, and the body had been found within the last two days. Joyce went to the police office where the man was lying. He had no need to look at the poor dead face, the dark, handsome face, which was so familiar to him. "'I expected as much,' he said to the official who had admitted him to see the body. "'He had money about him, and he has fallen into the hands of scoundrels.' "'You don't think it was an accident?' "'No. He has been murdered, sir, and I think I know the men who did it.' "'You know the men?' "'Yes.' "'But my knowledge won't help to avenge his death "'if I can't bring it home to them, "'and I don't suppose I can. "'There'll be a coroner's inquest, won't there?' "'At the inquest next day, "'Joyce Harker told his story, "'but that story threw very little light "'on the circumstances of Valentine Jernam's death. "'The investigation before the coroner "'set at rest all question "'as to the means by which the captain had met his death.' A medical examination demonstrated that he had been murdered by a blow on the back of the head, inflicted by some sharp, heavy instrument. The unfortunate man must have died before he was thrown into the water. The verdict of the coroner's jury was to the effect that Valentine Jernam had been willfully murdered by some person or persons unknown, and with this verdict Joyce Harker was obliged to be content. His suspicions he dared not mention in open court. They were too vague and shadowy. But he called upon a celebrated Bow Street officer and submitted the case to him. It was a case for secret inquiry, for careful investigation, and Joyce offered a handsome reward out of his own savings. While the secret investigation was in progress, Joyce opened the letter addressed to Valentine by his brother George. "'Dear Val,' wrote the sailor, "'I have been tempted to make another trip to Calcutta "'with a cargo shipped at Lisbon, "'and shall not be able to meet you in London on the 5th of April. "'It will be ten or twelve months before I see England again, "'but when I do come back, "'I hope to add something handsome to our joint fortunes. "'I long to see your honest face and grasp your hand again, "'but the chance of a big prize lures me out yonder.' We are both young and have all the world before us, so we can afford to wait a year or two. Bank the money. Joyce will tell you where and how to do it. And let me know your plans before you leave London. A letter addressed to me, care of Riverdale and Company, Calcutta, will be safe. Good luck to you, dear old boy, now and always, and every good wish. From your affectionate brother, George Jernam. It was Joyce Harker's melancholy task to tell Valentine Jernam's younger brother the story of the seaman's death. He wrote a long letter, recording everything that had happened within his knowledge, from the moment of the Pizarro reaching Gravesend to the discovery of Valentine's body in the Riverside Police Office. He told George the impression that had been made upon his brother by the ballad singer's beauty— I think that this girl and these two men, her father, Thomas Milsom, 
and Dennis Wayman, the landlord of the Jolly Tar, are in the secret, are between them the murderers of your brother. I think that when he broke his promise to me, and came back to this end of London before the fifth, he came lured by that girl's beauty. It is to the girl we must look for a key to the secret of his death. I do not expect to extort anything from the fears of the men. They are both hardened villains, and if, as I believe, they are guilty of this crime, it is not likely to be the first in which they have been engaged. The police are on the watch, and I have promised a liberal reward for any discoveries they may make. But it is very slow work. This and much more Joyce Harker wrote to George Jernam. The letter was written immediately after the inquest, and on the night succeeding that inquiry, Joyce went to the Jolly Tar in the hope of seeing Jenny Milsom. But he was doomed to disappointment, for in the concert room at Dennis Wayman's tavern he found a new singer, a fat, middle-aged woman with red hair. "'What has become of the pretty girl who used to sing here?' he asked the landlord. "'Milsom's daughter?' said Wayman. "'Oh, we've lost her. She was a regular she-devil, it seems. Her father and she had a row, and the girl ran away. She can get her living anywhere, with that voice of hers, and I don't suppose Milsom treated her over well. He's a rough fellow, but an honest one.' "'Yes.' "'answered Joyce with a sneer. "'He seems uncommonly honest. "'There's a good deal of that sort of honesty "'about this neighborhood, I think, mate. "'I suppose you've heard about my captain.' "'Not a syllable. "'Is there anything wrong with him?' "'Ah, news seems to travel slowly down here. "'There was an inquest held this morning, "'not so many miles from this house.' The landlord shrugged his shoulders. "'I've been busy indoors all day, and I haven't heard anything,' he said. Joyce told the story of his captain's fate, to which Dennis Wayman listened with every appearance of sympathy. "'And you've no idea what has become of the girl?' Hawker asked, after having concluded his story. "'No more than the dead. She's cut and run, that's all I know. "'Has her father gone after her?' "'Not a bit of it. He's not that sort of man. "'She has chosen to take herself off, and her father will let her go her own way. "'And her grandfather, the old blind man, he has gone with her.' "'There was no more to be said about the girl after this. "'I'll tell you what it is, Mr. Wayman,' said Joyce. "'I'm likely to be a good bit down in this neighborhood. "'while I'm waiting for directions about my poor captain's ship "'from his brother, Captain George, "'and as your house suits me as well as any other, "'I may as well take up my quarters here. "'I know you've got plenty of room, "'and you'll find me a quiet lodger.' "'So be it,' answered the landlord promptly. "'I'm agreeable.' "'Joyce deliberated profoundly "'as he walked away from the Jolly Tar that night. "'He's too deep to be caught easily.' God. He'll let me into his house, because he knows there's nothing I can find out, watch as I may. Such a murder as that leaves no trace behind it. If I had been able to get hold of the girl, I might have frightened her into telling me something. But it's clear to me she has really bolted, or Wayman would never let me into his house. For weeks, Joyce Harker was a lodger at the Jolly Tar, always on the watch, always ready to seize upon the smallest clue to the mystery of Valentine Jernam's death, but nothing came of his watching. The police did their best to discover the key to the dreadful secret, but they worked in vain. The dead man's money had been partly in notes and gold, partly in bills of exchange. It was easy enough to dispose of such bills in the city." There were men ready to take them at a certain price, and to send them abroad, men who never asked questions of their customers. So there was little chance of any light being thrown on this dark and evil mystery. Joyce watched and waited with dog-like fidelity, 
ready to seize upon the faintest clue, but he waited and watched in vain. Chapter Three of Run to Earth, a novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Three Disinherited. Nearly a year had elapsed since the murder of Valentine Jernam, and the March winds were blowing amongst the leafless branches of the trees in the green park. In the library of one of the finest houses in Arlington Street, a gentleman paced restlessly to and fro, stopping before one of the windows every now and then to look with a fretful glance at the dull sky. "'What weather!' he muttered. "'What execrable weather!' The speaker was a man of some fifty years of age, a man who had been very handsome, and who was handsome still, a man with a haughty patrician countenance, not easily forgotten by those who looked upon it. Sir Oswald Eversleigh, baronet, was a descendant of one of the oldest families in Yorkshire. He was the owner of Raynham Castle in Yorkshire, Eversleigh Manor in Lincolnshire, and his property in those two counties constituted a rent-roll of forty thousand per annum. He was a bachelor, and having nearly reached his fiftieth year, it was considered unlikely that he would marry. Such at least was the fixed idea of those who considered themselves the likely inheritors of the baronet's wealth. The chief of these was Reginald Eversleigh, his favorite nephew, the only son of a younger brother, who had fallen gloriously on an Indian battlefield. There were two other nephews who had some right to look forward to a share in the baronet's fortune. These were the two sons of Sir Oswald's only sister, who had married a country rector called Dale. But Lionel and Douglas Dale were not the sort of young men who cared to wait for dead men's shoes. They were sincerely attached to their uncle, but they carefully abstained from any demonstration of affection which could seem like worship of his wealth. The elder was preparing himself for the church. The younger was established in chambers in the temple, reading for the bar. It was otherwise with Reginald Eversleigh. From his early boyhood, this young man had occupied the position of an adopted son rather than a nephew. There are some who can bear indulgence, some flowers that flourish best with tender rearing. But Reginald Eversleigh was not one of these. Sir Oswald was too generous a man to require much display of gratitude from the lad on whom he so freely lavished his wealth and his affection. When the boy showed himself proud and imperious, the baronet admired that high and haughty spirit. When the boy showed himself reckless and extravagant in his expenditure of money, the baronet fancied that extravagance the proof of a generous disposition, overlooking the fact that it was only on his own pleasures that Reginald wasted his kinsman's money. When bad accounts came from the Eton masters and the Oxford tutors, Sir Oswald deluded himself with the belief that it was only natural for a high-spirited lad to be idle, and that, indeed, youthful idleness was often a proof of genius." But even the moral blindness of love cannot last forever. The day came when the baronet awoke to the knowledge that his dead brother's only son was unworthy of his affection. The young man entered the army. His uncle purchased for him a commission in a crack cavalry regiment, and he began his military career under the most brilliant auspices. But from the day of his leaving his military tutor, until the present hour, Sir Oswald had been perpetually subject to the demands of his extravagance, and had of late suffered most bitterly from discoveries which had at last convinced him that his nephew was a villain. In ordinary matters, Sir Oswald Eversleigh was by no means a patient or long-suffering man, 
but he had exhibited extraordinary endurance in all his dealings with his nephew. The hour had now come when he could be patient no longer. He had written to his nephew, desiring him to call upon him at three o'clock on this day. The idea of this interview was most painful to him, for he had resolved that it should be the last between himself and Reginald Eversleigh. In this matter he had acted with no undue haste, for it had been unspeakably distressing to him to decide upon a step which would separate him for ever from the young man. As the timepiece struck three, Mr. Eversleigh was announced. He was a very handsome man, of a refined and aristocratic type, but of a type rather effeminate than powerful. And pervading his beauty, there was a winning charm of expression which few could resist. It was difficult to believe that Reginald Eversleigh could be mean or base. People liked him and trusted him, in spite of themselves, and it was only when their confidence had been imposed upon, and their trust betrayed, that they learned to know how despicable the handsome young officer could be. Women did their best to spoil him, and his personal charms of face and manner, added to his brilliant expectations, rendered him a universal favorite in fashionable circles. He came to Arlington Street prepared to receive a lecture, and a severe one, for he knew that some of his late delinquencies had become known to Sir Oswald. But he trusted in the influence which he had always been able to exercise over his uncle, and he was determined to face the difficulty boldly as he had faced it before. He entered the room with a smile, and advanced towards his uncle, with his hand outstretched. But Sir Oswald drew back, refusing that proffered hand. "'I shake hands only with gentlemen and honest men,' he said haughtily. "'You are neither, Mr. Eversleigh.' Reginald had been used to hear his uncle address him in anger, but never before had Sir Oswald spoken to him in that tone of cool contempt. The color faded from the young man's face, and he looked at his uncle with an expression of alarm. "'My dear uncle!' he exclaimed. "'Be pleased to forget that you have ever addressed me by that name, "'or that any relationship exists between us, Mr. Eversleigh,' "'answered Sir Oswald with unaltered sternness. "'Sit down, if you please. "'Our interview is likely to be a long one.' "'The young man seated himself in silence. "'I have sent for you, Mr. Eversleigh,' said the baronet, "'because I wish to tell you, without passion, "'that the tie which has hitherto bound us "'has been completely broken. "'Heaven knows that I have been patient. "'I have endured your misdoings, "'hoping that they were the thoughtless errors of youth "'and not the deliberate sins of a hardened and wicked nature. "'I have trusted till I can trust no longer. "'I have hoped till I can hope no more. "'Within the past week... I have learned to know you, an old friend whose word I cannot doubt, whose honor is beyond all question, has considered it a duty to acquaint me with certain facts that have reached his knowledge, and has opened my eyes to your real character. I have given much time to reflection, before determining on the course I shall pursue, with one who has been so dear to me. You know me well enough to be aware that when once I do arrive at a decision, that decision is irrevocable. I wish to act with justice, even towards a scoundrel. I have brought you up with the habits of a rich man, and it is my duty to save you from absolute poverty. I have therefore ordered my solicitors to prepare a deed by which an income of two hundred a year will be secured to you for life unconditionally. After the execution of that deed, I shall have no further interest in your fate. You will go your own way, Mr. Eversleigh, and choose your own companions without remonstrance or interference from the foolish kinsman who has loved you too well. But, my dear uncle, Sir Oswald, what have I done that you should treat me so severely? The young man was deadly pale. His uncle's manner had taken him by surprise, but even in this desperate moment— when he felt that all was lost, 
he attempted to assume the aspect of injured innocence. "'What have you done?' cried the baronet passionately. "'Shall I show you two letters, Reginald Eversleigh? Two letters which by a strange combination of circumstances have reached my hands, and in each of which there is the clue to a shameful story, a cruel and disgraceful story, of which you are the hero.' "'What letters?' "'You shall read them.' "'replied Sir Oswald. "'They are addressed to you, and have been in your possession. "'But to so fine a gentleman such letters were of little importance. "'Another person, however, thought them worth preserving, and sent them to me. "'The baronet took up two envelopes from the table, and handed them to his nephew. "'At the sight of the address of the uppermost envelope, "'Reginald Eversleigh's face grew livid. "'He looked at the lower and then returned both documents to his uncle, with a hand that trembled in spite of himself. "'I know nothing of the letters,' he faltered huskily. "'You do not,' said his uncle. "'Then it will be necessary for me to enlighten you.' Sir Oswald took a letter from one of the envelopes, but before reading it he looked at his nephew with a grave and mournful countenance, from which all traces of scorn had vanished." Before I heard the history of this letter, I fully believed that, in spite of all your follies and extravagances, you were at least honorable and generous-hearted. After hearing the story of this letter, I knew you to be base and heartless. You say you know nothing of the letter? Perhaps you will tell me that you have forgotten the name of the writer. And yet you can scarcely have so soon forgotten Mary Goodwin. The young man bent his head. A terrible rage possessed him, for he knew that one of the darkest secrets of his life had been revealed to his uncle. "'I will tell you the history of Mary Goodwin,' said the baronet, "'since you have so poor a memory. She was the favorite and foster sister of Jane Stukeley, a noble and beautiful woman to whom you were engaged. You met Jane Stukeley in London, fell in love with her, as it seemed, and proffered your suit.' You were accepted by her, approved by her father. No alliance could have been more advantageous. I was never better pleased than when you announced to me your engagement. The influence of a good wife will cure him of all his follies, I thought, and I shall yet have reason to be proud of my nephew. Spare me, sir, for pity's sake, murmured Reginald hoarsely. When did you spare others, Mr. Reginald Eversleigh? When did you consider others, if they stood in the way of your base pleasures, your selfish gratifications? Never. Nor will I spare you. As Jane's engaged lover, you were invited to Stukeley Park. There you saw Mary Goodwin. Accident threw you across this girl's pathway very often in the course of your visit. But the time came when you ceased to meet by accident. There were secret meetings in the park. The poor, weak, deluded girl could not resist the fascinations of the fine gentleman, who lured her to destruction by means of lying promises. In due time you left Stukeley Park, unsuspected. Within a few days of your departure, the girl, Mary Goodwin, disappeared. For six months nothing was heard of the missing Mary Goodwin, but at the end of that time a gentleman, who remembered her in the days of her beauty and innocence at Stukeley Park, recognized the features of Miss Stukeley's protégé in the face of a suicide, whose body was exhibited in the morgue at Paris. The girl had been found drowned. The Englishman paid the charges of a decent funeral, and took back to the Stukeleys the intelligence of their protégé's fate. But no one knew the secret of her destruction. The secret was, however, suspected by Jane Stukeley, who broke her engagement with you on the strength of the dark suspicion. It was to you she fled when she left Stukeley Park. In your companionship she went abroad, where she passed as your wife, you assuming a false name, under which you were recognized nevertheless. The day came when you grew weary of your victim, when your funds were exhausted, when the girl's tears and penitence grew troublesome. In the hour when she was most helpless and miserable, and had most need of your pity and protection, you abandoned her, 
leaving her alone in Paris, with a few pounds to pay for her journey home, if she should have courage to go back to the friends who had sheltered her. In this hour of abandonment and shame, she chose death rather than such an ordeal, and drowned herself. "'I give you my honour, Sir Oswald. I meant to act liberally. I meant—' the young man interrupted, but his uncle did not notice the interruption. "'I will read you this wretched girl's letter,' continued the baronet. "'It is her last, and was left at the hotel where you deserted her, and whence it was forwarded to you. It is a very simple letter, but it bears in every line the testimony of a broken heart. "'You have left me, Reginald, and in doing so have proved to me most fully that the love you once felt for me has indeed perished. For the sake of that love I have sacrificed every principle and broken every tie. I have disgraced the name of an honest family, and have betrayed the dearest and kindest friend who ever protected a poor girl. And now you leave me, and tell me to return to my old friends, who will no doubt forgive me, you say, and shelter me in this bitter time of my disgrace. O oh, Reginald, do you know me so little that you think I could go back, could lift my eyes once more to the dear faces that used to smile upon me, but which now would turn for me with loathing and aversion? You know that I cannot go back. You leave me in this great city, so strange and unknown to me, and you do not care to ask yourself any questions as to my probable fate. Shall I tell you what I am going to do, Reginald? You— who were once so fond and passionate a lover, you, whom I have seen kneeling at my feet, humbly born and penniless though I was. It is only right that you should know the fate of your abandoned mistress. When I have finished this letter it will be dark. The shadows are closing in already, and I can scarcely see to write. I shall creep quietly from the house— and shall make my way over to that river which I have crossed so often, seated by your side in a carriage. Once on the bridge, under cover of the blessed darkness, all my troubles will be ended. You will be burdened with me no longer, and I shall not cost you even the ten-pound note which you so generously left for me, and which I enclose in this letter. Forgive me if there is some bitterness in my heart. I try to forgive you, I do forgive you. May a merciful heaven pardon my sins, as I pardon your desertion of me. M. G. There was a pause after the reading of the letter, a silence which Mr. Eversleigh did not attempt to break. The second letter I need scarcely read to you, said the baronet. It is from a young man whom you were pleased to patronize some twelve months back, a young man in a banking office, aspiring and ambitious, whose chief weakness was the desire to penetrate the mystic circle of fashionable society. You were good enough to indulge that weakness at your own price, and for your own profit. You initiated the banker's clerk into the mysteries of card-playing and billiards. You won money of him, more than he had to lose, and after being the kindest and most indulgent of friends— you became all at once a stern and pitiless creditor. You threatened the bank clerk with disgrace if he did not pay his losses. He wrote you pleading letters, but you laughed to scorn his prayers for mercy, and at last, maddened by shame, he helped himself to the money entrusted to him by his employers in order to pay you. Discovery came, as discovery always does come sooner or later in these cases— and your friend and victim was transported. Before leaving England, he wrote you a letter, imploring you to have some compassion on his widowed mother, whom his disgrace had deprived of all support. I wonder how much heed you took of that letter, Mr. Eversleigh. I wonder what you did towards the consolation of the helpless and afflicted woman who owed her misfortunes to you. The young officer did not lift his eyes to his uncle's face, the consciousness of guilt rendered him powerless to utter a word in his defence. "'I have little more to say to you,' resumed the baronet. "'I have loved you as a man rarely loves his nephew. I have loved you for the sake of the brother who died in my arms, 
and for the sake of one who was even dearer to me than that only brother, for the sake of the woman whom we both loved, and who made her choice between us, choosing the younger and poorer brother, and retaining to her dying day the affection and esteem of the elder. I loved your mother, Reginald Eversleigh, and when she died, within one short year of her husband's death, I swore that her only child should be as dear to me as a son. I have kept that promise. Few parents can find patience to forgive such follies as I have forgiven. But my endurance is exhausted. My affection has been worn out by your heartlessness. Henceforward we are strangers. You cannot mean this, sir, murmured Reginald Eversleigh. There was a terrible fear at his heart, an inward conviction that his uncle was in earnest. "'My solicitors will furnish you with all particulars of the deed I spoke of,' said Sir Oswald, without noticing his nephew's appealing tones. "'That deed will secure to you two hundred a year. You have a soldier's career before you, and you are young enough to redeem the past, at any rate in the eyes of the world, if not before the sight of heaven. If you find your regiment too expensive for your altered means, I would recommend you to exchange into the line. And now, Mr. Eversleigh, I wish you good morning. But, Sir Oswald, uncle, my dear uncle, you cannot surely cast me off thus coldly. You— The baronet rang the bell. The door for Mr. Eversleigh, he said to the servant who answered his summons. The young man rose— Looking at his kinsman with an incredulous gaze, he could not believe that all his hopes were utterly ruined, that he was indeed cast off with a pittance which to him seemed positively despicable. But there was no hope to be derived from Sir Oswald's face. A mask of stone could not have been more inflexible. "'Good morning, sir,' said Reginald, in accents that were tremulous with suppressed rage. He could say no more for the servant was in attendance, and he could not humiliate himself before the man who had been wont to respect him as Sir Oswald Eversleigh's heir. He took up his hat and cane, bowed to the baronet, and left the room. Once beyond the doors of his uncle's mansion, Reginald Eversleigh abandoned himself to the rage that possessed him. "'He shall repent this,' he muttered. "'Yes, powerful as he is, he shall repent having used his power, as if I had not suffered enough already, as if I had not been haunted perpetually by that girl's pale, reproachful face, ever since the fatal hour in which I abandoned her. But those letters, how could they have fallen into my uncle's hands? That scoundrel Laston must have stolen them in revenge for his dismissal. He went to the loneliest part of the Green Park, and stretched at full length upon a bench, abandoned himself to gloomy reflections, with his face hidden by his folded arms. For hours he lay thus, while the bleak March winds whistled loud and shrill in the leafless trees above his head, while the cold gray light of the sunless day faded into the shadows of evening. It was past seven o'clock, and the lamps in Piccadilly shone brightly, when he rose, chilled to the bone, and walked away from the park. And am I to consider myself rich, with my pay and fifty pounds a quarter, he muttered with a bitter laugh, and if I find a crack cavalry regiment too expensive, I am to exchange into the line, turn foot-soldier, and face the scornful looks of all my old acquaintances. No, no, Sir Oswald Eversleigh, you have brought me up as a gentleman, and a gentleman I will remain to the end of the chapter. Let who will pay the cost. It may... Chapter 4 of Run to Earth, a Novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern Chapter 4 Out of the Depths 
After dismissing his nephew, Sir Oswald Eversleigh abandoned himself for some time to gloomy thought. The trial had been a very bitter one, but at length, arousing himself from that gloomy reverie, he said aloud, "'Thank heaven it is over. My resolution did not break down, and the link is broken.' Sir Oswald had made his arrangements for leaving London that afternoon, on the first stage of his journey to Raynham Castle. There were few railroads six and twenty years ago, and the baronet was in the habit of travelling in his own carriage with post-horses. The journey from London to the far north of Yorkshire was therefore a long one, occupying two or three days. Sir Oswald left town an hour after his interview with Reginald Eversleigh. It was ten o'clock when he alighted for the first time in a large, bustling town on the great northern road. He had changed horses several times since leaving London, and had accomplished a considerable distance within the five hours. He put up at the principal hotel, where he intended to remain for the night. From the windows of his rooms was to be seen the broad, open market-place, which to-night was brilliantly lighted, and thronged with people. Sir Oswald looked with surprise at the bustling scene, as one of the waiters drew the curtains before the long windows. "'Your town seems busy to-night,' he said. "'Yes, sir. There has been a fair, sir. A spring fair, sir. A cattle fair, sir. Perhaps you'd rather not have the curtains drawn, sir.' "'You may like to look out of the window after dinner, sir.' "'Look out of the window? Oh, dear, no. Close the curtains by all means.' The waiter wondered at the gentleman's bad taste, and withdrew to hasten the well-known guest's dinner. It was long past eleven, and Sir Oswald was sitting brooding before the fire, when he was startled from his reverie by the sound of a woman's voice singing in the market-place below. The streets had been for some time deserted, the shops closed, the lights extinguished, except a few street lamps flickering feebly here and there. All was quiet, and the voice of the street ballad singer sounded full and clear in the stillness. Sir Oswald Eversleigh was in no humor to listen to street singers. It must needs be some voice, very far removed from common voices, which could awaken him from his gloomy abstraction. It was indeed an uncommon voice, such a voice as one rarely hears beyond the walls of the Italian opera house, such a voice as is not often heard even within those walls, full, clear, and rich. The melodious accents sent a thrill to the innermost heart of the listener. The song which the vagrant was singing was the simplest of ballads. It was old Robin Gray. While he sat by the fire, listening to that familiar ballad, Sir Oswald Eversleigh forgot his sorrow and indignation, forgot his nephew's baseness, forgot everything except the voice of the woman singing in the deserted market-place below the windows. He went to one of the windows and drew back the curtain. The night was cold and boisterous. But a full moon was shining in a clear sky, and every object in the broad street was visible in that penetrating light. The windows of Sir Oswald's sitting-room opened upon a balcony. He lifted the sash and stepped out into the chill night air. He saw the figure of a woman moving away from the pavement before the hotel, very slowly, with a languid, uncertain step. Presently he saw her totter and pause, as if scarcely able to proceed. Then she moved unsteadily onwards for a few paces, and at last sank down upon a doorstep with the helpless motion of utter exhaustion. He did not stop to watch longer from the balcony. He went back to his room, snatched up his hat, and hurried downstairs. They were beginning to close the establishment for the night and the waiter stared as Sir Oswald passed them on his way to the street. In the market-place nothing was stirring. The baronet could see the dark figure of the woman, still in the same attitude into which he had seen her sink, when she fell exhausted on the doorstep, half sitting, 
half lying on the stone. Sir Oswald hurried to the spot where the woman had sunk down, and bent over her. Her arms were folded on the stone, her head lying on her folded arms. "'Why are you lying there, my good girl?' asked Sir Oswald gently. Something in the slender figure told him that the ballad singer was young, though he could not see her face. She lifted her head slowly, with a languid action, and looked up at the speaker. "'Where else should I go?' she asked in bitter tones. "'Have you no home?' "'Home?' echoed the girl. "'I have never had what gentlemen like you call a home. "'But where are you going to-night?' "'To the fields. "'To some empty barn, if I can find one with the door unfastened, "'into which I may creep. "'I have been singing all day, and have not earned enough money to pay for a lodging.' The full moon shone broad and clear upon the girl's face. Looking at her by that silvery light, Sir Oswald saw that she was very beautiful. "'Have you been long leading this miserable life?' Sir Oswald asked her presently. "'My life has been one long misery,' answered the ballad singer. "'How long have you been singing in the streets?' "'I have been singing about the country for two years.' not always in the streets, for some time I was in a company of show-people, but the mistress of the show treated me badly, and I left her. Since then I have been wandering about from place to place, singing in the streets on market-days, and singing at fairs. The girl said all this in a dull mechanical way, as if she were accustomed to be called on to render an account of herself. And before you took to this kind of life, said the baronet, strangely interested in this vagrant girl. How did you get your living before then? I lived with my father, answered the girl in an altered tone. Have you finished your questions? She shuddered slightly, and rose from her crouching attitude. The moon still shone upon her face, intensifying its death-like pallor. See, said her unknown questioner, here are a couple of sovereigns. You need not wander into the open country to look for an empty barn. You can procure shelter at some respectable inn. Or stay, it is close upon midnight. You might find it difficult to get admitted to any respectable house at such an hour. You had better come with me to my hotel yonder, the Star. The landlady is a kind-hearted creature, and will see you comfortably lodged. Come." The girl stood before Sir Oswald, shivering in the bleak wind, with a thin black shawl wrapped tightly round her, and her dark brown hair blown away from her face by that bitter March wind. She looked at him with unutterable surprise in her countenance. "'You are very good,' she said. "'No one of your class ever before stepped out of his way to help me. Poor people have been kind to me, often, very often.' "'You are very good.' There was more of astonishment than pleasure in the girl's tone. It seemed as if she cared very little about her own fate, and that her chief feeling was surprise at the goodness of this fine gentleman. "'Do not speak of that,' said Sir Oswald gently. "'I am anxious to get you a decent shelter for the night, but that is a very small favor. I happen to be something of a musician.' and I have been much struck by the beauty of your voice. I may be able to put you in the way of making good use of your voice. Of my voice? The girl echoed the phrase, as if it had no meaning to her. Come, said her benefactor. You are weary, and ill, perhaps. You look terribly pale. Come to the hotel, and I will place you in the landlady's charge." He walked on, and the girl walked by his side, very slowly, as if she had scarcely sufficient strength to carry her even that short distance. There was something strange in the circumstance of Sir Oswald's meeting with this girl. There was something strange in the sudden interest which she had aroused in him, the eager desire which he felt to learn her previous history. The mistress of the Star Hotel 
was somewhat surprised when one of the waiters summoned her to the hall, where the street singer was standing by Sir Oswald's side. But she was too clever a woman to express her astonishment. Sir Oswald was one of her most influential patrons, and Sir Oswald's custom was worth a great deal. It was therefore scarcely possible that such a man could do wrong. "'I found this poor girl in an exhausted state in the street just now,' said Sir Oswald. "'She is quite friendless, and has no shelter for the night, though she seems above the mendicant class. "'Will you put her somewhere, and see that she is taken good care of, my dear Mrs. Willett? "'In the morning I may be able to think of some plan for placing her in a more respectable position.' Mrs. Willett promised that the girl should be taken care of, and made thoroughly comfortable. "'Poor young thing,' said the landlady. "'She looks dreadfully pale and ill, and I'm sure she'll be none the worse for a nice little bit of supper. Come with me, dear.' The girl obeyed, but on the threshold of the hall she turned and spoke to Sir Oswald. "'I thank you,' she said. I thank you with all my heart and soul for your goodness. I have never met with such kindness before. The world must have been very hard for you, my poor child, he replied, if such small kindness touches you so deeply. Come to me tomorrow morning, and we will talk of your future life. Good night. Good night, sir, and God bless you. The baronet went slowly and thoughtfully up the broad staircase, on his way to his rooms. Sir Oswald Eversleigh passed the night of his sojourn at the Star in broken slumbers. The events of the preceding day haunted him perpetually in his sleep, acting themselves over and over again in his brain. Sometimes he was with his nephew, and the young man was pleading with him in an agony of selfish terror. Sometimes he was standing in the marketplace, with the ghost-like figure of the vagrant ballad-singer by his side. When he arose in the morning, Sir Oswald resolved to dismiss all thought of his nephew. His strange adventure of the previous night had exercised a very powerful influence upon his mind, and it was upon that adventure he meditated while he breakfasted. I have seen a landscape which had no special charm in broad daylight, transformed into a glimpse of paradise by the magic of the moon, he mused as he lingered over his breakfast. Perhaps this girl is a very ordinary creature after all, a mere street wanderer, coarse and vulgar. But Sir Oswald stopped himself, remembering the refined tones of the voice which he had heard last night, the perfect self-possession of the girl's manner. No, he exclaimed, she is neither coarse nor vulgar. She is no common street ballad singer. Whatever she is, or whoever she is, there is a mystery around and about her, a mystery which it shall be my business to fathom. When he had breakfasted, Sir Oswald Eversleigh sent for the ballad singer. Be good enough to tell the young person that if she feels herself sufficiently rested and refreshed, "'I should like much to have a few minutes' conversation with her,' said the baronet to the head-waiter. In a few minutes the waiter returned, and ushered in the girl. Sir Oswald turned to look at her, possessed by a curiosity which was utterly unwarranted by the circumstances. It was not the first time in his life that he had stepped aside from his pathway to perform an act of charity." but it certainly was the first time he had ever felt so absorbing an interest in the object of his benevolence. The girl's beauty had been no delusion engendered of the moonlight. Standing before him in the broad sunlight, she seemed even yet more beautiful, for her loveliness was more fully visible. The ballad singer betrayed no signs of embarrassment under Sir Oswald's searching gaze. She stood before her benefactor with calm grace, and there was something almost akin to pride in her attitude. Her garments were threadbare and shabby, yet on her they did not appear the garments of a vagrant. Her dress was of some rusty black stuff, patched and mended in a dozen places, but it fitted her neatly, 
and a clean linen collar surrounded her slender throat, which was almost as white as the linen. Her waving brown hair was drawn away from her face in thick bands, revealing the small rosy-tinted ear. The dark brown of that magnificent hair contrasted with the ivory white of a complexion, which was only relieved by transient blushes of faint rose color that came and went with emotion or excitement. "'Be good enough to take a seat,' said Sir Oswald. "'I wish to have a little conversation with you. I want to help you, if I can. You do not seem fitted for the life you are leading, and I am convinced that you possess talent which would elevate you to a far higher sphere. But before we talk of the future, I must ask you to tell me something of the past.' "'Tell me,' he continued gently, "'how is it that you are so friendless? "'How is it that your father and mother "'allow you to lead such an existence?' "'My mother died when I was a child,' answered the girl. "'And your father?' "'My father is dead also.' "'You did not tell me that last night,' replied the baronet, "'with some touch of suspicion in his tone, "'for he fancied the girl's manner had changed "'when she spoke of her father.' "'Did I not?' she said quietly. "'I do not think you asked me any question about my father. "'But if you did, I may have answered at random. "'I was confused last night from exhaustion and want of rest, "'and I scarcely knew what I said. "'What was your father?' "'He was a sailor.' "'There is something that is scarcely English in your face,' said Sir Oswald. "'Were you born in England?' "'No.' I was born in Florence. My mother was a Florentine. Indeed. There was a pause. It seemed evident that this girl did not care to tell the story of her past life, and that whatever information the baronet wanted to obtain must be extorted from her little by little. A common vagrant would have been eager to pour out some tale of misery, true or false, in the hearing of the man who promised to be her benefactor. But this girl maintained a reserve which Sir Oswald found very difficult to penetrate. "'I fear there is something of a painful nature in your past history,' he said at last, "'something which you do not care to reveal.' "'There is much that is painful, much that I cannot tell. "'And yet you must be aware that it will be very difficult for me to give you assistance,' "'if I do not know to whom I am giving it. "'I wish to place you in a position very different from that which you now occupy, "'but it would be folly to interest myself in a person "'of whose history I positively know nothing.' "'Then dismiss from your mind all thoughts of me, "'and let me go my own way,' answered the girl, "'with that calm pride of manner which imparted a singular charm to her beauty. "'I shall leave this house grateful and contented.' I have asked nothing from you, nor did I intend to ask anything. You have been very good to me. You took compassion upon me in my misery, and I have been accustomed to see people of your class pass me by. Let me thank you for your goodness, and go on my way. So saying, she rose, and turned as if to leave the room. No, cried Sir Oswald impetuously, I cannot let you go. I must help you in some manner, even if you will throw no light upon your past existence, even if I must act entirely in the dark. You are too good, sir, replied the girl deeply touched, but remember that I do not ask your help. My history is a terrible one. I have suffered from the crimes of others, but neither crime nor dishonor have sullied my own life. I have lived amongst people I despised, holding myself aloof as far as was possible. I have been laughed at, hated, ill-used for that which has been called pride, but I have at least preserved myself unpolluted by the corruption that surrounded me. If you can believe this, if you can take me upon trust, and stretch forth your hand to help me, knowing no more of me than I have now told you, I shall accept your assistance proudly and gratefully. But if you cannot believe, let me go my own way. I will trust you, he said. 
I will help you blindly, since it must be so. Let me ask you two or three questions, then all questioning between us shall be at an end. I am ready to answer any inquiry that it is possible for me to answer. Your name? My name is Honoria Milford. Your age? Eighteen. Tell me, how is it that your manner of speaking, your tones of voice, are those of a person who has received a superior education? I am not entirely uneducated. An Italian priest, a cousin of my poor mother's, bestowed some care upon me when I was in Florence. He was a very learned man, and taught me much that is rarely taught to a girl of fourteen or fifteen. His house was my refuge in days of cruel misery, and his teaching was the only happiness of my life. And now, sir, question me no further, I entreat you. Very well, then, I will ask no more, and I will trust you. I thank you, sir, for your generous confidence. And now I will tell you my plans for your future welfare, Sir Oswald continued kindly. I was thinking much of you while I breakfasted. You have a very magnificent voice, and it is upon that voice you must depend for the future. Are you fond of music? I am very fond of it. There was little in the girl's words but the tone in which they were spoken, the look of inspiration which lighted up the speaker's face, convinced Sir Oswald that she was an enthusiast. Do you play the piano? A little, by ear. And you know nothing of the science of music? Nothing. Then you will have a great deal to learn before you can make any profitable use of your voice. And now I will tell you what I shall do. I shall make immediate arrangements for placing you in a first-class boarding school in London, or the neighborhood of London. There you will complete your education, and there you will receive lessons from the best masters in music and singing, and devote the greater part of your time to the cultivation of your voice. It will be known that you are intended for the career of a professional singer, and every facility will be afforded you for study. You will remain in this establishment for two years, and at the end of that time I shall place you under the tuition of some eminent singer who will complete your musical education and enable you to appear as a public singer. All the rest will depend on your own industry and perseverance. And I should be a worthless creature if I were not more industrious than ever any woman was before, exclaimed Honoria. Oh, sir, how can I find words to thank you? You have no need to thank me. I am a rich man, with neither wife nor child upon whom to waste my money. Besides, if you find the obligation too heavy to bear, you can repay me when you become a distinguished singer. I will work hard to hasten that day, sir, answered the girl earnestly. Sir Oswald had spoken thus lightly, in order to set his protégé more at her ease. He saw that her eyes were filled with tears, and moving to the window to give her time to recover herself, stood for some minutes looking out into the market-place. Then he came back to his easy-chair by the fire, and addressed her once more. "'I shall post up to town this afternoon to make the arrangements of which I have spoken,' he said. "'You, in the meantime, will remain under the care of Mrs. Willett, to whom I shall entrust the purchase of your wardrobe. When that has been prepared, you will come straight to my house in Arlington Street, whence I will myself conduct you to the school I may have chosen as your residence. Remember that from to-day you will begin a new life. Ah, by the by, there is one other question I must ask. You have no relations, no associates of the past, who are likely to torment you in the future? None. I have no relations who would dare approach me, and I have always held myself aloof from all associates. Good. Then the future lies clear before you. And now you can return to Mrs. Willett. I will see her presently and make all arrangements for your comfort. Honoria curtsied to her benefactor and left the room in silence, 
Her every gesture and her every tone were those of a lady. Sir Oswald looked after her with wonder as she disappeared from the apartment. The landlady of the star was very much surprised when Sir Oswald Eversleigh requested her to keep the ballad singer in her charge for a week and to purchase for her a simple but thoroughly complete wardrobe. And now, said Sir Oswald, I confide her to you for a week, Mrs. Willett, at the end of which time I hope her wardrobe will be ready. I will write you a check for, say, fifty pounds. If that is not enough, you can have more. Lord bless you, Sir Oswald. It's more than enough to set her up like a duchess, in a manner of speaking, answered the landlady, and then seeing Sir Oswald had no more to say to her, she curtsied and withdrew. Sir Oswald Eversleigh's carriage was at the door of the star at noon, and at ten minutes after twelve the baronet was on his way back to town. He visited a great many West End boarding schools before he found one that satisfied him in every particular. Had his protégé been his daughter, or his affianced wife, he could not have been more difficult to please. He wondered at his own fastidiousness. I am like a child with a new toy, he thought, almost ashamed of the intense interest he felt in this unknown girl. At last he found an establishment that pleased him, a noble old mansion at Fulham, surrounded by splendid grounds, and presided over by two maiden sisters. It was a thoroughly aristocratic seminary, and the ladies who kept it knew how to charge for the advantages of their establishment. Sir Oswald assented immediately to the Mrs. Beaumont's terms, and promised to bring the expected pupil in less than a week's time. "'The young lady is a relation, I presume, Sir Oswald?' said the elder Miss Beaumont. "'Yes,' answered the baronet. "'She is a distant relative.' If he had not been standing with his back to the light, the two ladies might have seen a dusky flush suffuse his face as he pronounced these words. Never before had he told so deliberate a falsehood. But he had feared to tell the truth. They will never guess her secret from her manner, he thought, and if they question her, she will know how to baffle their curiosity. On the very day that ended the stipulated week, Honoria Milford made her appearance in Arlington Street. Sir Oswald was in his library, seated in an easy-chair before the fireplace, with a book in his hand, but with no power to concentrate his attention to its pages. He was sitting thus when the door was opened, and a servant announced, "'Miss Milford!' Sir Oswald rose from his chair, and beheld an elegant young lady, who approached him with a graceful timidity of manner. She was simply dressed in grey merino, a black silk mantle, and a straw bonnet trimmed with white ribbon. Nothing could have been more Quaker-like than the simplicity of this costume, and yet there was an elegance about the wearer, which the baronet had seldom seen surpassed. He rose to welcome her. "'You have just arrived in town?' he said. "'Yes, Sir Oswald.' A hackney coach brought me here from the coach office. I am very glad to see you, said the baronet, holding out his hand, which Honoria Milford touched lightly with her own neatly gloved fingers. And I am happy to tell you that I have secured you a home which I think you will like. Oh, Sir Oswald, you are only too good to me. I shall never know how to thank you. Then do not thank me at all. Believe me, I desire no thanks. I have done nothing worthy of gratitude. An influence stronger than my own will has drawn me towards you, and in doing what I can to befriend you, I am only giving way to an impulse which I am powerless to resist. The girl looked at her benefactor with a bewildered expression, and Sir Oswald interpreted the look. Yes, he said, you may well be astonished by what I tell you. I am astonished myself. There is something mysterious in the interest which you have inspired in my mind. Although the baronet had thought continually of his protégé during the past week, 
he had never asked himself if there might not be some simple and easy solution possible for this bewildering enigma he had never asked himself if it were not just within the limits of possibility that a man of fifty might fall a victim to that fatal fever called love he looked at the girl's beautiful face with the admiration which every man feels for the perfection of beauty the pure calm reverential feeling of an artist or a poet and he never supposed it possible that the day might not be far distant when he would contemplate that lovely countenance with altered sentiments with a deeper emotion come to the dining-room miss milford he said i expected you to-day i have made all my arrangements accordingly you must be hungry after your journey and as i have not yet lunched i hope you will share my luncheon honoria assented her manner towards her benefactor was charming in its quiet grace deferential without being sycophantic the manner of a daughter rather than a dependent before leaving the library she looked around at the books the bronzes the pictures with admiring eyes never before had she seen so splendid an apartment and she possessed that intuitive love of beautiful objects which is the attribute of all refined and richly endowed natures the baronet placed his ward on one side of the table and seated himself opposite to her no servant waited upon them sir oswald himself attended to the wants of his guest he heaped her plate with dainties he filled her glass with rare old wine but she ate only a few mouthfuls and she could drink nothing the novelty of her present position was too full of excitement during the whole of the repast the baronet asked her no questions he talked as if they had long been known to each other explaining to her the merits of the different pictures and statues which she admired pleased to find her intelligence always on a level with his own she is a wonderful creature he thought a wonderful creature a priceless pearl picked up out of the gutter after luncheon sir oswald rang for his carriage and presently honoria milford found herself on her way to her new home the mansion inhabited by the mrs beaumont was called the beeches it had of old been the seat of a nobleman and the grounds which encircled it were such as are rarely to be found within a few miles of the metropolis and they would in vain be sought for now shabby little streets and terraces cover the ground where grand old cedars of lebanon cast their dark shadows on the smooth turf seven and twenty years ago honoria milford was enraptured with the beauty of her new home that stately mansion shut in by noble old trees from all the dust and clamor of the outer world those smooth lawns and exquisitely kept beds filled with flowers even in this chill spring weather must have seemed beautiful to those accustomed to handsome habitations what must they have been then to the wanderer of the streets the friendless tramp who a week ago had depended for a night's rest on the chance of finding an empty barn she looked at her benefactor with eyes that were dim with tears as the carriage approached this delightful retreat if i were your daughter you could not have chosen a better place than this she said if you were my daughter i doubt if i could feel a deeper interest in your fate than i feel now answered sir oswald quietly miss beaumont the elder received her pupil with ceremonious kindness she looked at the girl with the keen glance of examination which becomes habitual to the eye of the schoolmistress but the most severe scrutiny would have failed to detect anything unladylike or ungraceful in the deportment of honoria milford the young lady is charming said miss beaumont confidentially as the baronet was taking leave any one could guess that she was an eversleigh she is so elegant so patrician in face and manner ah sir oswald the good old blood will show itself the baronet smiled as he bade adieu to the schoolmistress he had told honoria that policy had compelled him to speak of her as a distant relative of his own 
and there was no fear that the girl would betray herself, or him, by any awkward admissions. Sir Oswald felt depressed and gloomy as he drove back to town. It seemed to him as if, in parting from his protégé, he had lost something that was necessary to his happiness. "'I have not spent half a dozen hours in her society,' he thought, "'and yet she occupies my mind more than my nephew Reginald, "'who for fifteen years of my life has been the object of so much hope, so many cares. "'What does it all mean?' Chapter Five of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Five, Evil, be thou my good. Reginald Eversleigh was handsome, accomplished, agreeable, irresistible when he chose. Many people said but he was not richly endowed with those intellectual gifts which lift a man to either the good or bad eminence. He was weak and vacillating, one minute swayed by a good influence, a transient touch of penitence, affection, or generosity, in the next given over entirely to his own selfishness, thinking only of his own enjoyment. He was apt to be influenced by any friend or companion endowed with intellectual superiority, and he possessed such a friend in the person of Victor Carrington, a young surgeon, a man infinitely below Mr. Eversleigh in social status, but whose talents, united to tact, had lifted him above his natural level. The young surgeon was a slim, elegant-looking young man, with a pale, sallow face and flashing black eyes. His appearance was altogether foreign, and although his own name was English, he was half a Frenchman, his mother being a native of Bordeaux. This widowed mother now lived with him, dependent on him and loving him with a devoted affection. From a chance meeting in a public billiard-room, an intimacy arose between Victor Carrington and Reginald Eversleigh, which speedily ripened into friendship. The weaker nature was glad to find a stronger on which to lean. Reginald Eversleigh invited his new friend to his rooms, to champagne breakfasts, to suppers of broiled bones, eaten long after midnight, to card parties, at which large sums of money were lost and won, but the losers were never Victor Carrington or Reginald Eversleigh and there were men who said that Eversleigh was a more dangerous opponent at loo and whist, since he had picked up that fellow Carrington. "'I always feel afraid of Eversleigh when that sallow-faced surgeon is his partner at whist, or hangs about his chair at a carte, said one of the officers in Reginald Eversleigh's regiment. "'It's my opinion that black-eyed Frenchman is Mephistopheles in person.' I never saw a countenance that so fully realized my idea of the devil. People laughed at the dragoon's notion, but there were few of Mr. Eversleigh's guests who liked his new acquaintance, and there were some who kept altogether aloof from the young cornet's rooms after two or three evenings spent in the society of Mr. Carrington. "'The fellow is too clever,' said one of Eversleigh's brother officers, these very clever men are almost invariably scoundrels. I respect a man who is great in one thing, a great surgeon, a great lawyer, a great soldier. But your fellow who knows everything better than anybody else is always a villain. Victor Carrington was the only person to whom Reginald Eversleigh told the real story of his breach with his uncle. He trusted Victor, not because he cared to confide in him, for the story was too humiliating to be told without pain, but because he wanted counsel from a stronger mind than his own. "'It's rather a hard thing to drop from the chance of forty thousand a year 
to a pension of a couple of hundred, isn't it, Carrington? said Reginald, as the two young men dined together in the cornet's quarters, a fortnight after the scene in Arlington Street. It's rather hard, isn't it, Carrington? Yes, it would be rather hard, if such a contingency were possible, replied the surgeon coolly. But we don't mean to drop from forty thousand to two hundred. The generous old uncle may choose to draw his purse-strings, and cast us off to beggarly divorcement, as Desdemona remarks. But we don't mean to let him have his own way. We must take things quietly, and manage matters with a little tact. You want my advice, I suppose, my dear Reginald? I do. The surgeon almost always addressed his friends by their Christian names, more especially when those friends were of higher standing than himself. There was a depth of pride which few understood, lurking beneath his quiet and unobtrusive manner, and he had a way of his own, by which he let people know that he considered himself in every respect their equal, and in some respects their superior. "'You want my advice? Very well. Then my advice is that you play the penitent prodigal. It is not a difficult part to perform, if you take care what you are about. Sir Oswald has advised you to exchange into the line. Instead of doing that, you will sell out altogether. It will look like a stroke of prudence.' and will leave you free to play your cards cleverly, and keep your eye upon this dear uncle. "'Sell out!' exclaimed Reginald. "'Leave the army? I have sworn never to do that.' "'But you will find yourself obliged to do it nevertheless. Your regiment is too expensive for a man who has only a pitiful two hundred a year beyond his pay.' Your mail phaeton would cost the whole of your income. Your tailor's bill can hardly be covered by another two hundred. And then, where are you to get your gloves, your hothouse flowers, your wines, your cigars? You can't go upon credit for ever. Tradesmen have such a tiresome habit of wanting money, if it's only a hundred or so now and then on account. The Jews are beginning to be suspicious of your paper. The news of your quarrel with Sir Oswald is pretty sure to get about somehow or other. And then where are you? Cards and billiards are all very well in their way, but you can't live by them without turning a regular blackleg. And as a blackleg, you would have no chance of the reign of estates. No, my dear Reginald, retrenchment is the word. You must sell out. Keep yourself very quiet, and watch your uncle." "'What do you mean by watching him?' asked Mr. Eversleigh peevishly. His friend's advice was by no means palatable to him. He sat in a moody attitude, with his elbows on his knees, and his head bent forward, staring at the fire. His wine stood untasted on the table by his side. "'I mean that you must keep your eye upon him, in order to see that he doesn't play you a trick.' "'answered the surgeon at his own leisure. "'What trick should he play me? "'Well, you see, when a man quarrels with his heir, "'he is apt to turn desperate. "'Sir Oswald might marry.' "'Marry? At fifty years of age?' "'Yes. Men of fifty have been known to fall as desperately in love "'as any of your heroes of two or three and twenty. Sir Oswald would be a splendid match, and depend upon it, there are plenty of beautiful and high-born women who would be glad to call themselves Lady Eversleigh. Take my advice, Reginald, dear boy, and keep your eye on the baronet. But he has turned me out of his house. He has severed every link between us. Then it must be our business to establish a secret chain of communication with his household, answered Victor, 
He has some confidential servant, I suppose. Yes, he has a valet called Millard, whom he trusts as far as he trusts any dependent. But he is not a man who talks to his servants. Perhaps not. But servants have a way of their own of getting at information, and depend upon it, Mr. Millard knows more of your uncle's business than Sir Oswald would wish him to know. We must get hold of this faithful Millard. But he is a very faithful fellow, honesty itself, the pink of fidelity. Hm, muttered the young surgeon. Did you ever try the effect of a bribe on this pink of fidelity? Never. Then you know nothing about him. Remember what Sir Robert Walpole said. Every man has his price. We must find out the price of Mr. Millard. You are a wonderful fellow, Carrington. You think so? Bah! I keep my eyes open, that's all. Other men go through the world with their eyes half shut. I graduated in a good school, and I may, perhaps, have been a tolerably apt pupil. What school? The school of poverty. That's the sort of education that sharpens a man's intellect. My father was a reprobate and a gamester, and I knew at an early age that I had nothing to hope for from him. I have had my own way to carve in life, and if I have as yet made small progress, I have fought against terrible odds. I wonder you don't set up in a professional career, said Mr. Eversleigh. You have finished your education, obtained your degree. What are you waiting for? I am waiting for my chances, answered Victor. I don't care to begin the jog trot career. "'in which other men toil for twenty years or so "'before they attain anything like prosperity. "'I have studied as few men of five and twenty have studied, "'chemistry as well as surgery. "'I could afford to wait my chances. "'I pick up a few pounds a week by writing for the medical journals, "'and with that resource and occasional luck with cards, "'I can very easily support the simple home "'in which my mother and I live.' In the meantime, I am free, and believe me, my dear Reginald, there is nothing so precious as freedom. And you will not desert me now that I am down in the world, eh, old fellow? No, Reginald, I will never desert you while you have the chance of succeeding to forty thousand a year, answered the surgeon with a laugh. His small black eyes flashed and sparkled as he laughed. Reginald looked at him with a sensation that was almost fear. "'What a fellow you are, Carrington!' he exclaimed. "'You don't pretend even to have a heart.' "'A heart is a luxury which a poor man must dispense with,' answered Victor, with perfect sang-froid. "'I should as soon think of setting up a male phaeton and pair, as of pretending to benevolent feelings or high-flown sentiments.' I have my way to make in the world, Mr. Eversleigh, and must consider my own interests as well as those of my friends. You see, I am no hypocrite. You needn't be alarmed, dear boy. I'll help you, and you shall help me. And it shall go hard if you are not restored to your uncle's favor before the year is out. But you must be patient. Our work will be slow, for we shall have to work underground. If Sir Oswald is still in Arlington Street, I shall make it my business to see Mr. Millard to-morrow. Sir Oswald Eversleigh had not left Arlington Street, and at dusk on the following evening Mr. Carrington presented himself at the door of the baronet's mansion and asked to see Mr. Millard, the valet. Victor Carrington had never seen his friend's kinsman. He was, therefore, secure against all chances of recognition. He had chosen the baronet's dinner hour as the time for his call, knowing that during that hour the valet must be disengaged. He sent his card to Mr. Millard, with a line written in pencil to request an interview on urgent business. 
Millard came to the hall at once to see his visitor, and ushered Mr. Carrington into a small room that was used occasionally by the upper servants. The surgeon was skilled in every science by which a man may purchase the hearts and minds of his fellow men. He could read Sir Oswald Eversley's valet, as he could have read an open book. He saw that the man was weak, irresolute, tolerably honest, but open to temptation. He was a middle-aged man, with sandy hair, a pale face, and light, greenish-gray eyes. Weak, thought the surgeon as he examined this man's countenance, greedy and avaricious. So, so, we can do what we like with Mr. Millard. Victor Carrington told the valet that he was the most intimate friend of Reginald Eversleigh, and that he had made this visit entirely without that gentleman's knowledge. He dwelt much upon Mr. Eversleigh's grief, his despair. But he is very proud, he added, too proud to approach this house, either directly or indirectly. The shock caused by his uncle's unexpected abandonment of him has completely prostrated him. I am a member of the medical profession, Mr. Millard, and I assure you that during the past fortnight I have almost feared for my friend's reason. I therefore determined upon a desperate step, a step which Reginald Eversleigh would never forgive, were he to become aware of it. I determined upon coming to this house, and ascertaining, if possible, the nature of Sir Oswald's feelings towards his nephew. Is there any hope of a reconciliation? I'm afraid not, sir. That's a bad thing, said Victor gravely. A very bad thing. A vast estate is at stake. It would be a bad thing for everyone if that estate were to pass into strange hands. A very bad thing for old servants, for with strangers all old links are broken. It would be a still worse thing for everyone if Sir Oswald should take it into his head to marry. The valet looked very grave. If you had said such a thing to me a fortnight ago, I should have told you it was impossible, he said. But now... Now what do you say? Well, sir, you're a gentleman, and of course you can keep a secret, so I'll tell you candidly that nothing my master could do would surprise me after what I've seen within the last fortnight. This was quite enough for Victor Carrington, who did not leave Arlington Street until he had extorted from the valley. Chapter Six of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Six, Old Robin Gray. A year and some months had passed, and the midsummer sunlight shone upon the woods around Raynham Castle. It was a grand pile of buildings, blackened by the darkening hand of time. At one end, Norman towers loomed round and grim. At another extremity, the light tracery of a Gothic era was visible in window and archway, turret and tower. The centre had been rebuilt in the reign of Henry the Eighth, and a long range of noble Tudor windows looked out upon the broad terrace beyond which there was a garden or pleasance sloping down to the park in the centre of this long facade there was an archway opening into a stone quadrangle where a fountain played perpetually in a marble basin this was raynham castle and all the woods and pastures as far as the eye could reach and far beyond the reach of any human eye belonged to the castle estate this was the fair domain of which Reginald Eversleigh had been for years the acknowledged heir, and which his own folly and dishonor had forfeited. Now all was changed. There was not a peasant in Raynham village 
who had not as much right to enter the castle, and as good a chance of welcome, as he who had once been acknowledged heir to that proud domain. It was scarcely strange if Reginald Eversleigh felt this bitter change very keenly. He had placed himself entirely in the hands of his friend and adviser, Victor Carrington. He had sold out of the cavalry regiment, and had taken up his abode in a modest lodging, situated in a small street at the west end of London. Here he had tried to live quietly, according to his friend's advice, but he was too much the slave of his own follies and vices to endure a quiet existence. The sale of his commission made him rich for the time being, and so long as his money lasted he pursued the old course, betting, playing billiards, haunting all the aristocratic temples of folly and dissipation, but at the worst, conducting himself with greater caution than he had done of old, and always allowing himself to be held somewhat in check by his prudent ally and counsellor. "'Enjoy yourself as much as you please, my dear Reginald,' said Victor Carrington. "'But take care that your little follies don't reach the ears of your uncle. Remember, I count upon your being reconciled to him before the year is out.' "'That will never be,' answered Mr. Eversleigh, with a tone of sullen despair. "'I am utterly ruined, Carrington. It's no use trying to shirk the truth. I am a doomed wretch, a beggar for life.' And the sooner I throw myself over one of the bridges and make an end of my miserable existence, the better. According to Millard's account, my uncle's infatuation for that singing girl grows stronger and stronger. Not a week now passes without his visiting the school where the young adventuress is finishing her education. As sure as fate, it will end by his marrying her, and the street ballad singer will be my lady Eversleigh. And when she is my Lady Eversleigh, it must be our business to step between her and the Eversleigh estates, answered Victor quietly. I told you that your uncle's marriage would be an unlucky thing for you, but I never told you that it would put an end to your chances. I think, from what Millard tells us, there is very little doubt Sir Oswald will make a fool of himself by marrying this girl. If he does... We must set our wits to work to prevent his leaving her his fortune. She is utterly friendless and obscure, so he is not likely to make any settlement upon her. And for the rest, a man of fifty who marries a girl of nineteen is very apt to repent of his folly. It must be our business to make your uncle repent very soon after he has taken the final step. I don't understand you, Carrington. "'My dear Eversleigh, you very seldom do understand me,' answered the surgeon in that half-contemptuous tone in which he was apt to address his friend. "'But that is not of the smallest consequence. "'Only do what I tell you, and leave the rest to me. "'You shall be lord of Raynham Castle yet, if my wits are good for anything.' "'A year had elapsed.' which had been passed by Sir Oswald between Raynham Castle and Arlington Street, and during which he had paid more visits than he could count to the beaches. On the occasion of these visits, he only saw his protégé for about a quarter of an hour, while the stately Miss Beaumont looked on, smiling a dignified smile upon her pet pupil and the liberal patron who paid so handsomely for that pupil's education. She had always a good account to give of Sir Oswald's protégé. There never was so much talent united to so much industry, according to Miss Beaumont's report. Sometimes Sir Oswald begged to hear Miss Milford sing, and Honoria seated herself at the piano, over whose notes her white fingers seemed to have already acquired perfect command. The rich and clear soprano voice had attained new power since Sir Oswald had heard it in the moonlit marketplace. The execution of the singer improved day by day. The Italian singing master spoke in raptures of his pupil. Never was there a finer organ or more talent. Miss Milford could not fail to create a profound impression when her musical education should be completed and she should appear before the public. 
but as the year drew to its close sir oswald eversleigh talked less and less of that public career for which he had destined his protege he no longer reminded her that on her own industry depended her future fortune he no longer spoke in glowing terms of that brilliant pathway which lay before her his manner was entirely changed and he was grave and silent whenever any allusion was made by Miss Beaumont or Honoria to the future use which was to be made of that superb voice and exceptional genius. The schoolmistress remarked upon this alteration one day when talking to her pupil. "'Do you know, my dear Miss Milford, I am really inclined to believe that Sir Oswald Eversleigh has changed his mind with regard to your future career?' and that he does not intend you to be an opera singer. The first year of Honoria Milford's residence at the Beeches expired, and another year began. Sir Oswald's visits became more and more frequent. When the accounts of his protégé's progress were more than usually enthusiastic, his visits were generally followed very speedily by the arrival of some costly gift for Miss Beaumont's pupil, a ring a bracelet, a locket, always in perfect taste, and such as a young lady at a boarding-school might wear, but always of the most valuable description. Honoria Milford must have possessed a heart of stone if she had not been grateful to so noble a benefactor. She was grateful, and her gratitude was obvious to her generous protector. Her beautiful face was illuminated with an unwanted radiance, when she entered the drawing-room, where he awaited her coming, and the pleasure with which she received his brief visits was as palpable as if it had been expressed in words. It was midsummer, and Honoria Milford had been a year and a quarter at the beeches. She had acquired much during that period, new accomplishments, new graces, and her beauty had developed into fresh splendor in the calm repose of that comfortable abode. She was liked by her fellow pupils, but she had made neither friends nor confidants. The dark secrets of her past life shut her out from all intimate companionship with girls of her own age. She had, in a manner, lived a lonely life amongst all these companions, and her chief happiness had been derived from her studies. Thus it was, perhaps, that she had made double progress during her residence with the Mrs. Beaumont. One bright afternoon in June, Sir Oswald's mail phaeton and pair drove past the windows of the schoolroom. "'Visitors for Miss Milford!' exclaimed the pupil seated near the windows, as they recognized the elegant equipage. Honoria rose from her desk, awaiting the summons of the schoolroom maid. She had not long to wait. The young woman appeared at the door in a few moments— and Miss Milford was requested to go to the drawing-room. She went, and found Sir Oswald Eversleigh awaiting her alone. It was the first time that she had ever known Miss Beaumont to be absent from the reception-room on the visit of the baronet. He rose to receive her, and took the hand which she extended towards him. "'I am alone, you see, Honoria,' he said, I told Miss Beaumont that I had something of a serious nature to say to you, and she left me to receive you alone. "'Something of a serious nature?' repeated the girl, looking at her benefactor with surprise. "'Oh, I think I can guess what you are going to say,' she added after a moment's hesitation. "'My musical education is now sufficiently advanced for me to take some new step in the pathway which you wish me to tread.' So far from wishing to hasten your musical education, I am about to entreat you to abandon all thought of a professional career. To abandon all thought of a professional career? You would ask me this, Sir Oswald? You, who have so often told me that all my hopes for the future depended on my cultivation of the art I love? You love your art very much, then, Honoria. More than I love life itself. And it would grieve you much, no doubt, to resign all idea of a public career, to abandon your dream of becoming a public singer? There was a pause, and then the girl answered, in a dreamy tone, I don't know. 
I have never thought of the public. I have never imagined the hour in which I should stand before a great crowd, as I have stood in the cruel streets, amongst all the noise and confusion, singing to people who cared so little to hear me. I have never thought of that. I love music for its own sake, and feel as much pleasure when I sing alone in my own room as I could feel in the grandest opera-house that ever was built. And the applause, the admiration, the worship, which your beauty as well as your voice would win, does the idea of resigning such intoxicating incense give you no pain, Honoria? The girl shook her head sadly. You forget what I was when you rescued me from the pitiless stones of the marketplace, or you would scarcely ask me such a question. I have confronted the public, not the brilliant throng of the opera house, but the squalid crowd which gathers before the door of a gin shop to listen to a vagrant ballad singer. I have sung at races, where the rich and the high-born were congregated, and have received their admiration. I know what it is worth, Sir Oswald. The same benefactor who throws a handful of halfpence offers an insult with his donation. Sir Oswald contemplated his protégé in silent admiration, and it was some moments before he continued the conversation. "'Will you walk with me in the garden?' he asked presently. "'That avenue of beeches is delightful, and—and and I think I shall be better able to say what I wish there than in this room. At any rate, I shall feel less afraid of interruption.' Honoria rose to comply with her benefactor's wish with that deferential manner which she always preserved in her intercourse with him, and they walked out upon the velvet lawn. Across the lawn lay the beech avenue, and it was thither Sir Oswald directed his steps. Honoria, he said after a silence of some duration, if you knew how much doubt, how much hesitation I experienced before I came here to-day, how much I still question the wisdom of my coming, I think you would pity me, but I am here, and I must needs speak plainly if I am to speak at all. Long ago I tried to think that my interest in your fate was only a natural impulse of charity, only an ordinary tribute to gifts so far above the common. I tried to think this, and I acted with the cold, calculating wisdom of a man of the world when I marked out for you a career by which you might win distinction for yourself and placed you in the way of following that career. I meant to spend last year upon the continent. I did not expect to see you once in twelve months. But the strange influence which possessed me in the hour of our first meeting grew stronger upon me day by day. In spite of myself, I thought of you. In spite of myself, I came here again and again to look upon your face, to hear your voice for a few brief moments, and then to go out into the world, to find it darker and colder by contrast with the brightness of your beauty. Little by little, the idea of your becoming a public singer became odious to me, continued Sir Oswald. At first, I thought with pride of the success which would be yours, the worship which would be offered at your shrine. But my feeling changed completely before long, and I shuddered at the image of your triumphs for those triumphs must, doubtless, separate us forever. Why should I dwell upon this change of feeling? You must have already guessed the secret of my heart. Tell me that you do not despise me. Despise you, Sir Oswald? You, the noblest and most generous of men. Surely you must know that I admire and reverence you for all your noble qualities, as well as for your goodness to a wretched creature like me. "'But, Honoria, I want something more than your esteem. "'Do you remember the night I first heard you singing in the marketplace on the North Road?' "'Can I ever forget that miserable night?' cried the girl in a tone of surprise. "'The question seemed so strange to her. "'That bitter hour in which you came to my rescue? "'Do you remember the song you were singing, the last song you ever sang in the streets?' Honoria Milford paused for some moments before answering. It was evident that she could not at first recall the memory of that last song. "'My brain was almost bewildered that night,' she said. 
I was so weary, so miserable. And yet, stay, I do remember the song. It was old Robin Gray. Yes, Honoria. The story of an old man's love for a woman young enough to be his daughter. I was sitting by my cheerless fireside, meditating very gloomily upon the events of the day which had been a sad one for me, when your thrilling tones stole upon my ear and roused me from my reverie. I listened to every note of that old ballad. Although those words had long been familiar to me, they seemed new and strange that night. An irresistible impulse led me to the spot where you had sunk down in your helplessness. From that hour to this, you have been the ruling influence of my life. I have loved you with a devotion which few men have power to feel. Tell me, Honoria, have I loved in vain? The happiness of my life trembles in the balance. It is for you to decide whether my existence henceforward is to be worthless to me or whether I am to be the proudest and happiest of men. Would my love make you happy, Sir Oswald? Unutterably happy. Then it is yours. You love me, in spite of the difference between our ages? Yes, Sir Oswald, I honor and love you with all my heart, answered Honoria Milford. Whom have I seen so worthy of a woman's affection? From the first hour in which some guardian angel threw me across your pathway, what have I seen in you but nobility of soul and generosity of heart? Is it strange, therefore, if my gratitude has ripened into love? Honoria, murmured Sir Oswald, bending over the drooping head and pressing his lips gently on the pure brow. Honoria, you have made me too happy— I can scarcely believe that this happiness is not some dream which will melt away presently and leave me alone and desolate, the fool of my own fancy. He led Honoria back towards the house. Even in this moment of supreme happiness, he was obliged to remember Miss Beaumont, who would no doubt be lurking somewhere on the watch for her pupil. Then you will give up all thought of a professional career, Honoria? said the baronet as they walked slowly back. I will obey you in everything. My dearest girl, and when you leave this house, you will leave it as Lady Eversleigh. Miss Beaumont was waiting in the drawing-room, and was evidently somewhat astonished by the duration of the interview between Sir Oswald and her pupil. You have been admiring the grounds, I see, Sir Oswald, she said very graciously. It is not quite usual for a gentleman visitor and a pupil to promenade in the grounds tete-a-tete, -tete. but I suppose, in the case of a gentleman of your time of life, we must relax the severity of our rules in some measure. The baronet bowed stiffly. A man of fifty does not care to be reminded of his time of life at the very moment when he has just been accepted as the husband of a girl of nineteen. It may perhaps be the last opportunity which I may have of admiring your grounds, Miss Beaumont, he said presently, for I think of removing your pupil very shortly. Indeed, cried the governess, reddening with suppressed indignation. I trust Miss Milford has not found occasion to make any complaint. She has enjoyed a special privileges under this roof. A separate bedroom, silver forks and spoons— roast veal or lamb on Sundays throughout the summer season, to say nothing of the most unremitting supervision of a positively maternal character, and I should really consider Miss Milford wanting in common gratitude if she had complained. You are mistaken, my dear madam. Miss Milford has uttered no word of complaint. On the contrary, I am sure she has been perfectly happy in your establishment." but changes occur every day, and an important change will, I trust, speedily occur in my life, and in that of Miss Milford. When I first proposed bringing her to you, you asked me if she was a relation. I told you she was distantly related to me. I hope soon to be able to say that distant relationship has been transformed into a very near one. I hope soon to call Honoria Milford my wife." 
the mistress of the beaches possessed a really kind heart beneath the ice of her ultra gentility and she was pleased with the idea of assisting in the bringing about of a genuine love match besides the affair if well managed would reflect considerable importance upon herself and she would be able by and by to talk of my pupil lady eversleigh or that sweet girl miss milford who afterwards married the wealthy baronet sir oswald eversleigh sir oswald pleaded for an early celebration of the marriage and honoria accustomed to obey him in all things did not oppose his wish in this crisis of his life once more sir oswald wrote a cheque for the wardrobe of his protege and miss beaumont swelled with pomposity as she thought of the grandeur which might be derived from the expenditure of a large sum of money at certain west end emporiums where she was in the habit of making purchases for her pupils and where she was already considered a person of some importance it was holiday time at the beaches and almost all the pupils were absent miss beaumont was therefore able to devote the ensuing fortnight to the delightful task of shopping she drove into town almost every day with honoria and hours were spent in the choice of silks and satins velvets and laces and in long consultations with milliners and dressmakers of parisian celebrity and boundless extravagance sir oswald has entrusted me with the supervision of this most important business and i will drop down in a fainting fit from sheer exhaustion before the counter at howell and james's sooner than i would fail in my duty to the extent of an iota miss beaumont said when honoria begged her to take less trouble about the wedding trousseau it was sir oswald's wish that the wedding should be strictly private whom could he invite to assist at his union with a nameless and friendless bride? Miss Beaumont was the only person whom he could trust, and even her he had deceived, for she believed that Honoria Milford was some fourth or fifth cousin, some poor relative of Sir Oswald's. Early in July the wedding took place. All preparations had been made so quietly as to baffle even the penetration of the watchful Millard. He had perceived that the baronet was more than usually occupied, and in higher spirits than were habitual to him, but he could not discover the reason. "'There is something going on, sir,' he said to Victor Carrington, "'but I'm blessed if I know what it is. I dare say that young woman is at the bottom of it. I never did see my master look so well or so happy. It seems as if he was growing younger every day. Reginald Eversleigh looked at his friend in blank despair when these tidings reached him. I told you I was ruined, Victor, he said, and now perhaps you will believe me. My uncle will marry that woman. It was only on the eve of his wedding day that Sir Oswald Eversleigh made any communication to his valet. While dressing for dinner that evening, he said quietly, "'I want my portmanteaus packed for travelling between this and two o'clock to-morrow, Millard, and you will hold yourself in readiness to accompany me. I shall post from London, starting from a house near Fulham at three o'clock. The chariot must leave here, with you and the luggage, at two. "'You are going abroad, sir?' "'No. I am going to North Wales for a week or two. "'But I do not go alone. "'I am going to be married to-morrow morning, Millard, "'and Lady Eversleigh will accompany me.' "'Much as the probability of this marriage "'had been discussed in the Arlington Street household, "'the fact came upon Joseph Millard as a surprise. "'Nothing is so unwelcome to old servants "'as the marriage of a master who has long been a bachelor. "'Let the bride be never so fair, never so high-born, she will be looked on as an interloper, and if, as in this case, she happens to be poor and nameless, the bridegroom is regarded as a dupe and a fool, the bride is stigmatized as an adventuress. The valet was fully occupied that evening with preparations for the journey of the following day, 
and could find no time to call at Mr. Eversleigh's lodgings with his evil tidings. "'He'll hear of it soon enough, I dare say, poor unfortunate man,' thought Mr. Millard. The valet was right. In a few days the announcement of the baronet's marriage appeared in the Times newspaper, for though he had celebrated that marriage with all privacy, he had no wish to keep his fair young wife hidden from the world. On Thursday the fourth instant, at St. Mary's Church, Fulham, Sir Oswald Morton Vansittart Eversleigh, baronet, to Honoria, daughter of the late Thomas Milford, this was all, and this was the announcement which Reginald Eversleigh read one morning as he dawdled over his late breakfast, after a night spent in dissipation and folly. He threw the paper away from him, with an oath, and hurried to his toilet. He dressed himself with less care than usual, for to-day he was in a hurry. He wanted at once to communicate with his friend, Victor Carrington. The young surgeon lived at the very extremity of the Maida Hill district, in a cottage, which was then almost in the country. It was a comfortable little residence, but Reginald Eversleigh looked at it with supreme contempt. "'You can wait,' he said to the hackney coachman. "'I shall be here in about a half an hour.' The man drove away to refresh his horses at the nearest inn and Reginald Eversleigh strode impatiently past the trim little servant-girl who opened the garden gate, and walked, unannounced, into the miniature hall. Everything in and about Victor Carrington's abode was the perfection of neatness. The presence of poverty was visible, it is true, but poverty was made to wear its fairest shape. In the snug drawing-room to which Reginald Eversleigh was admitted, all was bright and fresh. White muslin curtains shaded the French window. Birds sang in gilded cages, of inexpensive quality but elegant design. And tall glass vases of freshly cut flowers adorned tables and mantelpiece. Sir Oswald's nephew looked contemptuously at this elegance of poverty. For him, nothing but the splendor of wealth possessed any charm. The surgeon came to him while he stood musing thus. "'Do you mind coming to my laboratory?' he asked, after shaking hands with his unexpected visitor. "'I can see that you have something of importance to say to me, and we shall be safer from interruption there.' "'I shouldn't have come to this fag end of Christendom if I hadn't wanted very much to see you. You may depend upon it, Carrington,' answered Reginald sulkily. What on earth makes you live in such an out-of-the-way hole? I am a student, and an out-of-the-way hole, as you are good enough to call it, suits my habits. Besides, this house is cheap, and the rent suits my pocket. It looks like a doll's house, said Reginald contemptuously. My mother likes to surround herself with birds and flowers, answered the surgeon, and I like to indulge any fancy of my mother's. Victor Carrington's countenance seemed to undergo a kind of transformation as he spoke of his mother. The bright glitter of his eyes softened. The hard lines of his iron mouth relaxed. The one tender sentiment of a dark and dangerous nature was this man's affection for his widowed mother. He opened the door of an apartment at the back of the house, and entered, followed by Mr. Eversleigh. Reginald stared in wonder at the chamber in which he found himself. The room had once been a kitchen, and was much larger than any other room in the cottage. Here there was no attempt at either comfort or elegance. The bare, whitewashed walls had no adornment but a deal shelf here and there, loaded with strange-looking files and galley pots. Here, all the elaborate paraphernalia of a chemist's laboratory was visible. Here Reginald Eversleigh beheld stoves, retorts, alembics, distilling apparatus, all the strange machinery of that science which always seems dark and mysterious to the ignorant. The visitor looked about him in utter bewilderment. "'Why, Victor!' he exclaimed. 
Your room looks like the laboratory of some alchemist of the Middle Ages, the sort of man people used to burn as a wizard. I am rather an enthusiastic student of my art, answered the surgeon. The visitor's eyes wandered round the room in amazement. Suddenly they alighted on some object on the table near the stove. Carrington perceived the glance, and, with a hasty movement, very unusual to him, dropped his handkerchief upon the object. The movement, rapid though it was, came too late, for Reginald Eversleigh had distinguished the nature of the object, which the surgeon wished to conceal from him. It was a mask of metal, with glass eyes. "'So you wear a mask when you are at work, eh, Carrington?' said Mr. Eversleigh. "'That looks as if you dabble in poisons.' "'Half the agents employed in chemistry are poisonous,' answered Victor coolly. "'I hope there is no danger in the atmosphere of this room just now.' "'None whatever. Come, Reginald, I am sure you have bad news to tell me, or you would never have taken the trouble to come here.' "'I have, and the worst news. My uncle has married this street ballad singer.' "'Good.' "'Then we must try to turn this marriage to account.' "'How so?' "'By making it the means of bringing about a reconciliation. "'You will write a letter of congratulation to Sir Oswald, "'a generous letter, in which you will speak of your penitence, "'your affection, the anguish you have endured "'during this bitter period of estrangement. "'You can venture to speak freely of these things now, you will say.' "'for now that your honoured uncle has found new ties, "'you can no longer be suspected of any mercenary motive. "'You can now approach him boldly, you will say, "'for you have henceforward nothing to hope from him "'except his forgiveness. "'Then you will wind up with an earnest prayer for his happiness. "'And, if I am not very much out in my reckoning of human nature, "'that letter will bring about a reconciliation.' "'Do you understand my tactics?' "'I do. "'You are a wonderful fellow, Carrington. "'Don't say that until the day "'when you are restored to your old position "'as your uncle's heir. "'Then you may pay me any compliment you please. "'If ever that day arrives, "'you shall not find me ungrateful. "'I hope not. "'And now go back to town and write your letter. "'I want to see you invited to Raynham Castle.' "'to pay your respects to the bride.' "'But why so?' "'I want to know what the bride is like. "'Our future plans will depend much upon her.' "'Before leaving Laura Moore Cottage, "'Reginald Eversleigh was introduced to his friend's mother, "'whom he had never before seen. "'She was very like her son. "'She had the same pale, sallow face, "'the same glittering black eyes. "'She was slim and tall, with a somewhat stately manner, and with little of the vivacity usual to her countrywomen. She looked at Mr. Eversleigh with a searching glance, a glance which was often repeated as he stood for a few minutes talking to her. Nothing which interested her son was without interest for her, and she knew that this young man was his chief friend and companion. Reginald Eversleigh went back to town in much better spirits than when he had left the West End that morning. He lost no time in writing the letter suggested by his friend, and, as he was gifted with considerable powers of persuasion, the letter was a good one. "'I believe Carrington is right,' he thought, as he sealed it, "'and this letter will bring about a reconciliation.' It will reach my uncle at a time when he will be intoxicated with his new position as the husband of a young and lovely bride, and he will be inclined to think kindly of me and of all the world. Yes, the letter is decidedly a fine stroke of diplomacy. Reginald Eversleigh awaited a reply to his epistle with feverish impatience, but an impatience mingled with hope. His hopes did not deceive him. The reply came by return of post, and was even more favorable than his most sanguine expectations had led him to anticipate. "'Dear Reginald,' wrote the baronet, "'your generous and disinterested letter has touched me to the heart. Let the past be forgotten and forgiven. 
I do not doubt that you have suffered, as all men must suffer, from the evil deeds of their youth. You were no doubt surprised to receive the tidings of my marriage. I have consulted my heart alone in the choice which I have made, and I venture to hope that choice will secure the happiness of my future existence. I am spending the first weeks of my married life amidst the lovely solitudes of North Wales. On the twenty-fourth of this month, Lady Eversleigh and I go to Rainham, where we shall be glad to see you immediately on our arrival. Come to us, my dear boy, come to me, as if this unhappy estrangement had never arisen, and we will discuss your future together. Your affectionate uncle, Oswald Eversleigh, Royal Hotel, Bannerdoon, North Wales. Nothing could be more satisfactory than this epistle. Reginald Eversleigh and Victor Carrington dined together that evening, and the baronet's letter was freely discussed between them. "'The ground lies all clear before you now,' said the surgeon. "'You will go to Raynham, make yourself as agreeable as possible to the bride, win your uncle's heart by an appearance of extreme remorse for the past, and most complete disinterestedness for the future, and leave all the rest to me.' "'But how the deuce can you help me at Raynham? "'Time alone can show. "'I have only one hint to give you at present. "'Don't be surprised if you meet me unexpectedly "'amongst the Yorkshire hills and wolds, "'and take care to follow suit with whatever cards you see me playing. "'Whatever I do will be done in your interest, depend upon it. "'Mind, by the by, if you do see me in the north, "'that I know nothing of your visit to Raynham. "'I shall be as much surprised to see you "'as you will be to see me. "'So be it. "'I will fall into your plans. "'As your first move has been so wonderfully successful, "'I shall be inclined to trust you implicitly in the future. "'I suppose you will want to be paid rather stiffly by and by "'if you do succeed in getting me any portion of Sir Oswald's fortune. "'Well,' I shall ask for some reward, no doubt. I am a poor man, you know, and do not pretend to be disinterested or generous. Chapter 6, Part 2 of Run to Earth, a Novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 6, Part 2 Old Robin Gray On the 28th of July, Reginald Eversleigh presented himself at Raynham Castle. He had thought never more to set foot upon that broad terrace, never more to pass beneath the shadow of that grand old archway, and a sense of triumph thrilled through his veins, as he stood once again on the familiar threshold. And yet his position in life was terribly changed since he had last stood there. He was no longer the acknowledged heir to whom all dependents paid deferential homage. He fancied that the old servants looked at him coldly, and that their greeting was the chilling welcome which is accorded to a poor relation. He had never done much to win affection or gratitude in the days of his prosperity. It may be that he remembered this now and regretted it, not from any kindly impulse towards these people, but from a selfish annoyance at the chilling reception accorded him. "'If I ever win back what I have lost, these pampered parasites shall suffer for their insolence,' thought the young man as he walked across the broad Gothic hall of the castle, escorted by the grave old butler. But he had not much leisure to think about his uncle's servants. Another and far more important person occupied his mind, and that person was his uncle's bride. "'Lady Eversleigh is at home?' he asked while crossing the hall. "'Yes, sir. Her ladyship is in the long drawing-room.' The butler opened a ponderous oaken door, and ushered Reginald into one of the finest apartments in the castle. In the centre of this room, by the side of a grand piano from which she had just risen, 
stood the new mistress of the castle. She was simply dressed in pale gray silk, relieved only by a scarlet ribbon twisted in the masses of her raven hair. Her beauty had the same effect upon Reginald Eversleigh, which it exercised on almost all who looked at her for the first time. He was dazzled, bewildered, by the singular loveliness. And this divinity, this goddess of grace and beauty, is my uncle's wife, he thought. This is the street ballad singer, whom he picked up out of the gutter. For some moments the elegant and accomplished Reginald Eversleigh stood abashed before the calm presence of the nameless girl his uncle had married. Sir Oswald welcomed his nephew with perfect cordiality. He was happy, and in the hour of his happiness he could cherish no unkind feeling towards the adopted son who had once been so dear to him. But while ready to open his arms to the repentant prodigal, his intentions with regard to the disposition of his wealth had undergone no change. He had arrived calmly and deliberately at his certain resolve, and he intended to adhere to that decision. The baronet told his nephew this frankly, in the first confidential conversation which they had after the young man's arrival at Rainham. "'You may think me harsh and severe,' he said gravely, "'but the resolution which I announced to you in Arlington Street cost me much thought and care. I believe that I have acted for the best. I think that my overindulgence was the bane of your youth, Reginald, and that you would have been a better man had you been more roughly reared. Since you have left the army, I have heard no more of your follies, and I trust that you have at last struck out a better path for yourself and separated yourself from all dangerous associates. But you must choose a new profession. You must not live an idle life on the small income which you receive from me. I only intended that annuity as a safeguard against poverty, not as a sufficient means of life. You must select a new career, Reginald, and whatever it may be, I will give you some help to smooth your pathway. Your first cousin, Douglas Dale, is studying for the law. Would not that profession suit you? I am in your hands, sir, and am ready to obey you in everything. Well, Think over what I have said, and if you choose to enter yourself as a student in the temple, I will assist you with all necessary funds. My dear uncle, you are too good. I wish to serve you as far as I can with justice to others. And now, Reginald, we will speak no more of the past. What do you think of my wife? She is the most beautiful creature I ever beheld. And she is as good and true as she is beautiful. A pearl of price, Reginald. I thank Providence for giving me so great a treasure. And this treasure will be possessor of Raynham Castle, I suppose, thought the young man savagely. Sir Oswald spoke presently, almost as if in answer to his nephew's thoughts. As I have been thoroughly candid with you, Reginald, he said, I may as well tell you even more. I am at an age which some call the prime of life, and I feel all my old vigor. But death sometimes comes suddenly to men whose life seems as full of promise as mine seems to me now. I wish that when I die there may be no possible disappointment as to the disposal of my fortune. Other men make a mystery of the contents of their wills. I wish the terms of my will to be known by all interested in it. I have no desire to be enlightened, sir, murmured Reginald, who felt that his uncle's words boded no good to himself. My will has been made since my marriage, continued Sir Oswald, without noticing his nephew's interruption. Any previous will would indeed have been invalidated by that event. Two-thirds, more than two-thirds of my property— has been left to my wife, who will be a very rich woman when I am dead and gone. Should she have a son, the landed estates will, of course, go to him. But in any case, Lady Eversleigh will be mistress of a large fortune. I leave five thousand a year to each of my nephews. As for you, Reginald, you will perhaps consider yourself bitterly wronged, but you must, in justice, 
Remember that you have been your own enemy. The annuity of two hundred a year, which you now possess, will, after my death, become an income of five hundred a year, derived from a small estate called Morton Grange in Lincolnshire. You have nothing more than a modest competency to hope for, therefore, and it rests with yourself to win wealth and distinction by the exercise of your own talents. The pallor of Reginald Eversleigh's face alone revealed the passion which consumed him as he received these most unwelcome statements from his uncle's lips. Fortunately for the young man, Sir Oswald did not observe his countenance, for at this moment Lady Eversleigh appeared on the terrace-walk outside the open window of her husband's study, and he hurried to her. "'What are to be our plans for this afternoon, darling?' he asked. "'I have transacted all my business, and am quite at your service for the rest of the day.' "'Very well. Then you cannot please me better than by showing me some more of the beauties of your native county.' "'You make that proposition because you know it pleases me, artful puss, but I obey. "'Shall we ride or drive? "'Perhaps, as the afternoon is hot, we had better take the barouche,' continued Sir Oswald, while Honoria hesitated. "'Come to luncheon. I will give all necessary orders.' They went to the dining-room, where the Reginald accompanied them. Already he had contrived to banish the traces of emotion from his countenance. But his uncle's words were still ringing in his ears. Five hundred a year! He was to receive a pitiful five hundred a year, whilst his cousins, struggling men of the world, unaccustomed to luxury and splendor, were each to have an income of five thousand. And this woman, this base, unknown, friendless creature, who had nothing but her diabolical beauty to recommend her, was to have a splendid fortune. These were the thoughts which tormented Reginald Eversleigh as he took his place at the luncheon table. He had been now a fortnight at Raynham Castle, and had become, to all outward appearance, perfectly at his ease with the fair young mistress of the mansion. There are some women who seem fitted to occupy any station, however lofty. They need no teaching. They are in no way bewildered by the novelty of wealth or splendor. They make no errors. They possess an instinctive tact, which all the teaching possible cannot always impart to others. They glide naturally into their position, and looking on them in their calm dignity, their unsteadied grace, it is difficult to believe they have not been born in the purple. Such a woman was Honoria, Lady Eversleigh, the novelty of her position gave her no embarrassment. The splendor around her charmed and delighted her sense of the beautiful, but it caused her no bewilderment. It did not dazzle her unaccustomed eyes. She received her husband's nephew with the friendly yet dignified bearing which it was fitting Sir Oswald's wife should display towards his kinsman and the scrutinizing eyes of the young man sought in vain to detect some secret hidden beneath that placid and patrician exterior. The woman is a mystery, he thought. One would think she was some princess in disguise. Does she really love my uncle, I wonder? She acts her part well if it is a false one. But then, who would not act a part for such a prize as she is likely to win? I wish Victor were here. He, perhaps, might be able to penetrate the secret of her existence. She is a hypocrite, no doubt, and an accomplished one. I would give a great deal for the power to strip the veil from her beautiful face and show my lady in her true colors. Such bitter thoughts as these continually harassed the ambitious and disappointed man, and yet he was able to bear himself with studied courtesy toward Lady Eversleigh. The best people in the county had come to Raynham to pay their homage to Sir Oswald's bride. Nothing could exceed her husband's pride, as he beheld her courted and admired. No shadow of jealousy obscured his pleasure when he saw younger men flock round her to worship and admire. He felt secure of her love, for she had again and again assured him that her heart had been entirely his, 
even before he declared himself to her. He felt an implicit faith in her purity and innocence. Such a man as Oswald Eversleigh is not easily moved to jealousy, but with such a man one breath of suspicion, one word of slander against the creature he loves, is horrible as the agony of death. Reginald Eversleigh had shared in all the pleasures and amusements of Sir Oswald and his wife. They had gone nowhere without him since his arrival at the castle, for at present he was the only visitor staying in the house, and the baronet was too courteous to leave him alone. After the twelfth we shall have plenty of bachelor visitors, said Sir Oswald, and you will find the old place more to your taste, I dare say, Reginald. In the meantime you must content yourself with our society. I am more than contented, my dear uncle, and do not sigh for the arrival of your bachelor friends, though I dare say I shall on very well with them when they do come. I expect a bevy of pretty girls as well. Do you remember Lydia Graham, the sister of Gordon Graham, of the Fusiliers? Yes, I remember her perfectly. I think there used to be something like a flirtation between you and her. Sir Oswald and Lady Eversleigh seated themselves in the barouche. Reginald rode by their side on a thoroughbred hack out of the Raynham stables. The scenery within twenty miles of the castle was varied in character and rich in beauty. In the purple distance to the west of the castle there was a range of heather-clad hills, and between those hills in the village of Raynham there flowed a noble river, crossed at intervals by quaint old bridges, and bordered by little villages nestling amid green pastures. The calm beauty of a rustic landscape and the grandeur of wilder scenery were alike within reach of the explorer from the castle. On this bright August afternoon, Sir Oswald had chosen for the special object of their drive the summit of a wooded hill whence a superb range of country was to be seen. This hill was called Thorpe Peak, and was about seven miles from the castle. The barouche stopped at the foot of the hill. The baronet and his wife alighted and walked up a woody pathway leading to the summit, accompanied by Reginald, who left his horse with the servants. They ascended the hill slowly, Lady Eversleigh leaning upon her husband's arm. The pathway wound upward, through plantations of fir, and it was only on the summit that the open country burst on the view of the pedestrian. On the summit they found a gentleman seated on the trunk of a fallen tree sketching. A light, portable color box lay open by his side, and a small portfolio rested on his knees. He seemed completely absorbed in his occupation, for he did not raise his eyes from his work as Sir Oswald and his companions approached. He wore a loose traveling dress, which, in its picturesque carelessness of style, was not without elegance. A horse was grazing under a group of firs near at hand, fastened to one of the trees by the bridle. The traveller was Victor Carrington. "'Carrington!' exclaimed Mr. Eversleigh. "'Who ever would have thought of finding you up here? Sketching, too!' The surgeon lifted his head suddenly, looked at his friend, and burst out laughing as he rose to shake hands. He looked handsomer in his artistic costume than ever Reginald Eversleigh had seen him look before. The loose velvet coat, the wide linen collar and neckerchief of dark blue silk, set off the slim figure and pale foreign face. "'You are surprised to see me.' "'but I have still more right to be surprised at seeing you. "'What brings you here?' "'I am staying with my uncle, Sir Oswald Eversleigh, at Raynham Castle.' "'Ah, to be sure, that superb place within four miles of the village of Abbey Wood, "'where I have taken up my quarters.' "'The baronet and his wife had been standing at a little distance from the two young men, "'but Sir Oswald advanced.' with Honoria still upon his arm. "'Introduce me to your friend, Reginald,' he said in his most cordial manner. Reginald obeyed, and Victor was presented to Sir Oswald and his wife. 
His easy and graceful bearing was calculated to make an agreeable impression at the outset, and Sir Oswald was evidently pleased with the appearance and manners of his nephew's friend. "'You are an artist, I see, Mr. Carrington,' he said, after glancing at the young man's sketch, which even in its unfinished state was no contemptible performance. "'An amateur only, Sir Oswald,' answered Victor. "'I am by profession a surgeon, but as yet I have not practised. I find independence so agreeable that I can scarcely bring myself to resign it. I have been wandering about this delightful county for the last week or two, with my sketch-book under my arm, halting for a day or two in any picturesque spot I came upon, and hiring a horse whenever I could get a decent animal. It is a very simple mode of enjoying a holiday, but it suits me. Your taste does you credit, but if you are in my neighborhood, you must take your horses from the Raynham stables. Where are your present quarters? At the little inn by Abbey Wood Bridge. Four miles from the castle. We are near neighbors, Mr. Carrington, according to country habits. You must ride back with us and dine at Raynham. You are very kind, Sir Oswald, but my dress will preclude. No consequence whatever. We are quite alone just now, and I am sure Lady Eversleigh will excuse a traveller's toilet. If you are not bent upon finishing this very charming sketch, I shall insist on your returning with us. And you join me in the request, eh, Honoria? Lady Eversleigh smiled an assent, and the surgeon murmured his thanks. As yet he had looked little at the baronet's beautiful wife. He had come to Yorkshire with the intention of studying this woman, as a man studies an abstruse and difficult science, but he was too great a tactician to betray any unwanted interest in her. The policy of his life was patience, and in this, as in everything else, he waited his opportunity. She is very beautiful, he thought, and she has made a good market out of her beauty. But, it is only the beginning of the story yet. The middle and the end have still to come. After this meeting on Thorpe Peak, the surgeon became a constant visitor at Raynham. Sir Oswald was delighted with the young man's talents and accomplishments, and Victor contrived to win credit by the apparently accidental revelation of his early struggles, his mother's poverty, his patient studies, and indomitable perseverance. He told of these things without seeming to tell them. A word now, a chance illusion then, revealed the story of his friendless youth. Sir Oswald fancied that such a companion was eminently adapted to urge his nephew onward in the difficult road that leads to fortune and distinction. If Reginald had only half your industry, half your perseverance, "'I should not fear for his future career, Mr. Carrington,' said the baronet in the course of a confidential conversation with his visitor. "'That will come in good time, Sir Oswald,' answered Victor. "'Reginald is a noble fellow, and has a far nobler nature than I can pretend to possess. "'The very qualities which you are good enough to praise in me are qualities which you cannot expect to find in him.' I was a pupil in the stern school of poverty from my earliest infancy, while Reginald was reared in the lap of luxury. Pardon me, Sir Oswald, if I speak plainly, but I must remind you that there are few young men who would have passed honorably through the ordeal of such a change of fortune as that which has fallen on your nephew. What do you mean? I mean that with most men such a reverse would have been utter ruin of soul and body. An ordinary man, finding all the hopes of his future, all the expectations which had been a part of his very life, taken suddenly from him, would have abandoned himself to a career of vice. He would have become a blackleg, a swindler, a drunkard, a beggar at the doors of the kinsmen who had cast him off. But it was not so with Reginald Eversleigh. From the moment in which he found himself cast adrift by the benefactor who had been more than a father to him, 
he confronted evil fortune calmly and bravely. He cut the link between himself and extravagant companions. He disappeared from the circles in which he had been admired and courted, and the only grief which preyed upon his generous heart sprang from the knowledge that he had forfeited his uncle's affection. Sir Oswald sighed. For the first time he began to think that it was just possible he had treated his nephew with injustice. "'You are right, Mr. Carrington,' he said after a pause. "'It was a hard trial for any man, and I am proud to think that Reginald passed unscathed through so severe an ordeal. But the resolution at which I arrived a year and a half ago is one that I cannot alter now. I have formed new ties. I have new hopes for the future.' My nephew must pay for the penalty of his past errors, and must look to his own exertions for wealth and honour. If I die without a direct heir, he will succeed to the baronetcy, and I hope he will try his uttermost to win a fortune by which he may maintain his title. There was very little promise in this, but Victor Carrington was, nevertheless, tolerably well satisfied with the result of the conversation. He had sown the seeds of doubt and uncertainty in the baronet's breast. Time only could bring the harvest. The surgeon was accustomed to work underground, and knew... Chapter 7 of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 7. O oh, Beware, My Lord, of Jealousy. The castle was gay with the presence of many guests. The baronet was proud to gather old friends and acquaintances round him, in order that he might show them the fair young wife he had chosen to be the solace of his declining years. A man of fifty, who marries a girl of nineteen, is always subject to the ridicule of scandalous lips, the ironical jests of pitiless tongues. Sir Oswald Eversleigh knew this, and he wanted to show the world that he was happy, supremely happy, in the choice that he had made. Amongst those who came to Raynham Castle this autumn was one trusted friend of Sir Oswald, a gruff old soldier, Captain Copplestone, a man who had never won advancement in the service, but who was known to have nobly earned the promotion which had never been awarded him. This man was on brotherly terms with Sir Oswald, and was about the only creature who had ever dared to utter disagreeable truths to the baronet. He was very poor, but had never accepted the smallest favour from the hands of his wealthy friend. Sir Oswald was devoutly attached to him, and would have gladly opened his purse to him as to a brother, but he dared not offend the stern old soldier's pride by even hinting at such a desire. Captain Copplestone came to reign and prepared to remonstrate with his friend on the folly of his marriage. He arrived when the reception-room was crowded with other visitors, and he stood by, looking on in grim disdain, while the newly arrived guests were pressing their felicitations on Sir Oswald. By and by the guests departed to their rooms, and the friends were left alone. "'Well, old friend,' cried the baronet, stretching out both his hands to grasp those of the captain in a warmer salutation than that of his first welcome, Am I to have no word of congratulation from you? What word do you want? growled Copplestone. If I tell you the truth, you won't like it, and if I were to try to tell you a lie, egad, I think the syllables would choke me. It has been hard enough for me to keep patience while all those idiots have been babbling their unmeaning compliments, and now that they've gone away to laugh at you behind your back, You'd better let me follow their example, and not risk the chance of a quarrel with an old friend by speaking my mind. You think me a fool, then, Copplestone? Why, what else can I think of you? If a man of fifty must needs go and marry a girl of nineteen, he can't expect to be thought a soul on. 
Ah, Copplestone, when you have seen my wife, you will think differently. Not a bit of it. The prettier she is, the more fool I shall think you, for there'll be so much more the certainty that shall make your life miserable. Here she comes, said the baronet. Look at her before you judge her too severely, old friend, and let her face answer for her truth. The room in which the two men were standing opened into another and larger apartment, and through the open folding doors Captain Copplestone saw Lady Eversleigh approaching. She was dressed in white, that pure, transparent muslin in which her husband loved best to see her, and one large natural rose was fastened amidst her dark hair. As she drew nearer to the baronet and his friend, the bluff old soldier's face softened. The introduction was made by Sir Oswald, and Honoria held out her hand with her brightest and most bewitching smile. "'My husband has spoken of you very often, Captain Copplestone,' she said, "'and I feel as if we were old friends rather than strangers. "'I have pleasure in bidding welcome to all Sir Oswald's guests, "'but not such pleasure as I feel in welcoming you.' "'The soldier extended his bronzed hand "'and grasped the soft white fingers in a pressure "'that was something like that of an iron vice.' He looked at Lady Eversleigh with a serio-comic expression of bewilderment, and looked from her to the baronet. "'Well,' said Sir Oswald presently, when Honoria had left them, "'Well, Oswald, if the truth be told, I think you had some excuse for your folly. She is a beautiful creature, and if there is any faith to be put in the human countenance, she is as good as she is beautiful.' The baronet grasped his friend's hand with a pressure that was more eloquent than words. He believed implicitly in the captain's powers of penetration, and this favorable judgment of the wife he adored filled him with gratitude. It was not that the faintest shadow of doubt obscured his own mind. He trusted her fully and unreservedly, but he wanted others to trust her also. While Sir Oswald and his friend were enjoying a brief interval of confidential intercourse. Reginald Eversleigh and Victor Carrington lounged in a pleasant little sitting-room, smoking their cigars and leaning on the stone sill of the wide Gothic window. They were talking, and talking very earnestly. "'You are a clever fellow, I know, my dear Carrington,' said Reginald. "'But it is slow work, very slow work, and I don't see my way through it.' "'because you are as impatient as a child who has set his heart on a new toy,' answered the surgeon disdainfully. "'You complain that the game is slow, and yet you see one move after another made upon the board, and made successfully. "'A month ago you did not believe in the possibility of a reconciliation between your uncle and yourself, "'and yet that reconciliation has come about. "'A fortnight ago?' "'You would have laughed at the idea of my being here at Raynham, an invited guest, and yet here I am. "'Do you think there has been no patient thought necessary to work out this much of our scheme? "'Do you suppose that I was on Thorpe Hill by accident that afternoon?' "'And you hope that something may come of your visit here?' "'I hope that much may come of it. "'I have already dared to drop hints at injustice done to you.' That idea of injustice will rankle in your uncle's mind. I have my plans, Reginald, and you have only to be patient and to trust in me. Why should you refuse to tell me the nature of your plans? Because my plans are as yet but half formed. I may soon be able to speak more plainly. Do you see those two figures yonder, walking in the plaisance? Yes, I see them. "'My uncle and his wife,' answered Reginald, with a gesture of impatience. "'They are very happy, are they not? "'It is quite an Arcadian picture. "'I beg you to contemplate it earnestly.' "'What a fool you are, Carrington!' cried the young man, flinging away his cigar. "'If my uncle chooses to make an idiot of himself, "'that is no reason why I should watch the evidence of his folly.' "'But there is another reason,' answered Victor, 
with a sinister look in his glittering black eyes. Look at the picture while you may, Reginald, for you will not have the chance of seeing it very often. What do you mean? I mean that the day is near at hand when Lady Eversleigh will fall from her high estate. I mean that an elevation as sudden as hers is often the forerunner of a sudden disgrace. The hour will come when Sir Oswald will mourn his fatal marriage as the one irrevocable mistake of his life, and when, in his despair, he will restore you, the disgraced nephew, to your place as his acknowledged heir, because you will at least seem to him more worthy than his disgraced wife. "'And who is to bring this about?' asked Reginald, gazing at his friend in complete bewilderment. "'I am,' answered the surgeon. "'But before I do so, I must have some understanding as to the price of my services. "'If the cat who pulled the chestnuts out of the fire for the benefit of the monkey "'had made an agreement beforehand as to how much of the plunder he was to receive for his pains, "'the name of the animal would not have become a byword with posterity.' When I have worked to win your fortune, I must have my reward, my dear Reginald. Do you suppose I should be ungrateful? Of course not. But, you see, I don't ask for your gratitude. I want a good round sum, down on the nail, hard cash. Your uncle's fortune, if you get two-thirds of it, will be worth thirty thousand a year. And for such a fortune you can very well afford to pay me twenty thousand in ready money, "'within two years of your accession to the inheritance. Twenty thousand? "'Yes. "'If you think the sum too much, we will say no more about it. "'The business is a very difficult one, "'and I scarcely care to engage in it. "'My dear Victor, you bewilder me. "'I cannot bring myself to believe "'that you can bring about my restoration "'to my old place in my uncle's will. "'But if you do... The twenty thousand shall be yours. Good, answered the surgeon, in his coolest and most businesslike manner. I must have it in black and white. You will give me two promissory notes, one for ten thousand, to fall due a year hence, the other for the same sum, to fall due in two years. But if I do not get the fortune, and I am not likely to get it within that time, my uncle's life is a good one, and— Never mind your uncle's life. I will give you an undertaking to cancel those notes of hand, if you have not succeeded to the reign of estates. And now here are stamps. You may as well fill in the body of the notes, and sign them at once, and so close the transaction. You are prepared with the stamps? Yes. I am a man of business, although a man of science. Victor! said Reginald Eversleigh. You sometimes make me shudder. There is something almost diabolical about you. But if I drag yonder fair lady down from her high estate, you would scarcely care if I were the foul fiend in person, said Carrington, looking at his friend with a sardonic smile. Oh, I think I know you, Reginald Eversleigh, better than you know me. Amongst the guests who had arrived at the castle within the last few days was Lydia Graham, the young lady of whom the baronet had spoken to his nephew. She was a fascinating girl, with a bold, handsome face, brilliant gray eyes, an aquiline nose, and a profusion of dark, waving hair. She was a woman who knew how to make the most of every charm with which nature had endowed her. She dressed superbly but with an extravagance far beyond the limits of her means. She was, for this reason, deeply in debt, and her only chance of extrication from her difficulties lay in a brilliant marriage. For nearly nine years she had been trying to make this brilliant marriage. She had come out, as the phrase goes, at seventeen, and she was now nine and twenty. During that period she had been wooed and flattered by troops of admirers. She had reveled in flirtations. She had triumphed in the power of her beauty. But she had known more than one disappointment of her fairest hopes, and she had not won the prize in the great lottery of fashionable life, 
a wealthy and patrician husband. Her nine-and-twentieth birthday had passed, and contemplating herself earnestly in her glass, she was fain to confess that something of the brilliancy of her beauty had faded. "'I am getting wan and sallow,' she said to herself. "'What is to become of me if I do not marry?' The prospect was indeed a sorry one. Lydia Graham possessed an income of two hundred a year, inherited from her mother, but such an income was the merest pittance for a young lady with Miss Graham's tastes. Her brother was a captain of an expensive regiment, selfish and extravagant, and by no means inclined to open his purse for his sister's benefit. She had no home, but lived sometimes with one wealthy relation, sometimes with another, always admired, always elegantly dressed, but not always happy. Amidst all Miss Graham's matrimonial disappointments, she had endured none more bitter than that which she had felt when she read the announcement of Sir Oswald Eversleigh's marriage in the Times newspaper. She had met the rich baronet very frequently in society. She had visited at Raynham with her brother. Sir Oswald had, to all appearance, admired her beauty and accomplishments, and she had imagined that time and opportunity alone were wanting to transform that admiration into a warmer feeling. In plain words, Lydia Graham had hoped, with a little good management, to become Lady Eversleigh of Raynham, and no words can fully describe her mortification when she learnt that the baronet had bestowed his name and fortune on a woman of whom the fashionable world knew nothing, except that she was utterly unknown. Lydia Graham came to Raynham Castle with poisonous feelings rankling in her heart, but she wore her brightest smiles as well as her most elegant dresses. She congratulated the baronet in honeyed words, and offered warmest friendship to the lovely mistress of the mansion. "'I am sure we shall suit each other delightfully, dear Lady Eversleigh,' she said, "'and we shall be fast friends henceforward, shall we not?' Honoria's disposition was naturally reserved. She revolted against frivolous and unmeaning sentimentality. She responded politely to Miss Graham's proffers of friendship, but not with corresponding warmth. Lydia Graham perceived the coldness of her manner, and bitterly resented it. She felt that she had reason to hate this woman, who had caused the disappointment of her dearest hopes, whose beauty was infinitely superior to her own, and who was several years younger than herself. There was one person at Raynham whose scrutinizing eyes perceived the animosity of feeling lurking beneath Lydia Graham's smooth manner. That penetrating observer was Victor Carrington. He saw that the fashionable beauty hated Lady Eversleigh, and he resolved to make use of her hatred for the furtherance of his schemes. "'I fancy Miss Graham has at some time of her life cherished an idea that she might become mistress of this place, eh, Reginald?' he said one morning as the two men lounged together on the terrace. "'How did you know that?' said Reginald, questioning and replying at once. "'By no diabolical power of divination, I assure you, my dear Reginald,' I have only used my eyes. But it seems from your exclamation that I am right. Miss Graham did once hope to become Lady Eversleigh. Well, I believe she tried her uttermost to win my uncle for a husband. I have watched her maneuvers when she was here two years ago. But they did not give me much uneasiness, for I thought Sir Oswald was a confirmed bachelor. She used to vary her amusements by flirting with me. I was the acknowledged heir in those days, you know, and I have no doubt she would have married me if I had given her the opportunity. But she is too clever a woman for my taste, and with all her brilliancy I never admired her. You are wise for once in the way, my dear Reginald. Miss Graham is a dangerous woman. She has a very beautiful smile, but she is the sort of woman who can smile and murder while she smiles. But— she may be made a very useful tool, notwithstanding. A tool? Yes, a good workman takes his tools wherever he finds them. I may be in want of just such a tool as Lydia Graham. 
all went merry as a marriage bell at Raynham Castle during the bright August weather. The baronet was unspeakably happy. Honoria, too, was happy in the novelty of her position, happy in the knowledge of her husband's love. His noble nature had won the reward such nature should win. He was beloved by his young wife, as few men are beloved in the heyday of their youth. Her affection was reverential, profound, and pure. To her mind, Oswald Eversleigh was the perfection of all that is noble in mankind, and she was proud of his devotion, grateful of his love. No guest at the castle was more popular than Victor Carrington, the surgeon. His accomplishments were of so varied a nature as to make him invaluable in a large party, and he was always ready to devote himself to the amusement of others. Sir Oswald was astonished at the versatility of his nephew's friend. As a linguist, an artist, a musician, Victor alike shone preeminent. But in music he was triumphant, professing only to be an amateur. He exhibited a scientific knowledge, a mechanical proficiency, as rare as they were admirable. "'A poor man is obliged to study many arts,' he said carelessly, when Sir Oswald complimented him on his musical powers. My life has been one of laborious industry, and the cultivation of music has been almost the only relaxation I have allowed myself. I am not, like Lady Eversleigh, a musical genius. I only pretend to be a patient student of the great masters. The baronet was delighted with the musical talents of his guests, because they assisted much in the display of Lady Eversleigh's exceptional power. Victor Carrington's brilliant playing set off the magnificent singing of Honoria. With him as her accompanist, she sang as she could not sing without his aid. Every evening there was an impromptu concert in the long drawing-room. Every evening Lady Eversleigh sang to Victor Carrington's accompaniment. One evening in the summer dusk, when she had been singing even more superbly than usual. Lydia Graham happened to be seated near Sir Oswald, in one of the broad open windows. "'Lady Eversleigh is indeed a genius,' said Miss Graham, at the close of a superb bravura. "'But how delightful for her to have that accomplished Mr. Carrington to accompany her, though some people prefer to play their own accompaniments. I do, for instance— but when one has a relative who plays so well, it is, of course, a different thing. A relative? I don't understand you, my dear Miss Graham. I mean that it is very nice for Lady Eversleigh to have a cousin who is so accomplished a musician. A cousin? Yes. Mr. Carrington is Lady Eversleigh's cousin, is he not? Or, I beg your pardon, perhaps he is her brother. I don't know your wife's maiden name. My wife's maiden name was Milford, answered the baronet, with some displeasure in his tone. And Mr. Carrington is neither her brother nor her cousin. He is no relation whatever to her. Indeed, exclaimed Miss Graham. There was a strange significance in that word, indeed. And after having uttered it, the young lady seemed seized with a sudden sense of embarrassment. Sir Oswald looked at her sharply, but her face was half averted from him, as if she had turned away in confusion. "'You seem surprised,' he said haughtily, "'and yet I do not see anything surprising in the fact that my wife and Mr. Carrington are not related to each other.' "'Oh, dear no, Sir Oswald, of course not,' replied Lydia with a light laugh which had the artificial sound of a laugh intended to disguise some painful embarrassment. Of course not. It was very absurd of me to appear surprised, if I did really appear so, but I was not aware of it. You see, it was scarcely strange if I thought Lady Eversleigh and Mr. Carrington were nearly related, for when people are very old friends, they seem like relations. It is only in name that there is any difference." "'You seem determined to make mistakes this evening, Miss Graham,' answered the baronet with icy sternness. "'Lady Eversleigh and Mr. Carrington are by no means old friends. 
"'Neither my wife nor I have known the gentleman more than a fortnight. "'He happens to be a very accomplished musician, "'and is good enough to make himself useful "'in accompanying Lady Eversleigh when she sings. "'That is the only claim which he has on her friendship, "'and it is one of only a few days standing.' "'Indeed!' said Miss Graham, "'repeating the exclamation which had sounded so disagreeable to Sir Oswald. "'I certainly should have mistaken them for old friends. "'But then dear Lady Eversleigh is of Italian extraction, "'and there is always a warmth of manner, "'an absence of reserve in the southern temperament, "'which is foreign to our colder natures.' "'Lady Eversleigh rose from her seat just at this moment "'in compliance with the entreaties of the circle about her. "'She approached the grand piano, where Victor Carrington was still sitting, "'turning over the leaves of some music, "'and at the same moment Sir Oswald rose also and hurried towards her. "'Do not sing any more to-night, Honoria,' he said. "'You will fatigue yourself.' There was some lack of politeness in this speech, as Lady Eversleigh was about to sing in compliance with the entreaties of her guests. She turned to her husband with a smile. "'I am not in the least tired, my dear Oswald,' she said. "'And if our friends really wish for another song, I am quite ready to sing one. That is to say, if Mr. Carrington is not tired of accompanying me.' Victor Carrington declared that nothing gave him greater pleasure than to play Lady Eversleigh's accompaniments. "'Mr. Carrington is very good,' answered the baronet coldly, "'but I do not wish you to tire yourself by singing all the evening, "'and I beg that you will not sing again to-night, Honoria.' Never before had the baronet addressed his wife with such cold decision of manner. There was something almost severe in his tone, and Honoria looked at him with wondering eyes. "'I have no greater pleasure than in obeying you,' she said gently, as she withdrew from the piano. She seated herself by one of the tables, and opened a portfolio of sketches. Her head drooped over the book, and she seemed absorbed in the contemplation of the drawings. Glancing at her furtively, Sir Oswald could see that she was wounded, and yet he, the adoring husband, the devoted lover, did not approach her. His mind was disturbed, his thoughts confused. He passed through one of the open windows, and went out upon the terrace. There all was calm and tranquil, but the tranquil loveliness of the scene had no soothing influence on Sir Oswald. His brain was on fire. An intense affection can scarcely exist without a lurking tendency to jealousy. Until to-night... Every jealous feeling had been lulled to rest by the confiding trust of the happy husband, but to-night a few words, spoken in apparent carelessness, spoken by one who could have, as Sir Oswald thought, no motive for malice, had aroused the sleeping passion, and peace had fled from his heart. As Sir Oswald passed the window by which he had left Lydia Graham, he heard that young lady talking to someone. "'It is positively disgraceful,' she said. "'Her flirtation with that Mr. Carrington is really too obvious, "'though Sir Oswald is so blind as not to perceive it. "'I thought they were cousins until to-night. "'Imagine my surprise when I found that they were not even distantly related, "'that they have actually only known each other for a fortnight. "'The woman must be a shameless flirt.' "'and the man is evidently an adventurer.' "'The poisoned arrow shot to its mark. "'Sir Oswald believed that these words "'had never been intended to reach his ears. "'He did not for a moment suspect "'that Lydia Graham had recognized "'his approaching figure on the moonlit terrace "'and had uttered these words to her friend on purpose "'that they should reach his ears. "'How should a true-hearted man suspect a woman's malice?' How should he fathom the black depths of wickedness to which a really false and heartless woman can descend? He did not know that Lydia Graham had ever hoped to be mistress of his home. He did not know that she was inspired by fury against himself, by passionate envy of his wife. To him her words seemed only the careless slander of society, and experience had shown him that in such slanders there lurked generally some leaven of truth. 
I will not doubt her, he thought as he walked onward in the moonlight, too proud and too honorable to linger in order to hear anything more that Miss Graham might have to say. I will not doubt the wife I love so fondly, because idle tongues are already busy with her fair fame. Already! We have not been married two months, and already evil tongues drop the poison of doubt into my ear. It seems too cruel. But I will watch her with this man. Her ignorance of the world may have caused her to be more familiar with him than the rigid usages of society would permit, and yet she is generally so dignified, so reserved, apt to err on the side of coldness rather than of warmth. I must watch. I must watch. Never before had Sir Oswald known the anguish of distrust, but his was an impulsive nature, easily swayed by the force of any absorbing passion. Blindly, unquestionably, as he had abandoned himself to his love for Honoria Milford, so now he abandoned himself to the jealous doubts inspired by a malicious woman's lying tongue. That night his slumbers were broken and feverish. The next day he set himself to watch his wife and Victor Carrington. The mind, imbued with suspicion, contemplates everything in a distorted light. Victor Carrington was especially attentive to the mistress of the castle. It was not that he talked to her, or usurped more of her society than his position warranted, but he devoted himself to her service with a slavish watchfulness which was foreign to the manner of an ordinary guest. Wherever Lady Eversleigh went, Carrington's eyes followed her. Every wish of hers seemed to be divined by him. If she lingered for a few moments by an open window, Mr. Carrington was at hand with her shawl. If she was reading, and the leaves of her book required to be cut open, the surgeon had procured her a paper-knife before she could suffer inconvenience or delay. If she went to the piano, he was at the instrument before her, ready to adjust her chair, to arrange her music. In another man, these attentions might have appeared very commonplace, but so quiet a foot, so subdued a voice was Victor Carrington, that there seemed something stealthy, something secret in his devotion, something which had no right to exist. One long day of patient watchfulness revealed all this to Sir Oswald Eversleigh, and with the revelation came a new and terrible agony. How far was his wife to blame for all that was exceptional in the surgeon's manner? Was she aware of his devotion? Did she encourage this silent and stealthy worship? She did not at any rate discourage it, since she permitted it. The baronet wondered whether Victor Carrington's manner impressed others as it impressed himself. One person had, he knew, been scandalized by the surgeon's devotion to Lady Eversleigh, and had spoken of it in the plainest terms. But did other eyes see as Lydia Graham and he himself had seen? He determined on questioning his nephew as to the character of the gentlemanly and accomplished surgeon, whom an impulse of kindness had prompted him to welcome under his roof, an impulse which he now bitterly regretted. "'Your friend, Mr. Carrington, is very attentive to Lady Eversleigh,' said Sir Oswald to Reginald, with a pitiable attempt at indifference of manner. "'Is he generally so devoted in his attention to ladies?' "'On the contrary, my dear uncle,' answered Reginald, with an appearance of carelessness, which was as well assumed as that of his kinsman, was awkward and constrained. "'Victor Carrington generally entertains the most profound contempt for the fair sex. He is devoted to the science of chemistry, you know, and in London passes the best part of his life in his laboratory. But then Lady Eversleigh is such a superior person.' "'It is no wonder he admires her.' "'He admires her very much, then?' "'Amazingly, if I can judge by what he said when first he became acquainted with her. "'He has grown more reserved lately.' "'Oh, indeed, he has grown more reserved lately, has he?' asked the baronet, "'whose suspicions were fed by every word his nephew uttered. "'Yes.' "'I suppose he thinks I might take objection to his enthusiastic admiration of Lady Eversleigh. "'Very absurd of him, is it not? "'For, of course, my dear uncle, 
you cannot feel otherwise than proud when you see your beautiful young wife surrounded by worshippers and one devotee more or less at the shrine can make little difference these words carelessly spoken galled sir oswald to the quick but he tried to conceal his pain and parted from his nephew with affected gaiety of spirit alone in his own study he pondered long and moodily over the events of the day he shrank from the society of his wife her tender words irritated him he began to think those soft and loving accents were false more than once he answered honoria's anxious questions as to the cause of his gloom with a harshness that terrified her she saw that her husband was changed and knew not whence the change arose and this vagrant's nature was a proud one her own manner changed to the man who had elevated her from the very mire to a position of splendor and honor. She, too, became reserved, and a cruel breach yawned between the husband and wife, who, a few short days before, had been so happily united. Truly Victor Carrington's schemes prospered. Reginald Eversleigh looked on in silent wonder too base to oppose himself to the foul plot which was being concocted under his eyes. Whatever the schemer bade him do, he did without shame or scruple. Before him glittered the dazzling vision of future fortune. A week elapsed, a weary week for Sir Oswald Eversleigh, for every day and every hour seemed to widen the gulf between himself and his wife. Conscious of her innocence of the smallest offense against the man she truly and honestly loved, Honoria was too proud to sue for an explanation of that mysterious change which had banished all happiness and peace from her breast. More than once she had asked the cause of her husband's gloom of manner. More than once she had been coldly, almost rudely, repulsed. She sought, therefore, to question him no further— but held herself aloof from him with proud reserve. The cruel estrangement cost her dear, but she waited for Sir Oswald to break the ice. She waited for him to explain the meaning of his altered conduct. In the meantime, she performed all her duties as mistress of the mansion with the same calm grace which had distinguished her from the first hour of her elevation to her new position. But the struggle was a painful one, and left its traces on her beautiful face. Sir Oswald perceived the change in that lovely countenance, and his jealousy distorted this change into a damning evidence against her. This man's devotion has touched her heart, he thought. It is of him she is thinking when she is silent and pensive. She loves me no longer. Fool that I am, she never loved me. She saw in me a dupe, ready to lift her from obscurity into the place she longed to occupy. And now that place is hers. She need no longer care to blindfold the eyes of her dupe. She may please herself, and enjoy the attentions of more agreeable adorers. Then, in the next moment, remorse took possession of the baronet's heart, and for a while he fancied that he had wronged his wife. "'Is she to blame because this man loves her?' he asked himself. She may not even be aware of his love, though my watchful eyes have penetrated the secret. Oh, if I could only take her away from Raynham without delay this very moment, or if I could clear the castle of all this frivolous, selfish, heartless gang, what happiness it would be! But I can do neither. I have invited these people, and I must play my part to the end. Even this Victor Carrington I dare not send out of my house, for, in so doing, I should confirm the suspicions of Lydia Graham, and all who think like her. Thus mused Sir Oswald as he paced the broad terrace walk alone, while his guests were enjoying themselves in different parts of the castle and grounds, and while Lady Eversleigh spent the summer afternoon in her own apartments, brooding sadly on her husband's unkindness. There was one person to whom, in any ordinary trouble of mind, Sir Oswald Eversleigh would have most certainly turned for consolation, and that person was his old and tried friend, Captain Copplestone. But the jealous doubts which racked his brain were not to be revealed, even to this faithful friend. There was bitter humiliation in the thought of opening those bleeding wounds which had so newly lacerated his heart. 
If Captain Copplestone had been near his friend in the hour of his trouble, he might perhaps have wrung the baronet's secret from him in some unguarded moment. But within the last week the captain had been confined to his own apartments by a violent attack of gout, and except a brief daily visit of inquiry, Sir Oswald had seen nothing of him. He was very carefully tended, however, in his hours of suffering. Even her own anxiety of mind did not render Lady Eversleigh forgetful of her husband's invalid friend. Every day, and many times a day, the captain received some new evidence of her thoughtful care. It pleased her to do this. Apart from her natural inclination to be kind to the suffering and friendless, for the soldier was her husband's valued friend, and in testifying her respect for him, it seemed to her as if she were in some manner proving her devotion to the husband from whom she had become so mysteriously estranged. Amongst the many plans which had been set on foot for the amusement of the guests at Raynham, there was one on which all the visitors, male and female, had especially set their hearts. This much-talked-of entertainment was a picnic to take place at a celebrated spot whose picturesque loveliness was supposed to be unrivaled in Chapter 8 of Run to Earth, a Novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 8 After the Picnic The place was called the Wizard's Cave. It was a gigantic grotto, near which flowed a waterfall of surpassing beauty. A wild extent of woodland stretched on one side of this romantic scene. On the other, a broad moor spread wide before a range of hills, one of which was crowned by the ruins of an old Norman castle that had stood many a siege in days gone by. It would have been difficult to select a spot better adapted for a picnic, and some of the gentlemen who had ridden over to inspect the scene were rapturous in their praises of its sylvan beauty. The cave lay within ten miles of Raynham. "'Just the distance for a delightful drive,' said the ladies, and from the moment that Sir Oswald had proposed the entertainment, there had been perpetual discussion of the arrangements necessary, the probability of fine weather, and the date to be finally chosen. The baronet had proposed this rustic fete when his own heart had been light and happy. Now he looked forward to the day with a sickening dread of its weariness. Others would be happy, but the sound of mirthful voices and light laughter would fall with a terrible discordance on the ear of the man whose mind was tortured by hidden doubts. Sir Oswald was too courteous a host to disappoint his visitors. All the preparations for the rustic festival were duly made, and on the appointed morning a train of horses and carriages drew up in a line in the quadrangle of the castle. It would have been impossible to imagine a brighter picture of English life, and as the guests emerged in groups from the wide arched doorway and took their places in the carriages or sprang lightly into their saddles, the spectacle grew more and more enlivening. Lydia Graham had done her utmost to surpass all rivals on this important day. Wealthy country squires and rich young lordlings were to be present at the festival, and the husband huntress might, perchance, find a victim among these eligible bachelors. Deeply as she was already in debt, Miss Graham had written to her French milliner, imploring her to send her a costume, regardless of expense, and promising a speedy payment of at least half her long-standing account. The fair and false Lydia did not scruple to hint at the possibility of her making a brilliant matrimonial alliance ere many months were over, in order that this hope might beguile the long-suffering milliner into giving further credit. The fashionable beauty was not disappointed. The milliner sent the costume ordered, but wrote to inform Miss Graham, with all due circumlocution and politeness, that, 
unless her long-standing account were quickly settled, legal proceedings must be taken. Lydia threw the letter aside with a frown, and proceeded to inspect her dress, which was perfect in its way. But Miss Graham could scarcely repress a sigh of envy as she looked at Lady Eversleigh's more simple toilet, and perceived that, with all its appearance of simplicity, it was twice as costly as her own more gorgeous attire. The jewels, too, were worth more than all the trinkets Lydia possessed, and she knew that the treasures of Lady Eversleigh's jewel-cases were almost inexhaustible. With such a lavish hand had her husband heaped his gifts upon her. "'Perhaps he will not be so liberal with his presence in future,' thought the malicious and disappointed woman, as she looked at Honoria, and acknowledged to her own envious heart that never had she seen her look more beautiful, more elegant, or more fitted to adorn the position which Miss Graham would willingly have persuaded herself she disgraced. "'If he thinks that her love is bestowed upon another, he will scarcely find such delight in future in offering her costly tributes of affection.' There was a great deal of discussion as to who should occupy the different carriages, but at last all was arranged apparently to every one's satisfaction. There were many who had chosen to ride, and among the equestrians was Sir Oswald himself. For the first time in any excursion, the baronet deserted his accustomed place by the side of his wife. Honoria deeply felt the slight involved in this desertion, but she was too proud to entreat him to alter his arrangements. She saw his favorite horse brought round to the broad steps. She saw her husband mount the animal without a word of remonstrance, without so much as a reproachful glance, though her heart was swelling with passionate indignation. And then she took her place in the barouche, and allowed the gentleman standing near to assist her in the arrangement of the shawls and carriage rugs which were provided in case of change of weather. Sir Oswald was not slow to remark that appearance of indifference. When once estrangement has arisen between those who truly love each other, everything tends to widen the breach. The jealous husband had chosen to separate himself from his wife in a sudden impulse of angry distrust, but he was still more angry still more distrustful, when he saw her apparent carelessness of his desertion. "'She is happier without me,' he thought bitterly, as he drew his horse on one side, and watched all that took place around the barouche. "'Unrestrained by my presence, she will be free to revel in the flatteries of her younger admirers. She will be perfectly happy, for she will forget for a while that she is chained for life to a husband whom she does not love.' A silvery laugh from Honoria seemed to answer his thoughts, and to confirm his suspicions. He little dreamed that laugh was assumed, in order to deceive the malicious Lydia, who had just uttered a polite little speech, intended to wound the mistress of Raynham. The baronet kept his horse a little way behind the carriage, and watched his wife with jealous and angry eyes. Lydia Graham had taken her seat in the barouche, and there was now a slight discussion as to the gentleman who should accompany the two ladies. Many were eager for the privilege, and the occasion was a fitting one for the display of feminine coquetry. Miss Graham did not neglect the opportunity, and after a little animated conversation between the lady and a young fop who was heir to a peerage, the lordling took his place opposite the fashionable beauty. The second place still remained unoccupied. The baronet waited with painful eagerness to see who would take this place, for amongst the gentlemen grouped about the door of the carriage was Victor Carrington. Sir Oswald had not to wait long. He ground his teeth in a sudden access of jealous fury as he saw the young surgeon step lightly into the vehicle and seat himself opposite Lady Eversleigh. He took it for granted that it was on that lady's invitation the young man occupied this place of honour. He did not for a moment imagine that it was at Lydia Graham's entreaty the surgeon had taken his seat in the barouche, and yet it was so. "'Do come with us, Mr. Carrington,' Lydia had said. 
I know that you are well versed in county history and archaeology, and will be able to tell us all manner of interesting facts connected with the villages and churches we pass on our road. Lydia Graham hated Honoria for having won the proud position she herself had tried so hard to attain. She hated Sir Oswald for having chosen another in preference to herself, and she was determined to be revenged on both. She knew that her hints had already had their effect on the baronet, and she now sought, by every base and treacherous trick, to render Honoria Eversleigh an object of suspicion in the eyes of her husband. She had a double game to play, for she sought at once to gratify her ambition and her thirst for revenge. On one hand, she wished to captivate Lord Sumner Howden. On the other, she wanted to widen the gulf between Sir Oswald and his wife. She little knew that she was only playing into the hands of a deeper and more accomplished schemer than herself. She little thought that Victor Carrington's searching glance had penetrated the secrets of her heart, and that he watched her malicious maneuvers with a calm sense of amusement. Though August had already given place to September, the weather was warm and balmy, as in the full glory of midsummer. Sir Oswald rode behind Lady Eversleigh's barouche, too remote to hear the words that were spoken by those who occupied the vehicle, but quite near enough to distinguish the tones and the laughter, and to perceive every gesture. He saw Victor bend forward to address Honoria. He saw that deferential and devoted manner which had so much offended him since he had first set himself to watch the surgeon and Lady Eversleigh did not discourage her admirer. She let him talk. She seemed interested in his conversation. And, as Lydia Graham and Lord Howden were entirely occupied with each other, the conversation between Honoria was a complete tete-a-tete. The young man's handsome head bent lower and lower over the plumed hat of Lady Eversleigh, and with every step of that ten-mile journey, the cloud that overshadowed the baronet's mind grew more profound in its fatal gloom. He no longer struggled against his doubts. He abandoned himself altogether to the passion that held possession of him. But the eyes of the world were on Sir Oswald, and he was obliged to meet those unpitying eyes with a smile. The long line of equipages drew up at last on the margin of a wood. The pleasure-seekers alighted, and wandered about in twos and threes amongst the umbrageous pathways which led towards the wizard's cave. After alighting from the barouche, Lady Eversleigh waited to see if her husband would approach her and offer his arm. She had a faint hope that he would do so, even in spite of his evident estrangement, but her hope was cruelly disappointed. Sir Oswald walked straight to a portly dowager and offered to escort her to the cave. "'Do you remember a picnic here twenty years ago, at which you and I danced together by moonlight, Lady Hetherington?' he said. "'We old folks have pleasant memories of the past, and are the fittest companions for each other. The young people can enjoy themselves much better without the restraint of our society.' He said this loud enough for his wife to hear. She did hear every word, and felt there was hidden significance in that careless speech." For a moment she was inclined to break down the icy barrier of reserve. The words which she wanted to speak were almost on her lips. "'Let me go with you, Oswald.' But in the next instant she met her husband's eyes, and their cold gaze chilled her heart. At the same moment Victor Carrington offered her his arm, with his accustomed deferential manner. She accepted the proffered arm, scarcely knowing who offered it, so deeply did she feel her husband's unkindness. "'What have I done to offend him?' she thought. "'What is this cruel mystery which divides us, and which is almost breaking my heart?' "'Come, Lady Eversleigh,' cried several voices. "'We want you to accompany us to the wizard's cave.' Nothing could be more successful than the picnic. Elegantly dressed women— and aristocratic-looking men wandered here and there amidst the woodland and by the margin of the waterfall, sometimes in gay little parties whose talk and laughter rang out clearly on the balmy air, sometimes strolling tete-a-tete -tete, 
and engaged in conversations of a more confidential character. Half hidden by the foliage of a little thicket of pollard oaks, there was a military band, whose services Sir Oswald had obtained from a garrison town some twenty miles from Raynham, and the stirring music added much to the charm of the festival. Lydia Graham was as happy as it is possible for any evil-minded woman to be. Her envious feelings were lulled to temporary rest by the enjoyment of her own triumphs, for the young lordling seemed to be completely subjugated by her charms, and devoted himself exclusively to attendance upon her. The scheming beauty's heart thrilled with a sense of triumph. She thought that she had at last made a conquest that might be better worth the making than any of those past conquests, which had all ended in such bitter disappointments. She looked at Lady Eversleigh with flashing eyes, as she remembered that by the subjugation of this empty-headed young nobleman she might attain a higher position and greater wealth than that enjoyed by Sir Oswald's envied wife. As Lady Sumner Howden, I could look down upon the mistress of Raynham Castle, she thought. As Countess of Vandeleuse, I should take precedence of nobler women than Lady Eversleigh. The day waned. The revellers lingered long over the splendid collation, served in a marquee which had been sent from York for the occasion. The banquet seemed a joyous one, enlivened by the sound of laughter, the popping of champagne corks, the joyous talk that emanated alike from the really light-hearted and those whose gaiety is only a mockery and a sham. The sun was sloping westward when Lady Eversleigh arose, absent and despondent, to give the signal for the withdrawal of the ladies. As she did so, she looked to the other end of the marquee, to the table where her husband had been seated. To her surprise, his place was empty. Throughout the whole day, Honoria had been a prey to gloomy forebodings. The estrangement between herself and her husband was so unexpected, so inexplicable, that she was powerless to struggle against the sense of misery and bewilderment which it had occasioned in her mind. Again and again she asked herself what had she done to offend him. Again and again she pondered over the smallest and most insignificant actions— the lightest words of the past few weeks, in order to discover some clue to the mystery of Sir Oswald's altered conduct. But the past afforded her no such clue. She had said nothing, she had done nothing, which could offend the most sensitive of men. Then a new and terrible light began to dawn upon her. She remembered her wretched extraction, the pitiable condition in which the baronet had discovered her, and she began to think that he repented of his marriage. "'He regrets his folly, and I am hateful in his eyes,' thought Honoria, "'for he remembers my degraded position, the mystery of my past life. "'He has heard sneering words and cruel innuendos fall from the lips of his fashionable friends, perhaps, "'and he is ashamed of his marriage. "'He little knows how gladly I would release him from the tie that binds us.' if indeed it has grown hateful to him. Thus musing and wandering alone in one of the forest pathways, for she had outstripped her guests, and sought a little relief for her overwrought spirits, constrained to the courtesies of her position for the moment, she scarcely knew whither. She came presently upon a group of grooms, who were lounging before a rough canvas tent, which had been erected for the accommodation of the horses. "'Is Orestes in that tent, Plummer?' she asked of the old groom, who generally attended her in her rides and drives. "'No, my lady. Sir Oswald had him saddled a quarter of an hour ago, and rode him away.' "'Sir Oswald has gone away?' "'Yes, my lady. He got a message, I think, while he was sitting at dinner, and he rode off as fast as he could go, across the moor. It's the nighest way to the castle, you know, my lady.' though it ain't the pleasantest. Honoria grew very uneasy. What was the meaning of this sudden departure? "'Do you know who brought the message from Raynham? she asked the groom. "'No, indeed, my lady. I don't even know for sure and certain that the message was from Raynham. I only guess as much.' "'Why did Sir Oswald not take you with him?' "'I can't say, my lady. 
I asked Master if I wasn't to go with him, and he said no, he would rather be alone. This was all that Honoria could learn from the groom. She walked back towards the marquee, whence the sound of voices and laughter grew louder as the sun sank across the broad expanse of moorland. The ladies of the party had gathered together on a broad patch of velvet greensward, near the oak thicket where the band was stationed. Here the younger members of the party were waltzing merrily to the accompaniment of one of Strauss's sweetest waltzes, while the elders sat here and there on camp stools or fallen logs of trees, and looked on or indulged in a little agreeable gossip. Honoria Eversleigh made her way unobserved to the marquee, and approached one of the openings less used and less crowded than the others. Here she found a servant, whom she sent into the marquee with a message for Mr. Eversleigh, to inquire if he could explain Sir Oswald's sudden departure. The man entered the tent in obedience to his mistress, and Lady Eversleigh seated herself on a camp-stool at a little distance, awaiting the issue of her message. She had been waiting only a few minutes, when she saw Victor Carrington approaching her hurriedly, not from the marquee, but from the pathway by which she herself had come. There was an unwanted agitation about his manner as he approached her, which, in her present state of nervous apprehension, filled her with alarm. She went to meet him, pale and trembling. "'I have been looking for you everywhere, Lady Eversleigh,' he said hurriedly. "'You have been looking for me?' "'Something has happened, then. Sir Oswald?' "'Yes, it is, unhappily, of Sir Oswald, I have to speak.' "'Speak quickly, then. What has happened? You are agonizing me, Mr. Carrington. For pity's sake, speak. Your face fills me with fear.' "'Your fears are, unhappily, too well founded. Sir Oswald has been thrown from his horse, on his way across the moor, and lies dangerously hurt at the ruins of Yarborough Tower.' that black building on the edge of the moor yonder. A lad has just brought me the tidings. Let me go to him. For heaven's sake, let me go at once. Dangerously hurt? He is dangerously hurt, you say? I fear so, from the boy's account. And we have no medical man among our company. Yes, you are a surgeon. You can be of assistance. I trust so, my dear Lady Eversleigh. I shall hurry to Sir Oswald immediately. "'and in the meantime they have sent from the tower for medical help.' "'I must go to him,' said Honoria wildly. "'Call the servants, Mr. Carrington. "'My carriage, this moment.' "'She could scarcely utter the words in her excitement. "'Her voice had a choking sound, "'and but for the surgeon's supporting arm "'she must have fallen prone on the grass at his feet. "'As she clung to his arm, "'as she gasped out her eager entreaties, that he would take her to her husband. A faint rustling stirred the underwood beneath some sycamores at a little distance, and curious eyes peered through the foliage. Lydia Graham had happened to stroll that way. Her curiosity had been excited by the absence of Lady Eversleigh from among her guests, and being no longer occupied by her flirtation with the young Viscount, she had set out in search of the missing Honoria. She was amply rewarded for her trouble— by the scene which she beheld from her hiding-place among the sycamores. She saw Victor and Lady Eversleigh talking to each other with every appearance of agitation. She saw the baronet's wife clinging in some wild terror to the arm of the surgeon, and she began to think that Honoria Eversleigh was indeed the base and guilty wretch she would fain have represented her. Lydia Graham was too far from the two figures to hear a word that was spoken— she could only watch their gestures, and draw her own inferences therefrom. "'My carriage, Mr. Carrington,' repeated Honoria. "'Why don't you call the servants?' "'One moment, Lady Eversleigh,' said the surgeon calmly. "'You must remember that on such an occasion as this there is nothing so important as presence of mind, self-command. If I alarm your servants, all the guests assembled here will take the alarm.' and they will rush helter-skelter to Yarborough Tower to testify their devotion to Sir Oswald, and to do him all the harm they possibly can. What would be the effect of a crowd of half-drunken men clustering round him with their noisy expressions of sympathy? What I have to propose is this. 
"'I am going to Sir Oswald immediately in my medical capacity. "'I have a gig and horse ready under that group of fir-trees yonder, "'the fastest horse and lightest vehicle I could find. "'If you will trust yourself in that vehicle behind that horse, "'I will drive you across the moor, "'and we shall reach the ruins in half an hour. "'Have you courage to come with me thus, Lady Eversleigh, "'quietly, unobserved by any one? "'Or will you wait for your barouche, "'and wait until the revellers yonder "'are all ready to start with you?' "'The voices came loudly from the Marquis "'as the surgeon spoke, "'and Honoria felt that he spoke wisely. "'You are right,' she said. "'These people must know nothing of the accident "'until my husband is safely back at Raynham. "'But you had better go and tell Plummer, the groom, "'to send the barouche after us. "'A carriage will be wanted to convey Sir Oswald from the tower, "'if he is fit to be moved.' "'True,' answered Victor. "'I will see to it.' "'And quickly,' cried Lady Eversleigh, "'go quickly, I implore.' "'You will find me by the fir-trees when you return, ready to start with you. "'Do not waste time in words, Mr. Carrington. "'Remember, it is a matter of life and death.' "'Victor left her, and she walked to the little grove of firs, "'where she found the gig of which he had spoken, "'and the horse standing near it, ready harnessed, "'and with his bridle fastened to a tree. Two pathways led to this fir-grove, a lower and an upper.' the upper completely screened by brushwood. Along this upper pathway, which was on the edge of a sloping bank, Lydia Graham made her way, careless what injury she inflicted on her costly dress, so eager was she to discover whither Lady Eversleigh was going. Completely hidden from Honoria, though at only a few paces' distance, Miss Graham waited to watch the proceedings of the baronet's wife. She was mystified by the appearance of the gig and horse, "'stationed in this out-of-the-way spot. "'She was still more mystified "'when she saw Lady Eversleigh clasp her hands before her face "'and stand for a few moments, motionless and statue-like, "'as if abandoned to despair. "'What does it all mean?' Miss Graham asked herself. "'Surely she cannot intend to elope with this Carrington. "'She may be wicked, but she cannot be so insane "'as to throw away wealth and position.' "'for the sake of this foreign adventurer. "'She waited almost breathless with excitement, "'crouching amongst the brushwood at the top of the woody bank, "'and looking downward towards the fir-grove with watchful eyes. "'She had not to wait long. "'Victor appeared in a few moments, out of breath from running. "'Have you given orders about the carriage?' "'Yes, I have given all necessary orders.' "'No more was said.' Victor handed Lady Eversleigh into the vehicle and drove away, slowly, while they were still on the edge of the wood, but accelerating his pace as they emerged upon the moorland. "'It is an elopement!' exclaimed Miss Graham, whose astonishment was unbounded. "'It is an elopement! The infamous creature has gone off with that penniless young man. And now, Sir Oswald?' "'I think you will have good reason to repent your fine romantic marriage "'with a base-born adventuress, whom nobody ever heard of "'until she burst forth upon the world as Lady Eversleigh of Raynham Castle. "'Filled with the triumphant delight of gratified malice, "'Lydia Graham went back to the broad greensward by the wizard's cave. "'The gentleman had now left the marquee. "'The full moon was rising, round and yellow on the horizon.' like a great globe of molten gold. Preparations had already commenced for the return, and the younger members of the party were busy discussing the arrangements of the homeward drive. The moonlight drive was looked forward to as one of the chief pleasures of the excursion. It would afford such glorious opportunities for flirtation. It would enable romantic young ladies to quote so much poetry about the moon and the summer night, while poetically disposed young gentlemen replied in the same strain. All was animation and excitement. The champagne and burgundy, the sparkling hawk and moselle, which had been consumed in the marquee, had only rendered the majority of the gentlemen more gallant and agreeable, and softly spoken compliments and tender pressures of pretty little delicately gloved hands testified to the devotion of the cavaliers who were to escort the band of fair ones homeward. 
Lydia Graham hoped that she would be able to take up the thread of her flirtation with Lord Howden exactly where it had dropped when she had risen to leave the dinner-table. She had thought it even possible that, if she could secure a tete-a-tete -tete drive home with the weak-brained young nobleman, she might lure him on until he made a formal proposal, from which he would find it no easy matter to recede. For Captain Graham was at his sister's call, and was a gentleman of no very yielding temper where his own interests were at stake. He had long been anxious that his sister should make a wealthy marriage, for her debts and difficulties annoyed him, and he felt that if she were well married he would be able to borrow money of her, instead of being pestered by her applications for assistance. Miss Graham was doomed to endure a disappointment. Lord Sumner Howden, was one of the few gentlemen upon whom iced champagne and moselle had produced anything but an exhilarating effect. He was dull and stupid, pallid and sleepy, like some great greedy schoolboy who has overeaten himself and is suffering the consequences of his gluttony. The fair Lydia had the mortification of hearing him tell one of the grooms to put him into a closed carriage where he could have a nap on his way home. Reginald Eversleigh took the lording seat in the barouche, which was the first in the line of carriages for the homeward journey, in spite of Honoria's entreaties to Victor Carrington. The young man was almost as dull and stupid to all appearance as Lord Sumner Howden, but although he had been drinking deeply, intoxication had nothing to do with his gloomy silence. He knew that Carrington's scheme had been ripening day by day, and he knew also that within a few hours the final blow was to be struck. He did not know the nature of that intended stroke of treachery, but he was aware that it would involve misery and humiliation for Sir Oswald, utter ruin and disgrace for Honoria. The very uncertainty as to the nature of the cruel plot made it all the more dreadful, and he waited with no very pleasant feelings for the development of his friend's scheme. When all was ready for the start, it was discovered that dear Lady Eversleigh was missing. Servants were sent in every direction to search for her, but with no avail. Sir Oswald was also missed, but Plummer, the old groom, informed Mr. Eversleigh that his uncle had left some hours before, and as some of the party had seen the baronet leave the dinner-table in compliance with a sudden summons, this occasioned little surprise. The next person missed was Victor Carrington. It was Lydia who drew attention to the fact of his absence. The party waited an hour, while search for Lady Eversleigh was renewed in every direction, while many of the guests expressed their fears that something must have happened to her, that she had wandered too far and lost her way in the wood, or that she had missed her footing on the edge of one of the deep pools by the cavern and had fallen into the water or that she had been attacked by ruffians. But in due time it was discovered that Mr. Carrington had been seen to take a gig from amongst the vehicles, and a lad who had been in charge of the gig and the horse belonging to it told the other servants that Mr. Carrington had said he wanted the vehicle to drive Lady Eversleigh home. She was tired, Mr. Carrington had said, and wanted to go home quietly. This information was brought to Reginald by one of the upper servants, and the question of Lady Eversleigh's disappearance being at once set at rest, the procession of carriages moved away in the moonlight. It really was too bad of dear Lady Eversleigh to give us such unnecessary alarm, said Lydia Graham. The lady who had taken the second place in the barouche agreed with this remark. I never was more alarmed in my life, she said. I felt sure that something very dreadful must have happened. And to think that Lady Eversleigh should prefer going home in a gig, said Lydia maliciously. For my part, I think a gig a most unpleasant vehicle. The other lady whispered something about Lady Eversleigh's humble extraction and her ignorance of the usages of society. You can't wonder at it, my dear, she murmured. For my part, I was surprised to see her so much at her ease in her new position. But you see, her ignorance has now betrayed her into a terrible breach of the proprieties. Her conduct is, to say the least of it, most eccentric. 
and you may depend no one here will ever forget this ride home in a gig with that clever young surgeon i don't suppose sir oswald will very much approve of such conduct nor i said lydia in the same subdued tone poor sir oswald what could he expect when he disgraced himself by such a marriage reginald eversleigh leaned back in the carriage with his arm folded and his eyes fixed on vacancy while the ladies gossiped in whispers end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Nine, on Yarborough Tower. No sooner had Victor Carrington got completely clear of the wood, than he drove his horse at a gallop. The light gig swayed from side to side and jolted violently several times on crossing some obstruction in the way. "'You are not afraid?' asked Victor. "'I am only afraid of delay,' answered Honoria calmly, for by this time she had recovered much of her ordinary firmness, and was prepared to face her sorrow with at least outward tranquillity. "'Tell me, Mr. Carrington, have you reason to think that my husband is in great danger?' "'I can tell you nothing for certain.' "'You know how stupid the country people are. "'The boy who brought the message told me that the gentleman had been thrown from his horse "'and was very much hurt. "'He was insensible and was injured about the head. "'I gathered from this, and from the boy's manner rather than his words, "'that the injuries were very serious. "'Why was Sir Oswald taken to such a wretched place as a ruined tower? "'Because the accident happened near the ruin.' "'and your husband was found by the people who have charge of the tower. "'And could they take him to no better place? "'No. There is no habitation of any kind within three miles.' "'No more was said. "'It was not very easy to talk while flying through the air "'at the utmost speed of a spirited horse. "'The moon bathed the broad moorland in mellow light.' The wide expanse of level turf looked like a sea of black water that had suddenly been frozen into stillness. Not a tree, not a patch of brushwood or a solitary bush broke the monotony of the scene, but far away against the moonlit horizon rose a wild and craggy steep, and on the summit of that steep appeared a massive tower with black and ruined battlements that stood out grimly against the luminous sky. This was Yarborough Tower, a stronghold that had defied many a besieging force in the obscure past, but of the origin of which little was now known. Victor Carrington drove the gig up a rough and narrow road that curved around the sides of the craggy hill and wound gradually towards the top. He was obliged to drive slowly here, and Lady Eversleigh had ample leisure to gaze upwards at the dreary-looking ruin, whose walls seemed more densely black as they grew nearer and nearer. "'What a horrible place,' she murmured, "'to think of my husband lying there, with no better shelter than those ruined walls, in the hour of his suffering.' Honoria Eversleigh looked around her with a shudder as the gig passed across a narrow wooden drawbridge that spanned an enormous chasm in the craggy hillside. She looked up at the tower. All was dark, and the dismal cry of a raven suddenly broke the awful stillness with a sound that was even yet more awful. "'Why are there no lights in the windows?' she asked. "'Surely Sir Oswald is not lying in the darkness.' "'I don't know.' "'The chamber in which they have placed him may be on the other side of the tower,' answered Victor briefly. "'And now, Lady Eversleigh, you must alight. "'We can go no further with the vehicle, and I must take it back to the other side of the drawbridge.' "'They had reached the entrance of the tower, an archway of solid masonry, over which the ivy hung like a sombre curtain. 
Honoria alighted and passed under the black shadow of the arch. "'You had better wait till I return, Lady Eversleigh,' said Victor. "'You will scarcely find your way without my help.' Honoria obeyed. Anxious as she was to reach Sir Oswald without a moment's unnecessary delay, she felt herself powerless to proceed without a guide, so dark was the interior of the tower. She heard the ravens shrieking hoarsely in the battlements above, and the ivy flapping in the evening wind, but she could hear nothing else. Victor came back to her in a few minutes. As he rejoined her, there was a noise of some ponderous object falling, with a grating and rattling of heavy chains. But Lady Eversleigh was too much absorbed by her own anxieties to feel any curiosity as to the origin of the sound. Come, said Victor, give me your hand, Lady Eversleigh, and let me guide you. She placed her hand in that of the surgeon. He led her to a steep staircase, formed by blocks of solid stone, which were rendered slippery by the moss that had gathered on them. It was a winding staircase, built in a turret, which formed one angle of the tower. Looking upwards, Honoria saw a gap in the roof, through which the moonlight shone bright, but there was no sign of any other light. "'Where is my husband?' she asked. "'I see no lights. I hear no voices.' The place seems like a tomb. Victor Carrington did not answer her question. Come, he said in a commanding voice. Follow me, Lady Eversleigh. He still held her hand, and she obeyed him, making her way with some difficulty up the steep and winding staircase. At last she found herself at the top. A narrow doorway opened before her, and following her companion through this doorway, she emerged on the roof of the tower. Around her were the ruined battlements, broken away altogether here and there. Below her was the craggy hillside, sloping downwards to the wide expanse of the moorland. Above her was the purple sky, flooded with the calm radiance of the moon. But there was no sign of human habitation, no sound of a human voice. "'Where is my husband, Mr. Carrington?' she cried, with a wild alarm, which had but that moment taken possession of her. "'This ruin is uninhabited. I saw the empty rooms through gaps in the broken wall as we came up that staircase. Where is my husband?' "'At Raynham Castle, Lady Eversleigh, to the best of my knowledge,' answered the surgeon with imperturbable calmness. He had seated himself on one of the broken battlements, in a lounging attitude, with one arm leaning on the ruined stone, and he was looking quietly out at the solitary expanse of barren waste, sleeping beneath the moonlight. Lady Eversleigh looked at him with a countenance that had grown rigid with horror and alarm. "'My husband at Raynham? At Raynham?' she repeated, as if she could not credit the evidence of her own ears. "'Am I mad, or are you mad, Mr. Carrington?' "'My husband at Raynham Castle, you say?' "'I cannot undertake to answer positively for the movements of any gentleman. "'But I should say that, at this present moment, Sir Oswald Eversleigh is in his own house, "'for which he started some hours ago. "'Then why am I here?' "'To answer that question clearly will involve the telling of a long story, Lady Eversleigh,' answered Victor. My motive for bringing you here concerns myself and another person. You are here to father the interests of two people, and those two people are Reginald Eversleigh and your humble servant. But the accident, Sir Oswald's danger! I must beg you not to give yourself any further alarm on that subject. I regret very much that I have been obliged to inflict unnecessary pain upon a lady. The story of the accident is a little invention of my own. Sir Oswald is perfectly safe. "'Thank heaven!' cried Honoria, clasping her hands in the fervor of sudden gratitude. "'Thank heaven for that!' Her face looked beautiful as she lifted it towards the moonlit sky. Victor Carrington contemplated her with wonder. "'Can it be possible that she loves this man?' he thought. Can it be that she has not been acting a part after all? Her first thought on hearing that she had been deceived was one of unmingled joy, 
of deep and heartfelt gratitude. Her second thought was of the shameful trick that had been played upon her, and she turned to Victor Carrington with passionate indignation. "'What is the meaning of this juggling, sir?' she cried. "'And why have I been brought to this place?' "'It is a long story, Lady Eversleigh, and I would recommend you to calm yourself before you listen to it, if you have any wish to understand me clearly.' "'I can stop to listen to no long story, sir. "'Your trick is a shameful and unmanly one, whatever its motive. "'I beg that you will take me back to Raynham without a moment's delay, "'and I would advise you to comply with my request, "'unless you wish to draw upon yourself Sir Oswald's vengeance "'for the wrong you have done me. "'I am the last person in the world to involve my husband in a quarrel, "'but if you do not immediately take steps towards restoring me to my own home, "'I shall certainly let him know how deeply I have been wronged and insulted. "'I am not afraid of your husband, my dear Lady Eversleigh,' "'answered the surgeon with cool insolence, "'for I do not think Sir Oswald will care to take up the cudgels in your defence "'after the events of to-night.' "'Honoria Eversleigh looked at the speaker with unutterable scorn.' and then turned towards the doorway which communicated with the staircase. "'Since you refuse to assist in my return, I will go alone and unassisted,' she said. Victor raised his hand with a warning gesture. "'Do not attempt to descend that staircase, my dear Lady Eversleigh,' he said. "'In the first place, the steps are slippery and the descent very dangerous, and in the next, you would find yourself unable to go beyond the archway.' "'What do you mean?' "'Oblige me by looking down through that breach in the battlements.' He had risen from his lounging position, and pointed downward as he spoke. Involuntarily, Honoria followed the indication of his hand. A cry of horror broke from her lips as she looked below. The drawbridge no longer spanned the chasm. It had fallen, and hung over the edge of the abyss, suspended by massive chains— on all sides of the tower yawned a gulf of some fifteen feet wide. At first, Lady Eversleigh thought that this chasm might only be on one side of the ruin, but on rushing to the opposite battlements and looking down, she saw that it was a moss-grown stone moat which completely encircled the stronghold. The warriors of old knew how to build their fortresses and how to protect themselves from their foes, said Victor Carrington, as if in answer to his companion's despairing cry. Those who built this edifice and dug that moat little knew how useful their arrangements would be in these degenerate days. Do not pace to and fro with that distracted air, Lady Eversleigh. Believe me, you will do wisely to take things quietly. You are doomed to remain here till daybreak. This ruin is in the care of a man who leaves it at a certain hour every evening. When he leaves... He drops the drawbridge. You must have heard him do it a little while ago, and no hand but his can raise the chains that support it, for he only knows the secret of their machinery. He has left the place for the night. He lives three miles and a half away, at a little village yonder, which looks only a black speck in the distance, and he will not return till some time after daybreak. And you would keep me a prisoner here? You would detain me in this miserable place? "'while my husband is no doubt expecting me at Raynham, "'perplexed and bewildered by my mysterious absence?' "'Yes, Lady Eversleigh, "'there will be wonder and perplexity enough on your account tonight at Raynham Castle.' "'There was a pause after this. "'Honoria sank upon a block of fallen stone, "'bewildered, terror-stricken, for the moment powerless to express "'either her fears or her indignation, so strange so completely inexplicable was the position in which she found herself. "'I am in the power of a maniac,' she murmured. "'No one but a maniac could be capable of this wild act. "'My life is in the power of a madman. "'I can but wait the issue. "'Let me be calm. "'Oh, merciful heaven, give me fortitude to face my danger quietly.' "'The strength she prayed for seemed to come with the prayer.' The wild beating of her heart slackened a little. She swept the heavy masses of hair away from her forehead, and bound the fallen plates in a knot at the back of her head. 
she did this almost as calmly as if she had been making her toilet in her dressing-room at Raynham. Victor Carrington watched her with surprise. "'She is a wonderful woman,' he said to himself. "'A noble creature, as powerful in mind as she is lovely in person. "'What a pity that I should make myself the enemy of this woman "'for the sake of such a mean-spirited hound as Reginald Eversleigh. "'But my interests compel me to run counter to my inclination. "'It is a great pity. "'With this woman as my ally, "'I might have done greater things than I shall ever do by myself.' Victor Carrington mused thus while Honoria Eversleigh sat on the edge of the broken wall at a few paces from him, looking calmly out at the purple sky. She fully believed that she had fallen into the power of a maniac. What except madness could have prompted such conduct as that of Victor Carrington's? She knew that there is no defense so powerful as an appearance of calmness— and it was with tranquillity she addressed her companion after that interval of deliberation. "'Now, Mr. Carrington,' she said, "'since it seems I am your prisoner, perhaps you will be good enough to inform me why you have brought me to this place, and what injury I have ever done you, that you should inflict so deep a wrong on me.' "'You have never injured me, Lady Eversleigh,' replied Victor Carrington. "'But you have injured one who is my friend.' and whose interests are closely linked with mine. Who is that friend? Reginald Eversleigh. Reginald Eversleigh, repeated Honoria with amazement. In what manner have I injured Reginald Eversleigh? Is he not my husband's nephew? And am I not bound to feel interest in his welfare? How, then, can I have injured him? You have done him the worst wrong that one individual can do another. You stand between him and fortune. Do you not know that, little more than a year ago, Reginald Eversleigh was the heir to Raynham and all its surroundings? I know that, but he was disinherited before I crossed his uncle's pathway. True, but had you not crossed Sir Oswald's path, there is no doubt Reginald would have been restored to favor. But you have woven your spells round his kinsman— and his only hope lies in your disgrace. My disgrace? Yes, Lady Eversleigh, life is a battle in which the weakest must be trodden down. You have triumphed hitherto, but the hour of your triumph is past. Yesterday you were queen of Raynham Castle. Tomorrow no kitchen wench within its walls would be so low as you. What do you mean? asked Honoria more and more mystified every moment by her companion's words. For the first time an awful fear took possession of her, and she began to perceive that she was the victim of a foul and villainous plot. "'What do you mean?' she repeated in accents of alarm. "'I mean this, Lady Eversleigh. The world judges of people's actions by their outward seeming, not by their inward truth. Appearances have conspired to condemn you, before to-morrow every creature in Raynham Castle will believe that you have fled from your home, and with me. Fled from my home? Yes. How else can your absence to-night, your sudden disappearance from the picnic, be construed? If I live, I shall go back to the castle at daybreak to-morrow morning, go back to denounce your villainy, to implore my husband's vengeance on your infamy. "'And do you think any one will believe your denunciation? "'You will go back too late, Lady Eversleigh.' "'Oh, villain! Villain!' murmured Honoria, "'in accents of mingled abhorrence and despair, "'abhorrence of her companion's infamy, "'despair inspired by the horror of her own position. "'You have played for a very high stake, Lady Eversleigh,' said the surgeon, and you must not wonder if you have found opponents ready to encounter your play with a still more desperate and a still more dexterous game, when a nameless and obscure woman springs from poverty and obscurity to rank and riches, she must expect to find others ready to dispute the prize which she has won. And there can exist a wretch calling himself a man, and yet capable of such an act as this, cried Honoria, looking upward to the calm and cloudless sky, as if she would have called heaven to witness the iniquity of her enemy. "'Do not speak to me, sir,' 
she added, turning to Victor Carrington, with unutterable scorn. "'I believed a few minutes ago that you were a madman, and I thought myself the victim of a maniac's folly. I understand all now. You have plotted nobly for your friend's service, and he will, no doubt, reward you richly if you succeed. But you have not yet succeeded. Providence sometimes seems to favor the wicked. It has favored you so far.' "'but the end has not come yet.' "'She turned from him "'and walked to the opposite side of the tower. "'Here she seated herself on the battlemented wall, "'as calm in outward seeming "'as if she had been in her own drawing-room. "'She took out a tiny jewelled watch. "'By that soft light she could perceive the figures on the dial. "'It was a few minutes after one o'clock. It was not likely that the men who had charge of the ruins would come to the tower until seven or eight in the morning. For six or seven hours, therefore, Honoria Eversleigh was likely to be a prisoner. For six or seven hours she would have to endure the hateful presence of the man whose treachery had placed her in this hideous position. Despair reigned in her heart, entire and overwhelming despair. When released from her prison— she might hurry back to the castle but who would believe a story so wild so improbable as that which she would have to tell would her husband believe her would he who had to all appearance withdrawn his love from her for no reason whatever would he believe in her purity and truth when circumstances conspired in damning evidence of her guilt a sense of hopeless misery took possession of her heart but no cry of anguish broke from her pale lips. She sat motionless as a statue, with her eyes fixed upon the eastern horizon, counting the moments as they passed with cruel slowness, watching with yearning gaze for the first glimmer of morning. Victor Carrington contemplated that statuesque figure, that pale and tranquil face, with unalloyed admiration. Until to-night he had despised women as frail, helpless creatures, only made to be flattered by false words, and tyrannized over by stronger natures than their own. Among all the women with whom he had ever been associated, his mother was the only one in whose good sense he had believed, or for whose intellect he had felt the smallest respect. But now he beheld a woman of another stamp, a woman whose pride and fortitude were akin to the heroic. "'You endure the unpleasantness of your position nobly, Lady Eversleigh,' he said, "'and I can find no words to express my admiration of your conduct. "'It is very hard to find oneself the enemy of a lady, "'and above all of a lady whose beauty and whose intellect "'are alike calculated to inspire admiration. "'But in this world, Lady Eversleigh, there is only one rule, only one governing principle by which men regulate their lives. Let them seek as they will to mask the truth with specious lies which other men pretend to believe but do not. That one rule, that one governing principle, is self-interest. For the advancement of his own fortune, the man who calls himself honest will trample on the dearest ties, will sacrifice the firmest friendships, the game which reginald eversleigh and i have played against you is a desperate one but sir oswald rendered his nephew desperate when he reduced him in one short hour from wealth to poverty when he robbed him of expectations that had been his from infancy a desperate man will do desperate deeds and it has been your fate lady eversleigh to cross the path of such a man he waited with his eyes fixed on the face of sir oswald's wife but during the whole of his speech she had never once looked at him she had never withdrawn her eyes from the eastern horizon passionless contempt was expressed by that curving lip that calm repose of eye and brow it seemed as if this woman's disdain for the plodding villain into whose power she had fallen absorbed every other feeling Victor Carrington waited in vain for some reply from those scornful lips, but none came. He took out his cigar-case, lighted a cigar, and sat in a meditative attitude, smoking and looking down moodily at the black chasm below the base of the tower, 
for the first time in his life this man who was utterly without honor or principle this man who held self-interest as the one rule of conduct this unscrupulous trickster and villain felt the bitterness of a woman's scorn he would have been unmoved by the loudest evidence of its victim's despair but her silent contempt stung him to the quick the hours dragged themselves out with a hideous slowness for the despairing creature who sat watching for the dawn but at last that long night came to an end the chill morning light glimmered faint and gray in the east it was not the first time that sir oswald's wife had watched in anguish for the coming of that light in that lonely tower with her heart tortured by a sense of unutterable agony there came back to her the memory of another vigil which she had kept more than two years before she heard the dull plashing sound of a river the shivering of rushes then the noise of a struggle oaths a heavy crashing fall a groan and then no more blessed with her husband's love she had for a while closed her eyes upon that horrible picture of the past but now in the hour of despair it came back to her hideously distinct awfully palpable how could i hope for happiness she thought i the daughter of an assassin the sins of one generation are visited on another a curse is upon me and i can never hope for happiness the sun rose and shone broad and full over the barren moorland but it was several hours after sunrise before the man who took care of the ruins came to release the wretched prisoner he picked up a scanty living by showing the tower to visitors and he knew that no visitors were likely to come before nine o'clock in the morning it was nearly nine when honoria saw him approaching in the distance it was after nine when he drew up the bridge and came across it to the ruined fortress you are free from this moment lady eversleigh said the surgeon whose face looked horribly pale and worn in the broad sunlight that night of watching had not been without its agony for him honoria did not condescend to notice his words she took up the plumed hat which had been lying among the long grass at her feet the delicate feathers were wet and spoiled by the night dew, and she took them from the fragile hat and flung them away. Her thin white dress was heavy with the damp, and clung round her like a shroud, but she had not felt the chilling night winds. Lady Eversleigh groped her way down the winding staircase, which was dark even in the daytime, except here and there, where a gap in the wall let in a patch of light upon the gloomy stones. Under the archway she met the countryman, who uttered a cry on beholding the white, phantom-like figure. "'Oh, Lord!' he cried when he had recovered from his terror. "'I ask pardon, my lady, but danged if I didn't take thee for a ghost.' "'You did not know when you went away last night that there was anyone in the tower?' "'No, indeed, my lady. I'd been away for a few minutes looking after a bit of peg I've got in a shed down yonder.' and when I came back to let down the drawbridge, I didn't sing out to ax if there were any one in the old tower, for tain't often as there be any one at that time o' night. "'Tell me the way to the nearest village,' cried Honoria. "'I want to get some conveyance to take me to Raynham. "'Then you had better go to Edgington, ma'am. That's four miles from here on the Raynham Road.' The man pointed out the way to the village of which he spoke and Lady Eversleigh set forth across the wide expanse of moorland alone. She had considerable difficulty in finding her way, for there were no landmarks on that broad stretch of level turf. She wandered out of the track more than once, and it was one o'clock before she reached the village of Edgington. Here, after considerable delay, she procured a carriage to take her on to Raynham. Chapter Ten of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Ten. How art thou lost? 
How on a sudden lost. If Honoria Eversleigh had endured a night of anguish amid the wild desolation of Yarborough Tower, Sir Oswald had suffered an agony scarcely less terrible at Raynham. He had been summoned from the dinner-table in the Marquis by one of his servants, who told him that a boy was waiting for him with a letter, which he would entrust to no one but Sir Oswald Eversleigh himself. Mystified by the strange character of this message, Sir Oswald went immediately to see the boy who had brought it. He found a lad waiting for him under the trees near the marquee. The boy handed him a letter, which he opened and read immediately. The contents of that letter were well calculated to agitate and disturb him. The letter was anonymous. It consisted of the following words. If Sir Oswald Eversleigh wishes to be convinced of his wife's truth or falsehood, let him ride back to Raynham without a moment's delay. There he will receive ample evidence of her real character. He may have to wait, but the friend who writes this advises him to wait patiently. He will not wait in vain. A Nameless Counselor A fortnight before, Sir Oswald would have flung such a letter as this away from him with indignant scorn, but the poison of suspicion had done its corroding work. For a little time Sir Oswald hesitated, half inclined to despise the mysterious warning. All his better feelings prompted him to disregard this nameless correspondent. All his noblest impulses urged him to confide blindly and unquestioningly in the truth of the wife he loved. But jealousy, that dark and fatal passion, triumphed over every generous feeling, and he yielded to the influence of his hidden counsellor. No harm can arise from my return to Raynham, he thought. My friends yonder are enjoying themselves too much to trouble themselves about my absence. If this anonymous correspondent is fooling me, I shall soon discover my mistake. Having once arrived at this determination, Sir Oswald lost no time in putting it into execution. He ordered his horse, Orestes, and rode away as fast as the animal would carry him. Arrived at Raynham, he inquired if any one had asked for him, but was told there had not been any visitors at the castle throughout the day. Again and again Sir Oswald consulted the anonymous letter. It told him to wait. But for what was he to wait? Half ashamed of himself for having yielded to the tempter, restless and uneasy in spirit, he wandered from room to room in the twilight, abandoned to gloomy and miserable thoughts. The servants lighted the lamps in the many chambers of Raynham, while Sir Oswald paced to and fro, now in the long drawing-room, now in the library, now on the terrace, where the September moon shone broad and full. It was eleven o'clock, when the sound of approaching wheels proclaimed the return of the picnic party, and until that hour the baronet had watched and waited without having been rewarded by the smallest discovery of any kind whatever. He felt bitterly ashamed of himself for having been duped by so shallow a trick. It is the handiwork of some kind friend, the practical joke of some flippant youngster who thinks it a delightful piece of humour to play upon the jealousy of a husband of fifty, mused the baronet, as he brooded over his folly. I wish to heaven I could discover the writer of the epistle. He should find that it is rather a dangerous thing to trifle with a man's feelings. Sir Oswald went himself to assist at the reception of his guests. He expected to see his wife arrive with the rest. For the moment, he forgot all about his suspicions of the last fortnight. He thought only of the anonymous letter, and the wrong which he had done Honoria in being influenced by its dark hints. If he could have met his wife at that moment, when every impulse of his heart drew him towards her, all sense of estrangement would have melted away, all his doubts would have vanished before a smile from her. But though Sir Oswald found his wife's barouche the first of the carriages, she was not in it. Lydia Graham told him how dear Lady Eversleigh had caused all the party such terrible alarm. "'I suppose she reached home two hours ago,' 
added the young lady. "'She had more than an hour's start of us, "'and with that light vehicle and spirited horse, "'she and Mr. Carrington must have come so rapidly.' "'My wife and Mr. Carrington? "'What do you mean, Miss Graham?' "'Lydia explained, and Reginald Eversleigh confirmed her statement.' Lady Eversleigh had left the wizard's cave more than an hour before the rest of the party, accompanied by Mr. Carrington. No words can describe the consternation of Sir Oswald. He did his best to conceal his alarm, but the livid hue of his face, the ashen pallor of his lips, betrayed the intensity of his emotion. He sent out mounted grooms to search the different roads between the castle and the scene of the picnic and then he left his guests without a word, and shut himself in his own apartments to await the issue of the search. Had any fatal accident happened to her and her companion? Or were Honoria Eversleigh and Victor Carrington two guilty creatures who had abandoned themselves to the folly and madness of a wicked attachment, and had fled together, reckless alike of reputation and fortune? He tried to believe that this latter chance was beyond the region of possibility, but horrible suspicions racked his brain as he paced to and fro, waiting for the issue of the search that was being made. Better that he should be told that his wife had been found lying dead upon the hard, cruel road, than that he should hear that she had left him for another, a false and degraded creature." "'Why did she trust herself to the companionship of this man?' he asked himself. "'Why did she disgrace herself by leaving her guests in the company of a young man "'who ought to be little more than a stranger to her? "'She is no ignorant or foolish girl. "'She has shown herself able to hold her own in the most trying positions. "'What madness could have possessed her, that she should bring disgrace upon herself and me?' by such conduct as this. The grooms came back after a search that had been utterly in vain. No trace of the missing lady had been discovered. Inquiries had been made everywhere along the road, but without result. No gig had been seen to pass between the neighborhood of the wizard's cave and Raynham Castle. Sir Oswald abandoned himself to despair. There was no longer any hope His wife had fled from him. Bitter indeed was the penalty which he was called upon to pay for his romantic marriage, his blind confidence in the woman who had fascinated and bewitched him. He bowed his head beneath the blow, and alone, hidden from the cruel gaze of the world, he resigned himself to his misery. All that night he sat alone, his head buried in his clasped hands, "'stunned and bewildered by his agony. "'His valet, Joseph Millard, "'knocked at the door at the usual hour, "'anxious to assist at his master's toilet. "'But the door was securely locked, "'and Sir Oswald told his servant "'that he needed no help. "'He spoke in a firm voice, "'for he knew that the valet's ear "'would be keen to mark any evidence of his misery. "'When the man was gone, "'he rose up for the first time, and looked across the sunlit woods. A groan of agony burst from his lips as he gazed upon that beautiful landscape. He had brought his young wife to be mistress of this splendid domain. He had shown her that fair scene, and had told her that she was to be queen over all those proud possessions until the day of her death. No hand was ever to rob her of them. They were the free gift of his boundless love, to be shared only by her children, should heaven bless her and her husband with inheritors for this ancient estate. He had never been weary of testifying his devotion, his passionate love, and yet, before she had been his wife three months, she left him for another. While he stood before the open window, with these bitter thoughts in his mind, he heard the sound of wheels in the corridor without. The wheels belonged to an invalid chair, used by Captain Copplestone when the gout held him prisoner, a self-propelling chair in which the captain could make his way where he pleased. The captain knocked at his old comrade's door. 
"'Let me in, Oswald,' he said. "'I want to see you immediately.' "'Not this morning, my dear Copplestone. "'I can't see any one this morning,' answered the baronet. "'You can see me, Oswald. "'I must and will see you, "'and I shall stop here till you let me in.' "'A loud knock at the door with a heavy-handed cane "'accompanied the close of his speech. "'Sir Oswald opened the door and admitted the captain, "'who pushed his chair dexterously through the doorway. "'Well,' said this eccentric visitor, when Sir Oswald had shut the door. So you've not been to bed all night. How do you know that? By your looks, for one thing, and by the appearance of your bed, which I can see through the open door yonder, for another. Pretty goings on, these. A heavy sorrow has fallen upon me, Copplestone. Your wife has run away. That's what you mean, I suppose? What? cried Sir Oswald. It is all known, then? "'What is all known? That my wife has left me.' "'Well, my dear Oswald, there is a rumour of that kind of float, "'and I have come here in consequence of that rumour. "'But I don't believe there's a word of truth in it.' "'The baronet turned from his friend with a bitter smile of derision. "'I may strive to hoodwink the world, Copplestone,' he said, "'but I have no wish to deceive you. "'My wife has left me. There is no doubt of it.' "'I don't believe it,' cried the captain. "'No, Oswald Eversleigh, I don't believe it. "'You know what I am. "'I'm not quite like the Miller of D, "'for I do care for somebody, "'and that somebody is my oldest friend. "'When I first heard of your marriage, "'I told you that you were a fool. "'That was plain spoken enough, if you like. "'When I saw your wife, "'I told you that had changed my mind, "'and that I thought your folly an excusable one.' If ever I saw purity and truth in a woman's face, I saw them in the face of Lady Eversleigh, and I will stake my life that she is as true as steel. Sir Oswald clasped his friend's hand, too deeply moved for words. There was unspeakable consolation in such friendship as this. For the first time since midnight, a ray of hope dawned upon him. He had always trusted in his old comrade's judgment. Might he not trust in him still? When Captain Copplestone left him, he went to his dressing-room, and made even a more than usually careful toilet, and went to face the world. In the great dining-room he found all his guests assembled, and he took his seat amongst them calmly, though the sight of Honoria's empty place cut him to the heart. Never, perhaps, was a more miserable meal eaten, than that breakfast. There were long intervals of silence, and what little conversation there was appeared forced and artificial. Perhaps the most self-possessed person, the calmest to all appearance of the whole party, was Sir Oswald Eversleigh. So heroic an effort had he made over himself, in order to face the world proudly. He had a few words to say to every one, and was particularly courteous to the guests near him. He opened his letters with an unshaking hand, but he abstained from all allusion to his wife or the events of the previous evening. He had finished breakfast and was leaving the room when his nephew approached him. "'Can I speak to you for a few moments alone?' asked Reginald. "'Certainly. I am going to the library to write my letters. You can go with me if you like.' They went together to the library. As Sir Oswald closed the door and turned to face his nephew, he perceived that Reginald was deadly pale. "'What is amiss?' he asked. "'You ask me that, my dear uncle, at a time when you ought to know that my sympathy for your sorrow—' "'Reserve your sympathy until it is needed,' answered the baronet abruptly. "'I dare say you mean well, my dear Reginald, but there are some subjects which I will suffer no man to approach.' "'I beg your pardon, sir. Then in that case I can tell you nothing. I fancied that it was my duty to bring you any information that reached me, but I defer to you entirely. The subject is a most unhappy one, and I am glad to be spared the pain involved in speaking of it.' "'What do you mean?' said the baronet. "'If you have anything to tell me, anything that can throw light upon the mystery of my wife's flight, speak out.' 
and speak quickly. I am almost mad, Reginald. Forgive me if I spoke harshly just now. You are my nephew, and the mask I wear before the world may be dropped in your presence. I know nothing personally of Lady Eversleigh's disappearance, said Reginald, but I have good reason to believe that Miss Graham could tell you much if she chose to speak out. She has hinted at being in the secret, and I think it only right you should question her. I will question her, answered Sir Oswald, starting to his feet. Send her to me, Reginald. Mr. Eversleigh left his uncle, and Miss Graham very speedily appeared, looking the very image of unconscious innocence, and quite unable to imagine what dear Sir Oswald could want with her. The baronet came to the point very quickly, and before Lydia had time for consideration, she had been made to give a full account of the scene which she had witnessed on the previous evening between Victor Carrington and Honoria. Of course, Miss Graham told Sir Oswald that she had witnessed this strange scene in the most accidental manner. She had happened to be in a walk that commanded a view of the fir grove. "'And you saw my wife, agitated, clinging to that man. "'Lady Eversleigh was terribly agitated. "'And then you saw her take her place in the gig, of her own free will? "'I did, Sir Oswald.' "'Oh, what infamy!' murmured the baronet. "'What hideous infamy!' "'It was to himself that he spoke, rather than to Miss Graham. "'His eyes were fixed on vacancy.' and it seemed as if he was scarcely aware of the young lady's presence. Lydia was almost terrified by that blank, awful look. She waited for a few moments, and then, finding that Sir Oswald questioned her no further, she crept quietly from the room, glad to escape from the sorrow-stricken husband. Malicious though she was, she believed that this time she had spoken the truth. "'He has reason to repent his romantic choice,' she thought as she left the library. "'Perhaps now he will think that he might have done better by choosing a wife from his own set.' The day wore on. Sir Oswald remained alone in the library, seated before a table with his arms folded, his gaze fixed on empty space, a picture of despair. The clock had struck many times— the hot afternoon sun blazed full upon the broad Tudor windows, when the door was opened gently, and some one came into the room. Sir Oswald looked up angrily, thinking it was one of the servants who had intruded on him. It was his wife who stood before him, dressed in the white robes she had worn at the picnic, but wan and haggard, white as the dress she wore. Oswald! she cried with outstretched hands, and the look of one who did not doubt she would be welcome. The baronet sprang to his feet, and looked at that pale face with a gaze of unspeakable indignation. "'And you dare to come back?' he exclaimed. "'False-hearted adventuress, actress, hypocrite! You dare to come to me with that lying smile upon your face, after your infamy of last night?' "'I am neither adventurous nor hypocrite, Oswald. "'Oh, where have your love and confidence vanished "'that you can condemn me unheard? "'I have done no wrong, not by so much as one thought "'that is not full of love for you. "'I am the helpless victim of the vilest plot "'that was ever concocted for the destruction of a woman's happiness.' "'A mocking laugh burst from the lips of Sir Oswald. "'Oh!' he cried. "'So that is your story. "'You are the victim of a plot, are you? "'You were carried away by ruffians, I suppose. "'You did not go willingly with your paramour. "'Woman, you stand convicted of your treachery by the fullest evidence. "'You were seen to leave the wizard's cave. "'You were seen clinging to Victor Carrington. "'Were seen to go with him willingly.' "'And then you come and tell me you are the victim of a plot? "'Oh, Lady Eversleigh, this is too poor a story. "'I should have given you credit for greater powers of invention.' "'If I am guilty, why am I here?' asked Honoria. "'Shall I tell you why you are here?' cried Sir Oswald passionately. "'Look yonder, madam. "'Look at those wide woodlands, the deer park, the lakes and gardens.' 
"'This is only one side of Raynham Castle. "'It was for those you returned, Lady Eversleigh, "'for the love of those, and those alone. "'Influenced by a mad and wicked passion, "'you fled with your lover last night. "'But no sooner did you remember the wealth you had lost, "'the position you had sacrificed, "'than you repented your folly. "'You determined to come back. "'Your doting husband would doubtless open his arms to receive you, a few imploring words, a tear or so, and the poor, weak dupe would be melted. This is how you argued, but you were wrong. I have been foolish. I have abandoned myself to the dream of a dotard. But the dream is past. The awakening has been rude, but it has been efficacious. I shall never dream again. Oswald, will you not listen to my story? "'No, madam, I will not give you the opportunity of making me a second time your dupe. "'Go, go back to your lover, Victor Carrington. "'Your repentance comes too late. "'The Raynham heritage will never be yours. "'Go back to your lover, or, if he will not receive you, "'go back to the gutter from which I took you. "'Oswald!' "'The cry of reproach went like a dagger to the heart of the baronet.' but he steeled himself against those imploring tones. He believed that he had been wronged, that this woman was as false as she was beautiful. "'Oswald!' cried Honoria. "'You must and shall hear my story. I demand a hearing is a right, a right which you could not withhold from the vilest criminal, and which you shall not withhold from me, your lawfully wedded and faithful wife.' "'You may disbelieve my story, if you please. "'Heaven knows it seems wild and improbable. "'But you shall hear it. "'Yes, Oswald, you shall.' "'She stood before him, drawn to her fullest height, "'confronting him proudly. "'If this was guilt, it was indeed shameless guilt. "'Unhappily, the baronet believed in the evidence of Lydia Graham "'rather than in the witness of his wife's truth.' "'Why should Lydia have deceived him?' he asked himself. "'What possible motive could she have for seeking to blight his wife's fair name?' "'Honoria told her story from first to last. "'She told the history of her night of anguish. "'She spoke with her eyes fixed on her husband's face, "'in which she could read the indications of his every feeling. "'As her story drew to a close, "'her own countenance grew rigid with despair.' for she saw that her words had made no impression on the obdurate heart to which she appealed. "'I do not ask you if you believe me,' she said when her story was finished. "'I can see that you do not. "'All is over between us, Sir Oswald,' she added in a tone of intense sadness. "'All is over. "'You are right in what you said just now, cruel though your words were. "'You did take me from the gutter.' You accepted me in ignorance of my past history. You gave your love and your name to a friendless, nameless creature. And now that circumstances conspire to condemn me, can I wonder if you, too, condemn? If you refuse to believe my declaration of my innocence, I do not wonder. I am only grieved that it should be so. I should have been so proud of your love if it could have survived this fiery ordeal. So proud! But let that pass. I would not remain an hour beneath this roof on sufferance. I am quite ready to go from this house to-day, at an hour's warning, never to re-enter it. Raynham Castle is no more to me than that desolate tower in which I spent last night without your love. I will leave you without one word of reproach, and you shall never hear my name or see my face again." She moved towards the door as she spoke. There was a quiet earnestness in her manner, which might have gone far to convince Oswald Eversleigh of her truth. But his mind was too deeply imbued with a belief in her falsehood. This dignified calm, this subdued resignation, seemed to him only the consummate art of a finished actress. She is steeped in falsehood to the very lips, he thought. Doubtless, the little she told me of the history of her childhood was as false as all the rest. Heaven only knows what shameful secrets may have been hidden in her past life. 
she had crossed the threshold of the door when some sudden impulse moved him to follow her do not leave raynham till you have heard further from me lady eversleigh he said it will be my task to make all arrangements for your future life his wife did not answer him she walked towards the hall her head bent her eyes fixed on the ground she will not leave the castle until she is obliged to do so thought sir oswald as he returned to the library oh what a tissue of falsehood she tried to palm upon me and she would have blackened my nephew's name in order to screen her own guilt he rang a bell and told the servant who answered it to fetch mr eversleigh his nephew appeared five minutes afterwards still very pale and anxious-looking i have sent for you reginald said the baronet because i have a duty to perform a very painful duty but one which i do not care to delay it is now nearly a year and a half since i made a will which disinherited you i had good reason for that step as you know but i have heard no further talk of your vices or your follies and so far as i can judge you have undergone a reformation it is not for me therefore to hold sternly to a determination which i had made in a moment of extreme anger and i should perhaps have restored you to your old position ere this had not a new interest absorbed my heart and mind i have had cruel reason to repent my folly i might feel resentment against you on account of your friend's infamy but i am not weak enough for that victor carrington and i have a terrible account to settle and it shall be settled to the uttermost i need hardly tell you that if you hold any further communication with him you will forever forfeit my friendship my dear sir you surely cannot suppose do not interrupt me i wish to say what i have to say and to have done with this subject for ever you know i have already told you the contents of the will which i made after my marriage that will left the bulk of my fortune to my wife that will must now be destroyed and in the document which i shall substitute for it your name will occupy its old place heaven grant that i do wisely reginald and that you will prove yourself worthy of my confidence my dear uncle your goodness overpowers me i cannot find words to express my gratitude no thanks reginald remember that the change which restores you to your old position is brought about by my misery say no more better than an eversleigh should be master of raynham when i am dead and gone and now leave me the young man retired his face betrayed conflicting emotions lost to all sense of honour though he was the iniquity of the scheme by which he had succeeded weighed horribly upon his mind and he was seen Chapter Eleven of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Eleven, The Will, the Testament, Part One. The brief pang of fear and remorse passed quickly away, and Reginald went out upon the terrace to look upon those woods which were once more his promised heritage on which he could gaze as of old with the proud sense of possession while looking over that fair domain he forgot the hateful means by which he had re-established himself as the heir of raynham he forgot victor carrington everything except his own good fortune his heart throbbed with a sense of triumph he left the terrace crossed the italian garden and made his way to the light iron gate which opened upon the park leaning wearily upon this gate he saw an old man in the costume of a peddler a broad slouched hat almost concealed his face and a long iron-gray beard drooped upon his chest his garments were dusty as if with many a weary mile's wandering on the parched high roads 
and he carried a large pack of goods upon his back. The park was open to the public, and this man had, no doubt, come to the garden gate in the hope of finding some servant who would be beguiled into letting him carry his wares to the castle for the inspection of Sir Oswald's numerous household. "'Stand aside, my good fellow, and let me pass,' said Reginald, as he approached the little gate. The man did not stir. His arms were folded on the topmost bar of the gate, and he did not alter his attitude. "'Let me be the first to congratulate the heir of Raynham on his renewed hopes,' he said quietly. "'Carrington!' cried Reginald, and then, after a pause, he asked, "'What in heaven's name is the meaning of this masquerade?' The surgeon removed his broad-brimmed hat, and wiped his forehead with a hand that looked brown, wizen and wrinkled as the hand of an old man. Nothing could have been more perfect than his disguise. The accustomed pallor of his face was changed to the brown and sunburnt hue produced by constant exposure to all kinds of weather. A network of wrinkles surrounded the brilliant black eyes, which now shone under shaggy eyebrows of iron gray. "'I should never have recognized you,' said Reginald, staring for some moments at his friend's face, completely lost in surprise. "'Very likely not,' answered the surgeon coolly. "'I don't want people to recognize me. A disguise that can by any possibility be penetrated is the most fatal mistake.' I can disguise my voice as well as my face, as you will perhaps hear by and by. When talking to a friend, there is no occasion to take so much trouble. But why have you assumed this disguise? Because I want to be on the spot, and you may imagine that, after having eloped with the lady of the house, I could not very safely show myself here in my own proper person. What need had you to return? "'Your scheme is accomplished, is it not?' "'Well, not quite. "'Is there anything more to be done?' "'Yes, there is something more.' "'What is the nature of that something?' asked Reginald. "'Leave that to me,' answered the surgeon. "'And now you had better pass on, young heir of Raynham, "'and leave the poor old peddler to smoke his pipe "'and to watch for some passing maidservant.' Who will admit him to the castle. Reginald lingered, fascinated in some manner, by the presence of his friend and counsellor. He wanted to penetrate the mystery hidden in the breast of his ally. "'How did you know that your scheme had succeeded?' he asked presently. "'I read my success in your face as you came towards this gate just now. It was the face of an acknowledged heir.' "'and now perhaps you will be good enough to tell me your news.' "'Reginald related all that had happened, "'the use he had made of Lydia Graham's malice, "'the interview with his uncle after Lady Eversleigh's return. "'Good!' exclaimed Victor. "'Good from first to last. "'Did ever any scheme work so smoothly? "'That was a stroke of genius of yours, Reginald, "'the use you made of Miss Graham's evidence.' "'And so she was watching us, was she? "'Charming creature! "'How little she knows to what an extent we are indebted to her! "'Well, Reginald, I congratulate you. "'It is a grand thing to be the acknowledged heir of such an estate as this.' "'He glanced across the broad gardens, "'blazing with rich masses of vivid colour, "'produced by the artistic arrangement of the flower-beds. "'He looked up to the long range of windows, the terrace, the massive towers, the grand old archway, and then he looked back at his friend with a sinister light in his glittering black eyes. There is only one drawback, he said. And that is? That you may have to wait a very long time for your inheritance. Let me see. Your uncle is fifty years of age, I think? Yes, he is about fifty. And he has an iron constitution. He has led a temperate, hardy life. Such a man is as likely to live to be eighty as I am to see my fortieth birthday. And that would give you thirty years waiting. A long delay. 
a terrible trial of patience. "'Why do you say these things?' cried Reginald impatiently. "'Do you want to make me miserable in the hour of our triumph? "'Do you mean that we have burdened our souls with all this crime and falsehood for nothing? "'You are mad, Victor.' "'No, I am only in a speculative mood. Thirty years. Thirty years would be a long time to wait.' "'Who says I shall have to wait thirty years? "'My uncle may die long before that time. "'Ah, to be sure, your uncle may die suddenly. "'Perhaps very soon it may be. "'The shock of his wife's falsehood may kill him "'after he has made a new will in your favor. "'The two men stood face to face, looking at each other. "'What do you mean?' Reginald asked. "'And why do you look at me like that? "'I am only thinking what a lucky fellow you would be "'if this grief that has fallen upon your uncle "'were to be fatal to his life. "'Don't talk like that, Carrington. "'I won't think of such a thing. "'I am bad enough, I know, "'but not quite so bad as to wish my uncle dead. "'You would be sorry if he were dead, I suppose? "'Sorry, with this domain your own?' With all power and pleasure that wealth can purchase for a man, you would be sorry, would you? You wish well to the kind kinsman to whom you have been such a devoted nephew? You would prefer to wait thirty years for your heritage, if you should live so long. Victor Carrington, cried Reginald passionately, you are the fiend himself in disguise. Let me pass. I will not stop to listen to your hateful words. "'Wait to hear one question, at any rate. "'Why do you suppose I made you sign that promissory note at a twelve-month's date?' "'I don't know, but you must know, as well as I do, "'that the note will be waste-paper so long as my uncle lives.' "'I do know that, my dear Reginald, "'but I got you to date the document as you did, "'because I have a kind of presentiment "'that before that date you will be master of Raynham. "'You mean that my uncle will die within the year?' "'I am subject to presentiments of that kind. "'I do not think Sir Oswald will see the end of the year.' "'Carrington!' exclaimed Reginald. "'Your schemes are hateful. "'I will have no further dealings with you.' "'Indeed. "'Then am I to go to Sir Oswald and tell him the story of last night? "'Am I to tell him that his wife is innocent?' "'No, no, tell him nothing. "'Let things stand as they are. "'The promise of the estate is mine. "'I have suffered too much from the loss of my position, "'and I cannot forego my new hopes. "'But let there be no more guilt, no more plotting. "'We have succeeded. "'Let us wait patiently for the end.' "'Yes,' answered the surgeon coolly. "'We will wait for the end.' And, if the end should come sooner than our most sanguine hopes have led us to expect, we will not quarrel with the handiwork of fate. Now leave me. I see a petticoat yonder amongst the trees. It belongs to some housemaid from the castle, I dare say, and I must see if my eloquence as a wandering merchant cannot win me admission within the walls which I dare not approach as Victor Carrington. Reginald opened the gate with his pass-key, and allowed the surgeon to go through into the gardens. It was dusk when Sir Oswald left the library. He had sent a message to the chief of his guests, excusing himself from attending the dinner-table on the ground of ill health. When he knew that all his visitors would be assembled in the dining-room, he left the library for the first time since he had entered it after breakfast. He had brooded long and gloomily over his misery, and had come to a determination as to the line of conduct which he should pursue towards his wife. He went now to Lady Eversleigh's apartments, in order to inform her of his decision. But to his surprise he found the rooms empty. His wife's maid was sitting at needlework by one of the windows of the dressing-room. "'Where is your mistress?' asked Sir Oswald. "'She has gone out, sir. "'She has left the castle for some little time, I think, sir, "'for she put on the plainest of her travelling dresses, "'and she took a small travelling bag with her. 
"'There is a note, sir, on the mantelpiece in the next room. "'Shall I fetch it?' "'No, I will get it myself. "'At what time did Lady Eversleigh leave the castle?' "'About two hours ago, sir.' Two hours. "'In time for the afternoon coach to York,' thought Sir Oswald. "'Go and inquire if your mistress really left the castle at that time,' he said to the maid. He went into the boudoir, and took the letter from the mantelpiece. He crushed it into his breast pocket, with the seal unbroken. "'Time enough to discover what new falsehood she has tried to palm upon me,' he thought. He looked round the empty room, which she was never more to occupy. Her books, her music, were scattered on every side. The sound of her rich voice seemed still to vibrate through the room, and she was gone, forever. Well, she was a base and guilty creature, and it was better so, infinitely better, that her polluting presence should no longer dishonor those ancient chambers, within which generations of proud and pure women had lived and died. But to see the rooms empty, and to know that she was gone— gave him nevertheless a pang. "'What will become of her?' thought Sir Oswald. "'She will return to her lover, of course, and he will console her for the sacrifice she has made by her mad folly. Let her prize him while he still lives to console her, for she may not have him long. Why do I think of her? Why do I trouble myself about her? I have my affairs to arrange, a new will to make.' before I think of vengeance. And those matters once settled, vengeance shall be my only thought. I have done for ever with love. Sir Oswald returned to the library. A lamp burned on the table at which he was accustomed to write. It was a shaded reading lamp, which made a wide circle of vivid light around the spot where it stood, but left the rest of the room in shadow. The night was oppressively hot, an August rather than a September night, and before beginning his work, Sir Oswald flung open one of the broad windows leading out upon the terrace. Then he unlocked a carved oak bureau, and took out a packet of papers. He seated himself at the table, and began to examine these papers. Among them was the will which he had executed since his marriage. He read this, and then laid it aside, as he did so, a figure approached the wide-open window. An eager face, illuminated by glittering eyes, peered into the room. It was the face of Victor Carrington, hidden beneath the disguise of assumed age, and completely metamorphosed by the dark skin and grizzled beard. Had Sir Oswald looked up and seen that face, he would not have recognized its owner. After laying aside the document he had read, Sir Oswald began to write. He wrote slowly, meditating upon every word, and after having written for about half an hour, he rose and left the room. The surgeon had never stirred from his post by the window, and as Sir Oswald closed the door behind him, he crept stealthily into the apartment and to the table where the papers lay. His footstep, light always, made no sound upon the thick velvet pile. He glanced at the contents of the paper, on which the ink was still wet. It was a will, leaving the bulk of Sir Oswald's fortune to his nephew Reginald unconditionally. Victor Carrington did not linger a moment longer than was necessary to convince him of this fact. He hurried back to his post by the window, nor was he an instant too soon. The door opened before he had fairly stepped from the apartment. Sir Oswald re-entered, followed by two men. One was the butler. The other was the valet, Joseph Millard. The will was executed in the presence of these men, who affixed their signatures to it as witnesses. "'I have no wish to keep the nature of this will a secret from my household,' said Sir Oswald. "'It restores my nephew.' Mr. Reginald Eversleigh, to his position as heir to this estate. You will henceforth respect him as my successor. The two men bowed and retired. Sir Oswald walked towards the window, 
and Victor Carrington drew back into the shadow cast by a massive abutment of stonework. It was not very easy for a man to conceal himself on the terrace in that broad moonlight. Voices sounded presently, near one of the windows, and a group of ladies and gentlemen emerged from the drawing-room. "'It is the hottest night we have had this summer,' said one of them. "'The house is really oppressive.' Miss Graham had enchanted her viscount once more, and she and that gentleman walked side by side on the terrace." "'They will discover me if they come this way,' muttered Victor, as he shrank back into the shadow. "'I have seen all that I want to see for the present, and had better make my escape while I am safe.' He stole quietly along by the front of the castle, lurking always in the shadow of the masonry, and descended the terrace steps. From thence he went to the courtyard on which the servants' hall opened, and in a few minutes he was comfortably seated in that apartment, listening to the gossip of the servants, who could only speak upon the one subject of Lady Eversleigh's elopement. The baronet sat with the newly made will before him, gazing at the open leaves with fixed and dreamy eyes. Now that the document was signed, a feeling of doubt had taken possession of him. He remembered how deliberately he had pondered over the step, before he had disinherited his nephew, and now that work, which had cost him so much pain and thought, had been undone on the impulse of a moment. "'Have I done right, I wonder?' he asked himself. The papers which had been tied in the packet containing the old will had been scattered on the table. When the baronet unfastened the band that secured them, he took one of these documents up in sheer absence of mind, and opened it. It was the letter written by the wretched girl who drowned herself in the Seine, the letter of Reginald Eversleigh's victim, the very letter on the evidence of which Sir Oswald had decided that his nephew was no fitting heir to a great fortune. The baronet's brow contracted as he read, And it is to the man who could abandon a wretched woman to despair and death "'That I am about to leave wealth and power?' he exclaimed. "'No. The decision which I arrived at in Arlington Street was a just and wise decision. "'I have been mad to-day, maddened by anger and despair. "'But it is not too late to repent my folly. "'The seducer of Mary Goodwin shall never be the master of Raynham Castle.' "'Sir Oswald folded the sheet of foolscap on which the will was written.' and held it over the flame of the lamp. He carried it over to the fireplace, and threw it blazing on the empty hearth. He watched it thoughtfully until the greater part of the paper was consumed by the flame, and then went back to his seat. My nephews, Lionel and Douglas Dale, shall divide the estate between them, he thought. I will send for my solicitor to-morrow, and make a new will." Victor Carrington sat in the servants' hall at Raynham until past eleven o'clock. He had made himself quite at home with the domestics in his assumed character. The women were delighted with the showy goods which he carried in his pack, and which he sold them at prices far below those of the best bargains they had ever made before. At a few minutes after eleven he rose to bid them good night. "'I suppose I shall find the gates open,' he said." "'Yes. The gates of the courtyard are never locked till half-past eleven, answered a sturdy old coachman. The peddler took his leave, but he did not go out by the courtyard. He went straight to the terrace, along which he crept with stealthy footsteps. Many lights twinkled in the upper windows of the terrace front, for at this hour the greater number of Sir Oswald's guests had retired to their rooms.' The broad window of the library was still open, but a curtain had been drawn before it, on one side of which there remained a crevice. Through this crevice Victor Carrington could watch the interior of the chamber, with very little risk of being discovered. The baronet was still sitting by the writing-table, with the light of the library lamp shining full upon him. An open letter was in his hand. It was the letter his wife had left for him. 
It was not like the letter of a guilty woman. It was quiet, subdued, full of sadness and resignation, rather than of passionate despair. "'I know now that I ought never to have married you, Oswald,' wrote Lady Eversleigh. "'The sacrifice which you made for my sake was too great a one. No happiness could well come of such an unequal bargain. You gave me everything, and I could give you so little. The cloud upon my past life was black and impenetrable.' You took me nameless, friendless, unknown, and I can scarcely wonder if, at the first breath of suspicion, your faith wavered and your love failed. Farewell, dearest and best of men. You never can know how truly I have loved you, how I have reverenced your noble nature. In all that has come to pass between us since the first hour of our miserable estrangement, Nothing has grieved me so deeply as to see your generous soul overclouded by suspicions and doubts, as unworthy of you as they are needless and unfounded. Farewell. I go back to the obscurity from whence you took me. You need not fear for my future. The musical education which I owe to your generous help will enable me to live, and I have no wish to live otherwise than humbly. May heaven bless you, Honoria. This was all. There were no complaints, no entreaties. The letter seemed instinct with the dignity of truth. And she has gone forth alone, unprotected. She has gone back to her lonely and desolate life, thought the baronet, inclined for a moment at least to believe in his wife's words. But in the next instant, he remembered the evidence of Lydia Graham, the wild and improbable story by which Honoria had tried to account for her absence. No, no, he exclaimed, it is all treachery from first to last. She is hiding herself somewhere near at hand, no doubt to wait the result of this artful letter. And when she finds that her artifices are thrown away, when she discovers that my heart has been changed to adamant by her infamy, she will go back to her lover, if he still lives to shelter her. A hundred conflicting ideas confused Sir Oswald's brain, but one thought was paramount, and that was the thought of revenge. He resolved to send for his lawyer early the next morning to make a new will in favor of his sister's two sons, and then to start in search of the man who had robbed him of his wife's affection— Reginald would, of course, be able to assist him in finding Victor Carrington. While Sir Oswald mused thus, the man of whom he was thinking watched him through the narrow space between the curtains. "'Shall it be to-night?' thought Carrington. "'It cannot be too soon. He might change his mind about his will at any moment, and, if it should happen to-night, people will say the shock of his wife's flight has killed him.' Sir Oswald's folded arms rested on the table. His head sank forward on his arms. The passionate emotions of the day, the previous night of agony, had at last exhausted him. He fell into a doze, a feverish, troubled sleep. Carrington watched him for upwards of a quarter of an hour as he slept thus. "'I think he is safe now, and I may venture,' murmured Victor at the end of that time. He crept softly into the room, making a wide circle, and keeping himself completely in the shadow, till he was behind the sleeping baronet. Then he came towards the lamp-lit table. Amongst the scattered letters and papers, there stood a claret jug, a large carafe of water, and an empty glass. Victor drew close to the table, and listened for some moments to the breathing of the sleeper. Then he took a small bottle from his pocket, and dropped a few globules of some colorless liquid into the empty glass. Having done this, he withdrew from the apartment as silently as he had entered it. Twelve o'clock struck as he was leaving the terrace. So, he muttered, it is little more than three-quarters of an hour since I left the servants' hall. It would not be difficult to prove an alibi with the help of a blundering village innkeeper. 
he did not attempt to leave the castle by the courtyard which he knew would be locked by this time he had made himself acquainted with all the ins and outs of the place and had possessed himself of a key belonging to one of the garden gates through this gate he passed out into the park climbed a low fence and made his way into raynham village where the landlord of the hen and chickens was just closing his doors i have been told by the castle servants that you can give me a bed he said the landlord who was always delighted to oblige his patrons in sir oswald's servants hall and stables declared himself ready to give the traveller the best accommodation his house could afford it is late sir he said but we'll manage to make things comfortable for you so that night the surgeon slept in the village of raynham he too was worn out by the fatigue of the past twenty-four hours and he slept soundly all through the night and slept as calmly as a child it was eight o'clock next morning when he went down the steep old-fashioned staircase of the inn he found a strange hubbub and confusion below awful tidings had just been brought from the castle sir oswald eversleigh had been found seated in his library dead with the lamp still burning near him in the bright summer morning one of the grooms had come down to the little inn and was telling his story to all comers when the peddler came into the open space before the bar it was millard that found him the man said he was sitting quite calm like with his head lying back upon the cushion of his armchair there were papers and open letters scattered all about and they sent off immediately for mr dalton the lawyer to look to the papers and seal up the locks of drawers and desks and so on mr dalton is busy at it now mr eversleigh is awfully shocked he is i never saw such a white face in all my life as his when he came out into the hall after hearing the news it's a rare fine thing for him as you may say for they say sir oswald made a new will last night and left his nephew everything and mr eversleigh has been a regular wild one and is deep in debt but for all that i never saw any one so cut up as he was just now poor sir oswald cried the bystanders such a noble gentleman as he was too what did he die of mr kimber do you know the doctor says it must have been heart disease answered the groom a broken heart i say that's the only disease sir oswald had it's my lady's conduct has killed him she must have been a regular bad one mustn't she the story of the elopement had been fully discussed on the previous day at the hen and chickens and everywhere else in the village of raynham the country gossips shook their heads over lady eversleigh's iniquity but they said little this new event was of so appalling a nature that it silenced even the tongue of gossip for a while the peddler took his breakfast in the little parlour behind the bar and listened quietly to all that was said by the villagers and the groom and where is my lady asked the innkeeper she came back yesterday didn't she yes and went away again yesterday Chapter Eleven, Part Two, of Run to Earth, a Novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Eleven: The Will, the Testament, Part Two. Terrible indeed was the consternation which reigned that day at Raynham Castle. Already Sir Oswald's guests had been making hasty arrangements for their departure, and many visitors had departed even before the discovery of that awful event which came like a thunderclap upon all within the castle. Few men had ever been better liked by his acquaintances than Sir Oswald Eversleigh. His generous nature, his honourable character, had won him every man's respect his great wealth had been spent lavishly for the benefit of others his hand had always been open to the poor and necessitous he had been a kind master a liberal landlord an ardent and devoted friend there is little wonder therefore 
if the news of his sudden death fell like an overwhelming blow on all assembled within the castle, and on many more beyond the castle walls. The feeling against Honoria Eversleigh was one of unmitigated execration. No words could be too bitter for those who spoke of Sir Oswald's wife. It had been thought on the previous evening that she had left the castle forever, banished by the command of her husband. Nothing, therefore, could have exceeded the surprise which filled every breast when she entered the crowded hall some minutes after the discovery of Sir Oswald's death. Her face was whiter than marble, and its awful whiteness was contrasted by the black dress which she wore. "'Is this true?' she cried, in accents of despair. "'Is he really dead?' "'Yes, Lady Eversleigh,' answered General Desmond, an Indian officer and an old friend of the dead man. "'Sir Oswald is dead.' "'Let me go to him. I cannot believe it. I cannot. I cannot,' she cried wildly. "'Let me go to him.' Those assembled round the door of the library looked at her with horror and aversion. To them this semblance of agony seemed only the consummate artifice of an accomplished hypocrite. "'Let me go to him, for pity's sake, let me see him,' she pleaded with clasped hands. "'I cannot believe that he is dead.' Reginald Eversleigh was standing by the door of the library, pale as death, more ghastly of aspect than death itself. He had been leaning against the doorway, as if unable to support himself. But, as Honoria approached, he aroused himself from a kind of stupor, and stretched out his arm to bar her entrance to the death-chamber. "'This is no scene for you, Lady Eversleigh,' he said sternly. "'You have no right to enter that chamber. You have no right to be beneath this roof.' "'Who dares to banish me?' she asked proudly. "'And who can deny my right?' "'I can do both, as the nearest relative of your dead husband.' "'And as the friend of Victor Carrington,' answered Honoria, looking fixedly at her accuser. "'Oh, it is a marvellous plot, Reginald Eversleigh, and it wanted but this to complete it. "'My disgrace was the first act in the drama, my husband's death the second. "'Your friend's treachery accomplished one. "'You have achieved the other. "'Sir Oswald Eversleigh has been murdered.' "'A suppressed cry of horror broke simultaneously from every lip, "'as the awful word murder was repeated. "'The doctor, who had been until this moment beside the dead man, "'came to the door and opened it. "'Who was it spoke of murder?' he asked. "'It was I,' answered Honoria, I say that my husband's death is no sudden stroke from the hand of heaven. There is one here who refuses to let me see him, lest I should lay my hand upon his corpse, and call down heaven's vengeance on his assassin. The woman is mad, faltered Reginald Eversleigh. Look at the speaker, cried Honoria. I am not mad, Reginald Eversleigh though by you and your fellow plotter I have been made to suffer that which might have turned a stronger brain than mine. I am not mad. I say that my husband has been murdered, and I ask all present to mark my words. I have no evidence of what I say except instinct, but I know that it does not deceive me. As for you, Reginald Eversleigh, I refuse to recognize your rights beneath this roof. As the widow of Sir Oswald, I claim the place of mistress in this house, until events show whether I have a right to it or not. These were bold words from one who, in the eyes of all present, was a disgraced wife who had been banished by her husband. General Desmond was the person who took upon himself to reply. He was the oldest and most important guest now remaining at the castle, and he was a man who had been much respected by Sir Oswald. "'I certainly do not think that any one here can dispute Lady Eversleigh's rights, until Sir Oswald's will has been read, and his last wishes made known. Whatever passed between my poor friend and his wife yesterday is known to Lady Eversleigh alone. It is for her to settle matters with her own conscience, and if she chooses to remain beneath this roof— no one here can presume to banish her from it. 
except in obedience to the dictates of the dead. "'The wishes of the dead will soon be known,' said Reginald. "'And then that guilty woman will no longer dare to pollute this house by her presence.' "'I do not fear, Reginald Eversleigh,' answered Honoria with sublime calmness. "'Let the worst come. I abide the issue of events. I wait to see whether iniquity is to succeed, or whether, at the last moment, the hand of Providence will be outstretched to confound the guilty. My faith is strong in Providence, Mr. Eversleigh, and now stand aside, if you please, and let me look upon the face of my husband.' This time Reginald Eversleigh did not venture to dispute the widow's right to enter the death-chamber. He made way for her to pass him, and she went in and knelt by the side of the dead. Mr. Dalton, the lawyer, was moving softly about the room, putting seals on all the locks, and collecting the papers that had been scattered on the table. The parish doctor, who had been summoned hastily, stood near the corpse. A groom had been dispatched to a large town twenty miles distant to summon a medical man of some distinction. There were few railroads in those days, no electric telegraph to summon a man from one end of the country to another. But all the most distinguished doctors who ever lived could not have restored Sir Oswald Eversleigh to an hour's life. All that medical science could do now was to discover the mode of the baronet's death. The crowd left the hall by and by, and the interior of the castle grew more tranquil. All the remaining guests, with the exception of General Desmond, made immediate arrangements for leaving the house of death. General Desmond declared his intention of remaining until after the funeral. "'I may be of some use in watching the interests of my dear friend,' he said to Reginald Eversleigh. "'There is only one person who will feel your uncle's death more deeply than I shall.' "'and that is poor old Copplestone. "'He is still in the castle, I suppose?' "'Yes, he is confined to his room still by the gout.' "'Reginald Eversleigh was by no means pleased by the general's decision. "'He would rather have been alone in the castle. "'It seemed as if his uncle's old friend was inclined to take the place of master in the household. "'The young man's pride revolted against the general's love of dictation.' and his fears, strange and terrible fears, made the presence of the general very painful to him. Joseph Millard had come to Reginald a little time after the discovery of the baronet's death, and had told him the contents of the new will. "'Master told us with his own lips that he had left you heir to the estate, sir,' said the valet. "'There was no need for it to be kept a secret,' he said, "'and we signed the will as witnesses.' Peterson, the butler, and me. "'And you are sure you have made no mistake, Millard? Sir Oswald, my poor, poor uncle, said that?' "'He said those very words, Mr. Eversleigh. And I hope, sir, now that you are master of Raynham, you won't forget that I was always anxious for your interests, and gave you valuable information, sir, when I had little thought you would ever inherit the estate, sir.' "'Yes, yes.' "'You will not find me ungrateful, Millard,' answered Reginald, impatiently, for in the terrible agitation of his mind this man's talk jarred upon him. "'I shall reward you liberally for past services. You may depend upon it,' he added. "'Thank you very much, sir,' murmured the valet, about to retire. "'Stay, Millard,' said the young man. "'You have been with my uncle twenty years. You must know everything about his health.' "'Did you ever hear that he suffered from heart disease?' "'No, sir. He never did suffer from anything of the kind. "'There never was a stronger gentleman than Sir Oswald. "'In all the years that I have known him, "'I don't recollect his having a day's serious illness. "'And as to his dying of disease of the heart, "'I can't believe it, Mr. Eversleigh. "'But in heart complaint death is almost always sudden.' "'and the disease is generally unsuspected until death reveals it. "'Well, I don't know, sir. "'Of course the medical gentlemen understand such things, "'but I must say that I don't understand Sir Oswald going off sudden like that. "'You'd better keep your opinions to yourself downstairs, Millard, 
"'If an idea of that kind were to get about in the servants' hall, it might do mischief.' "'I should be the last to speak, Mr. Eversley. "'You asked me for my opinion, and I gave it to you candid. "'But as to expressing my sentiments in the servants' hall, "'I should as soon think of standing on my head. "'In the first place, I don't take my meals in the servants' hall, "'but in the steward's room, "'and it's very seldom I hold any communication whatever with under-servants. "'It don't do, Mr. Eversley. "'You may think me haughty, but it don't do. "'If upper servants want to be respected by under-servants, "'they must first respect themselves.' "'Well, well, Millard, I know I can rely upon your discretion. "'You can leave me now. "'My mind is quite unhinged by this dreadful event.' "'No sooner had the valet departed "'than Reginald hurried from the castle "'and walked across the garden to the gate "'by which he had encountered Victor Carrington on the previous day. "'He had no appointment with Victor "'and did not even know if he were still in the neighbourhood but he fancied it was just possible the surgeon might be waiting for him somewhere without the boundary of the garden. He was not mistaken. A few minutes after passing through the gateway, he saw the figure of the peddler approaching him under the shade of the spreading beeches. "'I am glad you are here,' said Reginald. "'I fancied I might find you somewhere hereabouts.' "'And I have been waiting and watching about here for the last two hours.' I dared not trust a messenger, and could only take my chance of seeing you. You have heard of... of... I have heard everything, I believe. What does it mean, Victor? What does it all mean? It means that you are a wonderfully lucky fellow, and that, instead of waiting thirty years to see your uncle grow a semi-idiotic old dotard, you will step at once into one of the finest estates in England." "'You knew, then, that the will was made last night?' "'Well, I guessed as much. "'You have seen Millard?' "'No, I have not seen Millard. "'How could you know of my uncle's will, then? "'It was only executed last night.' "'Never mind how I know it, my dear Reginald. "'I do know it. "'Let that be enough for you.' "'It is too terrible,' murmured the young man, after a pause. "'It is too terrible.' "'What is too terrible? "'This sudden death!' "'Is it?' cried Victor Carrington, "'looking full in his companion's face "'with an expression of supreme scorn. "'Would you rather have waited thirty years for these estates? "'Would you rather have waited twenty years, ten years? "'No, Reginald Eversley, you would not. "'I know you better than you know yourself, "'and I will answer for you in this matter.' If your uncle's life had lain in your open palm last night, and the closing of your hand would have ended it, your hand would have closed, Mr. Eversley, affectionate nephew though you be. You are a hypocrite, Reginald. You palter with your own conscience. Better to be like me and have no conscience, than to have one and palter with it as you do. Reginald made no reply to this disdainful speech. His own weakness of character placed him entirely in the power of his friend. The two men walked on together in silence. "'You do not know all that has occurred since last night at the castle,' said Reginald at last. "'Lady Eversleigh has reappeared.' "'Lady Eversleigh? I thought she left Raynham yesterday afternoon.' "'So it was generally supposed, but this morning she came into the hall, "'and demanded to be admitted to see her dead husband. "'Nor was this all. "'She publicly declared that he had been murdered and accused me of the crime. "'This is terrible, Victor.' "'It is terrible, and it must be put an end to at once.' "'But how is it to be put an end to?' asked Reginald. "'If this woman repeats her accusations,' "'Who is to seal her lips? "'The tables must be turned upon her. "'If she again accuses you, you must accuse her. "'If Sir Oswald were indeed murdered, "'who so likely to have committed the murder as this woman, "'whose hatred and revenge were no doubt excited "'by her husband's refusal to receive her back "'after her disgraceful flight? "'This is what you have to say.' 
and as every one's opinion is against Lady Eversleigh, she will find herself in rather an unpleasant position, and will be glad to hold her peace for the future upon the subject of Sir Oswald's death. "'You do not doubt my uncle died a natural death, do you, Victor?' asked Reginald with a strange eagerness. "'You do not think that he was murdered?' "'No, indeed. Why should I think so?' returned the surgeon, with perfect calmness of manner. "'No one in the castle but you and Lady Eversleigh had any interest in his life or death. "'If he came to his end by any foul means, she must be the guilty person, and on her the deed must be fixed. "'You must hold firm, Reginald, remember.' "'The two men parted soon after this.' but not before they had appointed to meet on the following day, at the same hour, and on the same spot. Reginald Eversleigh returned to the castle, gloomy and ill at ease, and on entering the house he discovered that the doctor from Plimborough had arrived during his absence, and was to remain until the following day, when his evidence would be required at the inquest. It was Joseph Millard who told him this. The inquest? "'What inquest?' asked Reginald. "'The coroner's inquest, sir. "'It is to be held to-morrow in the great dining-room. "'Sir Oswald died so suddenly, you see, sir, "'that it's only natural there should be an inquest. "'I'm sorry to say there's a talk about his having committed suicide, poor gentleman.' "'Suicide? Yes, yes, that is possible. "'He may have committed suicide,' murmured Reginald. "'It's very dreadful, isn't it, sir?' The two doctors and Mr. Dalton, the lawyer, are together in the library. The body has been moved into the state bedroom. The lawyer emerged from the library at this moment, and approached Reginald. "'Can I speak with you for a few minutes, Mr. Eversleigh?' he asked. "'Certainly.' He went into the library, where he found the two doctors and another person whom he had not expected to see. This was a country gentleman— a wealthy landed squire and magistrate, whom Reginald Eversleigh had known from his boyhood. His name was Gilbert Ashburn, and he was an individual of considerable importance in the neighborhood of Raynham, near which village he had a fine estate. Mr. Ashburn was standing with his back to the empty fireplace, in conversation with one of the medical men, when Reginald entered the room. He advanced a few paces to shake hands with the young man, and then resumed his favorite magisterial attitude, leaning against the chimney-piece with his hands in his trousers' pockets. "'My dear Eversleigh,' he said, "'this is a very terrible affair, very terrible.' "'Yes, Mr. Ashburn, my uncle's sudden death is indeed terrible. "'But the manner of his death, it is not the suddenness only.' "'But the nature—' "'You forget, Mr. Ashburn,' interposed one of the medical men. "'Mr. Eversleigh knows nothing of the facts which I have stated to you.' "'Ah, he does not. I was not aware of that. "'You have no suspicion of any foul play in this sad business, eh, Mr. Eversleigh?' asked the magistrate. "'No,' answered Reginald. "'There is only one person I could possibly suspect.' "'and that person has herself given utterance to suspicions "'that sound like the ravings of madness.' "'You mean Lady Eversleigh?' said the Raynham doctor. "'Pardon me,' said Mr. Ashburn, "'but this business is altogether so painful "'that it obliges me to touch upon painful subjects. "'Is there any truth in the report which I have heard "'of Lady Eversleigh's flight on the evening of some rustic gathering?' "'Unhappily, the report has only too good a foundation. "'My uncle's wife did take flight with a lover on the night before last, "'but she returned yesterday and had an interview with her husband. "'What took place at that interview I cannot tell you, "'but I imagine that my uncle forbade her to remain beneath his roof. "'Immediately after she had left him, he sent for me, "'and announced his determination to reinstate me in my old position as his heir.' He would not, I am sure, have done this, had he believed his wife innocent. And she left the castle at his bidding? It was supposed that she left the castle, but this morning she reappeared and claimed the right to remain beneath this roof. 
and where had she passed the night? "'Not in her own apartments. "'Of that I have been informed by her maid, "'who believed that she had left Raynham for good.' "'Strange!' exclaimed the magistrate. "'If she is guilty, why does she remain here, "'where her guilt is known, "'where she may be suspected of a crime, "'and the most terrible of crimes?' "'Of what crime? "'Of murder, Mr. Eversleigh.' "'I regret to tell you that these two medical gentlemen concur "'in the opinion that your uncle's death was caused by poison. "'A post-mortem examination will be made to-night. "'Upon what evidence?' "'On the evidence of an empty glass, "'which is under lock and key in yonder cabinet,' "'answered the doctor from Plimborough, "'and at the bottom of which I found traces of one of the most powerful poisons "'known to those who are skilled in the science of toxicology, "'and on the further evidence of diagnostics, which I need not explain, "'the evidence of the dead man's appearance, Mr. Eversleigh, "'that your uncle died from the effects of poison, there cannot be the smallest doubt. "'The next question to be considered is whether that poison was administered by his own hand,' "'or the hand of an assassin.' "'He may have committed suicide,' said Reginald, with some hesitation. "'It is just possible,' answered Gilbert Ashburn, "'though, from my knowledge of your uncle's character, "'I should imagine it most unlikely. "'At any rate, his papers will reveal the state of his mind "'immediately before his death. "'It is my suggestion, therefore, "'that his papers should be examined immediately by you.' "'as his nearest relative and acknowledged heir. "'By me, as magistrate of the district, "'and in the presence of Mr. Dalton, "'who was your uncle's confidential solicitor, "'have you any objection to offer to this course, Mr. Eversleigh? "'Or, Sir Reginald, as I suppose I ought now to call you?' "'It was the first time Reginald Eversleigh "'had heard himself addressed by the title which was now his own, "'that title which... Born by the possessor of a great fortune, bestows so much dignity, but which, when held by a poor man, is so hollow a mockery. In spite of his fears, in spite of that sense of remorse which had come upon him since his uncle's death, the sound of the title was pleasant to his ears, and he stood for the moment silent, overpowered by the selfish rapture of gratified pride. The magistrate repeated his question. "'Have you any objection to offer, Sir Reginald?' "'None whatever, Mr. Ashburn. "'Reginald Eversleigh was only too glad to accede to the magistrate's proposition. "'He was feverishly anxious to see the will which was to make him master of Raynham. "'He knew that such a will had been duly executed. "'He had no reason to fear that it had been destroyed. "'But still he wanted to see it, to hold it in his hands.' to have incontestable proof of its existence. The examination of the papers was serious work. The lawyer suggested that the first to be scrutinized should be those that he had found on the table at which Sir Oswald had been writing. The first of these papers which came into the magistrate's hand was Mary Goodwin's letter. Reginald Eversleigh recognized the familiar handwriting, the faded ink and crumpled paper, he stretched out his hand at the moment Gilbert Ashburn was about to examine the document. "'That is a letter,' he said, "'a strictly private letter, which I recognize. "'It is addressed to me, as you will see, "'and posted in Paris nearly two years ago. "'I must beg you not to read it.' "'Very well, Sir Reginald. "'I will take your word for it. "'The letter has nothing to do with the subject of our present inquiry.' Certainly, a letter, posted in Paris two years ago, can scarcely have any connection with the state of your uncle's mind last night. The magistrate little thought how very important an influence that crumpled sheet of paper had exercised upon the events of the previous night. Gilbert Ashburn and the lawyer examined the rest of the packet. There were no papers of importance— "'nothing throwing any light upon late events "'except Lady Eversleigh's letter "'and the will made by the baronet "'immediately after his marriage. "'There is another and later will,' "'said Reginald eagerly, "'a will made last night "'and witnessed by Millard and Peterson. 
this earlier will ought to have been destroyed it is not of the least consequence sir reginald replied the solicitor the will of late estate is the true one if there should be a dozen in existence we had better search for the will made last night said reginald anxiously the magistrate and the lawyer complied they perceived the anxiety of the expectant heir and gave way to it the search occupied a long time but no second will was found the only will that could be discovered was that made within a week of the baronet's marriage the will attested last night must be in this room exclaimed reginald i will send for millard and you shall hear from his lips an exact account of what occurred the young man tried in vain to conceal the feeling of alarm which had taken possession of him what would be his position if this will should not be found a beggar steeped in crime he rang the bell and sent for the valet joseph millard came and repeated his account of the previous night's transaction it was clear that the will had been made it was equally clear that if it were still in existence it must be found in that room for the valet declared that his master had not left the library after the execution of the document i was on the watch and on the listen all night you see gentlemen said joseph millard for i was very uneasy about master knowing what trouble had come upon him and how he'd never been to bed all the night before i thought he might call me at any minute so i kept close at hand there's a little room next to this and i sat in there with the door open and though i dropped off into a doze now and then i never was sound enough asleep not to have heard this door open if it did open but i'll take my bible oath that sir oswald never left this room after me and peterson witnessed the will then the will must be somewhere in the room and it will be our business to find it answered mr ashburn that will do millard you can go the valet retired reginald recommenced the search for the will assisted by the magistrate and the lawyer while the two doctors stood by the fireplace talking together in suppressed tones this time the search left no crevice unexamined but all was done without avail and despair began to gain upon reginald eversleigh what if all the crime the falsehood the infamy of the past few days had been committed for no result he was turning over the papers in the bureau for the third or fourth time with trembling hands in the desperate hope that somehow or other the missing will might have escaped former investigations when he was arrested by a sudden exclamation from mr missenden the plimborough surgeon i don't think you need look any farther sir reginald said this gentleman what do you mean cried reginald eagerly i believe the will is found thank heaven exclaimed the young man you mistake sir reginald said mr missenden who was kneeling by the fireplace looking intently at some object in the polished steel fender if i am right and that this really is the document in question i fear it will be of very little use to you it has been destroyed gasped reginald i fear so this looks to me like the fragment of a will he handed reginald a scrap of paper which he had found amongst a heap of gray ashes it was scorched to a deep yellow color and burnt at the edges but the few words written upon it were perfectly legible nevertheless these words were the following nephew reginald eversleigh Rainham castle estate all lands and tenements appertaining sole use and benefit this was all reginald gazed at the scrap of scorched paper with wild dilated eyes all hope was gone there could be little doubt that this morsel of paper was all that remained of sir oswald eversleigh's latest will and the will made previously bequeathed raynham to the testator's widow a handsome fortune to each of the two dales and a pittance of five hundred a year to reginald the young man sank into a chair stricken down by this overwhelming blow his white face was the very picture of despair 
"'My uncle never destroyed this document,' he exclaimed. "'I will not believe it. "'Some treacherous hand has been thrust between me and my rights. "'Why should Sir Oswald have made a will in one hour "'and destroyed it in the next? "'What could have influenced him to alter his mind?' As he uttered these words, Reginald Eversleigh remembered that fatal letter of Mary Goodwin, which had been found lying uppermost amongst the late baronet's papers. That letter had caused Sir Oswald to disinherit his nephew once. Was it possible that the same letter had influenced him a second time? But the disappointed man did not suffer himself to dwell long on this subject. He thought of his uncle's widow— and the triumph that she had won over the schemers who had plotted so basely to achieve her destruction. A savage fury filled his soul as he thought of Honoria. "'This will has been destroyed by the one person most interested in its destruction,' he cried. "'Who can doubt now that my uncle was poisoned, and the will destroyed by the same person? And who can doubt that person to be Lady Eversleigh?' "'My dear sir,' exclaimed Mr. Ashburn, "'this really will not do. "'I cannot listen to such accusations "'unsupported by any evidence. "'What evidence do you need "'except the evidence of truth?' "'cried Reginald passionately. "'Who else was interested "'in the destruction of that paper? "'Who else was likely to desire "'my uncle's death? "'Who but his false and guilty wife?' She had been banished from beneath this roof. She was supposed to have left the castle, but instead of going away, she remained in hiding, waiting her chances. If there has been a murder committed, who can doubt that she is the murderess? Who can question that it was she who burnt the will which robbed her of wealth and station and branded her with disgrace? You are too impetuous, Sir Reginald returned the magistrate. I will own there are grounds for suspicion in the circumstances of which you speak, but in such a terrible affair as this there must be no jumping at conclusions. However, the death of your uncle by poison immediately after the renunciation of his wife, and the burning of the will which transferred the estates from her to you, are, when considered in conjunction, so very mysterious not to say suspicious, that I shall consider myself justified in issuing a warrant for the detention of Lady Eversleigh upon suspicion of being concerned in the death of her husband. I shall hold an inquiry here to-morrow, immediately after the coroner's inquest, and shall endeavour to sift matters most thoroughly. If Lady Eversleigh is innocent, her temporary arrest can do her no harm." She will not be called upon to leave her own apartments, and very few outside the castle, or indeed within it, need be aware of her arrest. I think I will wait upon her myself, and explain the painful necessity. Yes, and be duped by her plausible tongue, cried Reginald bitterly. She completely bewitched my poor uncle. Do you know that he picked her up out of the gutter? and knew no more of her past life than he knew of the inhabitants of the other planets? If you see her, she will fool you as she fooled him. I am not afraid of her witcheries, answered the magistrate with dignity. I shall do my duty, Sir Reginald. You may depend upon it. Reginald Eversleigh said no more. He left the library without uttering a word to any of the gentlemen. The despair which had seized upon him was too terrible for words. Alone, locked in his own room, he gnashed his teeth in agony. Fools, dolts, idiots that we have been, with all our deeply laid plots and subtle scheming, he cried as he paced up and down the room in a paroxysm of mad rage. She triumphs in spite of us. She can laugh us to scorn. And Victor Carrington, the man whose intellect was to conquer impossibilities. What a shallow fool he has shown himself after all. I thought there was something superhuman in his success. So strangely did fate seem to favor his scheming. 
and now at the last when the cup was at my lips it is snatched away and dashed to the ground Chapter Twelve, Part One, of Run to Earth, a Novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Twelve, A Friend in Need, Part One. While the new baronet abandoned himself to the anguish of disappointed avarice and ambition. Honoria sat quietly in her own apartments, brooding very sadly over her husband's death. She had loved him honestly and truly. No younger lover had ever won possession of her heart. Her life, before her meeting with Sir Oswald, had been too miserable for the indulgence of the romantic dreams or poetic fancies of girlhood. The youthful feelings of this woman, who called herself Honoria, had been withered by the blasting influence of crime. It was only when gratitude for Sir Oswald's goodness melted the ice of that proud nature, it was then only that Honoria's womanly tenderness awoke. It was then only that affection, a deep-felt and pure affection, for the first time occupied her heart. That affection was all the more intense in its nature, because it was the first love of a noble heart. Honoria had reverenced in her husband all that she had ever known of manly virtue. And he was lost to her. He had died believing her false. I could have borne anything but that, she thought, in her desolation. The magistrate came to her and explained the painful necessity under which he found himself placed, but he did not tell her of the destruction of the will, nor yet that the medical men had pronounced decisively as to Sir Oswald's death. He only told her that there were suspicious circumstances connected with that death, and that it was considered necessary there should be a careful investigation of those circumstances. "'The investigation cannot be too complete,' replied Honoria eagerly. "'I know that there has been foul play, and that the best and noblest of men has fallen a victim to the hand of an assassin.' Oh, sir, if you are able to distinguish truth from falsehood, I implore you to listen to the story which my poor husband refused to believe, the story of the basest treachery that was ever plotted against a helpless woman. Mr. Ashburn declared himself willing to hear any statement Lady Eversleigh might wish to make, but he warned her that it was just possible that statement might be used against her hereafter. Honoria told him the circumstances which she had related to Sir Oswald, the false alarm about her husband, the drive to Yarborough Tower, and the night of agony spent within the ruins. But, to her horror, she perceived that this man also disbelieved her. The story seemed wild and improbable, and people had already condemned her. They were prepared to hear a fabrication from her lips— and the truth which she had to tell seemed the most clumsy and shallow of inventions. Gilbert Ashburn did not tell her that he doubted her, but, polite as his words were, she could read the indications of distrust in his face. She could see that he thought worse of her after having heard the statement which was her sole justification. "'And where is this Mr. Carrington to be found?' he asked presently. I do not know. Having accomplished his base plot and caused his friend's restoration to the estates, I suppose he has taken care to go far away from the scene of his infamy. The magistrate looked searchingly at her face. Was this acting, or was she ignorant of the destruction of the will? Did she indeed believe that the estates were lost to herself? Before the hour at which the coroner's inquest was to be held in the great dining-room, Reginald Eversleigh and Victor Carrington met at the appointed spot in the Avenue of Furs. One glance at his friend's face informed Victor that some fatal event had occurred since the previous day. 
Reginald told him in brief, passionate words of the destruction of the will. "'You are a clever schemer, no doubt, Mr. Carrington,' he added bitterly. "'But clever as you are, you have been outwitted as completely as the veriest fool that ever blundered into ruin. Do you understand, Carrington? We are not richer by one halfpenny for all your scheming.' Carrington was silent for a while, but when, after a considerable pause, he at length spoke, his voice betrayed a despair as intense in its quiet depth as the louder passion of his companion. "'I cannot believe it,' he exclaimed in a hoarse whisper. "'I tell you, man, you must have made some senseless mistake. The will cannot have been destroyed.' "'I had the fragments in my hand,' answered Reginald. "'I saw my name written on the worthless scrap of burnt paper. All that was left besides that wretched fragment were the ashes in the grate.' I saw the will executed. I saw it within a few hours of Sir Oswald's death. You saw it done? Yes. I was outside the window of the library. And you— Oh, it is too horrible, cried Reginald. What is too horrible? The deed that was done that night. That deed is no business of ours, answered Victor. The person who destroyed the will was your uncle's assassin if he died by the hand of an assassin. Do you really believe that, Carrington, or are you only fooling me? What else should I believe? The two men parted. Reginald Eversleigh knew that his presence would be required at the coroner's inquest. The surgeon did not attempt to detain him. For the time at least, this arch-plotter found himself suddenly brought to a standstill. The inquest commenced almost immediately after Reginald's return to the castle. The first witness examined was the valet, who had been the person to discover the death. The next were the two medical men, whose evidence was of a most important nature. It was a closed court, and no one was admitted who was not required to give evidence. Lady Eversleigh sat at the opposite end of the table to that occupied by the coroner. She had declined to avail herself of the services of any legal adviser. She had declared her determination to trust in her own innocence, and in that alone. Proud, calm, and self-possessed, she confronted the solemn assembly, and did not shrink from the scrutinizing looks that met her eyes in every direction. Reginald Eversleigh contemplated her with a feeling of murderous hatred as he took his place at some little distance from her seat. The evidence of Mr. Missenden was to the effect that Sir Oswald Eversleigh had died from the effects of a subtle and little-known poison. He had discovered traces of this poison in the empty glass which had been found upon the table beside the dead man and he had discovered further traces of the same poison in the stomach of the deceased. After the medical witnesses had both been examined, Peterson, the butler, was sworn. He related the facts connected with the execution of the will, and further stated that it was he who had carried the carafe of water, claret jug, and the empty glass to Sir Oswald. "'Did you fetch the water yourself?' asked the coroner. "'Yes, your worship.' Sir Oswald was very particular about the water being iced. I took it from a filter in my own charge. And the glass? I took the glass from my own pantry. Are you sure there was nothing in the glass when you took the salver to your master? Quite sure, sir. I'm very particular about having all my glass bright and clear. It is the under-butler's duty to see to that, and it's my duty to keep him up to his work. I should have seen in a moment if the glass had been dull and smudgy at the bottom. The water remaining in the carafe had been examined by the medical witnesses, and had been declared by them to be perfectly pure. The claret had been untouched. The poison could, therefore, have only been introduced to the baronet's room in the glass, and the butler protested that no one but himself and his assistant had access to the place in which the glass had been kept. How, then, could the baronet have been poisoned, except by his own hand? Reginald Eversleigh was one of the last witnesses examined. 
He told of the interview between himself and his uncle on the day preceding Sir Oswald's death. He told of Lydia Graham's revelations. He told everything calculated to bring disgrace upon the woman who sat, pale and silent, confronting her fate. She seemed unmoved by these scandalous revelations. She had passed through such bitter agony within the last few days and nights that it seemed to her as if nothing could have power to move her more. She had endured the shame of her husband's distrust. The man she loved so dearly had cast her from him with disdain and aversion. What new agony could await her equal to that through which she had passed? Reginald Eversleigh's hatred and rage betrayed him into passing the limits of prudence. He told the story of the destroyed will, and boldly accused Lady Eversleigh of having destroyed it. "'You forget yourself, Sir Reginald,' said the coroner. "'You are here as a witness, and not as an accuser.' "'But am I to keep silence when I know that yonder woman is guilty of a crime by which I am robbed of my heritage?' cried the young man passionately. "'Who but she was interested in the destruction of that will? Who had so strong a motive for wishing my uncle's death? Why was she hiding in the castle after her pretended departure, except for some guilty purpose? She left her own apartments before dusk, after writing a farewell letter to her husband. Where was she, and what was she doing after leaving those apartments? "'Let me answer those questions, Sir Reginald Eversleigh,' said a voice from the doorway. The young baronet turned and recognized the speaker. It was his uncle's old friend, Captain Copplestone, who had made his way into the room unheard while Reginald had been giving his evidence— he was still seated in his invalid chair, still unable to move without its aid. "'Let me answer those questions,' he repeated. "'I have only just heard of Lady Eversleigh's painful position. I beg to be sworn immediately, for my evidence may be of some importance to that lady.' Reginald sat down, unable to contest the captain's right to be heard, though he would fain have done so. Lady Eversleigh, for the first time that day, gave evidence of some slight emotion. She raised her eyes to Captain Copplestone's bronzed face with a tearful glance, expressive of gratitude and confidence. The captain was duly sworn, and then proceeded to give his evidence in brief, abrupt sentences, without waiting to be questioned. "'You ask where Lady Eversleigh spent the night of her husband's death, and how she spent it. I can answer both those questions.' She spent that night in my room, nursing a sick old man, who was mad with the tortures of rheumatic gout, and weeping over Sir Oswald's refusal to believe in her innocence. You'll ask, perhaps, how she came to be in my apartments on that night. I'll answer you in a few words. Before leaving the castle, she came to my room, and asked my old servant to admit her. She had been very kind and attentive to me throughout my illness— my servant is a gruff and tough old fellow, but he is grateful for any kindness that's shown to his master. He admitted Lady Eversleigh to see me, ill as I was. She told me the whole story which she had told her husband. He refused to believe me, Captain Copplestone, she said. He, who once loved me so dearly, refused to believe me. So I come to you, his best and oldest friend— in the hope that you may think better of me, and that some day, when I am far away, and time has softened my husband's heart towards me, you may speak a good word in my behalf. And I did believe her. Yes, Mr. Eversleigh, or Sir Reginald Eversleigh, I did, and I do believe that lady. Captain Copplestone, said the coroner, we really do not require all these particulars. The question is— when did Lady Eversleigh enter your rooms, and when did she quit them? She came to me at dusk, and she did not leave my rooms until the next morning, after the discovery of my poor friend's death. When she had told me her story, and her intention of leaving the castle immediately, I begged her to remain until the next day. She would be safe in my rooms, I told her. 
No one but myself and my old servant would know that she had not really left the castle, and the next day, when Sir Oswald's passion had been calmed by reflection, I should be able, perhaps, to intercede successfully for the wife whose innocence I most implicitly believed, in spite of all the circumstances that had conspired to condemn her. Lady Eversleigh knew my influence over her husband, and after some persuasion consented to take my advice. My diabolical gout happened to be a good deal worse than usual that night, and my friend's wife assisted my servant to nurse me with the patience of an angel, or a sister of charity. From the beginning to the end of that fatal night she never left my apartments. She entered my room before the will could have been executed, and she did not leave it until after her husband's death. "'Your evidence is conclusive, Captain Copplestone, and it exonerates her ladyship from all suspicion,' said the coroner. "'My evidence can be confirmed in every particular by my old servant, Solomon Grundy,' said the captain, "'if it requires confirmation.' "'It requires none, Captain Copplestone.' Reginald Eversleigh gnawed his bearded lip savagely. This man's evidence proved that Lady Eversleigh had not destroyed the will. Sir Oswald himself, therefore, must have burned the precious document. And for what reason? A horrible conviction now took possession of the young baronet's mind. He believed that Mary Goodwin's letter had been for the second time instrumental in the destruction of his prospects. A fatal accident had thrown it in his uncle's way after the execution of the will, and the sight of that letter had recalled to Sir Oswald the stern resolution at which he had arrived in Arlington Street. Utter ruin stared Reginald Eversleigh in the face. The possessor of an empty title, and of an income which, to a man of his expensive habits, was the merest pittance, he saw before him a life of unmitigated wretchedness. But he did not execrate his own sins and vices for the misery which they had brought upon him. He cursed the failure of Victor Carrington's schemes, and thought of himself as the victim of Victor Carrington's blundering. The verdict of the coroner's jury was an open one, to the effect that Sir Oswald Eversleigh died by poison, but by whom administered there was no evidence to show. The general opinion of those who had listened to the evidence was that the baronet had committed suicide. Public opinion around and about Raynham was terribly against his widow. Sir Oswald had been universally esteemed and respected, and his melancholy end was looked on as her work. She had been acquitted of any positive hand in his death, but she was not acquitted of the guilt of having broken his heart by her falsehood. Her obscure origin, her utter friendlessness, influenced people against her. What must be the past life of this woman, who, in the hour of her widowhood, had not one friend to come forward to support and protect her? The world always chooses to see the darker side of the picture— Nobody for a moment imagined that Honoria Eversleigh might possibly be the innocent victim in the villainy of others. The funeral of Sir Oswald Eversleigh was conducted with all the pomp and splendor befitting the burial of a man whose race had held the land for centuries, with untarnished fame and honor. The day of the funeral was dark, cold and gloomy. Stormy winds howled and shrieked among the oaks and beeches of Raynham Park. The tall firs in the avenue were tossed to and fro in the blast, like the funereal plumes of that stately hearse which was to issue at noon from the quadrangle of the castle. It was difficult to believe that less than a fortnight had elapsed since that bright and balmy day on which the picnic had been held at the wizard's cave. Lady Eversleigh had declared her intention of following her husband to his last resting-place. She had been told that it was unusual for women of the higher classes to take part in a funeral cortege, but she had steadfastly adhered to her resolution. "'You tell me it is not the fashion,' she said to Mr. Ashburn. "'I do not care for fashion. 
I would offer the last mark of respect and affection to the husband who was my dearest and truest friend upon this earth, and without whom the earth is very desolate for me. If the dead pass at once into those heavenly regions where divine wisdom reigns supreme over all mortal weakness, the emancipated spirit of him who goes to his tomb this day knows that my love, my faith never faltered. If I have wronged him as the world believes, Mr. Ashburn, I must indeed be the most hardened of wretches to insult the dead by my presence. Accept my determination as a proof of my innocence, if you can. The question of your guilt or innocence is a dark enigma which I cannot take upon myself to solve, Lady Eversleigh, answered Gilbert Ashburn gravely. It would be an unspeakable relief to my mind if I could think you innocent. Unhappily, circumstances combine to condemn you in such a manner that even Christian charity can scarcely admit the possibility of your innocence. Yes, murmured the widow sadly, I am the victim of a plot so skillfully devised, so subtly woven, that I can scarcely wonder if the world refuses to believe me guiltless. And yet you see that honourable soldier, that brave and true-hearted gentleman, Captain Copplestone, does not think me the wretch I seem to be. Captain Copplestone is a man who allows himself to be guided by his instincts and impulses, and who takes a pride in differing from his fellow men. I am a man of the world, and I am unable to form any judgment which is not justified by facts. If facts combine to condemn you, Lady Eversleigh, you must not think me harsh or cruel if I cannot bring myself to acquit you. During the preceding conversation, Honoria Eversleigh had revealed the most gentle, the most womanly side of her character. There had been a pleading tone in her voice, an appealing softness in her glances. But now the expression of her face changed all at once. The beautiful countenance grew cold and stern, the haughty lip quivered with the agony of offended pride. Enough, she said. I will never again trouble you, Mr. Ashburn, by entreating your merciful consideration. Let your judgment be the judgment of the world. I am content to await the hour of my justification. I am content to trust in time, the avenger of all wrongs, and the consoler of all sorrows. In the meanwhile, I will stand alone, a woman without a friend, a woman who has to fight her own battles with the world. Gilbert Ashburn could not withhold his respect from the woman who stood before him, queen-like in her calm dignity. She may be the basest and vilest of her sex, he thought to himself as he left her. Chapter Twelve, Part Two, of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Twelve, A Friend in Need, Part Two. The funeral procession was to leave Raynham at noon. At eleven o'clock, the arrival of Mister Lionel Dale and Mr. Douglas Dale was announced. These two gentlemen had just arrived at the castle, and the elder of the two requested the favor of an interview with his uncle's widow. She was seated in one of the apartments which had been allotted to her a special use when she arrived, a proud and happy bride, from her brief honeymoon tour. It was the spacious morning-room which had been sacred to the late Lady Eversleigh, Sir Oswald's mother. Here the widow sat in the hour of her desolation, unhonored, unloved, without friend or counsellor, unless indeed the gallant soldier who had defended her from the suspicion of a hideous crime might stoop to befriend her further in her bitter need. She sat alone, uncertain after the reading of the dead man's will, whether she might not be thrust forth from the doors of Raynham Castle shelterless 
homeless, penniless, once more a beggar and an outcast. Her heart was so cruelly stricken by the crushing blow that had fallen upon her, the grief she felt for her husband's untimely fate was so deep and sincere that she thought but little of her own future. She had ceased to feel either hope or fear. Let fate do its worst. No sorrow that could come to her in the future, no disgrace, no humiliation, could equal in bitterness that fiery ordeal through which she had passed during the last few days. Lionel Dale was ushered into the morning-room while Lady Eversleigh sat by the hearth, absorbed in gloomy thought. She rose as Lionel Dale entered the room and received him with stately courtesy. She was prepared to find herself despised by this young man, who would in all probability very speedily learn, or who had perhaps already learned, the story of her degradation. She was prepared to find herself misjudged by him. But he was the nephew of the man who had once so devotedly loved her, the husband whose memory was hallowed for her, and she was determined to receive him with all respect for the sake of the beloved and honored dead. "'You are doubtless surprised to see me here, madam,' said Mr. Dale, in a tone whose chilling accent told Honoria that this stranger was already prejudiced against her. "'I have received no invitation to take part in the sad ceremonial of to-day, either from you or from Sir Reginald Eversleigh. But I loved Sir Oswald very dearly, and I am here to pay the last poor tribute of respect to that honoured and generous friend.' "'Permit me thank you for that tribute,' answered Lady Eversleigh. If I did not invite you and your brother to attend the funeral, it was from no wish to exclude you. My desires have been in no manner consulted with regard to the arrangements of to-day. Very bitter misery has fallen upon me within the last fortnight. Heaven alone knows how undeserved that misery has been, and I know not whether this roof will shelter me after to-day." She looked at the stranger very earnestly as she said this. It was bitter to stand quite alone in the world, to know herself utterly fallen in the estimation of all around her, and she looked at Lionel Dale with a faint hope that she might discover some touch of compassion, some shadow of doubt in his countenance. Alas, no, there was none. It was a frank, handsome face— a face that was no polished mask beneath which the real man concealed himself. It was a true and noble countenance, easy to read as an open book. Honoria looked at it with despair in her heart, for she perceived but too plainly that this man also despised her. She understood at once that he had been told the story of his uncle's death, and regarded her as the indirect cause of that fatal event. And she was right. He had arrived at the chief inn in Raynham two hours before, and there he had heard the story of Lady Eversleigh's flight and Sir Oswald's sudden death, with some details of the inquest. Slow to believe evil, he had questioned Gilbert Ashburn before accepting the terrible story as he had heard it from the landlord of the inn. Mr. Ashburn only confirmed that story, and admitted that, in his opinion, the flight and disgrace of the wife had been the sole cause of the death of the husband. Once having heard this, and from the lips of a man whom he knew to be the soul of truth and honor, Lionel Dale had but one feeling for his uncle's widow, and that feeling was abhorrence. He saw her in her beauty and her desolation— but he had no pity for her miserable position, and her beauty inspired him only with loathing, for had not that beauty been the first cause of Sir Oswald Eversleigh's melancholy fate? "'I wished to see you, madam,' said Lionel Dale, after that silence which seemed so long, in order to apologize for a visit which might appear an intrusion. Having done so, I need trouble you no further.' He bowed with chilling courtesy and left the room. He had uttered no word of consolation, no assurance of sympathy, 
to that pale widow of a week. Nothing could have been more marked than the omission of those customary phrases, and Honoria keenly felt their absence. The dead leaves strewed the avenue along which Sir Oswald Eversleigh went to his last resting place. The dead leaves fluttered slowly downward from the giant oaks, the noble old beeches. There was not one gleam of sunshine on the landscape, not one break in the leaden gray of the sky. It seemed as if the funeral of departed summer was being celebrated on this first dreary autumn day. Lady Eversleigh occupied the second carriage in the stately procession. She was alone. Captain Copplestone was confined to his room by the gout. She went alone, tearless, in outward aspect calm as a statue, but the face of the corpse hidden in the coffin could scarcely have been whiter than hers. As the procession passed out of the gates of Raynham, a tramp who stood among the rest of the crowd was strangely startled by the sight of that beautiful face, so lovely even in its marble whiteness. "'Who is that woman sitting in yonder carriage?' he asked. He was a rough, barefooted vagabond, with a dark, evil-looking countenance, which he did well to keep shrouded by the broad brim of his battered hat. He looked more like a smuggler or a sailor than an agricultural laborer, and his skin was bronzed by long exposure to the weather. "'She's Sir Oswald's widow,' answered one of the bystanders, "'She's his widow. More shame for her. "'It was she that brought him to his death with her disgraceful goings-on.' "'The man who spoke was a Raynham tradesman. "'What goings-on?' asked the tramp eagerly. "'I'm a stranger in these parts and don't know anything about yonder funeral.' "'More's the pity,' replied the tradesman. "'Everybody ought to know the story of that fine madam who just passed us by in her carriage.' It might serve as a warning for honest men not to be led away by a pretty face. That white-faced woman yonder is Lady Eversleigh. Nobody knows who she was or where she came from before Sir Oswald brought her home here. She hadn't been home a month before she ran away from her husband with a young foreigner. She repented her wickedness before she got very far and begged and prayed to be took back again and vowed and declared that she'd been lured away by a villain, and that it was all a mistake. That's how I've heard the story from the servants and one and another. But Sir Oswald would not speak to her, and she would have been turned out of doors if it hadn't been for an old friend of his. However, the end of her wickedness was that Sir Oswald poisoned himself, as every one knows. No more was said. The tramp followed the procession with the rest of the crowd, first to the village church, where a portion of the funeral service was read, and then back to the park, where the melancholy ceremonial was completed before the family mausoleum. It was while the crowd made a circle round this mausoleum that the tramp contrived to push his way to the front rank of the spectators. He stood foremost amongst a group of villagers, when Lady Eversleigh happened to look towards the spot where he was stationed. In that moment, a sudden change came over the face of the widow. Its marble whiteness was dyed by a vivid crimson, a sudden flush of shame or indignation, which passed away quickly, but a dark shadow remained upon Lady Eversleigh's brow after that red glow had faded from her cheek. No one observed that change of countenance, the moment was a solemn one, and even those who did not really feel its solemnity affected to do so. At the last instant, when the iron doors of the mausoleum closed with a clanging sound upon the new inmate of that dark abode, Honoria's fortitude all at once forsook her. One long cry, which was like a shriek, wrung from the spirit of despair, broke from her colorless lips and in the next moment she had sunk fainting upon the ground before those inexorable doors. No sympathizing eyes had watched her looks, or friendly arm was stretched forth in time to support her. But when she lay lifeless and unconscious on the sodden grass, 
Some touch of pity stirred the hearts of the two brothers, Lionel and Douglas Dale. The elder, Lionel, stepped forward and lifted that lifeless form from the ground. He carried the unconscious widow to the carriage, where he seated her. Sense returned only too quickly to that tortured brain. Honoria Eversleigh opened her eyes and recognized the man who stood by her side. "'I am better now,' she said. "'Do not let my weakness cause you any trouble. I do not often faint, but that last moment was too bitter.' "'Are you really quite recovered? Can I venture to leave you?' asked Lionel Dale, in a much kinder tone than he had employed before in speaking to his uncle's widow. "'Yes, indeed. I have quite recovered. I thank you for your kindness.' murmured Honoria gently. Lionel Dale went back to the carriage allotted to himself and his brother. On his way he encountered Reginald Eversleigh. "'I have heard it whispered that my uncle's wife was an actress,' said Reginald. "'That exhibition just now was rather calculated to confirm the idea.' "'If by exhibition you mean that outburst of despair, I am convinced that it was perfectly genuine,' answered Lionel coldly. "'I am sorry you are so easily duped, my dear Lionel,' returned his cousin with a sneer. "'I did not think a pretty face would have such influence over you.' No more was said. The two men passed to their respective carriages, and the funeral procession moved homewards. In the grand dining hall of the castle, Sir Oswald's lawyer was to read the will. Kinsmen, friends, servants— all were assembled to hear the reading of that solemn document. In the place of honor sat Lady Eversleigh. She sat on the right hand of the lawyer, calm and dignified, as if no taint of suspicion had ever tarnished her fame. The solicitor read the will. It was that will which Sir Oswald had executed immediately after his marriage, the will of which he had spoken to his nephew, Reginald. It made Honoria Eversleigh sole mistress of the Raynham estates. It gave to Lionel and Douglas Dale property worth ten thousand a year. It gave to Reginald a small estate, producing an income of five hundred a year. To Captain Copplestone, the baronet left a legacy of three thousand pounds and an antique seal ring, which had been worn by himself. The old servants of Raynham were all remembered, and some curious old plate and gold snuff-boxes were left to Mr. Wargrave, the rector, and Gilbert Ashburn. This was all. Five hundred a year was the amount by which Reginald had profited by the death of a generous kinsman. By the terms of Sir Oswald's will, the estates of Lionel and Douglas Dale would revert to Reginald Eversleigh, in case the owners should die without direct heirs. If either of these young men were to die unmarried, his brother would succeed to his estate, worth five thousand a year. But if both should die, Reginald Eversleigh would become the owner of double that amount. It was the merest chance, the shadow of a chance, for the lives of both young men were better than his own inasmuch as both had led healthful and steadier lives than the dissipated Reginald Eversleigh. But even this poor chance was something. "'They may die,' he thought. "'Death lurks in every bush that borders the highway of life. They or both may die, and I may regain the wealth that should have been mine.' He looked at the two young men. Lionel, the elder, was the handsomer of the two. He was fair— with brown curling hair and frank blue eyes. Reginald, as he looked at him, thought bitterly, I must indeed be the very fool of hope and credulity to fancy he will not marry, but if he were safe, I should not so much fear Douglas. The younger, Douglas, was a man whom some people would have called plain, but the dark, sallow face, with its irregular features, was illuminated by an expression of mingled intelligence and amiability which possessed a charm for all judges worth pleasing. Lionel was the clergyman, Douglas the lawyer, or rather law student, for the glory of his maiden brief was yet to come. How Reginald envied these fortunate kinsmen! 
He hated them with passionate hate. He looked from them to Honoria, the woman against whom he had plotted, the woman who triumphed in spite of him, for he could not imagine that grief for a dead husband could have any place in the heart of a woman who found herself mistress of such a domain as Raynham and its dependencies. Lady Eversleigh's astonishment was unbounded. This will placed her in even a loftier position than that which she had occupied when possessed of the confidence and affection of her husband. For her pride there was some consolation in this thought, but the triumph, which was sweet to the proud spirit, afforded no balm for the wounded heart. He was gone, he whose love had made her mistress of that wealth and splendor. He was gone from her for ever, and he had died believing her false. In the midst of her triumph the widow bowed her head upon her hands and sobbed convulsively. The tears wrung from her in this moment were the first she had shed that day, and they were very bitter. Reginald Eversleigh watched her with scorn and hatred in his heart. "'What do you say now, Lionel?' he said to his cousin, when the three young men had left the dining-hall and were seated at luncheon in a smaller chamber. "'You did not think my respected aunt a clever actress when she fainted before the doors of the mausoleum. You will at least acknowledge that the piece of acting she favoured us with just now was superb. What do you mean by a piece of acting? That outburst of grief which my lady indulged in when she found herself mistress of Raynham. I believe that it was genuine, answered Mr. Dale gravely. Oh, you think the inheritance a fitting subject for lamentation? No, Reginald. I think a woman who had wronged her husband and had been the indirect cause of his death might well feel sorrow when she discovered how deeply she had been loved, and how fully she had been trusted by that generous husband. Bah! cried Reginald contemptuously. I tell you, man, Lady Eversleigh is a consummate actress, though she never acted before a better audience than the clodhoppers at a country fair. Do you know who my lady was when Sir Oswald picked her out of the gutter? If you don't, I'll enlighten you. She was a street ballad singer, whom the baronet found one night starving in the marketplace of a country town. He picked her up, out of charity, and because the creature happened to have a pretty face, he was weak enough to marry her. Respect the follies of the dead, replied Lionel. My uncle's love was generous. I only regret that the object of it was so unworthy. Oh, exclaimed Reginald. I thought just now that you sympathized with my lady. I sympathize with every remorseful sinner, said Lionel. Ah, that's your shop, cried Reginald, who could not conceal his bitter feelings. You sympathize with Lady Eversleigh because she is a wealthy sinner and mistress of Raynham Castle. Perhaps you'll stop here and try to step into Sir Oswald's shoes. I don't know whether there's any law against a man marrying his uncle's widow. You insult me, and you insult the dead, Sir Reginald, by the tone in which you discuss these things, answered Lionel Dale. I shall leave Raynham by this evening's coach, and there is little likelihood that Lady Eversleigh and I shall ever meet again. It is not for me to judge her sins, or penetrate the secrets of her heart. I believe that her grief today was thoroughly genuine. It is not because a woman has sinned that she must needs be incapable of any womanly feeling. "'You are in a very charitable humor, Lionel,' said Sir Reginald with a sneer. "'But you can afford to be charitable.' Mr. Dale did not reply to this insolent speech. Sir Reginald Eversleigh and his two cousins left the village of Raynham by the same coach. The evening was finer than the day had been, and a full moon steeped the landscape in her soft light as the travellers looked their last on the grand old castle. The baronet contemplated the scene with unmitigated rage. Hers, he muttered, hers, to have and hold so long as she lives. A nameless woman has tricked me out of the inheritance which should have been mine. But let her beware. Despair is bold, and I may yet discover some mode of vengeance. While the departing traveller mused thus, 
a pale woman stood at one of the windows of Raynham Castle, looking out upon the woods, over which the moon sailed in all her glory. Mine, she said to herself, those lands and woods belong to me, to me, who have stood face to face with starvation, to me, who have considered it a privilege to sleep in an empty barn. They are mine, but the possession of them brings no pleasure. My life has been blighted by a wrong so... Chapter 13 of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 13 In Your Patience Ye Are Strong Early upon the morning after the funeral, a lad from the village of Raynham presented himself at the principal door of the servants' offices, and asked to see Lady Eversleigh's maid. The young woman who filled that office was summoned, and came to inquire the business of the messenger. Her name was Jane Payland. She was a Londoner by birth, and a citizen of the world by education. She had known very little of either comfort or prosperity before she entered the service of Lady Eversleigh. She was, therefore, in some measure at least, devoted to the interests of that mistress, and she was inclined to believe in her innocence, though even to her the story of the night in Yarbower Tower seemed almost too wild and improbable for belief. Jane Payland was about twenty-four years of age, tall, slim, and active. She had no pretensions to beauty, but was the sort of person who is generally called ladylike. This morning she went to the little lobby in which the boy had been told to wait, indignant at the impertinence of any one who could dare to intrude upon her mistress at such a time. "'Who are you, and what do you want?' she asked angrily. "'If you please, ma'am, I'm Widow Beckett's son,' the boy answered, in evident terror of the young woman in the rustling black silk dress and smart cap. "'And I've brought this letter, please.' "'and I was only to give it to the lady's own maid, please.' "'I am her own maid,' answered Jane. "'The boy handed her a dirty-looking letter, "'directed in a bold, clear hand to Lady Eversleigh. "'Who gave you this?' asked Jane Payland, "'looking at the dirty envelope with extreme disgust. "'It was a tramp as give it me, "'a tramp as I met in the village, "'and I'm to wait for an answer, please.' "'and I'm to take it to him at the Hen and Chickens. "'How dare you bring Lady Eversleigh a letter given you by a tramp? "'A begging letter, of course. "'I wonder at your impudence.' "'I didn't go to do no harm,' expostulated Master Beckett. "'He says to me, he says, "'if her ladyship once sets eyes upon that letter, "'she'll answer it fast enough. "'And now you cut and run,' he says.' "'It's a matter of life and death, it is, "'and it won't do to waste time over it.' "'These words were rather startling to the mind of Jane Payland. "'What was she to do? "'Her own idea was that the letter was the concoction "'of some practised impostor, "'and that it would be an act of folly to take it to her mistress. "'But what if the letter should be really of importance? "'What if there should be some meaning in the boy's words?' "'Was it not her duty to convey the letter to Lady Eversleigh? "'Stay here till I return,' she said, pointing to a bench in the lobby. "'The boy seated himself on the extremest edge of the bench, "'with his hat on his knee, and Jane Payland left him. "'She went straight to the suite of apartments occupied by Lady Eversleigh. "'Honoria did not raise her eyes when Jane Payland entered the room.' There was a gloomy abstraction in her face, and melancholy engrossed her thoughts. "'I beg pardon for disturbing you, my lady,' said Jane. "'But a lad from the village has brought a letter, given him by a tramp, and, according to his account, the man talked in such a very strange manner 
that I thought I really ought to tell you, my lady, and— To the surprise of Jane Payland, Lady Eversleigh started suddenly from her seat and advanced towards her, awakened into sudden life and energy as by a spell. "'Give me the letter!' she cried abruptly. She took the soiled and crumpled envelope from her servant's hand with a hasty gesture. "'You may go,' she said. "'I will ring when I want you.' Jane Payland would have given a good deal to see that letter opened, but she had no excuse for remaining longer in the room. So she departed and went to her lady's dressing-room, which, as well as all the other apartments, opened out of the corridor. In about a quarter of an hour— Lady Eversleigh's bell rang, and Jane hurried to the morning-room. She found her mistress still seated by the hearth. Her desk stood open on the table by her side, and on the desk lay a letter, so newly addressed that the ink on the envelope was still wet. "'You will take that to the lad who is waiting,' said Honoria, pointing to this newly written letter. "'Yes, my lady.' Jane Payland departed. On the way between Lady Eversleigh's room and the lobby in the servants' offices, she had ample leisure to examine the letter. It was addressed, Mr. Brown, at the Hen and Chickens. It was sealed with a plain seal. Jane Payland was very well acquainted with the writing of her mistress, and she perceived at once that this letter was not directed in Lady Eversleigh's usual hand. The writing had been disguised. It was evident, therefore, that this was a letter which Lady Eversleigh would have shrunk from avowing as her own. Every moment the mystery grew darker. Jane Payland liked her mistress, but there were two things which she liked still better. Those two things were power and gain. She perceived in the possession of her lady's secrets a high road to the mastery of both. Thus it happened that— when she had very nearly arrived at the lobby where the boy was waiting, Jane Palin suddenly changed her mind, and darted off in another direction. She hurried along a narrow passage, up the servant's staircase, and into her own room. Here she remained for some fifteen or twenty minutes, occupied with some task which required the aid of a lighted candle. At the end of that time she emerged, with a triumphant smile upon her thin lips, and Lady Eversleigh's letter in her hand. The seal which secured the envelope was a blank seal, but it was not the same as the one with which Honoria Eversleigh had fastened her letter half an hour before. The Abigail carried the letter to the boy, and the boy departed, very well pleased to get clear of the castle without having received any further reproof. He went at his best speed to the little inn, where he inquired for Mr. Brown. That gentleman emerged presently from the inn-yard, where he had been hanging about, listening to all that was to be heard, and talking to the ostler. He took the letter from the boy's hand, and rewarded him with the promised shilling. Then he left the yard, and walked down a lane, leading towards the river. In this unfrequented lane he tore open the envelope and read his letter. It was very brief. Since my only chance of escaping persecution is to accede in some measure to your demands, I will consent to see you. If you will wait for me to-night at nine o'clock by the waterside, to the left of the bridge, I will try to come to that spot at that hour. Heaven grant the meeting may be our last. Exactly as the village church clock struck nine, a dark figure crossed a low, flat meadow lying near the water, and appeared upon the narrow towing-path by the river's edge. A man was walking on this pathway, his face half hidden by a slouched hat, and a short pipe in his mouth. He lifted his hat presently, and bared his head to the cool night breeze. His hair was closely cropped, like that of a convict. The broad moonlight shining full upon his face— revealed a dark, weather-beaten countenance, the face of the tramp who had stood at the park gates to watch the passing of Sir Oswald's funeral train, the face of the tramp who had loitered in the stable-yard of the hen and chickens, the face of the man who had been known in Ratcliffe Highway 
by the ominous name of Black Milsom. This was the man who waited for Honoria Eversleigh in the moonlight by the quiet river. He advanced to meet her as she came out of the meadow and appeared upon the pathway. "'Good evening, my lady,' he said. "'I suppose I ought to be humbly beholden to such a great lady as you for coming here to meet the likes of me. But it seems rather strange you must needs come out here in secret to see such a very intimate acquaintance as I am, considering as you're the mistress of that great castle up yonder. I must say, it seems uncommon hard a man can't pay a visit to his own. "'Hush!' cried Lady Eversleigh. "'Do not call me by that name.' "'if you do not wish to inspire me with a deeper loathing "'than that which I already feel for you.' "'Well, I'm blessed,' muttered Mr. Milsom. "'That's uncommon civil language from a young woman, too.' "'Honoria stopped him by a sudden gesture. "'I suppose you expect to profit by this interview?' she said. "'That I most decidedly do expect,' answered the tramp. "'In that case you will carefully avoid all mention of the past.' "'for otherwise you will get nothing from me.' "'The man responded at first only with a sulky growl. "'Then, after a brief pause, he muttered, "'I don't want to talk about the past any more than you do, "'my fine, proud madam. "'If it isn't a pleasant time for you to remember, "'it isn't a pleasant time for me to remember. "'It's all very well for a young woman who has her victuals found for her "'to give herself airs about the manner other people find their victuals.' "'but a man must live somehow or other. "'If he can't get his living in a pleasant way, "'he must get it in an unpleasant way.' "'After this there was a silence which lasted for some minutes. "'Lady Eversleigh was trying to control the agitation which oppressed her, "'despite the apparent calmness of her manner. "'Black Milsom walked by her side in sullen silence, "'waiting for her to speak. "'The spot was lonely.' Lady Eversleigh and her companion were justified in believing themselves unobserved. But it was not so. Lonely as the spot was, those two were not alone. A stealthy, gliding female figure, dark and shadowy in the uncertain light, had followed Lady Eversleigh from the castle gates, and that figure was beside her now, as she walked with Black Milsom upon the river bank. The spy crept by the side of the hedge that separated the river-bank from the meadow, and sheltered thus, she was able to distinguish almost every word spoken by the two upon the bank. So clearly sounded their voices in the still night air. "'How did you find me here?' asked Lady Eversleigh at last. "'By accident. You gave us the slip.' "'so cleverly that time you took it into your precious head to cut and run, "'that hunt where we would, we were never able to find you. "'I gave it up for a bad job, and then things went again me, and I got sent away. "'But I'm my own master again now, and I mean to make good use of my liberty, "'I can tell you, my lady. "'I little knew how you'd feathered your nest while I was on the other side of the water.' I little thought how you would turn up at last, when I least expected to see you. You might have knocked me down with a feather yesterday, when that fine funeral came out of the park gates, and I saw your face at the window of one of the coaches. You must have been an uncommonly clever young woman, and an uncommonly sly one, to get a baronet for your husband, and to get a spoony old cove to leave you all his fortune, after behaving so precious bad to him. "'Did your husband know who you were when he married you?' "'He found me starving in the street of a country town. "'He knew that I was friendless, homeless, penniless. "'That knowledge did not prevent him making me his wife.' "'Ah, but there was something more he didn't know. "'He didn't know that you were Black Milsom's daughter. "'You didn't tell him that, I'll lay a wager.' "'I did not tell him that which I know to be a lie,' replied Honoria calmly. "'Oh, it's a lie, is it? You're not my daughter, I suppose?' "'No, Thomas Milsom, I am not. I know and feel that I am not.' "'Huh!' muttered Black Milsom savagely. "'If you were not my daughter, how was it that you grew up to call me father?' "'Because I was forced to do so. 
"'I remember being told to call you father. "'I remember being beaten because I refused to do so, "'beaten till I submitted from very fear of being beaten to death. "'Oh, it was a bright and happy childhood, was it not, Thomas Milsom? "'A childhood to look back to with love and regret. "'And now, finding that fortune has lifted me out of the gutter "'into which you flung me, "'you come to me to demand your share of my good fortune, I suppose.' "'That's about it, my lady,' answered Mr. Milsom, with supreme coolness. "'I don't mind a few hard words, more or less. They break no bones. And what's more, I'm used to em. What I want is money, ready money, down on the nail, and plenty of it. You may pelt me as hard as you like with fine speeches, as long as you cash up liberally. But cash I must have, by fair means or foul, and I want a pretty good sum to start with. "'You want a large sum,' said Honoria, quietly. "'How much do you want?' "'Well, I don't want to take a mean advantage of your generosity, "'so I'll be moderate. "'Say five thousand pounds, to begin with.' "'And you expect to get that from me?' "'Of course I do. Five thousand pounds?' Five thousand pounds, ready money.' "'Lady Eversleigh stopped suddenly and looked the man full in the face.' "'You shall not have five thousand pence,' she exclaimed. "'Not five thousand pence. "'My dead husband's money shall never pass into your hands "'to be squandered in scenes of vice and crime. "'If you choose to live an honest life, "'I will allow you a hundred a year, a pension, "'which shall be paid you quarterly through the hands of my London solicitors. "'Beyond this, I will not give you a halfpenny.' "'What?' roared Black Milsom in an infuriated tone. "'What? Jenny Milsom, Honoria, Lady Eversleigh, or whatever you may please to call yourself. Do you think I will stand that? Do you think I will hold my tongue unless you pay me handsomely to keep silence? You don't know the kind of man you have to deal with. Tomorrow every one in the village shall know what a high-born lady lives up at the old castle.' They shall know what a dutiful daughter the Lady of Raynham is, and how she suffers her father to tramp barefoot in the mud while she rides in her carriage. You may tell them what you please. I'll tell them plenty. You may depend upon it. Will you tell them how Valentine Jernam came by his death? asked Honoria in a strange tone. The tramp started, and for a few moments seemed at loss for words in which to reply. "'but he covered himself very quickly and exclaimed savagely, "'I'm not going to tell them any of your senseless dreams and fancies, "'but I mean to tell them who you are. "'That will be quite enough for them, "'and before I do let them know so much, "'you'd better change your mind and act generously towards me.' "'Upon that subject I shall never change my mind,' "'answered Honoria Eversleigh with perfect self-possession. "'You will accept the pension I offer you, or you will reject it as you please. You will never receive more, directly or indirectly, from me, she continued presently. As for your threat of telling my miserable history to the people of this place, it is a threat which can have no influence over me. Tell these people what you choose. Happily, the opinion of the world is of small account to me. You will change your mind between this and tomorrow morning, cried Black Milsom. He was almost beside himself with rage and mortification. He felt as if he could have torn this woman to pieces, this proud and courageous creature who dared to defy him. "'I shall not change my mind,' answered Honoria. "'You could not conquer me, even when I was a weak and helpless child. You must remember that.' Hm. "'You were rather a queer temper in those days. A strange-looking child, too.' "'with your white face and your big black eyes. "'Ay, and even in those days my will was able to do battle with men and women, "'and to support me, even against your violence. "'You and those belonging to you were able to break my heart, "'but were not strong enough to bend my spirit. "'I have the same spirit yet, Thomas Milsom, "'and you will find it useless to try to turn me from my purpose.' The man did not answer immediately. 
he looked fiercely searchingly at the pale resolute face that was turned to him in the moonlight the name of my solicitor is dunford said honoria presently mr joseph dunford of gray's inn if you apply to him on your arrival in london he will give you the first instalment of your pension five and twenty pounds grumbled milsom a very handsome amount upon my word and you have fifteen thousand a year i have may the curse of a black and bitter heart cling to you cried the man lady eversleigh turned from her companion with a gesture of loathing but there was no fear in her heart she walked slowly back to the gate leading into the meadow followed by milsom who heaped abusive epithets upon her at every step as she entered the meadow the figure of the spy drew suddenly back into the shadow of the hedge from which it did not emerge till honoria had disappeared through the little gate on the opposite side of the field and the heavy tramp of milsom's footsteps had died away in the distance then the figure came forth into the broad moonlight and that subdued but clear radiance revealed the pale thin face of jane payland when jane payland was brushing her mistress's hair that night she ventured to sound her as to her future movements by a few cautions and respectful questions to which lady eversleigh replied with less than her usual reticence from her lady's answers the waiting-maid ascertained that she had no idea of seeking any relaxation in change of scene but proposed to reside at raynham for at least one year jane payland wondered at the decision of her mistress's manner she had imagined that lady eversleigh would be eager to leave a place in which she found herself the object of disapprobation and contempt if i were her i would go to france and be a great lady in paris which is twenty times gayer and more delightful than any place in stupid straight-laced old england thought jane payland if i had her money i would spend it and enjoy life in spite of all the world i'm afraid your health will suffer from a long residence at the castle my lady said jane presently determined to do all in her power to bring about a change in her mistress's plans after such a shock as you have had some distraction must be necessary when i had the honour of living with the duchess of montenor and we lost the dear duke the first thing i said to the duchess after the funeral was change of scene your grace change of scene nothing like a change of scene when the mind has received a sudden blow the sweet duchess's physician actually echoed my words though he had never heard them and within a week of the sad ceremony we started for the continent where we remained a year at the end of which period the dear duchess was united to the marquis of purpletown the duchess was speedily consoled replied lady eversleigh with a smile which was not without bitterness no doubt the variety and excitement of a continental tour did much towards blotting out all memory of her dead husband but i do not wish to forget i am in no hurry to obliterate the image of one who is most dear to me jane payland looked very searchingly at that pale earnest face reflected in the glass for me that which the world calls pleasure never possessed any powerful fascination continued honoria gravely my childhood and youth were steeped in sorrow sorrow beyond anything you can imagine jane payland though i have heard you say that you have seen much trouble the remembrance of it comes back to me more vividly than ever now thus it is that i shrink from society which can give me no real pleasure had i no special reason for remaining at raynham i should not care to leave it but you have a special reason my lady inquired jane eagerly i have may i presume to ask you may jane and i think i may venture to trust you fully for i believe you are my friend i mean to stay at raynham because in this hour of sorrow and desolation providence has not abandoned me entirely to despair i have one bright hope which renders the thought of my future endurable to me i stay at raynham because i hope next spring an heir will be born to raynham castle oh 
"'What happiness! "'And you wish the heir to be born at the castle, my lady? "'I do. "'I have been the victim of one plot, "'but I will not fall blindfold into a second snare, "'and there is no infamy which my enemies are not base enough to attempt. "'There shall be no mystery about my life. "'From the hour of my husband's death to the hour of his child's birth, "'the friends of that lost husband shall know every act of my existence.' They shall see me day by day. The old servants of the family shall attend me. I will live in the old house, surrounded by all who knew and loved Sir Oswald. No vile plotters shall ever be able to say that there was trick or artifice connected with the birth of that child. If I live to protect and watch over it, that infant life shall be guarded against every danger and defended from every foe. "'and there will be many foes ready to assail the inheritor of Raynham. "'Why so, my lady? "'Because that young life and my life "'will stand between a villain and a fortune. "'If I and my child were both to die, "'Reginald Eversleigh would become possessor "'of the wealth to which he once was the acknowledged heir. "'By the terms of Sir Oswald's will, "'he receives very little in the present, "'but the future has many chances for him.' If I die childless, he will inherit the Raynham estates. If his two cousins, the Dales, die without direct heirs, he will inherit ten thousand a year. But that seems only a poor chance, after all, my lady. There is no reason why Sir Reginald Eversleigh should survive you or the two Mr. Dales. There is no reason, except his own villainy, answered Honoria thoughtfully. "'There are some men capable of anything. "'But let us talk no further on the subject. "'I have confided my secret to you, Jane Payland, "'because I think you are faithfully devoted to my interests. "'You know now why I am resolved to remain at Raynham Castle. "'And you think my decision wise, do you not?' "'Well, yes, I certainly do, my lady,' answered Jane, "'after some moments of hesitation. "'And now leave me. Good night.' I have kept you long this evening, I see by that timepiece, but my thoughts were wandering, and I was unconscious of the progress of time. Good night. Jane Palin took a respectful leave of her mistress, and departed, absorbed in thought. Is she a good woman or a bad one? She wondered, as she sat by the fire in her own comfortable apartment. If she is a bad woman, she is an out-and-outer, "'for she looks one in the face with those superb black eyes of hers, "'as bright and clear as the image of truth itself. "'She must be good and true. She must. "'And yet, that night's absence, and that story... Chapter 14 of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 14 A Ghostly Visitant. For nearly three years, Thomas Milsom had been far away from London. He had been arrested on a charge of burglary within a month of Valentine Jernam's death and condemned to five years' transportation. In less than three years, by some kind of artful management, and by the exercise of consummate hypocrisy, Mr. Milsom had contrived to get himself free again, and to return to England his own master. He landed in Scotland, and tramped from Granton to Yorkshire, where an accidental encounter with an old acquaintance tempted him to linger at Raynham. The two tramps, scoundrels both, and both alike penniless and shoeless, had stood side by side at the gates of the park to see the stately funeral train pass out. And thus Thomas Milsom had beheld her, whom he called his daughter, the girl who had fled with her old grandfather from the shelter of his fatal roof three years before. After that unprofitable interview with Honoria, Thomas Milsom set his face Londonwards. "'The day will come when you and I will square accounts, my lady,' 
he muttered, as he looked up to those battlemented turrets with a blasphemous curse, and then turned his back upon Raynham Castle and the peaceful little village beneath it. The direction in which Mr. Milsom betook himself, after he passed the borderland of waste ground and newly built houses, which separates London from the country, was the direction of Ratcliffe Highway. He walked rapidly through the crowded streets, in which the crowd grew thicker as he approached the regions of the tower. But rapidly as he walked, the steps of time were faster. It had been bright noon when he entered the quiet little town of Barnet. It was night when he first heard the scraping fiddles and stamping feet of Ratcliffe Highway. He went straight to the Jolly Tar. Here all was unchanged. There were the flaring tallow candles, set in a tin hoop that hung from the low ceiling, dropping hot grease ever and anon on the loungers at the bar. There was the music. The same Scotch reels and Irish jigs played on squeaking fiddles, which were made more inharmonious by the accompaniment of shrill pandian pipes. There was the same crowd of sailors and bare-headed, bare-armed, loud-voiced women, assembled in the stifling bar, the same cloud of tobacco smoke, the same babble of voices to be heard from the concert-room within, while now and then, amongst the shouts and the laughter, the oaths and the riot, there sounded the tinkling of the old piano, and the feeble upper notes of a very poor soprano voice. Black Milsom had drawn his hat over his eyes before entering the jolly tar, the bar of that tavern was sunk considerably below the level of the street, and standing on the uppermost of the steps by which Mr. Wayman's customers descended to his hospitable abode, Black Milsom was able to look across the heads of the crowd to the face of the landlord busy behind his bar. In that elevated position, Black Milsom waited until Dennis Wayman happened to look up and perceive the stranger on the threshold. As he did so, Thomas Milsom drew the back of his hand rapidly across his mouth, with a gesture that was evidently intended as a signal. The signal was answered by a nod from Wayman, and then Black Milsom descended the three steps and pushed his way to the bar. "'Can I have a bed, mate, and a bit of supper?' he asked, in a voice that was carefully disguised. "'Ay, ay, to be sure you can,' answered Wayman, you can have everything that is comfortable and friendly by paying for it. This house is one of the most hospitable places there is, to those that can pay the reckoning. This rather clumsy joke was received with an applauding guffaw by the sailors and women next to the bar. If you'll step through that door yonder, you'll find a snug little room, mate, said Dennis Wayman, in the tone which he might have used in speaking to a stranger. I'll send you a steak and a potato as soon as they can be cooked. Thomas Milsom nodded. He pushed open the rough wooden door, which was so familiar to him, and went into the dingy little den which, in the jolly tar, was known as the private parlor. It was the room in which he had first seen Valentine Jernam. Two years and a half had passed since he had last entered it and during that time Mr. Milsom had been paying the penalty of his misdeeds in Van Diemen's land. This dingy little den, with its greasy walls and low, smoky ceiling, was a kind of paradise to the returned wanderer. Here, at least, was freedom. Here, at least, he was his own master, free to enjoy strong drinks and strong tobacco, free to be lazy when he pleased, and to work after the fashion that suited him best. He seated himself in one chair, and planted his legs on another. Then he took a short clay pipe from his pocket, filled and lighted it, and began to smoke in a slow, meditative manner, stopping every now and then to mutter to himself between the puffs of tobacco. Mr. Milsom had finished his second pipe of shag tobacco, and had given utterance to more than one exclamation of anger and impatience. When the door was opened— and Dennis Wayman made his appearance, bearing a tray with a couple of covered dishes and a large pewter pot. "'I thought I'd bring you your grub myself, mate,' he said, "'though I'm precious busy in yonder. 
"'I'm uncommonly glad to see you back again. "'I've been wondering where you was ever since you disappeared. "'You'd have left off wondering if you'd known I was on the other side of this blessed world of ours. "'I thought you knew I was—' "'Mr. Milsom's delicacy of feeling prevented his finishing this speech. "'I knew you had gone into trouble,' answered Mr. Wayman. "'At least I didn't know for certain, but I guessed as much.' "'though sometimes I was half inclined to think you had turned cheat and given me the slip. "'Bolted with the swag, I suppose you mean?' "'Precisely,' answered Dennis Wayman coolly. "'Which shows your suspicious nature,' returned Milsom in a sulky tone. "'When an unlucky chap turns his back upon his comrades, "'the worst word in their mouths isn't half bad enough for him. "'That's the way of the world, that is. "'No, Dennis Wayman.' I didn't bolt with the swag. Not sixpence of Valentine Jernam's money have I had the spending of, not even what I won from him at cards. I was nobbled one day, without a moment's warning, on a two-penny halfpenny charge of burglary. Never you mind whether it was true or whether it was false. That ain't worth going into. I was took under a false name, and I stuck to that false name, thinking it more convenient." I should have sent to let you know if I could have found a safe hand to take my message, but I couldn't find a living creature that was anything like safe. So there I was, remanded on Monday, tried on a Tuesday, and then a fortnight after shipped off like a bullock, along of so many other bullocks, and that's the long and the short of it. After having said which, Mr. Milsom applied himself to his supper, which consisted of a smoking steak and a dish of still more smoking potatoes. Dennis Wayman sat watching him for some minutes in thoughtful silence. The intent gaze with which he regarded the face of his friend was that of a man who was by no means inclined to believe every syllable he had heard. After Milsom had devoured about a pound of steak and at least two pounds of potatoes, Mr. Wayman ventured to interrupt his operations by a question. "'If you didn't call of the money, what became of it?' he asked. "'Put away,' returned the other man shortly, "'and as safe as a church, unless my bad luck goes against me harder than it ever went yet.' "'You hid it?' said Wayman, interrogatively. "'I did. "'Where?' "'Mr. Milsom looked at his friend with a glance of profound cunning. "'Wouldn't you like to know? "'Oh, wouldn't you just like to know, Mr. Wayman?' he said." "'And wouldn't you just dose me with a cup of drugged coffee "'and cut off to ransack my hiding-place "'while I was lying helpless in your hospitable abode? "'That's the sort of thing you'd do "'if I happened to be a born innocent, isn't it, Mr. Wayman? "'But you see, I'm not a born innocent, "'so you won't get the chance of doing anything of the kind.' "'Don't be a fool,' returned Dennis Wayman in a surly tone. "'You'll please to remember that one half of Valentine Jernam's money belongs to me, "'and ought to have been in my possession long before this. "'I was an idiot to trust it in your keeping. "'You trusted it in my keeping because you were obliged to do so,' answered Black Milsom, "'and I owe you no gratitude for your confidence. "'I happen to know a Jew who was willing to give cash for the notes and bills of exchange.' "'and you trusted them to me because it was the only way to get them turned into cash.' "'The landlord of the Jolly Tar nodded a surly assent to this rather cynical statement. "'I saw my friend the Jew, and made a very decent bargain,' resumed Milsom. "'I hid the money in a convenient place, intending to bring you your share at the earliest opportunity. "'I was lagged that very night and had no chance of touching the cash after I had once stowed it away. So, you see, it was no fault of mine that you didn't get the money. Hm, muttered Mr. Wayman. It has been rather hard lines for me to be kept out of it so long. And now you have come back, I suppose you can take me at once to the hiding place. I want money very badly just now. Do you? said Thomas Milsom with a sneer. "'That's a complaint you're rather subject to, isn't it? "'The want of money. "'Now, as I've answered your questions, "'perhaps you'll answer mine. "'Has there been much stir down this way "'while I've been over the water?' "'Very little, 
things have been as dull as they well could be. Ah, so you'll say, of course. Can you tell me whether anyone has lived in my old place while my back has been turned? The landlord of the Jolly Tar started with a gesture of alarm. It wasn't there you hid the money, was it? he asked eagerly. Suppose it was. What then? Why, every farthing of it is lost. The place has been taken by a man who has pulled the best part of it down and rebuilt it. If you hid your money there, there's little chance of you ever seeing it again, said Wayman. Black Milsom's dark face grew livid as he started from his chair and dragged on the crater coat which he had taken off on entering the room. It would be like my luck to lose that money, he said. It would be just like my luck. Come, Wayman, what are you staring at, man? he cried impatiently. Come. Where? To my old place. You can tell me all about the changes as we go. I must see to this business at once. The moon was shining over the masts and rigging in the pool, and over the housetops of Bermondsey and Wapping, as Black Milsom and his companion started on their way to the old house by the water. They went, as on a former occasion, in that vehicle which Mr. Wayman called his trap and as they drove along the lonely road across the marshy flat by the river, Dennis Wayman told his companion what had happened in his absence. For a year the house stood empty, he said, but at the end of that time an old sea captain took a fancy to it because of the water about it and the view of the pool from the top windows. He bought it and pulled it almost all to pieces, rebuilt it, and I doubt if there is any of the old house standing. He has made quite a smart little place of it. He's a queer old chap, this Cap'n Duncombe, I'm told, and rather a tough customer. I'll see the inside of his house, however tough he may be, answered Milsom in a dogged tone. If he's a tough customer, he'll find me tougher. Has he got any family? One daughter, as pretty a girl as you'll see within twenty miles of London. Well... We'll go and have a look at his place tonight. We'd better put up your trap at the pilot boat. Mr. Wayman assented to the wisdom of this arrangement. The pilot boat was a dilapidated-looking, low-roofed little inn, where there were some tumble-down stables, which were more often inhabited by bloated gray water-rats than by horses. In these stables Mr. Wayman lodged his pony and vehicle, while he and Milsom walked on to the cottage. "'Why, I shouldn't have known the place,' cried Milsom, as his companion pointed to the captain's habitation. The transformation was, indeed, complete. The dismal dwelling, which had looked as if it were, in all truth, haunted by a ghost, had been changed into one of the smartest little cottages to be seen in the suburbs of eastern London. The ditch had been narrowed and embanked, and two tiny rustic bridges of fantastical woodwork spanned its dark water. The dreary pollard willows had vanished, and evergreens occupied their places. The black rushes had been exchanged for flowers. A trim little garden appeared, where all had once been waste ground, and a flagstaff with a bit of bunting gave a naval aspect to the spot. All was dark. Not one glimmer of light to be seen in any of the windows. The garden was secured by an iron gate, and surrounded by iron rails on all sides, except that nearest the river. Here the only boundary was a hedge of laurels, which was still low and thin, and here Dennis Wayman and his companion found easy access to the neatly kept pleasure-ground. With stealthy footsteps they invaded Captain Duncombe's little domain, and walked slowly round the house, examining every door and window as they went. "'Is the captain a rich man?' asked Milsom. "'Yes. I believe he's pretty well off. Some say uncommonly well off. He spent over a thousand pounds on this place.' "'Curse him for his pains,' returned Black Milsom savagely. "'He knows how to take care of his property.' It would be a very clever burglar that would get into that house. The windows are all secured with outside shutters that seem as solid as if they were made of iron, and the doors don't yield the twentieth part of an inch. 
Then, after completing his examination of the house, Milsom exclaimed in the same savage tone, "'Why, that man has swept away every timber of the place I lived in.' "'I told you as much,' answered Wayman. "'I've heard say there was nothing left of old Scruton's house "'but a few solid timbers and a stack of chimneys. "'Scruton was the name of the miser "'whose ghost had been supposed to haunt the old place. "'Black Milsom gave a start as Dennis uttered the words, "'Stack of chimneys. "'Oh,' he said in an altered tone, "'So they left the chimney stack, did they?' "'Mr. Wayman perceived that change of tone. "'I begin to understand,' he said. "'You hid that money in one of the chimneys. "'Never you mind where I hid it. "'There's little chance of its being found there "'after Bricklay is pulling the place to pieces. "'I must get into that house, come what may.' "'You'll find that difficult,' answered Wayman. "'Perhaps. "'But I'll do it, or my name's not Black Milsom.' Captain Joseph Duncombe, or Joe Duncombe, as he generally called himself, was a burly, rosy-faced man of fifty years of age, a hearty, honest fellow. He was a widower, with only one child, a daughter whom he idolized. Any father might have been forgiven for being devotedly fond of such a daughter as Rosamond Duncombe. Rosamond was one of those light-hearted, womanly creatures who seemed born to make home a paradise. She had a sweet temper, a laugh which was like music, a manner which was fascination itself. When it is also taken into consideration that she had a pretty little nose, lips that were fresh and rosy as ripe red cherries, cheeks that were like dewy roses, newly gathered, and large, liquid eyes of the deepest, clearest blue, it must be confessed that Rosamond Duncombe was a very charming girl. If Joseph Duncombe doted on this bright-haired, blue-eyed daughter, his love was not unrecompensed. Rosamond idolized her father, whom she believed to be the best and noblest of created beings. Rosamond's remembrance of her mother was but shadowy. She had lost that tender protector at a very early age. Within the last year and a half, her father had retired from active service, after selling his vessel, the Vixen, for a large price. So goodly a name had she borne in the merchant service. The retirement of Captain Duncombe's was a sacrifice which he made for his beloved daughter. For himself, the life of a seaman had lost none of its attractions— but when he saw his fair young daughter of an age to leave school, he determined that she should have a home. He had made a very comfortable little fortune during five and thirty years of hard service, but he had never made a sixpence, the earning of which he need blush to remember. He was known in the service as a model of truth and honesty. Driving about the eastern suburbs of London, he happened one day to pass that dreary plot of waste ground on which the miser's tumble-down dwelling had been built. It was a pleasant day in April, and the place was looking less dreary than usual. The spring sunshine lit up the broad river, and the rigging of the ships stood out in sharp black lines against a bright blue sky. A board against the dilapidated palings announced that the ground was to be sold. Captain Duncombe drew up his horse suddenly. "'That's the place for me,' he exclaimed, "'close by the old river, whose tide carried me down to the sea on my first voyage five and thirty years ago, within view of the pool, and all the brave old ships lying at anchor. That's the place for me. I'll sweep away that old ramshackle hovel and build a smart, watertight little cottage for my pet and me to live in, and I'll stick the Union Jack on a main top over our heads, and at night, when I lie awake and hear the water rippling by, I shall fancy I'm still at sea. A landsman would most likely have stopped to consider that the neighborhood was lonely, the ground damp and marshy, the approach to this solitary crossroad through the most disreputable part of London— Captain Duncombe considered nothing except two facts, first the river, then the view of the ships in the pool. 
he drove back to Wapping, where he found the house-agent who was commissioned to sell old Scruton's dwelling. That gentleman was only too glad to get a customer for a place which no one seemed inclined to have on any terms. He named his price. The merchant captain did not attempt to make a bargain, but agreed to buy the place, and to give ready money for it, as soon as the necessary deeds were drawn up and signed. In a week this was done, and the captain found himself possessor of a snug little freehold on the banks of the Thames. He lost no time in transforming the place into an abode of comfort instead of desolation. It was only when the transformation was complete, and Captain Duncombe had spent upwards of a thousand pounds on his folly, that he became acquainted with the common report about the place. Sailors are proverbially superstitious. After hearing that dismal story, Joseph Duncombe was rather inclined to regret the choice he had made, but he resolved to keep the history of old Scruton a secret from his daughter, though it cost him perpetual efforts to preserve silence on this subject. In spite of his precaution, Rosamond came to know of the ghost. Visiting some poor cottagers, about a quarter of a mile from Riverview, she heard the whole story, told her unthinkingly by a foolish old woman who was amongst the recipients of her charity. Soon after this, the story reached the ears of the two servants. An elderly woman called Mugby, who acted as cook and housekeeper, and a smart girl called Susan Trot. Mrs. Mugby pretended to ridicule the idea of Scruton's ghost. "'I've lived in a many places, and all I've heard tell of a many ghosts,' she said. "'But never yet did I set eyes on one, which my opinion is that, if people will eat cold pork for supper, underdone, not to mention crackling or seasoning, and bottled stout, which is worse, and lies still heavier on the stomach, unless you take about as much ground ginger as would lie on a sixpence, and as much carbonate of soda as would lie on a fourpenny bit, and go to bed upon it all directly afterwards, they will see no end of ghosts. I have never trifled with my digestion, and no ghosts have I ever seen. The girl, Susan Trot, was by no means so strong-minded. The idea of Miser Scruton's ghost haunted her perpetually of an evening, and she would no more have gone out into the captain's pretty little garden after dark than she would have walked straight to the mouth of a cannon. Rosamond Duncombe affected to echo the heroic sentiments of the housekeeper, Mrs. Mugby. There never had been such things as ghosts, and never would be, and all the foolish stories that were told of phantoms and apparitions had their sole foundation in the imaginations of the people who told them. Such was the state of things in the household of Captain Duncombe at the time of Black Milsom's return from Van Diemen's land. It was within two nights after that return that an event occurred never to be forgotten by any member of Joseph Duncombe's household. The evening was cold but fine. The moon, still at its full, shone bright and clear upon the neat garden of Riverview Cottage. Captain Duncombe and his daughter were alone in their comfortable sitting-room, playing the captain's favorite game of backgammon before a cheery fire. The housekeeper, Mrs. Mugby, had complained all day of a touch of rheumatism, and had gone to bed after the kitchen tea, leaving Susan Trott, the smart little parlor-maid, to carry in the pretty pink and gold china tea service and hissing silver tea-kettle to Miss Rosamond and her papa in the sitting-room. Thus it was that, after having removed the tea-tray and washed the pretty china cups and saucers, Susan Trott seated herself before the fire, and set herself to trim a new cap, which was designed for the especial bewilderment of a dashing young baker. The dashing young baker had a habit of lingering at the gate of Riverview Cottage a good deal longer than was required for the transaction of his business, and the dashing young baker had more than once hinted at an honorable attachment for Miss Susan Trott. Thinking of the baker, and of all the tender things and bright promises of a happy future which he had murmured in her ear, 
as they walked home from church on the last Sunday evening, Susan found the solitary hours pass quickly enough. She looked up suddenly as the clock struck ten, and found that she had let the fire burn out. It was rather an awful sensation to be alone in the lower part of the house after every one else had gone to bed, but Susan Trott was very anxious to finish the making of the new cap, so she went back to the kitchen and seated herself once more at the table. She had scarcely taken up her scissors to cut an end of ribbon when a low, stealthy tapping sounded on the outer wooden shutter of the window behind her. Susan gave a little shriek of terror and dropped the scissors as if they had been red hot. What could that awful sound mean at ten o'clock at night? For some moments the little parlor maid was completely overcome by terror. Then, all at once, her thoughts flew back to the person whose image had occupied her mind all that evening. Was it not just possible that the dashing young baker might have something very particular to say to her, and that he had come in this mysterious manner to say it? Again the same low, stealthy tapping sounded on the shutter. This time Susan Trott plucked up a spirit, took the bright brass candlestick in her hand, and went to the little door leading from the scullery to the back garden. She opened the door and peered cautiously out. No one was to be seen. That tiresome baker was indulging in some practical joke, no doubt, and trying to frighten her. Susan was determined not to be frightened by her sweetheart's tricks, so she tripped boldly out into the garden, still carrying the brass candlestick. At the very first step the wind blew out the candle, but, of course, that was of very little consequence when the bright moonlight made everything as clearly visible as at noon. "'I know who it is,' cried Susan, in a voice intended to reach the baker, "'and it's a great shame to try and frighten a poor girl when she's sitting all alone by herself.' She had scarcely uttered the words when the candlestick fell from her extended hand, and she stood rooted to the gravel pathway, a statue of fear. Exactly opposite to her, slowly advancing towards the open door of the scullery, she saw an awful figure, whose description was too familiar to her. There it was, the ghost, the shadowy image of the man who had destroyed himself in that house, a tall spectral figure, robed in a long garment of grey serge, a scarlet handkerchief twisted round the head, rendered the white face whiter by contrast with it. As this awful figure approached, Susan Trott stepped backwards on the grass, leaving the pathway clear for the dreadful visitant. The ghostly form stalked on, with slow and solemn steps, and entered the house by the scullery door. For some minutes Susan remained standing on the grass, horror-struck, powerless to move. Then, all at once, feminine curiosity got the better, even of terror, and she followed the phantom figure into the house. From the kitchen doorway she beheld the figure standing on the hearth, his arms stretched above the fireplace, as if groping for something in the chimney. Doubtless this had been the miser's hiding-place for his hoarded gold, and the ghost returned to the spot where the living man had been accustomed to conceal his treasures. Susan darted across the hall and ran upstairs to her master's room. She knocked loudly on the door, crying, "'The ghost, master! The ghost! The old miser's ghost is in the kitchen!' "'What?' roared the captain, starting suddenly from his peaceful slumbers. The girl repeated her awful announcement. The captain sprang out of bed, dressed himself in trousers and dressing-gown, and ran downstairs, the girl close behind him. They were just in time to see the figure, in the red headgear and long gray dressing-gown, slowly stalking from the scullery door. The captain followed the phantom into the garden, but held himself at a respectful distance from the figure as it slowly paced along the smooth gravel pathway leading toward the laurel hedge. 
the figure reached the low boundary that divided the garden from the river-bank, crossed it, and vanished amongst the thick white mists that rose from the water. Joseph Duncombe trembled. A ghost was just the one thing which could strike terror to the seaman's bold heart. When the figure had vanished, Captain Duncombe went to the spot where it had passed out of the garden. Here he found the young laurels beaten and trampled down, as if by the heavy feet of human intruders. This was strange. He then went to the kitchen, accompanied by Susan Trott, who, although shivering like an aspen tree, had just sufficient strength of mind to find a lucifer and light her candle. By the light of this candle, Captain Duncombe examined the kitchen. On the hearth, at his feet, he saw something gleaming in the uncertain light. He stooped to pick up this object, and found that it was a curious gold coin, a foreign coin, bent in a peculiar manner. This was even yet more strange. The captain put the coin in his pocket. I'll take good Chapter Fifteen of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Fifteen, a terrible resolve. When the hawthorns were blooming in the woods of Raynham, a new life dawned in the stately chambers of the castle. A daughter was born to the beautiful widow lady a sweet consoler in the hour of her loneliness and desolation. Honoria Eversleigh lifted her heart to heaven and rendered thanks for the priceless treasure which had been bestowed upon her. She had kept her word. From the hour of her husband's death she had never quitted Raynham Castle. She had lived alone, unvisited, unknown, content to dwell in stately solitude rarely extending her walks and drives beyond the boundary of the park and forest. Some few of the country gentry would have visited her, but she would not consent to be visited by a few. Honoria Eversleigh's was a proud spirit, and until the whole county should acknowledge her innocence, she would receive no one. "'Let them think of me or talk of me as they please,' she said." I can live my own life without them. Thus the long winter months passed by, and Honoria was alone in that abode whose splendor must have seemed cold and dreary to the friendless woman. But when she held her infant in her arms, all was changed. She looked down upon the baby girl and murmured softly, Your life shall be bright and peaceful, dearest, whatever mine may be. The future looks bleak and terrible for me, but for you, sweet one, it may be bright and fair. The young mother loved her child with a passionate intensity, but even that love could not exclude darker passions from her breast. There was much that was noble in the nature of this woman, but there was also much that was terrible. From her childhood she had been gifted with a power of intellect, a strength of will, that lifted her high above the common ranks of womanhood, a fatal passion had taken possession of her soul after the untimely death of Sir Oswald, and that passion was a craving for revenge. She had been deeply wronged, and she could not forgive. She did not even try to forgive. She believed that revenge was a kind of duty which she owed not only to herself, but to the noble husband whom she had lost. The memory of that night of anguish in Yarborough Tower and that still darker hour of shame and despair in which Sir Oswald had refused to believe her innocent, was never absent from the mind of Honoria Eversleigh. She brooded upon these dark memories. Time could not lessen their bitterness. Even the soft influence of her infant's love could not banish those fatal recollections. Time passed. The child grew and flourished, 
beautiful to her mother's enraptured eyes, and yet, even by the side of that fair baby's face, arose the dark image of Victor Carrington. For a long time the county people had kept close watch upon the proceedings of the lady at the castle. The county people discovered that Lady Eversleigh never left Raynham, that she devoted herself to the rearing of her child as entirely as if she had been the humblest peasant woman, and that she expended more money upon solid works of charity than had ever before been so spent by any member of the Eversleigh family, though that family had been distinguished by much generosity and benevolence. The county people shrugged their shoulders contemptuously. They could not believe in the goodness of this woman, whose parentage no one knew, and whom every one had condemned. She is playing a part, they thought. She wishes to impress us with the idea that she is a persecuted martyr, a suffering angel, and she hopes thus to regain her old footing amongst us, and queen it over the whole county, as she did when that poor, infatuated Sir Oswald first brought her to Raynham. This was what the county people thought, until one day the tidings flew far and wide that Lady Eversleigh had left the castle for the continent, and that she intended to remain absent for some years. This seemed very strange, but what seemed still more strange was the fact that the devoted mother was not accompanied by her child. The little girl, Gertrude, so named after the mother of the late baronet, remained at Raynham under the care of two persons. These two guardians were Captain Copplestone and a widow lady of forty years of age, Mrs. Morden, a person of unblemished integrity, who had been selected as protectress and governess of the young heiress. The child was at this time two and a half years of age. Very young, she seemed, to be thus left by a mother who had appeared to idolize her. The county people shook their heads. They told each other that Lady Eversleigh was a hypocrite and an actress. She had never really loved her child. She had played the part of a sorrowing widow and a devoted mother for two years and a half, in the hope that by this means she would regain her position in society. And now, finding that this was impossible, she had all of a sudden grown tired of playing her part, and had gone off to the continent to spend her money and enjoy her life after her own fashion. This was what the world said of Honoria Eversleigh, but if those who spoke of her could have possessed themselves of her secrets, they would have discovered something very different from that which they imagined. Lady Eversleigh left the castle in the early part of November, accompanied only by her maid, Jane Payland. A strange time of the year in which to start for the continent, people said. It seemed still more strange that a woman of Lady Eversleigh's rank and fortune should go on a continental journey with no other attendant than a maidservant. If the eyes of the world could have followed Lady Eversleigh, they would have made startling discoveries. While it was generally supposed that the baronet's widow was on her way to Rome or Naples, Two plainly dressed women took possession of unpretending lodgings in Percy Street, Tottenham Court Road. The apartments were taken by a lady who called herself Mrs. Eden, and who required them only for herself and maid. The apartments consisted of two large drawing rooms, two bedrooms on the floor above, and a dressing room adjoining the best bedroom. The proprietor of the house was a Belgian merchant, called Jacob Mulk, a sedate old bachelor, who took a great deal of snuff, and disquieted himself very little about the world in general, so long as life went smoothly for himself. The remaining occupant of the house was a medical student, who rented one of the rooms on the third floor. Another room on the same floor was to let. Such was the arrangement of the house when Mrs. Eden and her maid took possession of their apartments. Mr. Jacob Mulk thought he had never seen such a beautiful woman as his new lodger when he entered her apartment to ascertain whether she was satisfied with the accommodation provided for her. She was sitting in the full light of an unshaded lamp as he entered the room. Her black silk dress was the perfection of simplicity, 
its sombre hues relieved only by the white collar which encircled her slender throat. Her pale face looked of an ivory whiteness, in contrast to the dark deep eyes and arched brows of sombre brown. The lady pronounced herself perfectly satisfied with all the arrangements that had been made for her comfort. "'I am in London on a business of importance,' she said, "'and shall therefore receive very little company. But I may have to hold many interviews with men of business, and I trust that my affairs may not be made the subject of curiosity or gossip, either in this house or outside it. Mr. Mulk declared that he was the last person in the world to talk, and that his two servants were both elderly women, the very pink of steadiness and propriety. Having said this, he took his leave, and as he did so, stole one more glance at the beautiful stranger. She had fallen into an attitude which betrayed complete abstraction of mind. Her elbow rested on the table by her side. Her eyes were shaded by her hand. Upon that white slender hand, Jacob Mulk saw diamonds, such as are not often seen upon the fingers of the inhabitants of Percy Street. Mr. Mulk occasionally dealt in diamonds, and he knew enough about them to perceive at a glance that the rings worn by his lodger were worth a small fortune. Hmph, muttered Mr. Mulk, as he returned to his comfortable sitting-room. Those diamonds tell a tale. There's something mysterious about this lodger of mine. However, my rent will be safe. That's one comfort. While the landlord was musing thus, the lodger was employed in a manner which might well have awakened his curiosity, could he have beheld her at that moment. She had fallen on her knees before a low easy chair, her face buried in her hands, her slender frame shaken by passionate sobs. "'My child!' she exclaimed, in almost inarticulate murmurs. "'My beloved, my idol, it is so bitter to be absent from you, so bitter!' so bitter. Early on the morning after her arrival in London, Honoria Eversleigh, otherwise Mrs. Eden, went in a cab to the office of an individual called Andrew Larkspur, who occupied dingy chambers in Lyons Inn. The science of the detective officer had not, at that time, reached its present state of perfection but even then there were men who devoted their lives to the work of private investigations and the elucidation of the strange secrets and mysteries of social life. Such a man was Andrew Larkspur, late Bow Street runner, now hanger-on of the new detective police. He was renowned for his skill in the prosecution of secret service, and it was rumoured that he had amassed a considerable fortune by his mysterious employment. He was not a man who openly sought employers. His services were in great request among a certain set of people, and he had little idle time on his hands. His name was painted in dirty white letters on the black door of his dingy chambers on a fourth story. On this door he called himself Andrew Larkspur, commission agent. It will be seen by and by how Honoria Eversleigh had become acquainted with the fact of this man's existence. She went alone to seek an interview with him. She had found herself compelled to confide in Jane Palin to a very considerable extent, but she did not tell that attendant more than she was obliged to tell of the dark business which had brought her to London. She was fortunate enough to find Mr. Andrew Larkspur alone and disengaged. He was a little sandy-haired man of some sixty years of age, spare and wizened, with a sharp nose like a beak, and thin, long arms, ending in large, claw-like hands, that were like the talons of a bird of prey. Altogether, Mr. Larkspur had very much of the aspect of an elderly vulture, which had undergone partial transformation into a human being. Honoria was in no way repelled by the aspect of this man. She saw that he was clever, and fancied him the kind of person who would be likely to serve her faithfully. "'I have been informed that you are skilled in the prosecution of secret investigations,' she said, 
and I wish to secure your services immediately. Are you at liberty to devote yourself to the task I wish to be performed by you? Mr. Larkspur was a man who rarely answered even the simplest question until he had turned the subject over in his mind and carefully studied every word that had been said to him. He was a man who made caution the ruling principle of his life, and he looked at every creature he encountered in the course of his career as an individual more or less likely to take him in. The boast of Mr. Larkspur was that he had never been taken in. "'I've been very near it more than once,' he said to his particular friends, when he unbent so far as to be confidential. "'I've had some very narrow escapes of being taken in, and done for as neatly as you please. There are some artful dodgers, whose artful dodging the oldest hand can scarcely guard against. But I'm proud to say not one of those artful dodgers has ever yet been able to get the better of me. Perhaps my time is to come.' and I shall be bamboozled in my old age. Before replying to Honoria's inquiry, Andrew Larkspur studied her from head to foot, with eyes whose sharp scrutiny would have been very unpleasant to anyone who had occasion for concealment. The result of the scrutiny seemed to be tolerably satisfactory, for Mr. Larkspur at last replied to his visitor's question in a tone which for him was extremely gracious. "'You want to know whether you can engage my services,' he said. "'That depends upon circumstances.' "'Upon what circumstances?' "'Whether you will be able to pay me. "'My hands are very full just now, "'and I've about as much business as I can possibly get through. "'I shall want you to abandon all such business, "'and to devote yourself exclusively to my service,' said Honoria. "'The deuce you will!' exclaimed Mr. Larkspur. Do you happen to know what my time is worth? Mr. Larkspur looked positively outraged by the idea that any one could suppose they could secure a monopoly of his valuable services. That is a question with which I have no concern, answered Honoria coolly. The work which I require you to do will most likely occupy all your time, and entirely absorb your attention. I am quite prepared to pay you liberally for your services, and I shall leave you to name your own terms. I shall rely on your honor as a man of business that those terms will not be exorbitant, and I shall accede to them without further question. Hm! muttered the suspicious Andrew. Do you know, ma'am, that sounds almost too liberal. I'm an old stager, ma'am, and have seen a good deal of life and I have generally found that people who are ready to promise so much beforehand are apt not to give anything when their work has been done. The fact that you have been cheated by swindlers is no reason why you should insult me, answered Honoria. I wished to secure your services, but I cannot continue an interview in which I find my offers met by insolent objections. There are no doubt other people in London who can assist me in the business I have in hand. I will wish you good morning. She rose and was about to leave the room. Mr. Larkspur began to think that he had been rather too cautious, and that perhaps this plainly attired lady might be a very good customer. You must excuse me, ma'am, he said, if I am rather a suspicious old chap. You see, it's the nature of my business to make a man suspicious. If you can pay me for my time— I shall be willing to devote myself to your service, for I'd much rather give my whole mind to one business than have ever so many odds and ends of affairs jostling each other in my brain. But the fact of it is, ladies very seldom have any idea what business is, however clever they may be in other matters, playing the piano, working bead mats and worsted slippers, and such like. Now I dare say you'll open your eyes uncommon wide when I tell you that my business is worth nigh upon sixteen pound a week to me, taking good with bad, and though you mayn't be aware of it, ma'am, having no doubt given your mind exclusive to Berlin wool and such like, sixteen pound a week is eight hundred a year. Mr. Larkspur, 
though not much given to surprise, was somewhat astonished to perceive that his lady visitor did not open her eyes any wider on receiving this intelligence. "'If you have earned eight hundred a year by your profession,' she returned quietly, "'I will give you twenty pounds a week for your exclusive services, and that will be a thousand and forty pounds a year.' This time Andrew Larkspur was still more surprised, though he was so completely master of himself as to conceal the smallest evidence of his astonishment. Here was a woman who had not devoted her mind to Berlin wool-work, and whose arithmetic was irreproachable. Hm, he muttered, too cautious to betray any appearance of eagerness to accept an advantageous offer. A thousand a year is very well in its way— "'But how long is it to last? "'If I turn my back upon this business here, "'it'll all tumble to pieces. "'And then, where shall I be when you have done with me?' "'I will engage you for one year, certain.' "'That won't do, ma'am. "'You must make it three years, certain.' "'Very well. "'I am willing to do that,' answered Honoria. "'I shall, in all probability, "'require your services for three years.' Mr. Larkspur regretted that he had not asked for an engagement of six years. "'Do you agree to those terms?' asked Honoria. "'Yes,' answered the detective, with well-assumed indifference. "'I suppose I may as well accept those terms, though I dare say I might make more money by leaving myself free to give my attention to anything that might turn up. And now, how am I to be paid? You see, you are quite a stranger to me.' "'I am aware of that, and I do not ask you to trust me,' replied Honoria. "'I will pay you eighty pounds a month.' Eighty pounds a month of four weeks,' interposed the cautious Larkspur. Eighty pounds for the lunar month. "'That makes a difference, you know, and it's just as well to be particular.' "'Certainly,' answered Lady Eversleigh, with a half-contemptuous smile. "'You shall not be cheated.' "'You shall receive your payment monthly in advance, "'and if you require security for the future, "'I can refer you to my bankers. "'My name is Mrs. Eden, Harriet Eden, "'and I bank with Messrs. Coutts.' "'The detective rubbed his hands with an air of gratification. "'Nothing could be more straightforward and businesslike,' he said. "'And when shall you require my services, Mrs. Eden?' "'Immediately.' "'There is an apartment vacant in the house in which I lodge. "'I should wish you to occupy that apartment, "'as you would thus be always at hand "'when I had any communication to make to you. "'Would that be possible?' "'Well, yes, ma'am, it would certainly be possible,' "'replied Mr. Larkspur, after the usual pause for reflection. "'But I am afraid I should be obliged to make that an extra. "'You shall be paid whatever you require. "'Thank you, ma'am.' "'You see, when a person of my age has been accustomed to live in one place for a long time, "'it goes against him to change his habits. "'However, to oblige you, I'll get together my little traps "'and shift my quarter to the lodging you speak of. "'Good. The house in question is number 90, Percy Street, Tottenham Court Road.' Mr. Larkspur was surprised to find that a lady who could afford to offer him more than a thousand a year was nevertheless contented to live in such a middle-class situation as Percy Street. "'Can you go to the new lodging to-morrow?' asked Honoria. "'Well, no, ma'am. You must give me a week, if you please. I must wind up some of the affairs I have been working upon, you see, and hand over my clients to other people, and I must set my books in order.' "'I've a few very profitable affairs in hand, I assure you. "'There's one which might have turned out a great prize, "'if I had been only able to carry it through. "'But those sort of things all depend on time, you see, ma'am. "'They're very slow. "'I have been about this one off and on for over three years, "'and very little has come of it yet.' "'The detective was turning over one of his books mechanically as he said this. "'It was a large ledger.' filled with entries in a queer, cramped handwriting, dotted about here and there, with mysterious marks in red and blue ink. Mr. Larkspur stopped suddenly as he turned the leaves, his attention arrested by one particular page. 
"'Here it is,' he said, "'the very business I was speaking of. Five hundred pounds for the discovery of the murderer or murderers, of Valentine Jernam, captain and owner of the Pizarro, whose body was found in the river below Wapping on the 3rd of April, 1836. That's a very queer business, that is, and I've never had leisure to get very deep into the rights and wrongs of it yet. Mr. Larkspur looked up presently, and saw that his visitor's face had grown white to the very lips. "'You knew Captain Jernam?' he said. "'No. Yes, I knew him slightly, and the idea of his murder is very shocking to me,' answered Honoria, struggling with her agitation. "'Do you expect to discover the secret of that dreadful crime?' "'Well, I don't know about that,' said Andrew Larkspur, with the careless and business-like tone of a man to whom murder is an incident of trade. You see, when these things have gone by for a long time, without anything being found out about them, the secret generally comes out by accident, if it ever comes out at all. There are cases in which the secret never does come out, but there are not many such cases. There's a deal in accident, and a man of my profession must be always on the lookout for accident, or he'll lose a great many chances. You see those red marks stuck here and there among all that writing in blue ink? Those red marks are set against the facts that seem pretty clear and straightforward. The blue marks are set against facts that seem dark. You see, there's more blue marks than red. That means that it's a dark case. Honoria Eversleigh bent over the old man's shoulder and read a few fragmentary lines here and there in the page beneath her. Seen at the Jolly Tar, Ratcliffe Highway, a low public house frequented by sailors. Seen with two men, Dennis Wayman, landlord of the Jolly Tar, and a man called Milson or Milsom. The man Milson or Milsom has since disappeared, is believed to have been transported but is not to be heard of abroad. A little below these entries was another, which seemed to Honoria Eversleigh to be inscribed in letters of fire. Valentine Jernam was known to have fallen in love with a girl who sang at the Jolly Tar public house, and it is supposed that he was lured to his death by the agency of this girl. She is described as about seventeen years of age, very handsome, dark eyes, dark hair, Mr. Larkspur closed the volume before Lady Eversleigh could read further. She returned to her seat, still terribly pale, and with a sickening pain at her heart. All the shame and anguish of her early life, the unspeakable horror of her girlhood, had been brought vividly back to her by the perusal of the memoranda in the detective's ledger. "'I mean to try my luck yet at getting at the bottom of the mystery,' said Andrew Larkspur. Five hundred pounds reward is worth working for. I, I've a notion that I shall lay my hands upon Valentine Jernam's murderer sooner or later. Who offers the reward? asked Honoria. Government offers one hundred of it, George Jernam four hundred more. Who is George Jernam? The captain's younger brother, a merchant captain himself, the owner of several vessels, and I believe a rich man. He came here accompanied by a queer-looking fellow called Joyce Harker, a kind of clerk, I believe, who was very much attached to the murdered man. Yes, yes, I know, murmured Honoria. She had been so terribly agitated by the mention of Valentine Jernam's name that her presence of mind had entirely abandoned her. You knew that humpbacked clerk? exclaimed Mr. Larkspur. "'I have heard of him,' she faltered. There was a pause during which Lady Eversleigh recovered in some degree from the painful emotion caused by memories so unexpectedly evoked. "'I may as well give you some preliminary instructions to-day,' she said, reassuming her business-like tone, "'and I will write you a cheque for the first month of your service.' Mr. Larkspur lost no time in providing his visitor with pen and ink. She took a checkbook from her pocket and filled in a check for eighty pounds in Andrew Larkspur's favor. The check was signed Harriet Eden. 
"'When you present that, you will be able to ascertain that your future payments will be secure,' she said. She handed the check to Mr. Larkspur, who looked at it with an air of assumed indifference, and slipped it carelessly into his waistcoat pocket. "'And now, ma'am,' he said, "'I am ready to receive your instructions.' "'In the first place,' said Honoria, "'I must beg that you will on no occasion attempt to pry into my motives.' "'whatever I may require of you. "'That, ma'am, is understood. "'I have nothing to do with the motives of my employers, "'and I care nothing about them.' "'I am glad to hear that,' replied Honoria. "'The business in which I require your aid is a very strange one, "'and the time may come when you will be half inclined to believe me mad. "'But, whatever I do, however mysterious my actions may be, think always that a deeply rooted purpose lies beneath them and that every thought of my brain every trivial act of my life will shape itself to one end i ask no questions ma'am and you will serve me faithfully blindly yes ma'am both faithfully and blindly i think i may trust you replied honoria very earnestly and now i will speak freely there are two men upon whose lives I desire to place a spy. I want to know every act of their lives, every word they speak, every secret of their hearts. I wish to be an unseen witness of their lonely hours, an impalpable guest at every gathering in which they mingle. I want to be near them always in spirit, if not in bodily presence. I want to track them step by step, let their ways be never so dark and winding. This is the purpose of my life, but I am a woman, powerless to act freely, bound and fettered as women only are fettered. Do you begin to understand what I require of you? I think I do. Mr. Larkspur, continued Honoria with energy, I want you to be my second self. I want you to be the shadow of these two men. Wherever they go, you must follow. In some shape or other, you must haunt them, by night and day. It is, of course, a difficult task which I demand of you. You have to decide whether it is impossible. Impossible, ma'am? Not a bit of it. Nothing is impossible to a man who has served twenty years' apprenticeship as a Bow Street runner. You don't know what we old Bow Street hands can do when we're on our metal. I've heard a deal of talk about Fouché. That was at the head of Bone Party's police. But bless your heart, ma'am, Fouché was a fool to us. I've done as much and more than what you talk of before today. All you have to do is give me the names and descriptions of the two men I am to watch, and leave all the rest to me. One of these two men is Sir Reginald Eversleigh, baronet, a man of small fortune, a bachelor, occupying lodgings in Villiers Street. I have reason to believe that he is dissipated, a gamester and a reprobate. Good, said Mr. Larkspur, who jotted down an occasional note in a greasy little pocket book. The second person is a medical practitioner called Victor Carrington, a Frenchman, but a perfect master of the English language, and a man whose youth has been spent in England. The two men are firm friends and constant associates. In keeping watch upon the actions of one, you cannot fail to see much of the other. Very good, ma'am. You may make your mind easy, answered the detective, as coolly as if he had just received the most commonplace order. He escorted Honoria to the door. Chapter Sixteen of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Sixteen, Waiting and Watching. Valentine Jernam's younger brother George had journeyed to and fro on the high seas five years since the murder of the brave and generous-hearted sea captain. Things had gone well with Captain George Jernam, and in the whole of the trading navy 
there were few richer men than the owner of the Pizarro, Stormy Petrel, and Albatross. With these three vessels constantly afloat, George Jernam was on the high road to fortune. His life had not been by any means uneventful since the death of his brother, though that mysterious calamity had taken away the zest from his success for many a day, and though he no longer cherished the same visions of a happy home in England, when his circumstances should have become so prosperous as to enable him to settle down. This same process of settling down was one by no means congenial to George Jernam's disposition at any time, and he was far less likely to take to it kindly now than when dear old Val, as he began to call his brother in his thoughts once more, when the horror of the murder had begun to wear off, and the lost friend seemed again familiar, had been the prospective sharer of the retirement which was to be so tranquil, so comfortable, and so well earned. It had no attraction for George at all, for many a long day, after Joyce Harker's letter had reached him, he never dwelt upon it. He set his face hard against his grief, and worked on as men must work, fortunately for them, under all chances and changes of this mortal life, until the last change of all. At first the thirst for revenge upon his brother's murderers had been hot and strong upon George Jernam almost as hot and strong as it had been, and continued to be, upon Joyce Harker. But the natures of the men differed materially. George Jernam had neither the dogged persistency nor the latent fierceness of his dead brother's friend and protégé, and the long, slow, untiring watching to which Harker devoted himself would have been a task so uncongenial as to be indeed impossible to the more open, more congenial temperament of the merchant captain. He had responded warmly to Harker's letters. He had more than sanctioned the outlay which he had made in money paid and money promised to the skilled detective to whom Harker had entrusted the investigation of the murder of Valentine Jernam. He had awaited every communication with anxious interest and suspense, and he had never landed after a voyage and received the letters which awaited his arrival without a keen revival of the first sharp pang that had smote him with the tidings of his brother's fate. Happily, George Jernam was a busy man, and his life was full of variety, adventure, and incident. In time he began, not to forget, indeed, but to remember less frequently and less painfully the manner of his brother's death, and to regard the fixed purpose of Joyce Harker's life as more or less of a harmless delusion. A practical man in his own way, George Jernam had very vague ideas concerning the lives of the criminal classes, and the faculties and facilities of the science of detection, and the hope of finding out the secret of his brother's fate had long ago deserted him. Only once had he and Joyce Harker met since the murder of Valentine Jernam. George had landed a cargo at Hamburg, and had given his brother's friend rendezvous there, then the two men had talked of all that had been done so vainly, and all that remained to be done, Harker hoped, so effectively. Joyce had never been able to bring his suspicions concerning Black Milsom to the test of proof. Unwearied search had been made for the old man who had played the part of grandfather to the beautiful ballad singer, but it had been wholly ineffectual. All that could be ascertained concerning him was— that he had died in a hospital in a country town on the great northern road, and that the girl had wandered away from there, and never more been heard of. Of Black Milsom, Joyce Harker had never lost sight, until his career received a temporary check by the sentence of transportation, which had sent the ruffian out of the country. But all efforts of the faithful watcher had failed to discover the missing link in the evidence which connected Black Milsom with Valentine Jernam's death. All his watching and questioning, all his silent noting of the idle talk around him, all his eager endeavor to take Dennis Wayman unawares, failed to enable him to obtain evidence of that one fact of which he was convinced, the fact that Valentine Jernam had been at the public house in Ratcliffe Highway on the day of his death. When the inutility of his endeavors became clear to Joyce Harker, he gave up his lodging in Wayman's house, 
and located himself in modest apartments at Poplar, where he transacted a great deal of business for George Jernam, and maintained a constant, though unprofitable, communication with the detective officer to whom he had confided the task of investigation, and who was no other than Mr. Andrew Larkspur. In one of the earliest of the numerous letters which George Jernam addressed to Harker after the death of Valentine, the merchant captain had given his zealous friend and assistant certain instructions concerning the old aunt to whom the two desolate boys had owed so much in their ill-treated childhood, and whom they had so well and constantly requited in their prosperous manhood. These instructions included a request that Joyce Harker would visit Susan Jernam in person, and furnish George with details relative to that venerable lady's requirements, looks, health, and general circumstances. "'I should have seen the good old soul, you know,' wrote George, "'when I was to have seen poor Val. "'But it didn't please God that the one thing should come off any more than the other, "'and it can't be helped. "'But I should like you to run down to Allen Bay and look her up, "'and let her know that she is neither neglected nor forgotten by her vagabond nephew.' "'So Joyce Harker went down to the Devonshire village,' and introduced himself to George Jernam's aunt. The old lady was much altered since she had last welcomed a visitor to her pretty, cheerful cottage, and had listened with simple surprise and pleasure to her nephew Valentine's tales of the sea, and they had talked together over the troublous days of his unhappy childhood. The untimely and tragic death of the merchant captain had afflicted her deeply, and had filled her mind with sentiments which, though they differed in degree, closely resembled in their nature those of Joyce Harker, the determination to be revenged upon the murderers of her boy, which Harker expressed, found a ready echo in the breast of his hearer, and she thanked him warmly for his devotion to the master he had lost. Strong mutual liking grew up between these two, and when her visitor left her, after having carried out all George's wishes in respect to her, on the scale of liberality which the grateful nephew had dictated, Susan Jernam gave him a cordial invitation to pass any leisure time he might have at the cottage, though, as she remarked, I am not very lively company, Mr. Harker, for you or anybody, for I can't talk of anything but George and poor Valentine. And I don't care to talk of much else either, Mrs. Jernam, said Harker in reply. So, you see— we couldn't possibly be better company for each other. Thus it happened that a second tie between George Jernam and Joyce Harker arose, in the person of the sole surviving relative of the former, and that Joyce had made three visits to the pretty seaside village in which the childhood of his dead friend and his living patron had been passed, before he and George Jernam met again on English ground. When at length that long-deferred meeting took place, Valentine Jernam's murder was a mystery rather more than five years old, and Mr. Andrew Larkspur had made no progress towards its solution. He had been obliged to acknowledge to Joyce Harker that he had not struck the right trail, and to confess that he had begun to despond. The disappearance of Black Milsom from among the congenial society of thieves and ruffians which he frequented was, of course, easily accounted for by Mr. Larkspur, and the absence of any, even the slightest additional clue to the fate of Jernam, confirmed that astute person in the conviction which he had reached early in the course of his confabulations with Harker, that the convict was the guilty man. There was, on this hypothesis, nothing for it but to wait until the worthy exile should have worked out his time and once more returned to grace his mother country, and then to resume the close watch, which, though hitherto ineffectual, might in time bring some of his former deeds to light. Such was the state of affairs when Captain Duncombe bought the deserted house which had had such undesirable tenants, first in the person of old Scruton, the miser, and secondly of Black Milsom. Joyce Harker was aware of the transaction, and had watched with some interest the transformation of the dreary, dismal, doomed place into the cheery, comfortable, middle-class residence it had now become. 
If he had known that the last hours of Valentine Jernam's life had been passed on that spot, that there his beloved master had met with a violent and cruel death, with what different feelings he would have watched the work. But though, as the former dwelling of Black Milsom, the cottage had a dreary attraction for him, he was far from imagining that within its walls lay hidden one infallible clue to the secret for which he had sought so long and so vainly. The new occupant of Riverview Cottage was acquainted with Joyce Harker, and held the solitary old man in some esteem. Captain Joe Duncombe and the protégé of the Jernams had nothing whatever in common in character, disposition, or manners, and the distance in the social scale which divided the prosperous merchant captain from the poor though clever dependent was considerable, even according to the not very strict standard of manners observed by persons of their respective classes. But Joe Duncombe knew and heartily liked George Jernam. He had been in England at the time of Valentine's murder, and he had then learned the faithful and active part played by Harker. He had lost sight of the man for some time, but when he had bought the cottage, and during the progress of the changes and improvements he had made in that unprepossessing dwelling, accident had thrown Harker in his way, and they had found much to discuss in George Jernam's prosperity, in his generous treatment of Harker, in the general condition of the merchant service, which the two men declared to be going to the dogs, after the manner of all professions, trades, and institutions of every age and every clime, when contemplated from a conversational point of view, and in the honest captain's plans, hopes, and prospects concerning his daughter. Joyce Harker had seen Rosamond Duncombe occasionally, but had not taken much notice of her, nor had Miss Duncombe been much impressed by that gentleman. Joyce was not a lady's man, and Rosamond, who entertained a rather disrespectful notion of her father's acquaintances in general, classing them collectively as old fogies, contented herself with distinguishing Mr. Harker as the ugliest and grimmest of the lot. Joyce came and went, not very often indeed, but very freely to Riverview Cottage, and there was much confidence and good fellowship between the bluff old seaman and the more acute but not less honest adventurer. There was, however, one circumstance which Captain Duncombe never mentioned to Harker. That circumstance was the apparition of old Scruton's ghost. Joe Duncombe was, to tell the truth, a little ashamed of his credulity on that occasion. He entertained no doubt that he had been victimized by a clever practical joke, and while he chuckled over the recollection that it had been an expensive jest to the perpetrator, who had lost a valuable gold coin by the transaction, he had no fancy for exposing himself to any further ridicule on the occasion. So the bluff, imperious, soft-hearted captain issued a commanding silence on the subject, and silence was observed, not in the least because Rosamond Duncombe or Susan Trott were afraid of him, but because Rosamond loved her father, and Susan Trott respected her master too much to disobey his lightest wish. There was also one circumstance which Joyce Harker never mentioned to Captain Duncombe. This circumstance was the identity of the former occupant of the cottage with the man whom he believed to be the murderer of Valentine Jernam. "'It is bad enough to live in a place that's said to be haunted,' said Harker to himself, when he visited the cottage for the first time, without my telling him that he comes out. Chapter 17, Part 1 of Run to Earth, a Novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 17 Doubtful Society Part 1 Victor Carrington still lived in the little cottage on the outskirts of London. Here, with his mother for his only companion, he led a simple, studious life, which, to anyone ignorant of his character, would have seemed the life of a good and honorable man. 
the few neighbours who passed to and fro beneath the wall which surrounded the cottage knew nothing of the inner life of its occupants they knew only that of all the houses in the neighbourhood this was the quietest yet those who happened to pass the house late at night always saw a glimmer of light in an upper chamber and the blue vapour of smoke rising from one particular chimney those who had occasion to pass the house frequently after dark perceived that the smoke from this chimney was different from the common smoke of common chimneys sometimes vivid sparks glittered and flashed upon the darkness at other times a semi-luminous green vapour was seen to issue from the mouth of the chimney these facts were spoken about by the neighbours and by and by people discovered that the smoke issued from the chimney of victor carrington's laboratory where the surgeon was frequently employed long after midnight making experiments in the science of chemistry the nature of these experiments was known to no one the few neighbours who had ever conversed with the french surgeon had heard him declare that he was a student of the mysteries of electricity it was therefore supposed that all his experiments were in some manner connected with that wondrous science no one for a moment suspected evil of a young man whose life was sober respectable and laborious and who went to the little catholic chapel every sunday with his mother leaning on his arm those who really knew victor carrington knew that he was without one ray of belief in a divine ruler and that he laughed to scorn those terrors of heavenly vengeance which sometimes restrain the hand of the most hardened criminal he was a wretch who seemed to have been created without those natural qualities which in some degree redeem the worst of humanity he was a creature without a conscience without a heart and yet he seemed the most dutiful and devoted of sons is it possible that filial love could hold any place in a soul so lost as his it is difficult to solve this enigma victor carrington was ambitious and to gain the object of his ambition he was willing to steep his soul in guilt but he was also cautious and calculating and he knew that to commit crime with impunity he must so shape his life as to escape suspicion he knew that a devoted and affectionate son is always respected by good men and women and he had studied human nature too closely not to be aware that there is more goodness than wickedness in the world base though some of earth's inhabitants may be the world is easily hoodwinked and those who watched the life of the young surgeon were ready to declare that he was a most deserving young man he had his reward for this apparent excellence patients came to him without his seeking and at the time of honoria eversleigh's arrival in london he had obtained a small but remunerative practice the money earned thus enabled him to live the money he won by his pen in the medical journals he was able to save he knew how necessary money was in all the turning points of life and he denied himself every pleasure and every luxury in order to save a sum which should serve him in time of need matilda carrington was one of those quiet women who seemed to take no interest in the world around them and to be happy without the pleasures which delight other women she lived quite alone without one female friend or acquaintance and she saw little of her son whose midnight studies in medical practice absorbed almost every hour of his existence her life therefore was one long solitude and but for the companionship of her birds and two angora cats she would have been almost as much alone as a prisoner in a condemned cell there was but one visitor who came often to the cottage and that was sir reginald eversleigh the young baronet contrived to exist somehow or other upon his income of five hundred a year but as he had neither abandoned his old haunts nor put aside his old vices the income which to a good man would have seemed a handsome competence barely enabled him to stave off the demands of his most pressing creditors by occasional payments on account he lived a dark and strange existence occupying a set of shabby genteel apartments in a street leading out of the strand but spending a great part of his life in a house on the banks of the thames 
a house that stood amidst grounds of some extent, situated midway between Chelsea and Fulham. The mistress of this house was a lady who called herself a widow, but of whose real position the world knew very little. She was said to be of Austrian extraction, and the widow of an Austrian officer. Her name was Paulina Dursky. She had bade farewell to the fresh bloom of early youth, for at her best she looked thirty years of age. But her beauty was of that brilliant order which does not need the charm of girlhood. She was a woman, a grand, queen-like creature. Those who admired her most compared her to a tall white lily, alike stately and graceful. She was fair, with that snowy purity of complexion which is so rare a charm. Her hair was of the palest gold, darker than flaxen, lighter than auburn. Hair that waved in sunny undulations on the broad white forehead, and imparted an unspeakable innocence to the beautiful face. Such was Paulina Dursky. One charm alone was wanting to render this woman as lovable as she was lovely, and that was the charm of expression. There was a lack of warmth in that perfect face. The bright blue eyes were hard. The rosy lips had been trained to smile on friend or foe, on stranger or kinsman, with the same artificial smile. Hilton House was the name of the villa by the river bank. It had belonged originally to a nobleman, but, on the decay of his fortunes, had fallen into the hands of a speculator, who intended to occupy it, but who failed almost immediately after becoming its owner. After this man's bankruptcy, the house had for a long time been tenantless. It was too expensive for some, too lonely for others, and when Madame Dursky saw and took a fancy to the place, she was able to secure it for a moderate rent. The grounds and the house had been neglected. The rare and costly shrubs in the gardens were rank and overgrown. The exquisite decorations of the interior were spoiled by damp. Madame Dursky was a person who lived a certain style, but it speedily became evident that she was very often at a loss for ready money. Her furniture arrived from Paris, and her household came also from that brilliant city. It was the household of a princess, but of a princess not unfamiliar with poverty. There was a Spanish courier, one Carlo Toas, a strange, silent creature, whose stately and solemn movements seemed fitted for a courtly assembly, rather than for the unceremonious gatherings of modern society. The next person in importance in the household of Madame Dursky was an elderly woman, who attended on the fair Austrian widow. She was a native of Paris, and her name was Sophie Elzer. There were three other servants, all foreigners, and apparently devoted to their mistress. The furniture was of a bygone fashion, costly and beautiful of its kind, but it was furniture which had seen better days. The draperies in every chamber were of satin or velvet, but the satin was worn and faded, the velvet threadbare. The pictures, china, plate, the bronzes and knick-knacks which adorned the rooms, all bore evidence of a refined and artistic taste. But much of the china was imperfect, and the plate was of very small extent. The existence of Paulina Dursky was one which might well excite curiosity in the minds of the few neighbors who had the opportunity of observing her mode of life. This beautiful widow had no female acquaintances, save a humble friend who lived with her, an Englishwoman, who subsisted upon the charity of the lovely Paulina. This person never quitted her benefactress. She was constant as her shadow, a faithful watchdog, always at hand, yet never obtrusive. She was a creature who seemed to have been born without eyes and without ears. So careless was the widow of her presence, so reckless what secrets were disclosed in her hearing. By daylight the life of Madame Dursky and her companion, Miss Brewer, seemed the dullest existence ever endured by womankind. Paulina rarely left her own apartment until six in the evening, at which hour she and Miss Brewer dined together in her boudoir. They always dined alone, 
After dinner, Paulina returned to her apartment to dress for the evening, while Miss Brewer retired to her own bedroom on the upper story, where she arrayed herself invariably in black velvet. She had never been seen by the visitors at Hilton House in any other costume than this lustreless velvet. Her age was between thirty and forty. She might once have had some pretensions to beauty, but her face was pinched and careworn, and there was a sharp, greedy look in the small eyes, whose color was that neutral, undecided tint that seems sometimes a pale yellowish-brown, anon a bluish-green. All day long the two women at Hilton House lived alone. No carriage approached the gates. No foot-passenger was seen to enter the grounds. Within and without, all was silent and lifeless. But with nightfall came a change. Lights shone in all the lower windows. Music sounded on the still night air. Many carriages rolled through the open gateway. Broms with flashing lamps dashed up to the marble portico, and hat-cabs mingled with the more stylish equipages. There were very few nights on which Paulina Dursky's saloons were not enlivened by the presence of many guests. Her visitors were all gentlemen, but they treated the mistress of the house with as much respect as if she had been surrounded by women of the highest rank. Night after night the same men assembled in those faded saloons. Night after night the carriages rolled along the avenue. The flashing lamps illuminated the darkness. Those who watched the proceedings of the Austrian widow had good reason to wonder what the attraction was which brought those visitors so constantly to Hilton House. Many speculations were formed, and the fair widow's reputation suffered much at the hands of her neighbors but none guessed the real charm of those nightly receptions. The secret was known only to those within the mansion, and from those it could not be hidden. The charm which drew so many visitors to the saloons of Madame Dursky was the fatal spell of the gaming-table. The beautiful Paulina opened a suite of three spacious chambers for the reception of her guests. In the outer apartment there was a piano, and it was here Paulina sat, with her constant companion, Matilda Brewer. In the second apartment were small green velvet-covered tables, devoted to whist and écarté. The third and inner apartment was much larger than either of the others, and in this room there was a table for rouge et noir. The door of this inner apartment was papered, so as to appear when closed like a portion of the wall. A heavy picture was securely fastened upon this papered surface, and the door was lined with iron. Once closed, this door was not easily to be discovered by the eye of a stranger, and even when discovered, it was not easily to be opened. It was secured with a spring lock, which fastened of itself as the door swung to. This inner apartment had no windows. It was never used in the daytime. It was a secret chamber, hidden in the very center of the house, and only an architect or a detective officer would have been likely to have discovered its existence. The walls were hung with red cloth, and Madame Dursky always spoke of this apartment as the red drawing-room. Her servants were forbidden to mention the chamber in their conversation with the neighbors, and the members of the Austrian widow's household were too well trained to disobey any such orders. By the laws of England, the existence of a table for rouge et noir is forbidden. All these precautions were therefore necessary to ensure safety for the guests of Madame Dursky. Paulina herself never played. Sometimes she sat with Miss Brewer in the outer chamber, silent and abstracted, while her visitors amused themselves in the two other rooms. Sometimes she seated herself at the piano, and played soft, plaintive German sonatas, or later on vert, for an hour at a time. Sometimes she moved slowly to and fro amongst the gamblers, now lingering for a few moments behind the chair of one, now glancing at the cards of another. One of her most constant visitors was Reginald Eversleigh. Every night he drove down to Hilton House in a hack-cab, he was generally the first to arrive, and the last to depart. 
It was also to be observed that almost all the men who assembled in the drawing-rooms of Hilton House were friends and acquaintances of Sir Reginald. It was he who introduced them to the lovely widow. It was he who tempted them to come. Chapter 17, Part 2 of Run to Earth, a Novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter 17 Doubtful Society, Part 2. The association between Reginald Eversleigh and Paulina Dursky was no new alliance. Immediately after the death of Sir Oswald Eversleigh, Reginald turned his back upon London, disgusted with the scene of his poverty and humiliation, eager to find forgetfulness of his bitter disappointments, in the fever and excitement of a more brilliant city than any to be found in Great Britain. He went to Paris, that capital which he had shunned since the death of Mary Goodwin, but whither he returned eagerly now, thirsting for riot and excitement any opiate by which he might lull to rest the bitter memories of the past month. He was familiar with the wildest haunts of that city of dissipation, and he was speedily engulfed in the vortex of vice and folly. If he had been a rich man, this life might have gone on for ever. But without money a man counts for very little in such a circle as that wherein Reginald alone could find delight. And to the inhabitants of that region— five hundred a year would seem a kind of pauperism. Sir Reginald contrived to keep the actual amount of his income a secret, locked in his own breast. His acquaintances and associates knew that he was not rich, but they knew no more. At the French Opera House he saw Paulina Dursky for the first time. She was seated in one of the smaller boxes, dressed in pure white, with white camellias in her hair. Her faithful companion, Matilda Brewer, was seated in the shadow of the curtains, and formed a foil for the beautiful Austrian. Reginald Eversleigh entered the house with a dissipated and fashionable young Parisian, a man who, like his companion, had wasted youth, character, and fortune in the tainted atmosphere of disreputable haunts and midnight assemblies. The two men took their places in the stalls, and amused themselves between the acts by a scrutiny of the occupants of the house. Hector Leonce, the Parisian, was familiar with the inmates of every box. "'Do you see that beautiful, fair-haired woman with the white camellias in her hair?' he said, after he had drawn the attention of the Englishman to several distinguished people. "'That is Madame Dursky, the young and wealthy widow of an Austrian officer.' and one of the most celebrated beauties in Paris. "'She is very handsome,' answered Reginald carelessly. "'But hers is a cold style of loveliness, too much like a face moulded out of wax.' "'Wait till you see her animated,' replied Hector Leonce. "'We will go to her box presently.' When the curtain fell on the close of the following act, the two men left the stalls and made their way to Madame Dursky's box." She received them courteously, and Reginald Eversleigh speedily perceived that her beauty, fair and wax-like as it was, did not lack intellectual grace. She talked well, and her manner had the tone of good society. Reginald was surprised to see her attended only by the little Englishwoman in her dress of threadbare black velvet. After the opera, Sir Reginald and Hector Leonce accompanied Madame Dursky to her apartments in the Rue de Faubourg, St. Honoré, and there the baronet beheld higher play than he had ever seen before in a private house presided over by a woman. On this occasion the beautiful widow herself occupied a place at the Rue Genois table, and Reginald beheld enough to enlighten him as to her real character. He saw that with this woman the love of play was a passion, a profound and soul-absorbing delight. He saw the eyes which, in repose, seemed of so cold a brightness, 
emit vivid flashes of feverish light. He saw the fair blush-rose-tinted cheek glow with a hectic crimson. He beheld the woman with her mask thrown aside, abandoned to the influence of her master passion. After this night, Reginald Eversleigh was a frequent visitor at the apartments of the Austrian widow. For him, as for her, the fierce excitement of the gaming-table was an irresistible temptation. In her elegantly appointed drawing-rooms, he met rich men who were desperate players, but he met few men who were likely to be dupes. Here neither skill nor bribery availed him, and he was dependent on the caprices of chance. The balance was tolerably even, and he left Paris neither richer nor poorer for his acquaintance with Paulina Dursky. But that acquaintance exercised a very powerful influence over his destiny, nevertheless. There was a strange fascination in the society of the Austrian widow, a nameless, indefinable charm, which few were able to resist. A bitter experience of vice and folly had robbed Reginald Eversleigh's heart and mind of all youth's freshness and confidence, and for him this woman seemed only what she was, an adventurous, dangerous to all who approached her. He knew this, and yet he yielded to the fascination of her presence. Night after night he haunted the rooms in the Rue de Faubourg St. Honoré. He went there even when he was too poor to play, and could only stand behind Paulina's chair, a patient and devoted cavalier. For a long time she seemed to be scarcely aware of his devotion. She received him as she received her other guests. She met him always with the same cold smile, the same studied courtesy. But one evening, when he went to her apartments earlier than usual, he found her alone and in a melancholy mood. Then, for the first time, he became aware that the life she led was odious to her, that she loathed the hateful vice of which she was the slave. She was wont to be very silent about herself and her own feelings, but that night she cast aside all reserve and spoke with a passionate earnestness which made her seem doubly charming to Reginald Eversleigh. "'I am so degraded a creature,' "'that perhaps you have never troubled yourself to wonder "'how I became the thing I am,' she said. "'And yet you must surely have marvelled to see a woman of high birth "'fall into the depths in which you find me, "'fallen so low as to be the companion of gamesters, "'a gamester myself. "'I will tell you the secret of my life.' "'Reginald Eversleigh lifted his hand with a deprecating gesture. "'Dear madam, tell me nothing, I implore you. "'I admire and respect you,' he said. "'To me you must always appear the most beautiful of women, "'whatever may be the nature of your surroundings.' "'Yes, the most beautiful,' echoed Paulina, with passionate scorn. "'You men think that to praise a woman's beauty "'is to console her for every humiliation. "'I have long held that which you call my beauty "'as the poorest thing on earth.' "'so little happiness has its possession won for me. "'I will tell you the story of my life. "'It is the only justification I have. "'I am ready to listen. "'So long as you speak of yourself, "'your words must have the deepest interest for me. "'I was reared amongst gamesters, Reginald Eversleigh, "'continued Paulina Dursky, "'with the same passionate intensity of manner. "'My father was an incorrigible gambler, and before I had emerged from childhood to girlhood, the handsome fortune which should have been mine had been squandered. As a girl, the rattle of the dice, the clamor of the rouge et noir table, were the most familiar sounds to my ears. Night after night, night after night, I have kept watch at my own window, and have seen the lighted windows of my father's rooms, and have known that grim poverty was drawing nearer and nearer, as the long hours of those sleepless nights went by. My poor Paulina! My mother died young, exhausted by the perpetual fever of anxiety which the gambler's wife is doomed to suffer. She died, and I was left alone, a woman, beautiful if you will, and, as the world supposed, heiress to a large fortune, for none knew how entirely the wealth, which should have been mine, 
had melted away in those nights of dissipation and folly. People knew that my father played, and played desperately, but few knew the extent of his losses. After my mother's death, my father insisted on my doing the honours of his house. I received his friends. I stood by his chair as he played écarté, or sat by his side and noted the progress of the game at the Rouge et Noir table. Then first I felt the fatal passion which I can but believe to be a taint in my very blood. Slowly and gradually the fascinating vice assumed its horrible mastery. I watched the progress of the play. I learned to understand that science which was the one all-absorbing pursuit of those around me. Then I played myself, first taking a hand at écarté with some of the younger guests, half in sport, and then venturing a small golden coin at the Rouge et Noir table, while my admirers praised my darling, as if I had been some capricious child. In those assemblies I was always the only woman, except Matilda Brewer, who was then my governess. My father would have no female guests at these nightly orgies. The presence of women would have been a hindrance to the delights of the gaming table. At first I felt all the bitterness of my position— I looked forward with unspeakable dread to the dreary future in which I should find destitution staring me in the face. But, when once the gamester's madness had seized upon me, I thought no more of that dreary future. I became as reckless as my father and his guests. I forgot everything in the excitement of the moment. To be lucky at the gaming-table was to be happy. To lose was despair. Thus my youth went by till the day when my father told me that Colonel Dursky had offered me his hand and fortune, and that I had no alternative but to accept him. "'Oh, then your first marriage was no love-match?' cried Reginald eagerly. "'A love-match?' exclaimed Paulina contemptuously. "'No. It was a marriage of convenience, dictated by a father who set less value on his daughter's happiness than on a good hand of cards.' My father told me I must choose between Leopold Dursky and ruin. This house cannot shelter you much longer, he said. For myself there is flight. I can go to America and lose my identity in strange cities. I cannot remain in Vienna to be pointed at as the beggared Count Vesci. But with you for my companion I should be tied hand and foot. As a wanderer and an adventurer I may prosper alone. "'but as a wanderer, burdened with a helpless woman, "'failure would be certain. "'It is not a question of choice, Paulina,' he said resolutely. "'There is no alternative. "'You must become the wife of Leopold Dursky. "'And you consented?' "'I ask you, Reginald Eversleigh, could I refuse? "'For me, love was a word which had no meaning. "'Leopold Dursky was more than double my age.' but in outward seeming he was a gentleman. He was reported to be wealthy. He had a high position at the Austrian court. I was so utterly helpless, so desolate, so despairing, that it is scarcely strange if I accepted the fate my father pressed upon me, careless as to a future which held no joy for me beyond the pleasure of the gaming-table. I left the house of one gambler to ally myself to the fortunes of another, for Leopold Dursky was my father's companion and friend, and the same master passion swayed both. It was strange that my father, himself a ruined gamester, should have become the dupe of a man whose reported wealth was as great a sham as his own. But so it was. I exchanged poverty with one master for poverty with another master. My new life was an existence of perpetual falsehood and trickery, I occupied a splendid house in the most fashionable quarter of Vienna, but that house was maintained by my husband's winnings at the gaming-table, and it was my task to draw together the dupes whose money was to support the false semblance of grandeur which surrounded me. The dupes came. I had my little court of flatterers, but the courtiers paid dearly for their allegiance to their queen. I was the snare which was set to entrap the birds whose feathers my husband was to pluck. If I had been like other women, my position would have been utterly intolerable to me. 
I should have found some means of escape from a life so hateful, a degradation so shameful. And you made no attempt to escape? None. I was a gambler. The vice which had degraded my husband had degraded me. We had both sunk to the same level, and I had no right to reproach him for infamy which I shared. We had little affection for each other. Colonel Dursky had sought me only because I was fitted to adorn his reception rooms and attract the dupes who were to suffer by their acquaintance with him. But if there was little love between us, we at least never quarreled. He treated me always with studied courtesy, and I never upbraided him for the deception by which he had obtained my hand. My father disappeared suddenly from Vienna, and only after his departure was it discovered that his fortune had long vanished, and that he had for several years been completely insolvent. His creditors tittered a cry of execration, but in great cities the cries of such victims are scarcely heard. My reception rooms were still thronged by aristocratic guests, and no one cared to remember my father's infamy. This life had lasted three years, when my husband died and left me penniless. I sold my jewels and came to this city, where for a year and a half I have lived, as my husband lived in Vienna, on the fortune of the gaming table. I am growing weary of Paris, and it may be that Paris is growing weary of me. I suppose I shall go to London next. And next? Who knows? Ah, Reginald Eversley, believe me, there are many moments of my life in which I think that the little walk from here to the river will cut the knot of all my difficulties. Tonight I am surrounded with anxieties, steeped in degradation, hemmed in by obstacles that shut me out of all peaceful resting places. "'Tomorrow I might be lying very quietly in the morgue. "'Paulina, for pity's sake! "'Ah, me! "'These are idle words, are they not?' "'said Madame Dursky, with a weary sigh. "'And now I have told you my history, Reginald Eversleigh, "'and it is for you to judge "'whether there is any excuse for such a creature as I am.' Sir Reginald pitied this hopeless, friendless woman as much as it was in him to pity any one except himself, and tried to utter some words of consolation. She looked up at him as he spoke to her, with a glance in which he saw a deeper feeling than gratitude. Then it was that Reginald declared himself the devoted lover of the woman who had revealed to him the strange story of her life. He told her of the influence which she exercised over him, the fascination which he had sought in vain to resist. He declared himself attached to her by an affection which would know no change, come what might. But he did not offer this friendless woman the shelter of his name, the ostensible position which would have been hers had she become his wife. Even when beneath the sway of a woman's fascination, Reginald Eversleigh was cold in calculating. Paulina Dursky was poor, and doubtless deeply in debt. She was a gambler, and the companion of gamblers. She was, therefore, no fitting wife for a man who looked upon marriage as a stepping-stone by which he might yet redeem his fallen fortunes. Paulina received his declaration with an air of simulated coldness, but Reginald Eversleigh could perceive that it was only simulated, and that he had awakened a real affection in the heart of this desolate woman. "'Do not speak to me of love,' she said. "'To me such words can promise no happiness. "'My love could only bring shame and misery on the man to whom it was given. "'Let me tread my dreary pathway alone, Reginald, alone to the very end.' "'Much was said after this by Reginald and the woman who loved him, "'and who was yet too proud to confess her love. "'Paulina Dursky was not an inexperienced girl to be persuaded by romantic speeches.' She had acquired knowledge of the world in a hard and bitter school. She could fully fathom the base selfishness of the man who pretended to love her, and she understood why it was that he shrank from offering her the only real pledge of his truth. "'I will speak frankly to you, Paulina,' he said. "'I am too poor to marry.' "'Yes,' she answered bitterly. "'I comprehend. You are too poor to marry a penniless wife.' and I am not likely to find a rich one. But believe me, 
that my love is none the less sincere because I shrink from asking you to ally yourself to misery. So be it, Sir Reginald. I am willing to accept your love for what it is, a wise and prudent affection, such as a man of the world may freely indulge in without fear that his folly may cost him too dearly. You will come to my house. I shall see you night after night amongst the reckless idlers who gather round me. You will pay me compliments all the year round, and bring me bonbons on New Year's Day. And some day, when I have grown old and haggard, you will all at once forget the fact of our acquaintance, and I shall see you no more. Let it be so. It is pleasant for a woman to fancy herself beloved, however false the fancy may be. I will shut my eyes and dream that you love me, Reginald. And this was all. No more was ever said of love between these two, but from that hour Reginald was more constant than ever in his attendance on the beautiful widow. The time came when she grew weary of Paris, and when those who had lost money began to shun the seductive delights of her nightly receptions. Reginald Eversleigh was not slow to perceive that the brilliant throng grew thin, the most distinguished guests conspicuous by their absence. He urged Paulina to leave Paris for London, and he himself selected the lonely villa on the banks of the Thames, in which he found a billiard-room, lighted from the roof, that was easily converted into a secret chamber. It was by his advice that Paulina Dursky altered her line of conduct on taking up her abode in England, and refrained altogether from any active share in the ruinous amusements for which men frequented her receptions. It was all very well for you to take a hand at Ecarte, or to take your place at the Rouge et Noir table in Paris, Reginald said when he discussed this question, but here it will not do. The English are full of childish prejudices, and to see a woman at the gaming table would shock those prejudices. Let me play for you. I will find the capital, and we will divide the profits of each night's speculation. For your part, you will have only to look beautiful, and to lure the golden-feathered birds into the net, and sometimes, perhaps, when I am playing écarté with one of your admirers, behind whose chair you may happen to be standing, you may contrive to combine a flattering interest in his play with a substantial benefit to mine. Paulina's eyelids fell, and a crimson flush dyed her face, but she uttered no exclamation of anger or disgust, and yet she understood only too well the meaning of Sir Reginald's words. She knew that he wished her to aid him in a deliberate system of cheating. She knew this, and she did not withdraw her friendship from this man. Alas, no, she loved him, not because she believed him to be good and honorable, not because she was blinded to the baseness of his nature. She loved him in spite of her knowledge of his real character. She yielded to the influence of an infatuation which she was so powerless to resist that she might almost be pardoned for believing herself the victim of a baleful destiny. "'It is my fate,' she murmured to herself, after this last revelation of her lover's infamy. "'It must needs be my fate, since women with less claim to be loved than I possess are so happy as to win the devotion of good and brave men. It is my fate to love a cheat and trickster, on whose constancy I have so poor a hold that a breath may sever the miserable bond that unites us.' Victor Carrington was one of the first persons whom Reginald Eversleigh introduced to Madame Dursky after her arrival in England. She was pleased with the quiet and graceful manners of the Frenchman, but she was at a loss to understand Sir Reginald's intimate association with a man who was at once poor and obscure. She told Sir Reginald as much the next time she saw him alone. "'I know that in most of your friendships convenience and self-interest reign paramount over what you call sentimentality, and yet you choose for your friend this Carrington, whom no one knows, and who is, you tell me, even poorer than yourself. You must have a hidden motive, Reginald, and a strong one.' A dark shade passed over the face of the baronet. "'I have my reasons,' he said. Victor Carrington was once useful to me. At least he endeavored to be so. If he failed,
Chapter Eighteen of Run to Earth, a novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Eighteen, at Anchor. The current of life flowed on at Riverview Cottage without so much as a ripple in the shape of an event after the appalling midnight visit of Miser Scruton's ghost until one summer evening when captain duncombe came home in very high spirits bringing with him an old friend of whom miss duncombe had heard her father talk very often but whom she had hitherto never seen this was no other than george jernam the captain of the albatross and the owner of the stormy petrel and pizarro in london the captain of the albatross found plenty of business to occupy him he had just returned from an african cruise and though he had not forgotten the circumstances which had made his last intended visit to england only a memorable and melancholy failure he was in high spirits the first few days hardly sufficed for the talks between george jernam and joyce harker who aided him vigorously in the refitting of his vessel he had been in london about a week before he fell in with honest joe duncombe the two men had been fast friends ever since the day on which george while still a youngster had served as second mate under the owner of the vixen they met accidentally in one of the streets about wapping joseph duncombe was delighted to encounter his seafaring friend and insisted on taking george jernam down to riverview cottage to eat what he called a homely bit of dinner the homely bit of dinner turned out to be a very excellent repast for mrs mugby prided herself upon her powers as a cook and housekeeper and to produce a good dinner at a short notice was a triumph she much enjoyed susan trot waited at table in her prettiest cotton gown and smartest cap Rosamond Duncombe sat by her father's side during the meal, and after dinner, when the curtains were drawn and the lamp lighted, the captain of the vixen set himself to brew a jorum of punch in a large old Japanese china bowl, the composition of which punch was his strong point. Altogether, that little dinner and cheerful evening entertainment seemed the perfection of home comfort. George Jernam had been too long a stranger to home and home pleasures not to feel the cheerful influence of that hospitable abode. For Joseph Duncombe, the companionship of his old friend was delightful. The society of the sailor was as invigorating to the nostrils of a seaman as the fresh breeze of ocean after a long residence inland you don't know what a treat it is to me to have an old shipmate with me once more george he said my little Rosie and i live here pretty comfortably though i keep a tight hand over her i can tell you he added with pretended severity but it's dull work for a man who has lived the best part of his life on the sea to find himself amongst a pack of spoony landsmen never you marry a landsman Rosie." "'If you don't want me to cut you off with a shilling,' he cried, turning to his daughter. "'Of course Miss Rosamond Duncombe blushed on hearing herself thus apostrophized, "'as young ladies of eighteen have a knack of blushing "'when the possibility of their falling in love is mentioned. "'George Jernam saw the blush, and thought that Miss Duncombe "'was the prettiest girl he had ever seen. "'George Jernam stayed late at the cottage.' for its hospitable owner was loath to let his friend depart how long do you stay in london george he asked as the young man was going away a month at least perhaps two months then be sure you come down here very often you can dine with us every sunday of course for i know you haven't a creature belonging to you in london except harker and you can run down of an evening sometimes and bring him with you and smoke your cigar in my garden with the bright water rippling past you and all the ships in the pools spreading their rigging against the calm gray sky and i'll brew you a jorum of punch and Rosie shall sing us a song while we drink it it is not to be supposed that george jernam 
who had a good deal of idle time on his hands, could refuse to oblige his old captain, or shrink from availing himself of hospitality so cordially pressed upon him. He went very often in the autumn dusk to spend an hour or two at Riverview Cottage, where he always found a hearty welcome. He strolled in the garden with Captain Duncombe and Rosamond, talking of strange lands and stranger adventures. Hawker did not always accompany him, but sometimes he did, and on such occasions Rosamond seemed unaccountably glad to see him. Hawker paid her no more attention than usual, and invariably devoted himself to Joe Duncombe, who was frequently lazy and inclined to smoke his cigar in the comfortable parlour. On these occasions, George Jernam and Rosamond Duncombe strolled side by side in the garden, and the sailor entertained his fair companion by the description of all the strangest scenes he had beheld and the most romantic adventures he had been engaged in. It was like the talk of some seafaring Othello, and never did Desdemona more seriously incline to hear her valiant moor than did Miss Duncombe to hear her captain. One of the windows of Joseph Duncombe's favorite sitting-room commanded the garden, and from this window the captain of the vixen could see his daughter and the captain of the albatross walking side by side upon the smoothly kept lawn. He used to look unutterably sly as he watched the two figures, and on one occasion went so far as to tap his nose significantly several times with his ponderous forefinger. "'It's a match,' he muttered to himself. "'It's a match, or my name is not Joe Duncombe.' Susan Trott was not slow to notice those evening walks in the garden. She told the dashing young baker that she thought there would be a wedding at the cottage before long. "'Yours, of course,' cried the baker. "'For shame now, you impotent creature!' exclaimed Susan, blushing till she was rosier than the cherry-coloured ribbons in her cap. "'You know what I mean well enough.' Neither Captain Duncombe nor Susan Trott were very far wrong. The albatross was not ready for her next cruise till three months after George Jernam's first visit to Riverview Cottage, nor did the captain of the vessel seem particularly anxious to hasten the completion of the repairs. When the albatross did drop down into the channel, she sailed on a cruise that was to last less than six months— and when George Jernam touched English ground again, he was to return to claim Rosamond Duncombe as his plighted wife. This arrangement had Joyce Hawker's hearty approbation. But when he, too, had taken leave of George Jernam, he turned away, muttering, "'I think he really has forgotten Captain Valentine now. But I have not. I have not. No. I remember him better than ever now, when there's no one but me.' The albatross came safely back to the pool in the early spring weather. George Jernam had promised Rosamond that she should know of his coming before ever he set foot on shore, and he contrived to keep his word. One fine March day she saw a vessel sailing up the river, with a white flag flying from the mainmast. On the white flag blazed, in bright red letters, the name Rosamond. When Miss Duncombe saw this, she knew at once that her lover had returned. No other vessel than the albatross was likely to sport such a piece of bunting. George Jernam came back braver, truer, handsomer even than when he went away, as it seemed to Rosamond. He came back more devoted to her than ever, she thought, and a man must have been indeed cold of heart, who could be ungrateful for the innocent girlish affection which Rosamond revealed in every word and look. The wedding took place within a month of the sailor's return, and after some discussion, George Jernam consented that he and his wife should continue to live at the cottage. "'I can't come here to take possession of your house,' he had said, addressing himself to his future father-in-law. "'That would be rather too much of a good thing. I know you'd like to keep Rosie in the neighborhood. "'and so you shall. "'I'll do as you did. "'I'll find a little bit of ground near here "'and build myself a comfortable crib "'with a view of the river. 
"'Stuff and nonsense,' replied Captain Duncombe. "'If that's what you are going to do, you shall not have my Rosie. "'I've no objection to her having a husband on the premises, "'but the day she leaves my roof for the sake of any man in Christendom, "'I'll cut her off with a shilling, and the shilling shall be a bad one.' The captain of the albatross took his young wife into Devonshire for a brief honeymoon, and during this pleasant springtime holiday, Rosamond made the acquaintance of her husband's aunt. Susan Jernam was pleased with the bright-eyed, pure-minded, modest girl, and in the few days they were together, learned to regard her with a motherly feeling, which was destined to be of priceless value to Rosie at an unforeseen crisis of the new life that began so fairly. Never did a married couple begin their new life with a fairer prospect than that which lay before George Jernam and his wife when they returned to Riverview Cottage. Captain Duncombe received his son-in-law with the hearty welcome of a true seaman, but a few days after George Jernam's return, the old sailor took him aside and made an announcement which filled him with surprise. "'You know how fond I am of Rosie,' he said. "'And you know that if Providence had blessed me with a son of my own, "'he couldn't have been much dearer to me than you are. "'So come what may, neither you or Rosie must doubt my affection for both of you. "'Come now, George, promise me you won't.' "'I promise with all my heart,' answered Captain Jernam. "'I should no more think of doubting your goodness or your love for us.' "'then I should think of doubting that there's a sun shining up aloft yonder. "'But why do you speak of this?' "'Because, George, the truth of the matter is, I'm going to leave you.' "'You are going to leave us?' "'Yes, old fellow. You see, a lazy landlubber's life doesn't suit me. "'I've tried it, and it don't answer. "'I thought the sound of the water washing against the bank at the bottom of my garden— and the sight of the ships in the pool would be consolation enough for me, but they ain't, and I've been sickening for the sea for the last six months. As long as my little Rosie had nobody in the world but me to take care of her, I stayed with her, and I should have gone on staying with her till I died at my post, but she's got a husband now, and two trustworthy women servants, who would protect her if you left her, as I suppose you must leave her sooner or later." "'so there's no reason why I should stop on shore any longer, "'pining for a sight of blue water.' "'And you really mean to leave us?' exclaimed George Jernam. "'I am afraid your going will break poor Rosie's heart.' "'No, it won't, George,' answered Captain Duncombe. "'When a young woman's married, her heart is uncommonly tough "'with regard to everybody except her husband. "'I dare say poor little Rosie Posy will be sorry to lose her old father.' "'but she'll have you to console her, and she won't grieve long. "'Besides, I'm not going away forever, you know. "'I'm only just going to take a little cruise to the Indies, "'with a cargo of dry goods, "'make a bit of money for my grandchildren that are to be, "'and then come home again, fresher than ever, "'and settle down in the bosom of my family. "'I've seen a neat little craft that will suit me to a tea, "'and I shall fit her out, "'and be off for blue water before the month is ended.' "'It was evident that the old sailor was in earnest, "'and George Jernam did not attempt to overrule his determination. "'Rosamond pleaded against her father's departure, but she pleaded in vain. "'Early in June, Captain Duncombe left England on board a neat little craft, "'which he christened the Young Wife, in compliment to his daughter. "'Before he went, George promised that he would himself await the return of his father-in-law before he started on a new voyage. "'I can afford to be idle for twelve months or so,' he said, "'and my dear little wife shall not be left without a protector.' So the young couple settled down comfortably in the commodious cottage, which was now all their own. To Rosamond, her new existence was all unbroken joy— she had loved her husband with all the romantic devotion of inexperienced girlhood. To her poetic fancy, he seemed the noblest and bravest of created beings, and she wondered at her own good fortune when she saw him by her side, fond and devoted, 
content to sacrifice all the delights of his free, roving life for her sake. "'I don't think such happiness can last, George,' she said to him one day. That vague foreboding was soon to be too sadly realized. The sunshine and the bright summer peace had promised to last for ever, but a dark cloud arose which in one moment overshadowed all that summer sky. Chapter Nineteen of Run to Earth, a novel, by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Nineteen, a familiar token. Joseph Duncombe had been absent from Riverview Cottage little more than a month, and the life of its inmates had been smooth and changeless as the placid surface of a lake. They sought no society but that of each other. Existence glided by, and the eventless days left little to remember, except the sweet tranquillity of a happy home. It was on a wet, dull, unsettled July day that Rosamond Jernam found her life changed all at once, while the cause for that dark change remained a mystery to her. After idling away half the morning, Captain Jernam discovered that he had an important business letter to write to the captain of his trading ship, the Pizarro. On opening his portfolio, the captain found himself without a single sheet of foreign letter paper. He told this difficulty to his wife, as it was his habit to tell her all his difficulties, and he found her, as usual, able to give him assistance. "'There is always foreign letter paper in Papa's desk,' she said. "'You can use that.' "'But, my dear Rosie, I could not think of opening your father's desk in his absence.' "'And why not?' cried Rosamond, laughing. "'Do you think Papa has any secrets hidden there, "'or that he keeps some mysterious packet of old love-letters tied up with a blue ribbon, "'which he would not like your prying eyes to discover? "'You may open the desk, George. I give you my permission, "'and if Papa should be angry, the blame shall fall upon me alone.' The desk was a large, old-fashioned piece of furniture, which stood in the corner of Captain Duncombe's favorite sitting-room. "'But how am I to open this ponderous piece of machinery?' asked George. "'It seems to be locked.' "'It is locked,' answered his wife. "'Luckily, I happen to have a key, which precisely fits it. "'There, sir, is the key. "'And now I leave you to devote yourself to business, while I go to see about dinner.' She held up her pretty rosy lips to be kissed, and then tripped away, leaving the captain to achieve a duty for which he had no particular relish. He unlocked the desk, and found a quire of letter-paper. He dipped a pen in ink, tried it, and then began to write. He wrote, London, July 20th, and, My dear Boyd, and having written thus much, he came to a stop. The easiest part of the letter was finished. Captain Jernam sat with his elbows resting on the table, looking straight before him, in pure absence of mind. As he did so, his eyes were caught suddenly by an object lying amongst the pens and pencils in the tray before him. The object was a bent gold coin. His face grew pale as he snatched up the coin and examined it closely. It was a small Brazilian coin, bent and worn, and on one side of it was scratched the initial G. That small battered coin was very familiar to George Jernam's gaze, and it was scarcely strange if the warm life-blood ebbed from his cheeks and left them ashy pale. The coin was a keepsake which he had given to his murdered brother Valentine on the eve of their last parting, and he found it here, here, in Joseph Duncombe's desk. For some moments he sat aghast, motionless, powerless even to think. He could not realize the full weight of this strange discovery. He could only remember the warm breath of the tropical night on which he and his brother had bidden each other farewell, the fierce light of the tropical stars beneath which they had stood when they parted. Then he began to ask himself how that farewell token 
the golden coin, which he had taken from his pocket in that parting hour, and upon which he had idly scratched his own initial, had come into the possession of Joseph Duncombe. He was not a man of the world, and he was not able to reason calmly and logically on the subject of his brother's untimely fate. He shared Joyce's rooted idea that the escape of Valentine's murderer was only temporary, and that sooner or later accident would disclose the criminal. It seemed now as if the eventful moment had come. Here, on this spot, near the scene of his brother's disappearance, he came upon this token, this relic, which told that Valentine had been in some manner associated with Joseph Duncombe. And yet Joseph Duncombe and George had talked long and earnestly on the subject of the murdered sailor's fate, and in all their talk Captain Duncombe had never acknowledged any acquaintance with its details. This was strange. Still more incomprehensible to George Jernam was the fact that Valentine should have parted with the farewell token, except with his life, for his last words to his brother had been, "'I'll keep the bit of gold, George, to my dying day, in memory of your fidelity and love.' There had been something more between these two men than a common brotherhood. There had been the bond of a joyless childhood spent together, and their affection for each other was more than the ordinary love of brothers. "'I don't believe he would have parted with that piece of gold,' cried George. "'Not if he had been without a sixpence in the world. "'And he was rich. "'It was the money he carried about him which tempted his murderer. "'It was near here that he met his fate, on this very spot, perhaps. "'Joyce told me that before my father-in-law built this house "'there was a dilapidated building, which was a meeting-place "'for the vilest scoundrels in Ratcliffe Highway. "'But how came that coin in Joseph Duncombe's desk? "'How?' unless Joseph Duncombe was concerned in my brother's murder. This idea, once aroused in the mind of George Jernam, was not to be driven away. It seemed too hideous for reality, but it took possession of his mind, nevertheless, and he sat alone, trying to shut horrible fancies out of his brain, but trying uselessly. He remembered Joseph Duncombe's wealth. Had all that wealth been honestly won? He remembered the captain's restlessness— his feverish desire to run away from a home in which he possessed so much to render life happy. Might not that eagerness to return to the sailor's wild roving life have its root in the tortures of a guilty conscience? His very kindness to me may be prompted by a vague wish to make some paltry atonement for a dark wrong done my brother, thought George. He remembered Joseph Duncombe's seeming goodness of heart, and wondered if such a man could possibly be concerned in the darkest crime of which mankind can be guilty. But he remembered also that the worst and vilest of men were often such accomplished hypocrites as to remain unsuspected of evil until the hour when accident revealed their iniquity. It is so, perhaps, with this man, thought George Jernam. That air of truth and goodness may be but a mask. I know what a master passion the greed of gain is with some men— it has doubtless been the passion of this man's heart. The wretches who lured Valentine Jernam to this house were tools of Joseph Duncombe's. How otherwise could this token have fallen into his hands? He tried to find some other answer to this question, but he tried in vain. That little piece of gold seemed to fasten the dark stigma of guilt upon the absent owner of the house. "'And I have shaken this man's hand,' cried George." I am the husband of his daughter. I live beneath the shelter of his roof, in this house, which was bought, perhaps, with my brother's blood. Great heavens! It is too horrible! For two long hours George Jernam sat brooding over the strange discovery which had changed the whole current of his life. Rosamond came and peeped in at the door. Still busy, George? she asked. Yes, he answered in a strange, harsh tone. I am very busy. That altered voice alarmed the loving wife. She crept into the room and stood behind her husband's chair. George, she said, your voice sounded so strange just now. You are not ill, are you, darling? No, no. I only want to be alone. Go, Rosamond. The wife could not fail to be just a little offended by her husband's manner. The pretty rosy lips pouted, 
and then tears came into the bright blue eyes. George Jernam's head was bent upon his clasped hands, and he took no heed of his wife's sorrow. She could not leave him without one more anxious question. "'Is there anything amiss with you, George?' she asked. "'Nothing that you can cure.' The harshness of his tone, the coldness of his manner, wounded her heart. She said no more, but went quietly from the room. Never before had her beloved George spoken unkindly to her. Never before had the smallest cloud obscured the calm horizon of her married life. After this, the dark cloud hung black and heavy over that once happy household. The sun never shone again upon the young wife's home. She tried to penetrate the secret of the sudden change, but she could not do so. She could complain of no unkindness from her husband. He never spoke harshly to her after that first day. His manner was gentle and indulgent, but it seemed as if his love had died, leaving in its place only a pitiful tenderness, strangely blended with sadness and gloom. He asked Rosamond several questions about her father's past life, but on that subject she could tell him very little. She had never lived with her father until after the building of Riverview Cottage, and she knew nothing of his existence before that time, except that he had only been in England during brief intervals, and that he had always come to see her at school when he had the opportunity of doing so. "'He is the best and dearest of fathers,' she said affectionately. George Jernam asked if Captain Duncombe had been in England during that spring in which Valentine met his death. After a moment's reflection, Rosamond replied in the affirmative. "'I remember his coming to see me that spring,' she said. "'He came early in March, and again in April, and it was then he began first to talk of settling in England.' "'And with that assurance my last hope vanishes,' thought George." He had asked the question in the faint hope of hearing that Joseph Duncombe was far away from England at the time of the murder. A fortnight after the discovery of the Brazilian coin, George Jernam announced to his wife that he was about to leave her. He was going to the coast of Africa, he said. He had tried to reconcile himself to a landsman's life, and had found it unendurable. The blow fell very heavily on poor Rosamond's loving heart. "'We seem so happy, George, only two short weeks ago,' she pleaded. "'Yes,' he answered. "'I tried to be happy, but you see, the life doesn't suit me. "'Your father couldn't rest in this house, though he had made himself such a comfortable home. "'No more can I rest here. "'There is a curse upon the house, perhaps,' he added with a bitter laugh. "'Rosamond burst into tears. "'Oh, George, you will break my heart,' she cried. I thought our lives were to be so happy, and now our happiness ends all at once, like a broken dream. It is because you are weary of me and of my love that you were going away. You promised my father that you would remain with me till his return. I did, Rosamond, answered her husband gravely, and, as I am an honest man, I meant to keep that promise. I am not weary of your love. That is as precious to me as ever it was. But you must not continue to reside beneath this roof. I tell you, there is a curse upon this house, Rosamond, and neither peace nor happiness can be the lot of those who dwell within its fatal walls. You must go down to Allenby, where you may find kind friends, where you may be happy, dear, while I am away. But, George, what is all this mystery? Ask me no questions, Rosamond, for I can answer none. Believe me what I tell you, that you have no share in the change that has come upon me. My feelings towards you remain unaltered, but within the last few weeks I have made a discovery which has struck a death-blow to my happiness. I go out once more a homeless wanderer, because the quiet of domestic life has become unbearable to me. I want bustle, danger, hard work. I want to get away from my own thoughts." Rosamond, in vain, implored her husband to tell her more than this. He, so yielding of old, was on this point inflexible. Before the leaves had begun to fall in the dreary autumn days, the albatross was ready for a new voyage. The first mate took her down to Plymouth Harbor, there to wait the coming of her captain, who traveled into Devonshire by mail-coach, taking Rosamond to her future abode. 
At any other time, Rosamond would have been delighted with the romantic beauty of that Devonian village, where her husband had selected a pleasant cottage for her, near his aunt's abode. But a settled melancholy had taken possession of the once joyous girl. She had brooded continually over her husband's altered conduct and she had at last arrived at a terrible conclusion. She believed that he was mad. What but sudden insanity could have produced so great a change, a change for which it was impossible to imagine a cause? If he had been absent from me for some time, and had returned an altered creature, I should not be so much bewildered by the change, Rosamond said to herself, but the transformation occurred in an hour. He saw no strange visitor, he received no letter, no tidings of any kind could possibly have reached him. He entered my father's sitting-room, a light-hearted, happy man. He came out of it gloomy and miserable. Can I doubt that the change is something more than any ordinary alteration of feeling or character? Poor Rosamond remembered having heard of the fatal effects of sunstrokes, effects which have sometimes revealed themselves long after the occurrence of the calamity that caused them, and she told herself that the change in George Jernam's nature must needs be the result of such a calamity. She entreated her husband to consult an eminent physician as to the state of his health, but she dared not press her request, so coldly was it received. "'Who told you that I was ill?' he asked. "'I am not ill.' All the physicians in Christendom could do nothing for me. After this, Rosamond could say no more. For worlds she would not have revealed to a stranger her sad suspicion of George Jernam's insanity. She could only pray that Providence would protect and guide him in his roving life. The excitement and hard work of his existence on board ship may work a cure, she thought, trying to be hopeful. It is very possible that the calm monotony of a landsman's life may have produced a bad effect upon his brain. I can only trust in Providence. I can only pray, night and day, for the welfare of him I love so fondly. And so they parted. George Jernam left his wife with sadness in his heart. But it was a kind of sadness in which love had little share. I have thought too much of my own happiness, he said to himself. "'and I have left my brother's death unavenged. "'Have I forgotten the time when he carried me "'along the lonely seashore in his loving arms? "'Have I forgotten the years in which he was father, mother, "'all the world to me? "'No, by heaven, I have not. "'The time has come when the one thought of... Chapter Twenty, Part One of Run to Earth, a Novel by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gail Mattern. Chapter Twenty, Part One, On Guard. Mister Andrew Larkspur, the police officer, took up his abode in Percy Street a week after his interview with Lady Eversleigh. For a fortnight after he became an occupant of the house in which she lived, Honoria received no tidings from him. She knew that he went out early every morning, and that he returned late every night, and this was all that she knew respecting his movements. At the end of the fortnight he came to her late one evening, and begged to be favoured with an audience. "'I shall want at least two hours of your time, ma'am,' he said, "'and perhaps you may find it fatiguing to listen to me so late at night. "'If you'd rather defer the business till to-morrow morning—' "'I would rather not defer it,' answered Lady Eversleigh. "'I am ready to listen to you for as long a time as you choose. "'I have been anxiously expecting some tidings of your movements.' "'Very likely, ma'am,' replied Mr. Larkspur coolly. "'I know you ladies are given to impatience, as well as Berlin wool-work.' and steel beads, and the pianoforte, and such like. But you see, ma'am, there's not a living creature more unlike a racehorse than a police officer, and it's just like you ladies to expect police officers to be flying Dutchmen, in a manner of speaking. I've been a hard worker in my time, ma'am, 
but I've never worked harder or stuck to my work better than I have these last two weeks, and all I can say is, if I ain't deadbeat, it's only because it isn't in circumstances to deadbeat me. Lady Eversleigh listened very quietly to this exordium, but a slight, nervous twitching of her lips every now and then betrayed her impatience. "'I am waiting to hear your news,' she said presently. "'And I'm a-going to tell it, ma'am, in due course,' returned the police officer, drawing a bloated leather book from his pocket and opening it. "'I've got all down here in regular order. First and foremost, the baronet. He's a bad lot, is the baronet.' "'I do not need to hear that from your lips.' "'Very likely not, ma'am. "'But if you set me to watch a gentleman, "'you must expect I shall form an opinion about him. "'The baronet has lodgings in Villiers Street, "'uncommon shabby ones. "'I went in and took a good survey of him and his lodgings together, "'in the character of a bootmaker, "'taking home a pair of boots, "'which was intended for a Mr. Everfield in the next street,' says I. "'And, of course,' Everfield and Eversleigh, being almost the same names, was calculated to lead to inconvenient mistakes. In the character of the bootmaker, Sir Reginald Eversleigh tells me to get out of his room and be something uncommonly unpleasant and unfit for the ears of ladies. In the character of the bootmaker, I scrapes acquaintance with a young person employed as a housemaid and very willing to answer questions and be drawed out. From the young person employed as housemaid, I gets what I take the liberty to call my ground plan of the baronet's habits, beginning with his late breakfast, consisting chiefly of gunpowder tea and cayenne pepper, and ending with the scroop of his latch-key, to be heard any time from two in the morning to daybreak. From the young person employed as housemaid, I discover that my baronet always spends his evenings out of doors, and is known to visit a lady at Fulham very constant whereby the young person employed as housemaid supposes he is keeping company with her. From the same young person I obtain the lady's address, which piece of information the young person has acquired in the course of taking letters to the post. The lady's address is Hilton House, Fulham. The lady's name has slipped my young person's memory, but is warranted to begin with a D. Mr. Loxburgh paused to take breath and to consult the memoranda in the bloated leather book. "'Having ascertained this much, I had done with the young person for the time being,' he continued glibly, "'and I felt that my next business would be at Hilton House. "'Here I presented myself in the character of a two-penny postman, "'but here I found the servants foreign, and so uncommonly close, "'that they might as well have been so many marble monuments "'for any good that was to be got out of them.' Failing the servants, I fell back upon the neighbors and the tradespeople, and from the neighbors and the tradespeople I find out that my foreign lady's name is Dursky, and that my foreign lady gives a party every night, which party is made up of gentlemen. That is queer, to say the least of it, thinks I, a lady who gives a party every night and whose visitors are all gentlemen, is an uncommonly queer customer. Having found out this much, my mouth watered to find out more, for a man who has his soul in his profession takes a pleasure in his work, ma'am, and if you were to offer to pay such a man double to waste his time, he couldn't do it. I tried the neighbors, and I tried the tradespeople every way, and work em how I would, I couldn't get much out of em. You see, ma'am, there's scarcely a human habitation within a quarter of a mile of Hilton House— so when I say neighbors, I don't mean neighbors in the common sense of the word. There might be assassination going on every night in Hilton House undiscovered, for there's no one lives near enough to hear the victim's groans. And if there was anything as good for our trade as pork pie making out of murdered human victims going nowadays, ma'am, Hilton House would be the place where I should look for pork pies. Well, I was almost beginning to lose patience, when I sat down in a fancy stationer's shop to rest myself. I sat down in this shop because I was really tired, not with any hope of making use of my time, for I was too far away from Hilton House to expect any luck in the way of information from the gentleman behind the counter. However, when a man has devoted his life to ferreting out information, the habit of ferreting is apt to be very strong upon him. So I pass the time of day to my fancy stationer, and then begins to ferret. 
"'Madame Dursky at Hilton House yonder is an uncommonly handsome woman, I throw out by way of an opening.' uncommonly replies my fancy stationer by which i perceive he knows her a customer of yours perhaps i throw out promiscuous yes answers my fancy stationer a good one too i'll be bound i throw out in a lively conversational way my fancy stationer smiles and being accustomed to study smiles i see significance in his smile "'A very good one in some things,' replies my fancy stationer, laying a tremendous stress upon the word some. "'Oh,' says I, "'gilt-edged note-paper and cream-colored sealing-wax, for instance?' "'I don't sell her a choir of paper in a month,' answers my stationer. "'If she was as fond of writing letters as she is of playing cards, I think it would be better for her.' "'Oh, she's fond of card-playing, is she?' I ask. Yes, replies my fancy stationer. I rather think she is. Your hair would stand on end if I were to tell you how many packs of playing cards I've sold her lady companion within the last three months. The lady companion comes here at dusk with a thick black veil over her face, and she thinks I don't know who she is. But I do know her, and know where she lives, and whom she lives with. After this, I buy myself a choir of writing paper, which I don't want, and I wish my fancy stationer good afternoon. Ho, ho! I say to myself when I get outside. I know the meaning of Madame Dursky's parties now. Madame Dursky's house is a flash gambling crib, and all those fine gentlemen in cabs and broughams go there to play cards. The mistress of a gaming house, exclaimed Honoria. A fitting companion for Reginald Eversleigh. Just so, ma'am, and a fitting companion for Mr. Victor Carrington, likewise. Have you found out anything about him? cried Lady Eversleigh eagerly. No, ma'am, I haven't. At least, nothing in my way. I've tried his neighbors and his tradespeople also, in the character of a postman, which is respectable and calculated to inspire confidence. "'but out of his tradespeople I can get nothing more "'than the fact that he is a remarkably praiseworthy young man "'who pays his debts regular "'and is the very best of sons to a highly respectable mother. "'There's nothing much in that, you know, ma'am.' "'Hypocrite!' murmured Lady Eversleigh. "'A hypocrite so skilled in the vile arts of hypocrisy "'that he will contrive to have the world always on his side. "'And this is all your utmost address has been able to achieve?' "'All at present, ma'am, but I live in hopes. "'And now I've got a bit of news about the baronet, "'which I think will astonish you. "'I've been improving my acquaintance with the young person "'employed as housemaid in Villiers Street for the last fortnight, "'and I find from her that my baronet is on very friendly terms "'with his first cousin, Mr. Dale, of the Temple.' "'Indeed!' exclaimed Honoria. "'These two men are the last between whom I should have imagined a friendship impossible.' "'Yes, ma'am, but so it is, notwithstanding. "'Mr. Douglas Dale, barrister at law, dined with his cousin, Sir Reginald, twice last week, "'and on each occasion the two gentlemen left Villiers Street together in a hack-cab between eight and nine o'clock. "'My friend, the housemaid, happened to hear the address given to the cabmen on both occasions.' and on both occasions the address was Hilton House, Fulham. "'Douglas Dale, a gambler!' cried Honoria. "'The companion of his infamous cousin. That is indeed ruin. "'Well, certainly, ma'am, it does not seem a very lively prospect for my friend D.D.' answered Mr. Loxburgh with irrepressible flippancy. "'Do you know any more respecting this acquaintance?' asked Honoria. "'Not yet, ma'am, but I mean to know more.' "'Watch, then,' she cried. "'Watch those two men. "'There is danger for Mr. Dale "'in any association with his cousin, "'Sir Reginald Eversleigh. "'Do not forget that. "'There is peril for him, "'the deadliest it may be. "'Watch them, Mr. Loxburgh. "'Watch them by day and night.' "'I'll do my duty, ma'am. "'Depend upon it,' replied the police officer, "'and I'll do it well. "'I take pride in my profession, "'and to me duty is a pleasure.' I will trust you. You may, ma'am. Oh, 
By the by, I must tell you that in this house my name is Andrews. Please remember that, ma'am. Mr. Andrews, 